White Gold Wielder by Stephen R. Donaldson. Copyright 1983 by Stephen R. Donaldson. Narrated by Merwin Smith. This book was originally created for audio cassette playback. Any announcements concerning cassettes do not apply to this recording. This version contains markers allowing direct access to major portions of the book. Annotation Third and concluding volume of the fantasy saga The Second Chronicles of Thomas Covenant. Covenant and his companions set out on a quest to extinguish the sunbane, restore health to the land, and face Lord Fowl for a final showdown at Mount Thunder. Sequel to The One Tree R.C. and F.D. 17727 Bestseller, 1983 From the Book Jacket I want you to go back to the land, to Revelstone, and stop the clave. Put out the bane fire. If you do that, the sun bane will slow down. Maybe it'll even recede. That'll give us time to look for a better answer. Thomas Covenant was shocked by Lyndon Avery's demand, but he realized that despite their awful failure on the Isle of the One Tree, there was no alternative but to return and fight. Moram had warned him, in the end, you must return to the land. After a long and arduous journey overland, the company reaches Revelstone. Following a fiery showdown with Gibbon Raver, Covenant discovers that he can come to terms with and control his awesome power. As he readies himself for the final showdown with Lord Fowl, the despiser, Thomas Covenant knows he has the answer at last. White Gold Wielder, Book Three of the Second Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, is the stunning conclusion to the extraordinary saga that has become a major international bestseller. About the author. Born in 1947 in Cleveland, Ohio, Stephen R. Donaldson made his publishing debut with the first Covenant trilogy in 1977. Shortly thereafter, he was named Best New Writer of the Year and given the prestigious John W. Campbell Award. He graduated from the College of Worcester, Ohio, in 1968, served two years as a conscientious objector doing hospital work in Akron, then attended Kent State University, where he received his M.A. in English in 1971. Donaldson now lives in New Mexico. Other books by Stephen R. Donaldson The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever Book One Lord Fowl's Bane, Book Two, The Ill-Earth War, Book Three, The Power That Preserves. The Second Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, Book One, The Wounded Land, Book Two, The One Tree. Book Three of the Second Chronicles of Thomas Covenant. White Gold Wielder, by Stephen R. Donaldson, to Bruce L. Blackie, without whose help. Contents. What Has Gone Before Side 1 Part 1 Retribution 1. The Master's Scar Side 1 2. Leper's Ground Side 1 3. The Path to Pain Side 2 4. Sea of Ice Side 2 5. Landward Side 3 6. Winter in Combat. Side 4. 7. Physician's Plight. Side 5. 8. The Defenders of the Land. Side 5. 9. March to Crisis. Side 6. 10. The Bane Fire. Side 7. Part 2. Apotheosis. 11. Aftermath. Side 8. 12. Those Who Part. Side 8. 13. The Ebrand. Side 9. 14. The Last Born. Side 10. 15. Enactors of Desecration. Side 10. 16. Andelaine, Forgive. Side 11. 17. Into the White Warrens. Side 11. 18. No Other Way. Side 12. 19. Hold Possession. Side 12. 20. The Sun Sage. Side 13. Epilogue. Restoration. 21. To Say Farewell. 
side 13. Glossary, side 13. What has gone before? The Wounded Land, Book 1 of the Second Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, describes the return of Thomas Covenant to the land, a realm of magic and peril, where in the past he fought a bitter battle against sin and madness and prevailed. Using the power of wild magic, he overcame Lord Fowl the Despiser, the land's ancient enemy, thus winning peace for the land and integrity for himself. Ten years have passed for Covenant, years that represent many centuries in the life of the land. Lord Fowl has regained his strength, confident that he will succeed in his efforts to gain possession of Covenant's white gold ring, the wild magic. Lord Fowl summons Covenant to the land. Covenant finds himself on Kevin's watch, for once before Fowl prophesied that Covenant would destroy the world. Now that prophecy is reaffirmed, but in a new and terrible way. Accompanied by Lyndon Avery, a doctor who was unwittingly drawn to the land with him, Covenant descends to the old village of Mithill Stonedown, where he first encounters the heinous force that the despiser has unleashed, the Sunbane. The Sunbane is a corruption of the law of nature. It afflicts the land with rain, drought, fertility, and pestilence in mad succession. It has already slain the old forests. As it intensifies, it threatens to destroy every form of life. The people of the land are driven to bloody sacrificial rites to appease the sunbane for their own survival. Seeing the extremity of their plight, Covenant begins a quest for an understanding of the sunbane, and for a way to heal the land. Guided by Sunder, a man from Mithill Stonedown, he and Lyndon fare northward toward Revelstone, where lives the Clave, the lore-masters who most clearly comprehend and use the sunbane. But the travelers are pursued by ravers, Lord Fowl's ancient servants, whose purpose is to afflict Covenant with a strange venom that will eventually drive him mad with power. Surviving the perils of the sunbane and the attacks of venom, Covenant, Linden, and Sunder continue northward. As they near Andalane, a once beautiful region in the center of the land, they encounter another village, Crystal Stonedown, in which a woman named Hollyan is being threatened by the clave because of her power to foresee the sunbane. The travelers rescue her, and she joins them on their quest. She informs Covenant that Andalane, while still beautiful, has become a place of horror. Dismayed by this desecration, Covenant enters Andalane alone to confront the evil therein. He learns that Andalane is not a place of evil. Rather, it has become a place of power where the dead gather around a forestall who defends the trees. Covenant soon meets this forestall who was once a man named Heil Troy, and several of his former friends, the lords Moram and Aelina, the bloodguard Banor, and the giant Saltheart Foam Follower. The Forestal and the dead give Covenant gifts of obscure knowledge and advice, and Foam Follower offers Covenant the companionship of a strange ebony creature named Vane, who was created by the Irviles of the Demon Dim, and whose purpose is hidden. With Vane behind him, Covenant seeks to rejoin his companions, who, in his absence, have been captured by the clave. His search for them nearly costs him his life, first in the desperate village of Stonemite Woodhelven, then among the sunbane victims of During Stonedown. However, with the aid of the Wainhem, he at last wins his way to Revelstone. There he meets Gibbon, the leader of the clave, and learns that his friends have been imprisoned so that their blood can be used to manipulate the sunbane. Desperate to free his friends and to gain knowledge of Lord Fowl's atrocity, Covenant submits to a sooth-tell, a ritual of blood in which much of the truth is revealed. His visions show him two crucial facts, that the source of the sunbane lies in the destruction of the Staff of Law, a powerful tool that formerly supported the natural order, and that the clave actually serves Lord Fowl to the actions of the raver that controls Gibbon. Unleashing the wild magic, Covenant frees his friends from Revelstone. He then resolves to find the one tree from which the original staff of law was made, so that he can fashion a new one to use against the sunbane. In this purpose he is joined by Bryn, Kale, Seer, and Hergrim, Harochai, members of the race that spawned the Bloodguard. With Linden, Sunder, Hollian, and Vane, Covenant turns eastward toward the sea, hoping there to find the means to pursue his quest. 
On the way, he encounters a party of giants who name themselves the Search. One of them, Cable Sea Dreamer, has had an earth sight vision of the Sunbane, and they have come to the land to combat the peril. Guiding the Search to Sea Reach and Kirkry, the former home of the giants in the land, Covenant uses his knowledge of their ancestors to persuade them to commit their giant ship to the service of his quest for the One Tree. Before his departure from the land, Covenant performs a great act of absolution for the dead of Kirkry, the former giants who were damned by the manner of their death at the hands of a raver. He then sends Sunder and Hallian back to the land, hoping they will be able to inspire the villages to resist the clave, and prepares himself to begin the next stage of his quest. The One Tree, Book Two of the Second Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, details that quest the voyage of the giant ship Starfare's Gem in search of the One Tree. From the first, the journey is beset by treachery. Linda discovers too late that a raver has boarded the vessel. The raver uses a pack of rats to attack Covenant, triggering a venom relapse, which increases his power. Delirious, Covenant fears that he will destroy his friends, so he seals himself off from help. Lyndon is able to save him only by attempting a superficial possession of his spirit. As he recovers, the quest sails to the land of the Elohim, a reclusive and mystic people who the giants believe will be able to reveal the location of the One Tree. But when Covenant and his companions reach Elamesnadine, home of the Elohim, they are met with distrust and mystification rather than aid. The Elohim proclaim Lyndon the Sun Sage, denigrate Covenant because he lacks her health sense, and refuse to provide the location of the One Tree except by entering Covenant's mind to lay bare the knowledge hidden there by the Forestall and Andalane. As a result, the giants learn how to find the One Tree, but Covenant's mind is lost. Meanwhile, Vane is captured and imprisoned by the Elohim, who fears his presence. But when Lyndon leads the quest away from the Elamesnadine, he manages to make his escape. Aboard Starfare's gem, the quest sets out for the One Tree. To their surprise, the companions are joined by an Elohim, Findale the Appointed, who has been sent by his people to promote their secret purposes and to guard against Vain. And Lyndon finds that she cannot heal Covenant's mind without taking full possession of him, an act which she considers evil. Damaged by a terrible storm, Starfare's gem is forced to seek supplies and repairs in the seaport of Bretha Realm, the home of the Brathair, a people who have spent most of their history in a war against the feral sand gorgons of the Great Desert. They are ruled by an ancient thaumaturge, Kosrain of the Gyre, who covets Covenant's ring. Kosrain attempts to free Covenant's mind, so that Covenant can be compelled to release it to him. These initial efforts fail, so Kosrain seeks to coerce Linden to obtain the ring for him by exposing the Harachai to the violence of the Sand Gorgons, slaying Hergrim, crippling Seer, and imprisoning the entire company when they try to flee Kosrain's castle, the Sandhold. However, Linden turns Kosrain's machinations against him. She takes the damage done to Covenant's mind upon herself, thus restoring him to consciousness and power in time to save the quest by mastering a Sand Gorgon and bringing about Kosrain's death. As the companions and Starfare's gem escape Bratherealm, Seer is slain, but Linden recovers from the loss of mind she absorbed from Covenant, and the quest continues. When the companions reach the Isle of the One Tree, Cable Sea Dreamer strives to dissuade Covenant and Linden from their purpose, but his muteness prevents him from making his earth sight understood. In the name of the Harachai people, and for Covenant's sake, Bryn battles the guardian of the One Tree to obtain access to the Isle. In the process, he becomes the guardian himself, and allows the company to descend into the deep cave which holds the One Tree. There, Sea Dreamer sacrifices his life to reveal the truth of Lord Fowl's secret manipulations. Covenant has been made so powerful by Venom that he can no longer raise wild magic without threatening the Arch of Time. In addition, the One Tree is guarded by the Worm of the World's End. Any attempt to touch the tree will rouse the Worm, and all the companions will be destroyed unless Covenant fights to protect them. Seeing the trap, Linden calls Covenant back from battle. In turn, he tries to return her to their former world, so that she can tend his mortally wounded body, 
but she causes his attempt to fail so that she can remain with him. In despair, the company retreats to Starfare's gem without a new staff of law, while the Isle of the One Tree sinks into the sea. Here begins White Gold Wielder, Book Three of the Second Chronicles of Thomas Covenant. To Go Wherever Dreaming Goes Part One Retribution 1. The Master's Scar Awkward without its midmast, Starfarer's gem turned heavily toward the north, putting its stern to the water clogged with sand and foam, which marked the passing of the one tree. In the rigging, giants labored and fumbled at their tasks, driven from line to line by the hoarse goad of seven hands' commands, even though Sea Dreamer lay dead on the deck below them. The anchor-master stood, lean and rue-bitten, on the wheel-deck, and yelled up at them, his voice raw with suppressed pain. If any compliance lagged, the stores-master, Galrath, seconded him, throwing her shout after his like a piece of ragged granite, because all the search had come to ruin, and she did not know any other way to bear it. The Dromond went north simply to put distance between itself and the deep grave of its hope. But Grimmond Hanenscrave, the giant ship's master, huddled on the afterdeck with his brother in his arms and did not speak. His massive face, so strong against storms and perils, looked like a yielded fortification. His beard tangled the shadows as the sun declined toward setting, and beside him stood the first of the search and pitchwife, as if they were lost without the earth's sight to guide them. Findale the Appointed stood there also, wearing his old misery, like a man who had always known what would happen at the Isle of the One Tree. Vane stood there with one heel of the former staff of law, bound around his wooden wrist and his useless hand dangling. And Lyndon Avery stood there as well, torn between bereavements. Outrage and sorrow for Sea Dreamer swimming in her eyes, need for covenant aching in her limbs. But Thomas Covenant had withdrawn to his cabin like a crippled animal going to ground, and he stayed there. He was beaten. He had nothing left. Harsh with revulsion, he lay in his hammock and stared at the ceiling. His chamber had been made for a giant. It outsized him, just as his doom and the despiser's manipulations had outsized him. The red sunset through the open port bloodied the ceiling until dusk came and leached his sight away but he had been blind all along, so truncated of perception, that he had caught no glimpse of his true fate, until Linden had cried it into his face. This is what Fowl wants. That was how his former strengths and victories had been turned against him. He could not feel Kale standing guard outside his door like a man whose fidelity had been redeemed. Beyond the slow rolling of the giant ship's pace, the salt of futility in the air, the distant creak of rigging and report of canvas. He could not tell the difference between this cabin and the dungeon of the sand-hold, or the betrayed depths of Revelstone. All stone was one to him, deaf to appeal or need, senseless. He might have destroyed the earth in that crisis of power and venom, might have broken the arch of time as if he were indeed the despiser's servant, if Lyndon had not stopped him and then he had failed at his one chance to save himself. Horrified by love and fear for her, he had allowed Lyndon to return to him, abandoning the stricken and dying body of his other life, abandoning him to ruin, though she had not intended any ruin. Bryn had said to him, "'That is the grace which has been given to you, to bear what must be borne.' But it was a lie. In darkness he lay and did not move, Sleepless, although he coveted slumber, yearned for any oblivion which would bring surcease. He went on staring upward as if he too were graven of dead stone. A reification of folly and broken dreams snared within the eternal ambit of his defeat. Anger and self-despite might have impelled him to seek out his old clothes, might have sent him up to the decks to bear the desolation of his friends. But those garments he had left in Linden's cabin as though for safekeeping, and he could not go there. His love for her was too corrupt, had been too severely falsified by selfishness. Thus the one lie he had practiced against her from the beginning came back to damn him. He had withheld one important fact from her, hoping like a coward that it would prove unnecessary. 
that his desire for her would be permissible in the end. But by the lie of withholding, he had accomplished nothing except her miscomprehension, nothing except the search's destitution and the despiser's victory. He had let his need for her blind both of them. No, it was worse than that. He did need her, had needed her so acutely that the poignance of it had shredded his defenses. But other needs had been at work as well. The need to be the land's rescuer, to stand at the center of Lord Fowle's evil and impose his own answer upon it. The need to demonstrate his mortal worth against all the bloodshed and pain which condemned him. He had become so wrapped up in his isolation and leprosy, so certain of them and what they meant, that they had grown indistinguishable from despite. Now he was beaten. He had nothing left for which he might sanely hope or strive. He should have known better. The old man on Haven Farm had spoken to Linden, rather than to him. The Elohim had greeted her as the sun-sage, him as the wrongness which imperiled the earth. Even dead, Elena, in Andalane, had said plainly that the healing of the land was in Linden's hands, rather than his. Yet he had rejected comprehension in favor of self-insistence. His need or arrogance had been too great to allow comprehension. And still, with the destruction of everything he held precious laid squarely at his door, he would not have done otherwise, would not give up his ring, not surrender the meaning of his life either to Linden or to Findale. It was all that remained to him to bear the blame if he could not achieve the victory. Failing everything else, he could still at least refuse to be spared. So he lay in his hammock, like a sacrifice, with the stone vessel spread out unreadably around him. Fettered by the iron of his failures, he did not move or try to move. The first night after the dark of the moon filled his eyes. In Andalane, High Lord Moram had warned, "'He has said that you are his enemy.' Remember that he seeks always to mislead you. It was true. He was the despiser's servant, rather than enemy. Even his former victory had been turned against him. Sucking the wounded places of his heart, he returned the sightless stare of the dark, and remained where he was. He had no measure for the passage of time, but the night was not far advanced when he heard a stiff, stretched voice rumble outside his door. It uttered words he was unable to distinguish. Yet Kale's reply was precise. "'The doom of the earth is upon his head,' the Harochai said. "'Will you not pity him?' Too weary for indignation or argument. Hanan's crave responded, "'Can you believe that I mean him harm?' Then the door opened, and a lantern led the master's tall bulk into the cabin. The light seemed small against the irreducible night of the world— but it lit the chamber brightly enough to sting Covenant's eyes, like tears he had not shed. Still he did not turn his head away or cover his face. He went on staring numbly at the ceiling while Hanan's crave set the lantern on the table. The table was low for the size of the cabin. From the first day of the quest's voyage, the giantish furniture had been replaced by a table and chairs better suited to Covenant's stature. As a result, the lantern threw the hammock's shadow above him. He seemed to lie in the echo of his own dark. With a movement that made his sark sigh along the wall, Hanan's crave lowered himself to the floor. After long moments of silence, his voice rose out of the wan light. My brother is dead. The knowledge still wrung him. Having no other family since the passing of our mother and father, I loved him, and he is dead. The vision of his earth sight gifted us with hope even as it blighted him with anguish. And now that hope is dead, and he will never be released. As did the dead of the grieve, he has gone out of life in horror. He will never be released. Cable Sea Dreamer, my brother, bearer of earth's sight, voiceless and valiant to his grave. Covenant did not turn his head, but he blinked at the sting in his eyes until the shadow above him softened it. The way of hope and doom, he thought dumbly, lies open to you. Perhaps for him that had been true. Perhaps if he had been honest with Linden, or had heeded the Elohim, the path of the one tree might have held some hope. But what hope had there ever been for a sea dreamer? Yet without hope the giant had tried to take all the doom upon himself, 
and somehow at the last he had found his voice to shout a warning. Roughly, Hunnensgrave said, I beseeched of the Chosen that she speak to you, but she would not. When I purposed to come to you myself, she railed at me, demanding that I forbear. Has he not suffered sufficiently, she cried. Have you no mercy? He paused briefly, and his voice lowered. She bears herself bravely, the Chosen. No longer is she the woman of frailty and fright who coiled so before the lurker of the Sarngrave. But she also was bound to my brother by a kinship which rends her in her way. In spite of her refusal, he seemed to believe that she deserved his respect. Then he went on. But what have I to do with mercy or forbearance? They are too high for me. I know only that Cable Sea Dreamer is dead. He will never be released, if you do not release him. At that, Covenant flinched in surprise and pain. If I don't— He was sick with venom and protest. How can I release him? If revelation and dismay and Lyndon had not driven restraint so deeply into him, during his struggle against the aura of the worm of the world's end— he would have burned the air for no other reason than because he was hurt and futile with power. How can I bear it? But his restraint held, and Hunnensgrave looked preternaturally reduced as he sat on the floor against the wall, hugging his unanswered grief. The giant was Covenant's friend. In that light, Hunnensgrave might have been an avatar of lost salt-heart foam-follower, who had given Covenant everything. He still had enough compassion left to remain silent. "'Giant friend,' the master said without lifting his head, "'have you been given the tale of how Cable Sea Dreamer, my brother, came by his scar?' His eyes were hidden beneath his heavy brows. His beard slumped on his chest. The shadow of the table's edge cut him off at the torso, but his hands were visible, gripping each other. The muscles of his forearms and shoulders were corded with fatigue and strain. The fault of it was mine, he breathed into the empty light. The exuberance and folly of my youth marked him for all to see that I had been careless of him. He was my brother, and the younger by some years, though as the lives of giants are reckoned the span between us was slight. Surely we were both well beyond the present number of your age, but still were we young, new to our manhood and but recently apprenticed to the sea-craft and the ships we loved. The earth's sight had not yet come upon him, and so there was naught between us beyond my few years and the foolishness which he outgrew more swiftly than I. He came early to his stature, and I ended his youth before its time. In those days we practiced our new craft in a small vessel which our people name a tear-skull, a stone craft near the measure of the longboats you have seen, with one sail, a swinging boom and oars for use should the wind be lost or misplayed. With skill a tear skull may be mastered by one giant alone, but two are customary. Thus Sea Dreamer and I worked and learned together. Our tear skull we named Foam Kite, and it was our heart's glee. Now among prentices it is no great wonder that we reveled in tests against each other pitting and honing our skills with races and displays of every description. Most common of these was the running of a course within the great harbor of home, far sufficiently from shore to be truly at sea, and yet within any swimmer's reach of land should some prentice suffer capsize, a mishap which would have shamed us deeply, young as we were. And when we did not race, we trained for races, seeking new means by which we might best our comrades. The course was simply marked. One point about which we swung was a boy fixed for that purpose, but the other was a rhymed and hoary rock that we named Salt Tooth, for the sheer, sharp manner in which it rose to bite the air. Once or twice, or many times around that course, we ran our races, testing our ability to use the winds for turning as well as for speed. Hunnensgrave's voice had softened somewhat. Remembrance temporarily took him away from his distress, but his head remained bowed, and Covenant could not look away from him. Punctuated by the muffled sounds of the sea, the plain details of Hunnensgrave's story transfixed the atmosphere of the cabin. This coarse sea-dreamer and I ran as often as any, and more than most, 
for we were eager for the sea. Thus we came to stand well among those who vied for mastery. With this my brother was content. He had the true giantish exhilaration, and did not require victory for his joy. But in that I was less worthy of my people. Never did I cease to covet victory, or to seek out new means by which it might be attained. So it befell that one day I conceived a great thought, which caused me to hug my breast in secret, and to hasten Sea Dreamer to Foam Kite, that I might practice my thought and perfect it for racing. But that thought I did not share with him. It was grand, and I desired its wonder for myself. Not questioning what was in me, he came for the simple pleasure of the sea. Together we ran Foam Kite out to the boy, then swung with all speed toward upthrust Salt Tooth. It was a day as grand as my thought. He spoke as if it were visible behind the shadows of the cabin. Under the faultless sky blew a wind with a whetted edge which offered speed and hazard, cutting the wave crests to white froth as it bore us ahead. Swiftly before us loomed Salt Tooth, in such a wind the turning of a tear skull requires true skill, a jeopardy even to competent prentices, and it was there that a race could be won or lost, for a poor tack might drive a small craft far from the course or overturn it altogether. But my thought was for that turning, and I was not daunted by the wind. Leaving Sea Dreamer to the tiller and the management of the boom, I bid him run in as nigh to Salt Tooth as he dared. All apprentices knew such a course to be folly, for the turning would then bear us beyond our way. But I silenced my brother's protests, and went to Foam Kite's prow, still preserving my secret, hiding my hands from his sight. I freed the anchor, and readied its line. Abruptly the master faltered, fell still. One fist lay knotted in his lap, the other twisted roughly into his beard, tugging it for courage. But after a moment he drew a deep breath to let the air hiss away through his teeth. He was a giant, and could not leave his story unfinished. Such was Sea Dreamer's skill that we passed hastening within an arm's span of Salt Tooth, though the wind healed us sharply from the rock, and any side slip might have done Foam Kite great harm. But his hand upon the wind was sure, and an instant later I enacted my intent. As we sped, I arose and cast the anchor upon the rock, snagging us there. Then I lashed the line. This was my thought for a turning too swift to be matched by any other tear skull, that our speed and the anchor and salt tooth should do the labor for us, though I was uncertain how the anchor might be unsnared when the turn was done. But I had not told Sea Dreamer my purpose. His voice had become a low rasp of bitterness in his throat. He was fixed upon the need to pass Salt Tooth without mishap, and my act surprised him entirely. He half gained his feet, half started toward me as if I had gone mad. Then the line sprang taut, and Foam Kite came about with a violence which might have snapped the mast from its holes. Again he stopped, the muscles of his shoulders bunched. When he resumed, he spoke so softly that Covenant barely heard him. Any child might have informed me what would transpire, but I had given no consideration to it. The boom wrenched across the stern of Foam Kite with a force to sliver granite, and Sea Dreamer, my brother, had risen into its path. In that wind and my folly, I would not have known that he had fallen had he not cried out as he was struck. But at his cry I turned to see him flung into the sea. Ah, my brother! A groan twisted his voice. I dove for him, but he would have been lost had I not found the path of his blood in the water and followed it. Senseless he hung in my arms as I bore him to the surface. With the sea thus wind-slashed, I saw little of his injury, but blood, until I had borne him to Foam Kite and rested him aboard. But there his wound seemed so great that I believed his eyes had been crushed in his head, and for a time I became as mad as my intent had been. To this day I know nothing of our return to the docks of home. 
I did not regain myself until a healer spoke to me, compelling me to hear that my brother had not been blinded. Had the boom itself struck him, mayhap he would have been slain outright. But the impact was borne by a cable along the boom, taking him below the eyes and softening the blow somewhat. Once more he fell still. His hands covered his face as if to staunch the flow of blood he remembered. Covenant watched him mutely. He had no courage for such stories, could not bear to have them thrust upon him. But Hunnan's grave was a giant and a friend, and since the days of Fulm Follower, Covenant had not been able to close his heart. Though he was helpless and aggrieved, he remained silent and let Hunnan's grave do what he willed. After a moment the master dropped his hands. Drawing a breath like a sigh, he said, "'It is not the way of giants to punish such folly as mine, though I would have found comfort in the justice of punishment. And Cable Sea Dreamer was a giant among giants. He did not blame the carelessness which marked his life forever.' Then his tone stiffened. "'But I do not forget. The fault is mine.' Though I, too, am a giant in my way, my ears have not found the joy to hear this story. And I have thought often that perhaps my fault is greater than it has appeared. The earth's sight is a mystery. None can say why it chooses one giant rather than another. Perhaps it befell my brother because of some lingering hurt or alteration done him by the puissance of that blow. Even in their youth giants are not easily stricken senseless. Suddenly Hunnan's grave looked upward, and his gaze struck foreboding into Covenant's maimed empathy. His eyes under his heavy brows were fierce with extremity, and the new-cut lines around them were as intense as scars. "'Therefore have I come to you,' he said slowly, as if he could not see Covenant coiling. "'I desire a restitution which is not within my power to perform. My fault must be assuaged.' It is the custom of our people to give our dead to the sea. But Cable Sea Dreamer, my brother, has met his end in horror, and it will not release him. He is like the dead of the grieve, damned to his anguish. If his spirit is not given its Kaamora, for an instant his voice broke, he will haunt me while one stone of the arch of time remains standing upon another. Then his gaze fell to the floor. Yet there is no fire in all the world that I can raise to give him surcease. He is a giant. Even in death he is immune to flame. At that Covenant understood, and all his dreads came together in a rush, the apprehension which had crouched in him since Hunnan's crave had first said, If you do not release him. The terror of his doom, to destroy the earth himself, or to surrender it for destruction by ceding his ring to Lord Fowl. The despiser had said, The ill that you deem most terrible is upon you. Of your own volition, you will give the white gold into my hand. Either that, or bring down the arch of time. There was no way out. He was beaten, because he had kept the truth from Linden, seeking to deny it. And Hanan's crave asked, You want me to cremate him? Clenched fear made him harsh. With my ring. Are you out of your mind? Hunnan's crave winced. The den of the grieve, he began. No, Covenant retorted. He had walked into a bonfire to save them from their reiterated hell, but risks like that were too great for him now. He had already caused too much death. After I sink the ship, I won't be able to stop. For a moment even the sounds of the sea fell still, shocked by his vehemence. The giant ship seemed to be losing headway. The light of the lantern flickered as if it were going out. Perhaps there were shouts like muffled lamentations in the distance. Covenant could not be sure. His senses were condemned to the surface of what they perceived. The rest of the Dromond was hidden from him. If the master heard anything, he did not react to it. His head remained bowed, moving heavily like a man hurt in every limb. He climbed to his feet. Though the hammock hung high above the floor, he stood head and shoulders over the unbeliever, and still he did not meet Covenant's glare. The light of the lantern was below and behind him as he took one step closer. 
His face was shadowed, dark, and fatal. In a wan and husky voice, he said, Yes, giant friend. The epithet held a tinge of sarcasm. I am gone from my mind. You are the ringwielder, as the Elohim have said. Your power threatens the earth. What import has the anguish of one or two giants in such a plight? Forgive me. Then Covenant wanted to cry out in earnest, torn like dead Kevin Landwaster between love and defeat. But loud feet had come running down the companionway outside his cabin, had already reached his door. The door sprang open without any protest from Kale. A crew member thrust her head past the threshold. "'Master, you must come!' Her voice was tight with alarm. "'We are beset by Nikor!' Two. Lepers ground. Hanenskrave left the cabin slowly like a man responding by habit, unconscious of the urgency of the summons. Perhaps he no longer understood what was happening around him. Yet he did respond to the call of his ship. When the master reached the companionway, Kale closed the door behind him. The Haruchai seemed to know instinctively that Covenant would not follow Hanenskrave. Nikor! Covenant thought, and his heart labored. Those tremendous serpent-like sea-beasts were said to be the offspring of the worm of the world's end. Starfair's gem had passed through a region crowded with them, near the Isle of the One Tree. They'd been indifferent to the Dromon then. But now, with the Isle gone, and the worm restive? And what could one stone vessel do against so many of those prodigious creatures? What could Hanan's crave do? Yet the unbeliever did not leave his hammock. He stared at the dark ceiling and did not move. He was beaten, defeated. He dared not take the risk of confronting the giant ship's peril. If Lyndon had not intervened at the one tree, he would already have become another Kevin, enacting a ritual of desecration to surpass every other evil. The threat of the Nikor paled beside the danger he himself represented. Deliberately he sought to retreat into himself. He did not want to know what transpired outside his cabin. How could he endure the knowledge? He had said, I'm sick of guilt. But such protests had no meaning. His very blood had been corrupted by venom and culpability. Only the powerless were truly innocent. And he was not powerless. He was not even honest. The selfishness of his love had brought all this to pass. Yet the lives at stake were the lives of his friends— and he could not close himself to the Drummond's jeopardy. Starfare's gem rolled slightly in the water, as if it had lost all headway. The period of shouts and running had followed Hunnenskrave's departure, but now the giant ship was silent. With Linden's senses, he would have been able to read what was happening through the stone itself. But he was blind and bereft, cut off from the essential spirit of the world. His numb hands clutched the edges of the hammock. Time passed. He was a coward, and his dreams swarmed darkly about him as if they were born in the shadows above his head. He gripped himself with thoughts of ruin, held himself still with curses, but Hunnenskrave's face kept coming back to him, the beard like a growth of pain from his cheeks, the massive brow knuckled with misery, the hands straining. Covenant's friend, like foam follower. My brother has met his end in horror. It was intolerable that such needs had to be refused. And now the Nikor. Even a beaten man could still feel pain. Roughly, he pulled himself into a sitting position. His voice was a croak of coercion and fear as he called out, Kale! The door opened promptly, and Kale entered the cabin. The healed wound of a coarser spur marked his left arm from shoulder to elbow like the outward sign of his fidelity. But his visage remained as impassive as ever. "'Er, Lord?' he asked flatly. His dispassionate tone gave no hint that he was the last Haruchai left in Covenant's service. Covenant stifled a groan. "'What the hell's going on out there?' In response, Kale's eyes shifted fractionally, but still his voice held no inflection. "'I know not. Until the previous night, when Bryn had left the quest to take up his role as Akharu Kenostan Ardenal, Kale had never been alone in his chosen duty. 
and the mental interconnection of his people had kept him aware of what took place around him. But now he was alone. Bryn's defeat of the former guardian of the One Tree had been a great victory for him personally, and for the Harochai as a people, but it left Kale isolated in a way that no one who had not experienced such mind-sharing could measure. His blunt, I know not, silenced Covenant like an admission of frailty. Kale, Covenant tried to say. He did not want to leave the Harochai in that loneliness. But Bryn had said, Kale will accept my place in your service until the word of the bloodguard Banor has been carried to its end. And no appeal or protest would sway Kale from the path Bryn had marked out for him. Covenant remembered Banor too poignantly to believe that the Harochai would ever judge themselves by any standards but their own. Yet his distress remained. Even lepers and murderers were not immune to hurt. He fought down the thickness in his throat and said, I want my old clothes. They're in her cabin. Kale nodded as if he saw nothing strange in the request. As he left, he closed the door quietly after him. Covenant lay back again and clenched his teeth. He did not want those clothes, did not want to return to the hungry and unassuaged life he had lived before he had found Lyndon's love. But how else could he leave his cabin? Those loathed and necessary garments represented the only honesty left to him, and the other apparel would be a lie. However, when Kale returned, he was not alone. Pitchwife entered the chamber ahead of him, and at once Covenant forgot the bundle Kale bore. The deformity which bent Pitchwife's spine, hunching his back and crippling his chest, made him unnaturally short for a giant. His head did not reach the level of the hammock. But the irrepressibility of his twisted face gave him stature. He was alight with excitement as he limped forward to greet Covenant. "'Have I not said that she is well chosen?' he began without preamble. "'Never doubt it, giant friend. Mayhap this is but one wonder among many, for surely our voyage has been rife with marvels. Yet I do not dream to see it surpassed. Stone and sea, giant friend, she has taught me to hope again.' Covenant stared in response, stung by an inchoate apprehension. What new role had Lyndon taken upon herself, when he still had not told her the truth? Pitchwife's eyes softened. But you do not comprehend. As how should you, who have not seen the sea loom with Nikkor under the stars, not heard the Chosen sing them to peace? Still Covenant did not speak. He had no words for the complex admixture of his pride and relief and bitter loss. The woman he loved had saved the giant ship, and he, who had once defeated the despiser in direct combat, he no longer signified. Watching Covenant's face, Pitchwife sighed to himself. In a more subdued manner, he went on, It was an act worthy of long telling, but I will briefen it. You have heard that the giants are able to summon Nikkor upon occasion. Such a summons we wrought on your behalf when last the venom sickness of the raver possessed you. Covenant had no memory of the situation. He had been near death and delirium at the time, but he had been told about it. Yet to the Nikkor we do not speak. They lie beyond our gift of tongues. The sounds which may summon them we have learned from our generations upon the sea— but those sounds we make blindly, uncertain of their meaning. And a giant ship which enters the sea of Nikkor in their wrath has scant need of summons. A small smile quirked his mouth, but he did not stop. It was Lyndon Avery the Chosen who found means to address them for our survival. Lacking the plain might of arm for her purpose, she called Galrath's storesmaster with her and went below, down to the bottommost hull of the Dromond. There, through the stone, she read the ire of the Nikkor, and gave it answer. With her hand she clapped a rhythm which Galrath echoed for her, pounding it with hammers upon the hull. Then for a moment the giant's enthusiasm resurged. "'And she was heeded,' he crowed. "'The Nikkor parted about us, burying their anger into the south. We have been left without scathe.' His hands gripped the edge of the hammock, rocked it as if to make Covenant hear him. There is yet hope in the world. While we endure, 
and the Chosen and the Giant Friend remain among us. There is hope. But Pitchwife's claim was too direct. Covenant flinched from it. He had wronged too many people, and had no hope left for himself. A part of him wanted to cry out in protest. Was that what he would have to do in the end? Give Lyndon his ring, the meaning of his life, when she had never seen the land without the sunbane, and did not know how to love it? Weakly he muttered, Tell that to Hanan's grave. He could use some hope. At that pitchwife's eyes darkened, but he did not look away. The master has spoken of your refusal. I know not the good or ill of these matters, but the word of my heart is that you have done what you must, and that is well. Do not think me ungrieved by Sea Dreamer's fall, or the master's hurt. Yet the hazard of your might is great, and who can say how the Nikor would answer such fire, though they have passed us by? None may judge the doom which lies upon you now. You have done well in your way. Pitchwife's frank empathy made Covenant's eyes burn. He knew acutely that he had not done well. Pain like Hanan's craves should not be refused, never be refused. But the fear and the despair were still there, blocking everything. He could not even meet Pitchwife's gaze. Ah, giant friend, Pitchwife breathed at last. You also are grieved beyond bearing. I know not how to solace you. Abruptly he stooped, and one hand lifted a leather flask into the hammock. If you find no ease in my tale of the Chosen, will you not, at the least, drink diamond draught and grant your flesh rest? Your own story remains to be told. Be not so harsh with yourself. His words raised memories of dead Atiaran in Andalain. The mother of the woman he had raped and driven mad had said with severe compassion, In punishing yourself you come to merit punishment. This is despite. But Covenant did not want to think about Atiaran. Find no ease. Belatedly he pictured Lyndon in the depths of the Drummond, holding the survival of the search in her hands. He could not hear the rhythm of her courage, but he saw her face. Framed by her wheaten hair, it was acute with concentration, knotted between the brows, marked on either side of the mouth by the consequences of severity, and beautiful to him in every bone and line. Humbled by what she had done to save the ship, he raised the flask to his lips and drank. When he awoke, the cabin was full of afternoon sunshine, and the pungent taste of a diamond draft lingered on his tongue. The giant ship was moving again. He remembered no dreams. The impression he bore with him out of slumber was one of blankness, a leper's numbness carried to its logical extreme. He wanted to roll over and never wake up again. But as he glanced blearily around the sun-sharp cabin, he saw Lyndon sitting in one of the chairs beside the table. She sat with her head bowed and her hands open in her lap, as if she had been waiting there for a long time. Her hair gleamed cleanly in the light, giving her the appearance of a woman who had emerged whole from an ordeal, refined, perhaps, but not reduced. With an inward moan he recollected what the old man on Haven Farm had said to her. There is also love in the world, and in Andalane, dead Elena, Covenant's daughter, had urged him, care for her beloved, so that in the end she may heal us all. The sight of her made his chest contract. He had lost her as well. He had nothing left. Then she seemed to feel his gaze on her. She looked up at him, automatically brushing the tresses back from her face, and he saw that she was not unhurt. Her eyes were hollow and flagrant with fatigue. Her cheeks were pallid, and the twinned lines running past her mouth from either side of her delicate nose looked like they had been left there by tears as well as time. A voiceless protest gathered in him. Had she been sitting here with him ever since the passing of the Nikor, when she needed so much rest? But a moment after he met her gaze she rose to her feet. A knot of anxiety or anger marked her brows. Probing him with her health sense, she stepped closer to the hammock. What she saw made her mouth severe. "'Is that it?' she demanded. "'You've decided to give up?' Mutely. 
Covenant flinched. Was his defeat so obvious? At once a look of regret changed her expression. She dropped her eyes, and her hands made an aimless half-gesture, as if they were full of remembered failure. "'I didn't mean that,' she said. "'That isn't what I came to say. I wasn't sure I should come at all. You've been so hurt. I wanted to give you more time.' Then she lifted her face to him again, and he saw her sense of purpose sharpen. She was here because she had her own ideas, about hope, as well as about him. But the first was going to come, and I thought I should do it for her. She gazed into him as if she sought a way to draw him down from his lonely bed. She wants to know where we're going. Where? Covenant blinked pain at her. She had not withdrawn her question. She had simply rephrased it. Where? A spasm of grief gripped his heart. His doom was summed up in that one grim word. Where could he go? He was beaten. All his power had been turned against him. There was nowhere left for him to go. Nothing left for him to do. For an instant he feared he would break down in front of her, bereft even of the bare dignity of solitude. She was saying, We've got to go somewhere. The sunbane is still there. Lord Fowl is still there. We've lost the one tree, but nothing else has changed. We can't just sail in circles for the rest of our lives. She might have been pleading with him, trying to make him see something that was already plain to her. But he did not heed her. Almost without transition, his hurt became resentment. She was being cruel, whether she realized it or not. He had already betrayed everything he loved with his mistakes and failures and lies. How much more responsibility did she wish him to assume? Bitterly he replied, I hear you saved us from the Nikkor. You don't need me. His tone made her wince. Don't say that, she responded intensely. Her eyes were wide with awareness of what was happening to him. She could read every outcry of his wrecked spirit. I need you. In response, he felt his despair plunging toward hysteria. It sounded like the glee of the despiser, laughing in triumph. Perhaps he had gone so far down this road now that he was the despiser, the perfect tool or avatar of Lord Fowl's will. But Lyndon's expostulation jerked him back from the brink. It made her suddenly vivid to him, too vivid to be treated this way. She was his love, and he had already hurt her too much. For a moment... The fall he had nearly taken left him reeling. Everything in the cabin seemed imprecise, overburdened with sunlight. He needed shadows and darkness in which to hide from all the things that surpassed him. But Lyndon still stood there as if she were the center around which his head whirled. Whether she spoke or remained silent, she was the one demand he could not refuse. Yet he was altogether unready to tell her the truth he had withheld. Her reaction would be the culmination of all his dismay. Instinctively he groped for some way to anchor himself, some point of simple guilt or passion to which he might cling. Squinting into the sunshine, he asked thickly, "'What do they do about Sea Dreamer?' At that Linden sagged in relief as though a crisis had been averted. Wanly, she answered, "'Hunnan's grave wanted to cremate him. As if that were possible.' Memories of suffering seemed to fray the words as she uttered them. But the first ordered the giants to bury him at sea. For a minute there I thought Hunnan's crave was going to attack her. But then something inside him broke. It wasn't physical, but I felt it snap. Her tone said that she had sensed that parting like a rupture in her own heart. He bowed to her as if he didn't know what else to do with all that hurt. Then he went back to the wheel deck, back to doing his job. Her shoulders lifted in a pained shrug. If you didn't look at his eyes, you wouldn't know he isn't as good as new. But he refused to help them give Sea Dreamer to the sea. As she spoke, his eyes blurred. He was unable to see her clearly in all that light. Sea Dreamer should have been burned should have been freed from his horror in a kamor of white fire. Yet the mere thought made Covenant's flesh itch darkly. He had become the thing he hated, because of a lie. 
he had known, or should have known, what was going to happen to him. But his selfish love had kept the truth from her. He could not look at her. Through his teeth he protested, Why did you have to do that? Do! Her health sense did not make her prescient. How could you possibly know what he was talking about? You threw yourself in the fire. The explanation came arduously, squeezed out by grief and self-recrimination. It was not her fault. No one had the right to blame her. I sent you away to try to save my life. I didn't know what else to do. For all I knew, it was already too late for anything else. The worm was already awake. I had already destroyed— A clench of anguish closed this throat. For a moment, he could not say, I didn't know how else to save you. Then he swallowed convulsively and went on. So I sent you away, and you threw yourself in the fire. I was linked to you. The magic tied us together. For the first time my senses were open, and all I saw was you throwing yourself in the fire. Why did you force me to bring you back? In response she flared as if he had struck a ragged nerve. Because I couldn't help you the way you were. Suddenly she was shouting at him. Your body was there, but you weren't. Without you it was just so much dying meat. Even if I'd had you in a hospital, even if I could have given you transfusions and surgery right then, I could not have saved you. I needed you to come back with me. How else was I supposed to get your attention? Her pain made him look at her again, and the sight went through him like a crack through stone, following its flaws to the heart. She stood below him, with her face hot and vivid in the light, and her fists clenched, as intense and uncompromising as any woman he had ever dreamed. The fault was not hers, though surely she blamed herself. Therefore he could not shirk telling her the truth. At one time he had believed that he was sparing her by not speaking, that he was withholding information so that she would not be overwhelmed. Now he knew better. He had kept the truth to himself for the simple reason that he did not want it to be true, and by so doing he had falsified the relationship profoundly. I should have told you, he murmured in shame. I tried to tell you everything else, but it hurt too much. She glared at him, as if she felt the presence of something horrible between them. But he did not look away. It's always been this way. Nothing here interrupts the physical continuity of the world we came from. What happens here is self-contained. It's always the same. I go into the land, hurt, possibly dying. A leper. And I'm healed. Twice my leprosy disappeared. I could feel again, as if my nerves— His heart twisted at the memory, and at the poignant distress of Lyndon's stare. But before I left the land something always happened to duplicate the shape I was in earlier. Sometimes my body was moved. I stopped bleeding, or got worse. But my physical condition was always exactly what it would have been if I'd never been to the land. And I'm still a leper. Leprosy doesn't heal. So this time that knife hit me, and when we got to the land I healed it with wild magic, the same way I healed those cuts the clave gave me. They had slashed his wrists to gain blood for their sooth-tell, that already the scars had faded were nearly invisible. But it doesn't make any difference. What happens here doesn't change what's going on there. All it does is change the way we feel about it. After that, his shame was too great to hold her gaze. That's why I didn't tell you about it. At first, right at the beginning, I thought you had enough to worry about. You would learn the truth soon enough. But after a while, I changed. Then I didn't want you to know. I didn't think I had the right to ask you to love a dead man. As he spoke, her shock boiled into anger. The moment he stopped, she demanded— do you mean to say that you've been planning to die all along? Her voice was abruptly livid against the quiet background of the ship and the sea. That you haven't even been trying to find a way to survive? No. In despair he sought to defend himself. Why do you think I wanted a new staff of law? Needed it so badly. It was my only hope. To fight for the land without risking wild magic. And to send you back. You're a doctor, aren't you? 
I wanted you to save me. But the anguish of her stare did not waver, and he could not meet it, could not pretend that what he had done was justified. I've been trying, he pleaded, but no appeal was enough. I didn't tell you because I wanted to love you for a while. That's all. He heard her moving, and the fear that she would walk out of the cabin, turn her back on him forever, wrenched at him. But she was not leaving. She retreated to the chair, seated herself there as if something in her had broken. Her hands covered her face as she hunched forward and her shoulders jerked, yet she made no sound. At her mother's deathbed she had learned to keep her weeping to herself. When she spoke, her voice shook. Why do I end up killing everybody I care about? Her grief hurt him like the raw acid of his guilt. This, too, was on his head. He wanted to descend from the hammock, go to her, take her in his arms. But he had forfeited that privilege. There was nothing he could do except fight back his own rue and protest, It's not your fault. You tried. I should have told you. You would have saved me if you could. The vehemence of her reaction took him by surprise. Stop that, she spat. I've got eyes, a mind of my own. I'm not some innocent kid you can protect. The sun flashed on her face. You've been lying down here ever since we came back aboard as if you were to blame for everything. But you're not. Fowl set this up. He manipulated you into it. What are you trying to do now? Prove him right? I can't help it, he retorted, stung by the salt she rubbed into his futility. Of course he's right. What do you think he is? He's me. He's just an externalization of the part of me that despises. The part that— No! Her contradiction cut him off, though she did not shout. She had become too clenched and furious for shouting too extreme to be denied. He's not you. He's not the one who's going to die. She might have said, I'm the one who kills. The words were plain in every line of her visage, but her passion carried her past that recognition as if she could not bear it in any other way. Everybody makes mistakes, but all you've done is try to fight for what you love. You have an answer. I don't. The heat of her assertion contained no self-pity. I haven't had one since this thing started. I don't know the land the way you do. I haven't got any power. All I've been able to do is follow you around. Her hands rose into fists. If you're going to die, do something to make it count. Then, like a quick touch of ice, he realized that she had not come here to question him simply because the first desired a destination. She wants to know where we're going. Her father had killed himself and blamed her for it and she had killed her mother with her own hands, and now his covenant's death seemed as certain as the desecration of the earth. But those things served only to give her the purpose he had lost. She was wearing her old severity now, the same rigid self-punishment and determination with which she had defied him from the moment of their first meeting, yet the fierce fire in her eyes was new, and he recognized it. It was the unanswered anger of her grief and it swept all costs aside in its desire for battle. You've decided to give up. Her demand made his failure as acute as agony. He could have shouted, I don't have any choice. He beat me. There's nothing I can do. But he knew better. He was a leper and knew better. Leprosy itself was defeat, complete and incurable. Yet even lepers had reasons to go on living. Ati Aran had told him that it was the task of the living to give meaning to the sacrifices of the dead. But now he saw that the truth went further, to give meaning to his own death, and to the prices the people he loved had already paid. In the name of Lyndon's harsh insistence, he sat up in the hammock and asked hoarsely, What do you want? His response seemed to steady her. The bitter pressure of her loss eased somewhat. In a hard voice, she said, I want you to go back to the land, to Revelstone, and stop the clave, put out the bane fire. He drew a hissing breath at the sheer audacity of what she required, but she went on without heeding him. If you do that, the sun bane will slow down. Maybe it'll even recede. That'll give us time to look for a better answer. Then she surprised him again by faltering. She did not face him as she concluded, Maybe I don't care about the land the way you do. 
I was too scared to go into Andalane. I've never seen what it used to be like. But I know sickness when I see it. Even if I weren't a doctor, I'd have the sunbane carved on me in places where I'll never be able to forget it. I want to do something about that. I don't have anything else. The only way I can fight is through you. As she spoke, echoes of power capered in Covenant's veins. He heard what she was saying. But his fear took him back to the beginning. Stop the clave? Put out the bane fire? In blunt alarm, he replied, That'll be a lot of fun. What in hell makes you believe I can even think about things like that without endangering the arch? She met him with a sour smile, humorless and certain. Because you know how to restrain yourself now. I felt it when you called back all that wild magic and used it to send me away. You're more dangerous now than you've ever been. To Lord Fowl. For a moment he held the look she gave him, but then his eyes fell. It was still too much. He was not ready. The ruin of his life was hardly a day old. How was it possible to talk about fighting when the despiser had already defeated him? He had only one power, and it had been transformed by venom and falsehood into a graver threat than any sunbane. What she wanted was madness. He did not have it in him. Yet he had to make some reply. She had borne too many burdens for him, and he loved her. She had the right to place demands upon him. So he groped in bitter shame for a way out, for something he might say or do which would at least postpone the necessity of decision. Still without meeting Lyndon's stare, he muttered sourly, There are too many things I don't understand. I need to talk to Findale. He thought that would deflect her. From the moment when the appointed of the Elohim had first attached himself to the search, he had never come or gone at any behest but that of his own secret wisdom or cunning. Yet if anyone possessed the knowledge to win free of this defeat, surely his people did. And surely also he would not come here simply because the unbeliever asked for him. Covenant would gain at least that much respite while Lyndon tried to persuade Findale. But she did not hesitate, and did not leave the cabin. Turning to face the prow, she rasped the name of the appointed stridently, as if she expected to be obeyed. Almost at once the sunlight seemed to condense against the wall, and Findale came flowing out of the stone into human form as though he had been waiting there for her call. His appearance was unchanged. Behind his creamy mantle and unkempt silver hair, within his bruised yellow eyes, he looked like an incarnation of all the world's misery, an image of every hurt and stress that did not touch his tranquil and self-absorbed people. Where they were deliberately graceful and comely, he was haggard and pain-carved. He appeared to be their antithesis and contradiction, a role which appalled him. Yet something must have changed for him. Before the crisis of the one tree, he would not have answered any summons. But his manner remained as distant and disapproving as ever. Though he nodded an acknowledgment to Lyndon, his voice held a note of reproof. I hear you. Vehemence is not needful. His tone made no impression on Lyndon. Bracing her fists on her hips, she addressed him as if he had not spoken. "'This has gone on long enough,' she said stiffly. "'Now we need answers.' Findale did not glance at Covenant. In Elamestandine, the Elohim had treated Covenant as if he were of no personal importance, and now the appointed seemed to take that stance again. He asked Lyndon, "'Is it the ring-wielder's intent to surrender his ring?' At once Covenant snapped, No! Refusals ran in him like echoes of old delirium. Never give him the ring. Never. It was all that remained to him. Then, Findale sighed, I must answer as I may, hoping to persuade him from his folly. Lyndon glanced up at Covenant, looking for his questions. But he was too close to his internal precipice. He could not think clearly. Too many people wanted him to surrender his ring. It was the only thing which still wedded him to life, made his choices matter. He did not respond to Lyndon's gaze. Her eyes narrowed as she studied him, gauged his condition. Then, as if she were wrenching herself back from a desire to comfort him, she turned away, faced Findale again. Why? She spoke with difficulty, wrestling words passed a knot in her chest. I hardly know where to begin. There's so much— why did you people do it? 
Abruptly her voice became stronger, full of indignation she had never been able to forget. What in God's name did you think you were doing? All he wanted was the location of the one tree. You could have given him a straight answer, but instead you locked him in that silence of yours. They'd imposed a stasis upon his mind. If Lyndon had not risked herself to rescue him, he would have remained an empty husk until he died, blank of thought or desire. And the price she had paid for that rescue! Her outrage pulled him into focus with her, as she concluded, You're responsible for this. How can you stand to live with yourself? Findale's expression turned into a glower. As soon as she stopped, he replied, Does it appear to you that I am made glad by the outcome of my appointment? Is not my life at hazard as much as yours? Yes, as much and more, for you will depart when your time is ended. But I must remain and bear the cost. The fault is not mine. Lyndon started to protest, but the gathering sadness in his tone halted her. No, do not rail against me. I am the appointed, and the burden of what you do falls to me. I do not deny that the path we chose was harsh to the ring-wielder. But are you truly unable to see in this matter? You are the sun-sage. He is not. Yet the wild magic which is the crux of the arch of time is his to wield, not yours. There lies the hand of evil upon the earth, and also upon the Elohim, for the earth's word. You have said that we serve the evil which you name Lord Fowl the Despiser. That is untrue. If you mislike my word, consider other knowledge. Would this despiser have sent his servant the raver against you in the storm, when already a servant such as myself stood among you? No, you cannot credit it. Yet I must say to you openly that there is a shadow on the hearts of the Elohim. It is seen in this that we were able to conceive no path of salvation which would spare you. You have not forgotten that there were those among us who did not wish to spare you. Surely it is plain that for us the easiest path lay in the simple wresting from him of the ring. With wild magic could we bid any despite defiance. Then for being such as we are, it would be no great task to achieve the perfection of the earth. Yet that we did not do. Some among us feared the arrogance of such power, when a shadow plainly lay upon our hearts and some saw that the entire price of such an act would fall upon you alone. You would be lost to yourselves, deprived of meaning and value. Perhaps the meaning and value of the earth would be diminished as well. Therefore we chose a harder path, to share with you the burden of redemption and the risk of doom. The ring-wielder we silenced not to harm him, but to spare the earth the ill of power without sight. As that silence preserved him from the malice of Kasrain of the Gyre, so also would it have preserved him from the despiser's intent at the one tree. Thus the choice would have fallen to you in the end. His ring you might have taken unto yourself, thereby healing the breach between sight and power. Or perhaps you might have ceded the ring to me, empowering the Elohim to save the earth after their fashion. Then would we have had no need to fear ourselves, for power given is altogether different than one wrested away. But whatever your choice, there would have been hope. To accomplish such hope, the price of the ring-wielder's silence, and of my appointment, appeared to be neither too great nor too ill. That you took from us. In the dungeon of the sandhold you chose the wrong which you name possession above the responsibility of sight, and the hope we strove to nurture was lost. Now I say to you that he must be persuaded to surrender his ring. If he does not, it is certain that he will destroy the earth. For a moment Covenant reeled down the path of Findale's explanation. His balance was gone. To hear his own dread, expressed so starkly, like a verdict, but when he turned toward Lyndon he saw that she had been hit harder than he. Her face had gone pale, her hands made small fugitive movements at her sides. Her mouth tried to form a denial, but she had no strength for it. Confronted by the logic of her actions as Findale saw it, she was horrified. Once again he placed her at the center, at the cusp of responsibility and blame. And Covenant's earlier revelation was still too recent. 
she had not had time to absorb it. She had claimed fault for herself, but had not understood the extent to which she might be accused. Ire for her stabilized him. Findale had no right to drop the whole weight of the earth on her in this way. "'It's not that simple,' he began. He did not know the true name of his objection, but Lyndon faced him in mute appeal, and he did not let himself falter. "'If Fowl planned this all along, why did he go to the trouble?' That was not what he needed to ask, yet he pursued it, hoping it would lead him to the right place. "'Why didn't he just wake up the worm himself?' Findale's gaze held Lyndon. When her wide eyes went back to his, he replied, This despiser is not mad. Should he rouse the worm himself, without the wild magic in his hand, would he not also be consumed in the destruction of the world? Covenant shrugged the argument aside, went on searching for the question he needed, the flaw in Findale's rationalizations. Then why didn't you tell us sooner? Naturally you couldn't condescend to explain anything before she freed me. With all the sarcasm he could muster, he tried to force the appointed to look at him, release Lyndon. After what you people did, you knew she'd never give you my ring if she understood how much you want it. But later, before we got to the one tree, why didn't you tell us what kind of danger we were in? The Elohim sighed, but still he did not relinquish Lyndon. Perhaps in that I erred, he said softly. Yet I could not turn aside from hope. It was my hope that some access of wisdom or courage would inspire the ring-wielder to step back from the precipice of his intent. Covenant continued groping. But now he saw that Lyndon had begun to rally. She shook her head, struggled internally for some way to refute or withstand Findale's accusations. Her mouth tightened. She looked like she was chewing curses. The sight lit a spark of encouragement in him made him lean forward to aim his next challenge at the Elohim. "'That doesn't justify you,' he grated. "'You talk about silencing me as if that was the only decent alternative you had. But you know goddamn well it wasn't. For one thing, you could have done something about the venom that makes me so bloody dangerous.' Then Findale did look at Covenant. His yellow gaze snapped upward with a fierceness which jolted Covenant. We dared not. His quiet passion left trails of fire across Covenant's brain. The doom of this age lies also upon me, but I dare not. Are we not the Elohim, the word of the earth? Do we not read the truth in the very roots of the raw edge rim, in the shape of the mountain sides, and in the snows which gild the winter peaks? You mock me at your peril. By means of his venom, this despiser attempts the destruction of the Arch of Time, and that is no little thing, but it pales beside the fate which would befall the earth and all life upon the earth, were there no venom within you. You conceive yourself to be a figure of power, but in the scale of worlds you are not. Had this despiser's lust for the ill-earth stone not betrayed him, enhancing you beyond your mortal stature, you would not have stood against him so much as once. And he is wiser now, with the wisdom of old frustration, which some name madness. Lacking the venom, you would be too small to threaten him. If he did not seek you out for his own pleasure, you would wander the world without purpose, powerless against him. And the sunbane would grow, it would grow, devouring every land and sea in turn, until even Elamesnadine itself had fallen and still it would grow, and there would be no halt to it. Seeing no blame for yourself, you would not surrender your ring, therefore he would remain trapped within the arch. But no other stricture would limit his victory. Even we, the Elohim, would in time be reduced to mere playthings for his mirth. While time endured, the desecration of the world would not end at all. Therefore, the appointed articulated with careful intensity, we blessed the frustration or madness which inspired the gambit of this venom. Discontented in the prison of the earth, the despiser has risked his hope of freedom in the venom which gives you such might. It is our hope also, for now the blame is plain. Since you are blind in other ways, 
we must pray that guilt will drive you to the surrender which may save us. The words went through Covenant like a shot. His arguments were punctured, made irrelevant. Findale admitted no alternative to submission except the ritual of desecration, the outright destruction of the earth to spare it from Lord Fowle's power. This was Kevin Landwaster's plight on a scale which staggered Covenant, appalled him to the marrow of his bones. If he did not give up his ring, how could he bear to do anything but ruin the world himself in order to foil the eternal sunbane of the despiser? Yet he could not surrender his ring. The simple thought was immediately and intimately terrible to him. That metal circle meant too much. It contained every hard affirmation of life and love that he had ever wrested from the special cruelty of his loneliness, his leper's fate. The alternative was better. Yes, to destroy, or to risk destroying in any kind of search for a different outcome. His dilemma silenced him. In his previous confrontation with Lord Fowl, he had found and used the quiet center of his vertigo, the still point of strength between the contradictions of his plight. But now there seemed to be no center, no place on which he could stand to affirm both the earth and himself. And the necessity of choice was dreadful. But Lyndon had taken hold of herself again. The conceptions which hurt her most were not the ones which pierced Covenant, and he had given her a chance to recover. The look she cast at him was brittle with stress, but it was alert once more, capable of reading his dismay. For an instant, empathy focused her gaze. Then she swung back toward the appointed, and her voice bristled dangerously. That's just speculation. You're afraid you might lose your precious freedom, so you're trying to make him responsible for it. You still haven't told us the truth. Findale faced her and Covenant saw her flinch as if the Elohim's eyes had burned her, but she did not stop. "'If you want us to believe you, tell us about Vane.' At that, Findale recoiled. Immediately she went after him. First you imprisoned him, as if he was some kind of crime against you, and you tried to trick us about it, so we wouldn't know what you were doing. When he escaped, you tried to kill him. Then, when he and Sea Dreamer found you aboard the ship, you spoke to him. Her expression was a glower of memory. You said, whatever else you may do, that I will not suffer. The appointed started to reply, but she overrode him. Later you said, only he whom you name Vane has it within him to expel me. I would give my soul that he should do so. And since then you've hardly been out of his sight, except when you decide to run away instead of helping us. She was unmistakably a woman who had learned something about courage. You've been more interested in him than us from the beginning. Why don't you try explaining that for a change? She brandished her anger at the Elohim, and for a moment Covenant thought Findale would answer. But then his grief-ensnared visage tightened. In spite of its misery, his expression resembled the hauteur of chant and infelice, as he said grimly, Of the demon dim spawn I will not speak. That's right! She shot back at him at once. Of course you won't. If you did, you might give us a reason to do some hoping of our own. Then we might not roll over and play dead the way you want. She matched his glare, and in spite of all his power and knowledge, she made him appear diminished and judged. Sourly she muttered, Oh, go on, get out of here. You make my stomach hurt. With a stiff shrug, Findale turned away, but before he could depart, Covenant interposed, Just a minute. He felt half mad with fear and impossible decisions, but a fragment of lucidity had come to him, and he thought he saw another way in which he had been betrayed. Lena had told him that he was Beric Halfhand reborn, and the lords he had known had believed that. What had gone wrong? We couldn't get a branch of the one tree. There was no way. But it's been done before. How did Beric do it? Findale paused at the wall answered over his shoulder. The worm was not made restive by his approach, for he did not win his way with combat. In that age the one tree had no guardian. It was he himself who gave the tree its ward, setting the guardian in place so that the vital wood of the world's life would not again be touched or broken. Beric? Covenant was too astonished to watch the Elohim melt out of the cabin. 
Beric had set the guardian? Why? The Lord Fatherer had been described as both seer and prophet. Had he been short-sighted enough to believe that no one else would ever need to touch the one tree? Or had he had some reason to ensure that there would never be a second staff of law? Dizzy with implications, Covenant was momentarily unaware of the way Lyndon regarded him, but gradually he felt her eyes on him. Her face was sharp with the demand she had brought with her into his cabin, the demand of her need. When he met her gaze, she said distinctly, Your friends in Andalane didn't think you were doomed. They gave you vain for a reason. What else did they do? They talked to me, he replied, as if she had invoked the words out of him. Moram said, When you have understood the land's need, you must depart the land, for the thing you seek is not within it. The one word of truth cannot be found otherwise. But I give you this caution. Do not be deceived by the land's need. The thing you seek is not what it appears to be. In the end you must return to the land. He had also said, When you have come to the crux and have no other recourse, remember the paradox of white gold. There is hope in contradiction. But that covenant did not comprehend. Lyndon nodded severely. So what's it going to be? Are you just going to lie here until your heart breaks? Or are you going to fight? Distraught by fear and despair, he could not find his way. Perhaps an answer was possible, but he did not have it. Yet what she wanted of him was certain, and because he loved her he gave it to her as well as he was able. I don't know, but anything is better than this. Tell the first we'll give it a try. She nodded again. For a moment her mouth moved as if she wished to thank him in some way, but then the pressure of her own bare grasp on resolution impelled her toward the door. What about you? he asked after her. He had sent her away and did not know how to recall her. He had no right. What are you going to do? At the door she looked back at him, and her eyes were openly full of tears. I'm going to wait. Her voice sounded as forlorn as the cry of a kestrel, and as determined as an act of valor. My turn's coming. As she left, her words seemed to remain in the sunlit cabin like a verdict, or a prophecy. After she was gone, Covenant got out of the hammock and dressed himself completely in his old clothes. 3. The Path to Pain When he went up on deck, the sun was setting beyond the western sea, and its light turned the water crimson, the color of disaster. Hanan's grave had raised every span of canvas the spars could hold, and every sail was belly full of wind as Starfair's gem pounded forward a few points west of north. It should have been a brave sight, but the specific red of that sunset covered the canvas with fatality, gilded the lines until they looked like they were slick with blood, and the wind carried a precursive chill hinting at the bitter cold of winter. Yet Hanan's Crave strode the wheel deck as if he could no longer be daunted by anything the sea brought to him. The air riffled his beard, and his eyes reflected occasional glints of fire from the west. But his commands were as precise as his master of the giant ship, and the rawness of his voice might have been caused by the strain of shouting over the wind rather than by the stress of the past two days. He was not foam-follower, after all. He had not been granted the Ka Mora his spirit craved. But he was a giant still, the master of Starfare's gem, and he had risen to his responsibilities. With Kale beside him, Covenant went up to the wheel-deck. He wanted to find some way to apologize for having proven himself inadequate to the master's need. But when he approached Hanan's grave and the other two giants with him, seven-hand anchor-master and a steersman holding ship's heart thew, the caution in their eyes stopped Covenant. At first he thought that they had become wary of him, that the danger he represented made them fearful in his presence. But then Seven Hand said simply, Giant friend, and it was plain even to Covenant's superficial hearing that the anchor master's tone was one of shared sorrow rather than misgiving. Instead of apologizing, Covenant bowed his head in tacit recognition of his own unworth. He wanted to stand there in silence until he had shored up enough self-respect to take another step back into the life of the giant ship. But after a moment, Kale spoke. In spite of his characteristic Harochai dispassion, 
His manner suggested that what he meant to say made him uncomfortable. Involuntarily, Covenant reflected that none of the Harochai who had left the land with him had come this far unscathed. Covenant did not know how the uncompromising extravagance of the Harochai endured the role Bryn had assigned to Kale. What promise lay hidden in Bryn's statement that Kale would eventually be permitted to follow his heart? But Kale did not speak of that. He did not address Covenant. Without preamble, he said, Grimmond Hanan's crave. In the name of my people, I desire your pardon. When Bryn essayed himself against Akharo, Kenost, and Ardenol, he who is the sovereign legend and dream of all the Harochai among the mountains, it was not his intent to bring about the death of Cable Sea Dreamer, your brother. The master winced. His cavernous eyes shot splinters of red at Kale. But almost at once he regained his deliberate poise. He glanced around the giant ship as if to assure himself that all was still well with it. Then he turned over his command to Seven Hand, drew Kale and Covenant with him to the port rail. The setting sun gave his visage a tinge of sacrificial glory. Watching him, Covenant thought obscurely that the sun always set in the west, that a man who faced west would never see anything except decline, things going down, the last beauty before light and life went out. After a moment, Hanan's crave lifted his voice over the wet splashing of the shipside. The earth sight is not a thing which any giant selects for himself. No choice is given, but we do not therefore seek to gainsay or eschew it. We believe, or have believed, he said with a touch of bitterness, that there is life as well as death in such mysteries. How, then, should there be any blame in what has happened? Hunnansgrave spoke more to himself than to Covenant or Kale. The earth sight came upon Cable Sea Dreamer, my brother, and the hurt of his vision was plain to all. But the content of that hurt he could not tell. Mayhap his muteness was made necessary by the vision itself. Mayhap for him no denial of death was possible, which would not also have been a denial of life. I know nothing of that. I know only that he could not speak his plight, and so he could not be saved. There is no blame for us in this. He spoke as though he believed what he was saying, but the loss knotted around his eyes, contradicted him. His death places no burden upon us but the burden of hope. The sunset was fading from the west and from his face, translating his mien from crimson to the pallor of ashes. We must hope that in the end we will find means to vindicate his passing. To vindicate, he repeated faintly, and to comprehend. He did not look at his auditors. The dying of the light echoed out of his eyes. I am grieved that I can conceive no hope. He had earned the right to be left alone, but Covenant needed an answer. He and Foam Follower had talked about hope. Striving to keep his voice gentle in spite of his own stiff hurt, he asked, Then why do you go on? For a long moment Hunnanscrave remained still against the mounting dark, as if he had not heard, could not be reached. But at last he said simply, I am a giant, the master of Starfare's gem, and sworn to the service of the first of the search. That is preferable. Preferable, Covenant thought with a mute pang. Mora might have said something like that. But Findale obviously did not believe it. Yet Kale nodded as if Hanan's Crave's words were ones which even the extravagant Harochai could accept. After all, Kale's people did not put much faith in hope. They staked themselves on success or failure, and accepted the outcome. Covenant turned from the darkling sea, left the rail. He had no place among such people. He did not know what was preferable, and could not see enough success anywhere to make failure endurable. The decision he had made in Lyndon's name was just another kind of lie. Well, she had earned that pretense of conviction from him, but at some point any leper needed something more than discipline or even stubbornness to keep him alive. And he had too sorely falsified his relationship with her. He did not know what to do. Around Starfair's gem, the giants had begun to light lanterns against the night. They illuminated the great wheel, the stairs down from the wheel deck, the doorways to the under decks and the galley. They hung from the fore and after masts like instances of bravado, both emphasizing and disregarding the gap where the midmast should have been. They were nothing more than small oil lamps under the vast heavens, 
and yet they made the giant ship beautiful on the face of the deep. After a moment, Covenant found that he could bear to go looking for Lyndon. But when he started forward from the wheel deck, his attention was caught by Vane. The demon dim swan stood beyond the direct reach of the lanterns, on the precise spot where his feet had first touched stone, after he had come aboard from the Isle of the One Tree. But his black silhouette was distinct against the fading horizon. As always, he remained blank to scrutiny, as though he knew that nothing could touch him. Yet he had been touched. One iron heel of the old staff of law still clamped him where his wrist had been. But that hand dangled useless from the wooden limb which grew like a branch from his elbow. Covenant had no idea why Fum Follower had given him this product of the dark and historically malefic Irviles. But now he was sure that Lyndon had been right, that no explanation which did not include the secret of the demon dim spawn was complete enough to be trusted. When he moved on past Vane, he knew more clearly why he wanted to find her. He came upon her near the foremast, some distance down the deck from the prow, where Findale stood confronting the future like a figurehead. With her were the first, Pitchwife, and another giant. As Covenant neared them, he recognized Mistweave, whose life Lyndon had saved at the risk of his own during his most recent venom relapse. The three giants greeted him with the same gentle caution Hunnan's crave and Seven Hand had evinced the wariness of people who believed they were in the presence of a pain which transcended their own. But Lyndon seemed almost unconscious of his appearance. In the wan lantern light her face looked pallid, nearly haggard, and Covenant thought suddenly that she had not rested at all since before the quest had arrived at the Isle of the One Tree. The energy which had sustained her earlier had eroded away. Her manner was febrile with exhaustion. For a moment he was so conscious of her nearness to collapse that he failed to notice the fact that she too was wearing her old clothes, the checked flannel shirt, tough jeans, and sturdy shoes in which she had first entered the land. Though her choice was no different than his, the sight of it gave him an unexpected pang. Once again he had been betrayed by his preterite instinct for hope. Unconsciously he had dreamed that all the shocks and revelations of the past days would not alter her, not impel her to resume their former distance from each other. Fool, he snarled at himself. He could not escape her percipience. Down in his cabin she had read what he was going to do before he had known it himself. The first greeted him in a tone made brusque by the sternness of her own emotions, but her words showed that she also was sensitive to his plight. Thomas Covenant, I believe that you have chosen well. If anything, the losses of the past days and the darkness of the evening seemed to augment her iron beauty. She was a sword main, trained to give battle to the peril of the world. As she spoke, one hand gripped her sword's hilt as if the blade were a vital part of what she was saying. I have named you Giant Friend, and I am proud that I did so. Pitchwife, my husband, is wont to say that it is the meaning of our lives to hope. But I know not how to measure such things. I know only that battle is better than surrender. It is not for me to judge your paths in this matter. Yet am I gladdened that you have chosen a path of combat. In the way of a warrior, she was trying to comfort him. Her attempt touched him and frightened him as well, for it suggested that once again he had committed himself to more than he could gauge. But he was given no chance to reply, for once Pitchwife seemed impatient with what his wife was saying. As soon as she finished, he interposed, "'I, and Lyndon Avery also, is well chosen, as I have said. But in this she does not choose well. Giant friend, she will not rest.' His exasperation was plain in his voice. Lyndon grimaced. Covenant started to say, Lyndon, you need... But when she looked at him, he stopped. Her gaze gathered up the darkness and held it against him. I don't have anywhere to go. The stark bereavement of Lyndon's answer went through him like a cry. It meant too much. That her former world had been ruined for her by what she had learned. That, like him, she could not bear to return to her cabin the cabin they had shared. Somewhere in the distance, Pitchwife was saying, To her have been offered the chambers of the Harochai, but she replies that she fears to dream in such places. 
and Starfare's gem holds no other private quarters. Covenant understood that also without heeding it. Bryn had blamed her for Hergrim's death, and she had tried to kill Seer. Leave her alone, he said dully, as deaf to himself as to Pitchwipe. She'll rest when she's ready. That was not what he wanted to say. He wanted to say, forgive me. I don't know how to forgive myself, but the words were locked in his chest. They were impossible. Because he had nothing else to offer her, he swallowed thickly and said, You're right. My friends didn't expect me to be doomed. Foam follower gave me vain for a reason. Even that affirmation was difficult for him, but he forced it out. What happened to his arm? She went on, staring darkness at him, as if he were the linchpin of her exhaustion. She sounded as misled as a sleepwalker as she responded, Mr. Weave won't go away. He says he wants to take Kale's place. Covenant peered at her, momentarily unable to comprehend. But then he remembered his own dismay when Bryn had insisted on serving him, and his heart twisted. Linden, he demanded, forlorn and harsh in his inability to help her. Tell me about Vane's arm. If he had dared, he would have taken hold of her. If he had had the right. She shook her head and lantern light glanced like supplication out of her dry eyes. I can't. She might have protested like a child. It hurts. His arm's empty. When I close my eyes, it isn't even there. If you took all the life out of the one tree, took it away so completely that the tree never had any, never had any meaning at all, it would look like that. If he was actually alive, if he wasn't just a thing the Irviles made— He'd be in terrible pain. Slowly she turned away, as though she could no longer support his presence. When she moved off down the deck with Mistweave, walking, deferential and stubborn behind her, he understood that she also did not know how to forgive. He thought then that surely his loss and need had become too much for him, that surely he was about to break down. But the first and pitchwife were watching him with their concern poignant in their faces. They were his friends, and they needed him. Somehow he held himself together. Later, Mistweave sent word that Lyndon had found a place to sleep at last, huddled in a corner of the galley near the warmth of one of the great stoves. With that covenant had to be content. Moving stiffly, he went back to his hammock and took the risk of nightmares. Dreams seemed to be the lesser danger. But the next morning the wind was stronger. It might have been a true sailor's wind, enough to shake the Dromond out of its normal routine and make it stretch, not enough to pose any threat to the sea craft of the crew. It kicked the crests of the waves into spume and spray, sent water crashing off the giant ship's granite prow, made the lines hum and the sails strain. The sides of the vessel moved so swiftly that their moray markings looked like flames crackling from the sea. In the rigging, some of the giants laughed as they fisted the canvas from position to position, seeking the Dramon's best stance for speed. If its midmast had not been lost, Starfare's gem would have flown like exuberance before the blow. However, the day was dull with clouds and felt unnaturally cold. A south wind should have been warmer than this. It came straight from the place where the isle had gone down, and it was as chill as the cavern of the one tree. Without the sun to light it, the sea had a gray and viscid hue. Though he wore a robe over his clothes, Covenant hunched his shoulders and could not stop shivering. Seeking reassurance, he went up to the wheel-deck, where Heft Gailrath commanded the Drummond. But she greeted him with only a blunt nod. Her normally stolid demeanor held a kind of alert watchfulness that he had not seen in her before. For the first time since they had met, she seemed accessible to misgiving— Rather than trouble her with his trepidations, he returned to the afterdeck and moved forward, looking for someone who could be more easily questioned. It's not that cold, he told himself. It's just wind. But still the chill cut at him. No matter how he hugged the robe about him, the wind found its way to his skin. Instinctively he went to the galley, looking for warmth and linden. He found her there, seated at one wall, near the cheery bustle of the Dramon's two cooks, a husband and wife, aptly named Sea Sauce and Hearth Coal. They had spent so much of their lives working over the great stoves that their faces had become perpetually ruddy. They looked like images of each other as they blustered about their tasks, 
moving with a disingenuous air of confusion which concealed the ease of their teamwork. When they went out on deck, heat overflowed from them, and in their constricted demean they radiated like ovens. Yet Covenant's chill persisted. Lyndon was awake, but still glazed with sleep. She had paid only a part of the debt of her weariness. Though she acknowledged Covenant, behind her eyes everything was masked in somnolence. He thought at once that he should not bother her with questions until she had rested more, but he was too cold for good intentions. Hunkering down beside her, he asked, "'What do you think of this wind?' She yawned. "'I think,' she said distantly, "'that Fowl's in a hurry to get us back.' However, after another day's rest, Lyndon was able to look at the weather more precipiently. By then, Covenant had worn himself petulant with aimless anxiety. He felt repeatedly that he had lost the center of his life, that he could no longer hold himself from flying outward in all directions when the vertigo of his fear arose. Nothing had happened to suggest that the Dramond was in danger, yet his inchoate conviction of peril remained. Snappishly, he asked Lyndon his question a second time. But long sleep had brought her back to herself, and the gaze she turned toward him was capable of knowledge. She seemed to see without effort that his irritation was not directed at her. She placed a brief touch on his forearm like a promise that she would not forsake him. Then she went out to look at the wind. After a moment's assessment, she declared that this blow was not unnatural or ill, not something which the despiser had whipped up for his own ends. Instead, it was a reaction to the fundamental convulsion which had pulled down the Isle of the One Tree. By that violence, the balances of the weather had been disturbed, outraged. It was conceivable that Lord Fowle had known this would happen, but she felt no evidence of his influence on the wind. When Covenant relayed her verdict to Hannan's grave, the master shrugged, his thoughts hidden behind the buttress of his brows. No matter, he muttered, as if he were not listening to himself. Should it worsen, Starfair's gem must run before it. Part-masted as we are, I will not hazard resistance to the wind's path. There is no need. At present we are born but a scant span from our true way. That should have satisfied Covenant. His experience of the sea was trivial compared to Hunnan's craves, yet the alarm in his guts refused to be eased. Like Galewrath, the master conveyed an impression of concealed worry. During the next two days the wind became more serious. Blowing with incessant vehemence a few points west of north, it cut into the sea like the share of a plow, whined across the decks of the Dramond like the ache of its own chill. In spite of its speed, Starfare's gem no longer appeared to be moving swiftly. The wind bore the water itself northward, and what little bow-way of the prow raised was torn away at once. Clouds hugged the world from horizon to horizon. The sails looked gray and brittle as they heaved the heavy stone along. And that night the cold began in earnest. When Covenant scrambled shivering out of his hammock the next morning, he found a scum of ice in the wash-basin which Kale had set out for him. Faint patches of frost licked the moray granite as if they had soaked in through the walls. Passing vain on his way to the warmth of the galley, he saw that the demon dim spawn's black form was mottled with rime like leprosy. Yet the giants were busy about their tasks as always. Impervious to fire, if not to pain, they were also proof against cold. Most of them labored in the rigging, fighting the frozen stiffness of the lines. For a moment, while his eyes teared, Covenant saw them imprecisely, and thought they were furling the sails. But then he saw clouds blowing off the canvas like steam, and he realized that the giants were beating the sails to prevent the frost on them from building into ice. Ice might have torn the canvas from the spars, crippling Starfare's gem when the Dramon's life depended upon its headway. His breathing crusted in his beard as he let the wind thrust him forward. Without Kale's help he would have been unable to wrestle open the galley door. Slivers of ice sprang from the cracks and vanished inward as the Haruchai broke the seal caused by the moisture of cooking. Riding a gust that swirled stiffly through the galley, Covenant jumped the storm sill and nearly staggered at the concussion as the door slammed behind him. "'Stone and sea!' Hearthcole barked in red-faced and harmless ire. "'Are you fools that you enter aft rather than forward in this gale?' With a dripping ladle, she gestured fiercely at the other sea-door. 
Behind her, Seesaw's clang shut his stove's firebox indignantly. But a moment later, all vexation forgotten, he handed Covenant a steaming flagon of diluted diamond draft, and Hearth Cole scooped out a bowl of broth for him from the immense stone pot she tended. Awkward with self-consciousness, he sat down beside Lyndon against one wall, out of the way of the cooks, and tried to draw some warmth back into his bones. In the days that followed, he spent most of his time there, sharing with her the bearable clangor and heat of the galley. In spite of his numbness, the cold was too fierce for him, and for her it was worse because her senses were so vulnerable to it. He made one more attempt to sleep in his cabin, but after that he accepted a pallet like hers in the galley. The wind mounted incrementally every day, and with it the air grew steadily more frigid. Starfare's gem was being hurled like a jared toward the ice-gnawed heart of the north. When giants entered the galley seeking food or warmth, their clothing was stiff with gray rime which left puddles of slush on the floor as it melted. Ice clogged their beards and hair, and their eyes were haggard. Covenant made occasional forays out on deck to observe the state of the ship. But what he saw, the thick, dire sea, the lowering rack, the frozen nerves of spume which were allowed to chew at the railings because the crew was too hard-pressed to clear them away, always drove him back to the galley with a jellied knot in his chest. Once he went far enough forward to look at Findale, when he returned his lips were raw with cold and curses. "'That bastard doesn't even feel it,' he muttered to no one in particular, although Pitchwife was there with Lyndon, Mistweave, the two cooks, and a few other giants. It goes right through him. He could not explain his indignation. It simply seemed unjust that the appointed should be untouched by the plight of the Dromond. But Lyndon was not looking at him. Her attention was fixed on Pitchwife, as if she wanted to ask him something important. At first, however, she had no opportunity to interpose her question. Pitchwife was teasing hearth coal and sea sauce like a merry child, and laughing at the concealed humor of their rebuffs. He had a giant's tall spirit in his bent frame, and more than a giant's capacity for mirth. His japing dissipated some of Covenant's acid mood. At last Pitchwife wrung an involuntary laugh from the cooks, and with that he subsided near Covenant and Linden, the heat of the stoves gleaming on his forehead. Covenant was conscious of Linden's tautness as she mustered her inquiry. Pitchwife, what are we getting into? The giant looked at her with an air of surprise, which might have been feigned. "'Nobody wants to talk about it,' she pursued. "'I've asked Galerath and Sevenhand, but all they say is that Starfare's gem can go on like this indefinitely. Even Mistweave thinks he can serve me by keeping his mouth shut.' Mistweave peered studiously at the ceiling, pretending he did not hear what was said. "'So I'm asking you. You've never held anything back from me?' Her voice conveyed a complex vibration of strain. What are we getting into? Outside the galley, the wind made a peculiar keening sound as it swept through the anchor holes. Frost snapped in the cracks of the doors. Pitchwife did not want to meet her gaze, but she held him. By degrees, his good cheer sloughed away, and the contrast made him appear older, eroded by an unuttered fear. For no clear reason, Covenant was reminded of a story Lyndon had told him in the days before the quest had reached Elamesnadine, the story of the role Pitchwife had played in the death of the first's father. He looked now like a man who had too many memories. "'Ah, Chosen,' he sighed, "'it is my apprehension that we have been snared by the dole wind which leads to the soul-biter.' "'The soul-biter.' Pitchwife called it an imprecise sea, not only because every ship that found it did so in a different part of the world, but also because every ship that won free of it again told a different tale. Some vessels met gales and reefs in the south, others stifling calms in the east, still others rank and impenetrable beds of sargasso in the west. In spite of this, however, the soul-biter was known for what it was, for no craft or crew ever came back from it unscathed, and each of those ships had been driven there by a dull wind that blew too long without let or variation. Lyndon argued for a while, vexed by the conflicting vagueness and certainty of Pitchwife's explanations, but Covenant paid no heed to either of them. 
He had a name now for his chill anxiety, and the knowledge gave him a queer comfort. The soul-biter. It was not Lord Fowle's doing. Neither could it be avoided, and the outcome of that sea might make all other fears unnecessary. Very well. The galley was too warm, but outside cried and groaned a cold which only giants could endure for any length of time. Eventually even the din of the cooks became soothing to him, and he passed out of trepidation into a kind of waking somnolence, a stupefied inner silence like an echo of the emptiness which the Elohim had imposed upon him in Elamesnadine. That silence comprised the only safety he had known in this world. It was a leper's answer to despair, a state of detachment and passivity made complete by the deadness of every nerve which should have conveyed import. The Elohim had not invented it. They had simply incarnated in him the special nature of his doom, to feel nothing and die. Linden had once redeemed him from that fate, but now he was beaten. He made decisions not because he believed in them, but because they were expected of him. He did not have the heart to face the soul-biter. In the days that followed, he went through the ordinary motions of being alive. He drank enough diamond draft to account for his mute distance to the people who watched him. He slept in the galley, took brief walks, acknowledged greetings and conversations like a living man. But inwardly he was becoming untouchable. After years of discipline and defiance, of stubborn argument against the seduction of his illness, he gave the effort up. And still Starfair's gem ploughed a straight furrow across the grey and gravid sea, while the wind blew arctic outrage. Except for a few worn paths here and there, the decks were now clenched with ice, overgrown like an old ruin. Its sheer weight was enough to make the giants nervous but they could not spare time or strength to clear the crust away. There was too much water in the wind. The blow sheared too much spray off the battered waves, and that damp collected in the sails faster than it could be beaten clear. At intervals, one stretch of canvas or another became too heavy to hold. The wind rent it out of its shrouds. A hail of ice slivers swept the decks. Tattered scraps of sail were left flapping like broken hands from the spars. Then the giants were forced to clue new canvas up the yards. Bereft of its midmast, the granite Drummond needed all its sails or none. Day after day the shrill whine of the rigging and the groans of the stone became louder, more distressed. The sea looked like fluid ice, and Starfair's gem was dragged forward against ever-increasing resistance. Yet the giant's ship was stubborn. Its masts flexed and shivered, but did not shatter. Grinding its teeth against the gale, Starfair's gem endured. When the change came, it took everyone by surprise. Rest had restored the combative smolder to Lyndon's eyes, and she had been fretting for days against the maddening pressure of the blast and the constriction of the galley. But even she did not see what was coming, and the giants had no warning at all. At one moment Starfair's gem was riding the howl of the wind, through the embittered heart of a cloud-dark night. At the next, the Dramon pitched forward like a destrier, with locked forelegs, and the gale was gone. The suddenness of the silence staggered the vessel like a detonation. There was no sound except the faint clink and crash of ice falling from the slack sails. Linden jerked her percipients from side to side, probing the ship. Then she muttered in astonishment, "'We've stopped!' just like that. For an instant no one moved. Then Mistweave strode to the forward door, kicked it out of its frost. Cold as pure as absolute winter came flowing inward, but it had no wind behind it. The air across the giant ship was still. Shouts sprang along the decks. In spite of his inward silence, Covenant followed Mistweave and Linden out into the night. The clouds were gone. The dark was as clear and sharp as a knife-edge, Spots of light marked out the giant ship as the crew lit more lanterns. Near the eastern horizon stood the moon, yellow and doleful. It was nearly full, but appeared to shed no illumination, cast no reflection onto the black and secret face of the water. The stars littered the sky in every direction, all their portents lost. Lind muttered to herself, What in hell? But she seemed unable to complete the question. Hunnan's grave and Pitchwife approached from opposite ends of the ship. 
When the first joined them, Pitchwife said with unconvincing nonchalance, "'It appears that we are here.' Covenant felt too numb to be cold, but Lyndon was shivering violently beside him. In a bitten voice, she asked, "'What do we do now?' "'Do?' replied Hunnan's grave, distantly. His visage was benighted, devoid of content. "'This is the soul-biter. We must await its will.' Plumes of steam came from his mouth as if his spirit escaped him at every word. Its will, Covenant thought dumbly. My will. Fowl's will. Nothing made any difference. Silence was safety. If he could not have hope, he would accept numbness. Returning to the galley, he curled up on his pallet and fell immediately asleep. But the next morning he was awakened by the cold and the quiet. The stoves put out no heat. Except for kale, the galley was deserted. Abandoned. Starfare's gem lay as still as if he and the Harochai were the only people left aboard. A pang went through him, threatening his defenses. Stiff with sleep and chill, he fumbled erect. Where? he asked weakly. Where did they go? Kale's reply was flat and pitiless. They have gone to behold the soul-biter. Covenant winced. He did not want to leave the confines of the galley. He feared the return of sensation and pain and responsibility. But Kale's expressionless stare was insistent. Kale was one of the Harochai, kindred to Bryn and Manor. His comrades Seer and Hergrim had given their lives. He had the right to make demands, and his gaze was as plain as words. It is enough. Now you must resume yourself. Covenant did not want to go, but he adjusted his rumpled attire, made an effort to secure the silence closely about him. When Kale opened the door for him, he took a step over the storm sill and walked blinking into the bright, frigid morning. After so many days hidden behind the glower of the clouds, the sun alone would have been enough to blind him. But it was not alone. White cold glared around the ship. Light sprang at him from all sides. Dazzles as piercing as spears volleyed about his head. His tears froze on his cheeks. When he raised his hands to rub the beads away, small patches of skin were torn from his face. But slowly his sight cleared. He saw giants lining the rails, their backs to him. Everyone on board stood at the forward railings somewhere, facing outward. They were still, as quiet as the sea and the sails hanging empty in their gear but no hush could silence their expectant suspense. They were watching the soul-biter, waiting for it. Then he recovered enough vision to discern the source of all the dazzling. Motionless in the water, Starfair's gem lay surrounded by a flotilla of icebergs, hundreds of them in every size and configuration. Some were mere small humps on the flat sea. Others raised jagged crests to the level of the Dramon's spars, and they were all formed of the same impeccable ice, ice as translucent and complete as glass, as hard-faced as diamonds, ice on which the morning broke, shattering light in all directions. They were moving. Singly, or in squadrons, they bore slowly down on the ship as they floated southward. A few came so close that a giant could have reached them in one leap, yet none of them struck the Drummond. Along the deep the flotilla drifted with a wondrous majesty as bewitching as the cold. Most of the giants stood as if they had been carved from a muddier ice. They scarcely breathed while their hands froze to the rails and the gleaming burned into their eyes. Covenant joined Lyndon near the first, Pitchwife and Mistweave. Behind the raw red of cold in her face lay a blue pallor, as if her blood had become as milky as frost. But she had stopped shivering paid no heed to the drops of ice which formed on her parted lips. Pitchwife's constant murmur did not interrupt the trance. Like everyone else, he watched the ice pass stately by, as if he were waiting for someone to speak. As if the sun-sharp wonder of this passage were merely a prelude. Covenant found that he, too, could not look away. Commanded by so much eye-piercing glister and beauty, he braced his hands on one of the cross-beams of the railing, and at once lost the power of movement. He was calm now, prepared to wait forever if necessary to hear what the cold was going to utter. Kale's voice reached him distantly. 
The Harachai was saying, Her lord, this is not well. Chosen, hear me. It is not well. You must come away. But his protest slowly ran out of strength. He moved to stand beside Covenant and did not speak again. Covenant had no sense of time. Eventually, the waiting ended. A berg drifted past the line of spectators, showing everyone a flat space like a platform in its side. And from that space rose cries. A ship at last! Help us! In the name of pity! We have been marooned! He seemed to hear the same shouts behind him also, from the other side of the giant ship. But that strange detail made no impression on him. His eyes were the only part of him that moved, as the iceberg floated southward amid the slow procession, its flat side passed directly below the watchers. And he saw figures emerge from the pellucid ice, human figures. Three or four of them, he could not be sure. The number was oddly imprecise. But numbers did not matter. They were men, and their destitution made his heart twist against its shackles. They were hollow-eyed, gaunt, and piteous. Their hands, maimed by frostbite, were wrapped in shreds torn from their ragged clothing. Emaciation and hopelessness lined their faces. Their cracked and splintered voices were hoarse with despair. Marooned, they cried like a memory of the wind. Mercy! But no one on the Drummond moved. Help them! Lyndon's voice issued like a moan between her beaded lips. Throw them a line! Somebody! No one responded. Gripped by cold, volitionless, the watchers only stared as the iceberg drifted slowly by, bearing its frantic victims away. Gradually the current took the marooned men out of hearing. In the name of God! Her tears formed a gleaming fan of ice under each eye. Again Covenant's heart twisted, but he could not break free. His silence covered the sea. Then another berg drew near. It lay like a plate on the unwavering face of the water. Beneath the surface, its bulk lightly touched the ship, scraped a groan from the hushed hull. For a moment, the plate caught the sun squarely, and its reflection rang like a knell. Yet Covenant was able to see through the glare. Poised in the sun's image were people that he knew. Hergrim. Seer. They stood braced as if they had their backs to the sun wall. At first they were unaware of the giant ship. But then they saw it. Seer shouted a hail which fell without echo onto the decks of the Drummond. Leaving Hergrim, he sprinted to the edge of the ice, waved his arms for assistance. Then out of the light came a sand gorgon. White against the untrammeled background of the ice, the beast charged toward Hergrim with murder outstretched in its mighty arms. Tremors shook Kale. Strain made steam puff between his teeth, but the cold held him. For an instant, the implacable structure of Seer's face registered the fact that the giant ship was not going to help him. His gaze shivered in Covenant's chest like an accusation that could never be answered. Then he sped to Hergrim's defense. The sand gorgon, struck with the force of a juggernaut, cracks sprang through the ice, a flurry of blows scattered Hergrim's blood across the flow. Seer's strength meant nothing to the beast. And still no one moved. The giants were ice themselves now, as frigid and brittle as the wilderland of the sea. Lyndon's weeping gasped in her throat. Droplets of blood ran from Covenant's palms as he tried to rip his hands from the railing. But the grasp of the cold could not be broken. Seer! Hergrim! But the plate of ice slowly drifted away, and no one moved. After that the waiting seemed long, for the first time since Covenant had fallen under the spell of the soul-biter. At last another hunk of ice floated near the giant ship. It was small, hardly a yard wide, its face barely above the water. It seemed too small to be the bringer of so much fear. For a moment his vision was smeared with light. He could see nothing past the bright assault of the sun's reflections. But then his eyes cleared. On that little flow stood Cable Sea Dreamer. He faced the Dramond, stared up at the watchers. His posture was erect, his arms were folded sternly over the gaping wound in the center of his chest. Above his scar, his eyes were full of terrible knowledge. Stiffly, he nodded a greeting. "'My people,' he said in a voice as quiet and extreme as the cold, "'you must succor me. This is the soul-biter. 
Here suffer all the damned who have died in a false cause, unaided by those they sought to serve. If you will not reach out to me, I must stand here forever in my anguish, and the ice will not release me. Hear me, you whom I have loved to this cost. Is there no love left in you for me? Sea dreamer, Linden groaned. Hanansgrave gave a cry that tore frozen flesh from his mouth, sent brief drops of blood into his beard. The first panted faintly. No, I am the first of the search. I will not endure it. But none of them moved. The cold had become irrefragable. Its victory was accomplished. Already Sea Dreamer was almost directly opposite Covenant's position. Soon he would pass amidships, and then he would be gone, and the people of Starfair's gem would be left with nothing except abomination and rue and cold. It was intolerable. Sea Dreamer had given his life to save Covenant from destroying the earth. Prevented by muteness from sharing the earth site, he had placed his own flesh in the path of the world's doom, purchasing a reprieve for the people he loved and Covenant had refused to grant him the simple decency of a Ka'amora. It was too much. In pain and dismay, Covenant moved. With a curse that splintered the silence, he burned his hands off the rail. Wild magic pulsed through him like the hot ichor of grief. White fire burst out of his ring like rage. "'We're going to lose him!' he howled at the giants. "'Get a rope!' An instant later, the first wrenched herself free. Her iron voice rang across the giant ship. No! Jerking toward the mooring of a nearby ratline, she snatched up on the belaying pins. Avant, demon! she yelled. We will not hear you! Fierce with fury and revulsion, she hurled the pin straight at Sea Dreamer. The giants gaped as her projectile flashed through him. It struck a chip from the edge of the ice and skipped away into the sea, splashing distinctly. At once his form wavered. He tried to speak again, but already he had dissolved into mirage. The flow drifted emptily away toward the south. While Covenant stared, the fire rushed out of him, quenched again by the cold. But an instant later the spell broke with an audible crackle and shatter of ice. Lyndon lifted raw hands to her face, blinked her cold-gouged eyes. Coughing and cursing, Hunnenscrave reeled back from the rail— "'Move, sluggards!' his shout scattered flecks of blood. "'Where the wind?' Relief and dismay were etched in frost on different parts of Pitchwife's face. Numbly, the other giants turned from the vista of the sea. Some seemed unable to understand what had happened. Others struggled in mounting haste toward their stations. Seesaws and Hearthcole bustled back to the galley as if they were ashamed of their prolonged absence. The first and Galerath moved among the slower crew members, shaking or manhandling them into a semblance of alertness. Hunnenscrave strode grimly in the direction of the wheel deck. A moment later, one of the sails rattled in its gear, sending down a shower of frozen dust, and the first giant to ascend the rat lines gave a hoarse call. The South! A dark moil of clouds was already visible above the Dramon's taffrail. The gale was coming back. Covenant wondered momentarily how Starfair's gem would be able to navigate through the flotilla of icebergs in such a wind, or how the ice-laden sails would survive if the blast hit too suddenly, too hard. But then he forgot everything else, because Lyndon was fainting, and he was too far away to reach her. Mistweave barely caught her in time to keep her from cracking her head open on the stone deck. 4. Sea of Ice the first gusts hit the giant ship at an angle, heeling it heavily to port, but then the main force of the wind came up against the stern, and Starfair's gem righted with a wrench as the sails snapped and bellied and the blast tried to claw them away. The Dramond lay so massively in the viscid sea that for a moment it seemed unable to move. The upper spars screamed. Abruptly, dawn greeters split from top to bottom, and wind tore shrilling through the rent but then Starfair's gem gathered its legs under it, thrust forward, and the pressure eased. As the clouds came boiling overhead, the giant ship took hold of itself and began to run. In the first moments, Hunnan's Crave and the steerswoman were tested to their limits by the need to avoid collision with the nearest bergs. Under these frigid conditions, any contact might have burst the granite of the Dramon's flanks like dry wood. 
but soon the flotilla began to thin ahead of the ship. Starfair's jam was coming to the end of the soul-biter. The wind continued to scale upward, but now the immediate danger receded. The Dramond had been fashioned to withstand such blasts. But Covenant was oblivious to the ship and the wind. He was fighting for Lyndon's life. Mistweave had carried her into the galley, where the cooks labored to bring back the heat of their stoves. But once the giant had laid her down on her pallet, Covenant shouldered him aside. Pitchwife followed Kale into the galley and offered his help. Covenant ignored him. Cursing with methodical vehemence under his breath, he chaffed her wrists, rubbed her cheeks, and waited for the cooks to warm some water. She was too pale. The movement of her chest was so slight that he could hardly believe it. Her skin had the texture of wax. It looked like it would peel away if he rubbed it too hard. He slapped and massaged her forearms, her shoulders, the sides of her neck, with giddy desperation pounding in his temples. Between curses, he reiterated his demand for water. "'It'll come,' muttered Seesaws. His own impatience made him sound irate. "'The stoves are cold. I have no theurgy to hasten fire.' "'She isn't a giant,' Covenant responded without looking away from Lyndon. "'It doesn't have to boil.' Pitchwife squatted at Lyndon's head, thrust a leather flask into Covenant's view. Here is diamond draft. Covenant did not pause, but he shifted his efforts down to her hips and legs, making room for Pitchwife. Cupping one huge palm under her head, the giant lifted her into a half-sitting posture. Carefully, he raised the mouth of his flask to her lips. Liquid dribbled from the corners of her mouth. In dismay, Covenant saw that she was not swallowing. Her chest rose as she inhaled, but no gag reflex prevented her from breathing the potent liquor. At the sight, his mind went white with fire. The hysteria, venom, and power coursed through his muscles, keen, argent, fretted with reminders of midnight and murder. He thrust Bitchwife away as if the giant were a child. But he dared not try to reach heat into Linden. Without any health sense to guide him, he would be more likely to kill than warm her. Swallowing flame, he wrenched her onto her side, hit her once between the shoulder blades, twice hoping to dislodge the fluid from her lungs. Then he pressed her to her back again, tilted her head as he had been taught, clasped shut her nose, and with his mouth over hers started breathing urgently down her throat. Almost at once, effort and restraint made him dizzy. He no longer knew how to find the still point of strength in the center of his whirling fears. He had no power to save her life, except the one he could not use. "'Giant friend,' Hearth Cole's voice came from a great distance. "'Here is a stew-pot able to hold her.' Covenant's head jerked up. For an instant he gaped in comprehension at the cook. Then he rapped out, "'Fill it!' and clamped his mouth back over Linden's. A muffled thunder of water poured into the huge stone pot. Wind shrieked in the hawse-holes, plucked juddering ululations from the shrouds. Around Covenant the galley began to spin. Head up, inhale. Head down, exhale. He had no way to keep his balance, except with fire. In another moment he was going to erupt or lose consciousness. He did not know which. Then Seesaws said, "'It is ready.' The pitchwife touched Covenant's shoulder. Scooping his arms under Linden, Covenant tried to unknot his cramped muscles, stand erect. Starfair's gem rented through the crest of a wave and dove for the trough. Unable to steady himself, he pitched headlong toward the wall. Hands caught him. Mistweave held him while pitchwife pulled Linden from his embrace. He was giddy and irresistible with fire. He jerked away from Mistweave, followed Pitchwife toward the stove on which sat the oblong stewpot. The floor seemed to yaw viciously, but he kept moving. The stovetop was as high as his chin. He could see nothing of Linden past the pot's rim except a crown of hair as Sea Sauce held her head above water. But he no longer needed to see her. Pressing his forehead against the base of the stewpot, he spread his arms as far as possible along its sides. The guts of the stove were aflame, but that heat would take too long to warm so much stone and water. Closing his eyes against the ghoul whirl of his vertigo, he let wild magic pour down his arms. This he could do safely. He had learned enough control to keep his power from tearing havoc through the galley. 
and Linden was buffered from his imprecise touch. With white passion he girdled the pot, then he narrowed his mind until nothing else impinged upon it, and let the fire flow. In that way he turned his back on silence and numbness. For a time he was conscious only of the current of his power, squeezing heat into the stone but not breaking it, not tearing the fragile granite into rubble. Then suddenly he realized that he could hear Linden coughing. He looked up. She was invisible to him, hidden by the sides of the pot and the steam pluming thickly into the air. But she was coughing, clearing her lungs more strongly with every spasm, and a moment later one of her hands came out of the vapor to clutch at the lip of the pot. "'It is enough,' Pitchwife was saying. "'Giant friend, it is enough. More heat will harm her.' Covenant nodded dumbly. With a deliberate effort he released his power. At once he recoiled, struck by the vertigo and fear he had been holding at bay. But Pitchwife put an arm around him, kept him on his feet. As the spinning slowed, he was able to watch Seesaws lift Linden dripping from the water. She still looked as pallid and frail as a battered child, but her eyes were open and her limbs reacted to the people around her. When Mistweave took her from the cook, she instinctively hugged his neck while he wrapped her in a blanket. Then Kale offered her pitchwife's flask of diamond draft. Still shivering fiercely, she pulled the flask to her mouth. Gradually, two faint spots of color appeared on her cheeks. Covenant turned away and hid his face against Pitchwife's malformed chest until his relief eased enough to be borne. For a few moments, while the diamond draft spread out within her, Linden remained conscious. Though she was so weak that she tottered, she got down from Mistweave's arms. With the blanket swaddled around her, she stripped off her wet clothing. Then her gaze hunted for Covenant's. He met it as bravely as he could. Why? she asked huskily. Her voice quivered. Why couldn't we help them? It was the soul-biter. Her question made his eyes blur. Her heart was still torn by what she had seen. They were illusions. We were damned if we refused to help. Because of how we would have felt about ourselves. And damned if we tried. If we brought one of those things aboard. The soul-biter he thought as he strove to clear his vision. It was aptly named. The only way out was to break the illusion. She nodded faintly. She was fading into the embrace of the diamond draft. It was like watching my parents. Her eyes closed. If they were as brave as I wanted them to be. Her voice trailed toward silence. If I let myself love them. Then her knees folded. Mistweave lowered her gently to her pallet, tucked more blankets around her. She was already asleep. By increments, the galley recovered its accustomed warmth. Seesaws and hearth coal labored like titans to produce hot food for the hard-pressed crew. As Hunnensgrave became more confident of the Dramon's stance against the gale, he began sending giants in small groups for element and rest. A steady stream of them passed through the galley. They entered with horror in their hair and strain in their eyes. The same gaunt look of memory marked every face. But the taste of hot food and the comradely bluster of the cooks solaced them, and when they returned to their tasks they bore themselves with more of their wonted jaunty sea-love and courage. They had survived the soul-biter. Valiantly they went back to their battle with the bitter grew of the sea. Covenant remained in the galley for a while to watch over Linden. Her slumber was so profound that he distrusted it instinctively. He expected her to slip back into the tallow pallor of frostbite. She looked so small, frail, and desirable, lying there nearly under the feet of the giants. But her form curled beneath the blankets, brought back other memories as well, and eventually he found himself falling from relief and warmth into bereavement. She was the only woman he knew who understood his illness and still accepted him. Already her stubborn commitment to him and to the land had proved itself stronger than his despair. He yearned to put his arms around her, clasp her to him, but he did not have the right, and in her analytic sleep she did not need the loyalty of his attendants. To escape the ache of what he had lost, he sashed his robe tightly about him and went out into the keening wind. Instantly he stumbled into the swirl of a snowfall as thick as fog. It flurried against his face. Ice crunched under his boots. 
When he blinked his eyes clear, he saw pinpricks of light around the decks and up in the rigging. The snow veiled the day so completely that the giants were compelled to use lanterns. The sight dismayed him. How could Hanenskrave keep the giant ship running, headlong and blind in such a sea, when his crew was unable to tend the sails without lamps? But the master had no choice. While this wind held, the Dremond could do nothing but grit its teeth and endure. The matter was out of Covenant's hands. Braving the flung snow and the ice-knurled decks with Kale's support, he went looking for the first. But when he found her in the cabin she shared with Pitchwife, he discovered that he did not know what to say. She was polishing her longsword, and her slow, stroking movements had a quality of deliberate grimness which suggested that the survival of Starfare's gem was out of her hands as well. She had broken the spell of the soul-biter. She could do nothing now. For a long moment they shared a hard stare of determination and helplessness. Then he turned away. The snowfall continued. It clung to the air, and the wind whipped it forward, darkening the day as if the sky were clogged with ashes. It brought with it a slight moderation of the temperature, and the fierceness of the blast was softened somewhat. But in reaction the seas grew more tempestuous, and they no longer followed the thrust of the gale. Other forces bent them out of the grasp of the storm, forcing Starfare's gem to slog and claw its way across the grain of the current. Hanensgrave shifted course as much as he dared to accommodate the seas, but the wind did not give him much latitude. As a result, the massive vessel pounded forward with a wild gait, a slewing pitch and yaw with a sickening pause on the wave-tops, while the Dremond hung momentarily out of control, followed by a plunge which buried the stern to its taffrail in black water. Only the unfrightened demeanor of the giants convinced Covenant that Starfare's gem was not about to founder. Shortly before sunset, the snow lifted, letting a little dirty yellow light lick briefly across the battered seas. At once Hanenskrave set giants to the tops to scan the horizons before the illumination failed. They reported no landfall in sight. Then a night blinded by clouds closed down over the giant ship, and Starfare's gem went running into the pit of an unreadable dark. In the galley, Covenant rode the storm, with his back braced between one wall and the side of a stove, and his gaze fixed on Linden. Blank to the vessel's staggering, she slept so peacefully that she reminded him of the land before the onset of the sunbane. She was a terrain which should never have been violated by bloodshed and hate, a place that deserved better. But the land had men and women, however few, who had fought and would fight for its healing, and Linden was among them and in the struggle against her own inner sunbane, she had no one but herself. The night stretched out ahead of Starfare's gem. After a meal and a cup of thinned diamond draft, Covenant tried to rest. Recumbent on his pallet, he let the seas flop him from side to side and strove to imagine that he was being cradled. Fitfully he dozed his way into true sleep. But almost at once he began to flounder. He was back on the sandhold, in Kemper's pitch, strapped motionless for torture. He had passed untouched through knives and fire, but now he was being hurled down into himself, thrown with the violence of greed toward the hard wall of his fate. Then, however, he had been saved by Hergrim, and now Hergrim was dead. There was no one to save him from the impact that broke everything, filled the air with the splintering thunder of a mountain being riven. His skin slick with sweat, he awakened, and the sound went on. Starfare's gem was shattering. Concussions yelled through the hull. His face pressed the wall. A chaos of crockery and utensils burst across the galley. He tried to thrust himself back, but the ship's momentum pinned him. Stone screams answered the wind, the sound of masts and spars splitting under the strain. The Dremond had been driven into some kind of collision. The next instant, Starfare's gem heaved to a halt. Covenant rolled out into the broken litter, dancing across the floor. Bruising his knees and hands on the shards, he lurched to his feet. Then a tremendous weight hammered down on the prow of the ship, and the floor tilted as if the giant ship were on its way to the depths. The after-door of the galley jumped from its mounts. Until Starfare's gem stumbled back onto a semblance of trim, Covenant had to cling to Kale and let the Harochai uphold him. The Dramon seemed to be settling. Cries of breakage retorted along the wind. Outside the galley the air was frantic with shouts. But over them all rose Hanenskrave's stentorian howl, Pitch wife!
Then hearth coals stirred in one corner. Seesaws shrugged the remains of a broken shelf off his back, and Covenant started to move. His first thought was for Lyndon, but a swift glance showed him that she was safe, still clasped in the soper of diamond draft. She lay on her pallet with Mistweave braced protectively over her. Seeing Covenant's look, Mistweave gave a quick nod of reassurance. Without hesitation, Covenant surged to the ruptured door and charged out into the teeth of the wind. He could see nothing. The night was as black as vain. All the lanterns seemed to have been blown out. When he located a point of light hanging near Ship's Hearth Thew, it showed him only that the wheel deck had been abandoned. But shouts of command and desperation came from the direction of the prow. Gripping Kale's shoulder because he could not keep his footing on the ice, Covenant labored forward. At first he followed the sound of Hunnenscrave's bellow, the first's iron orders. Then lanterns began to reappear as giants called for light so that they could see their way amid the snarled wreckage which crowded the vessel's foredeck. In a prodigious tangle of sundered canvas and gear, pulleys and lines, sprawled several thick stone beams, the two upper spars, and a section of the foremast. The great trunk of the mast had been broken in half. One of the fallen spars was intact. The other lay in three jagged pieces. At every step the giants kicked through slivers of granite. Four crew members were crumpled in the wreckage. The lantern light was so wan, cast so many shadows, that Covenant could not see if any of them were still alive. The first had her sword in her fist. Wielding it as deftly as a dagger, she cut through shrouds and sails toward the nearest of the fallen giants. Galerath and several others attacked the same task with their knives. Sevenhand started into the wreckage. Hanenscrave called him back, sent him instead to muster hands at the pumps. Covenant felt the Dramond sinking dangerously, but he had no time for that fear. Through the din, he shouted at Kale, "'Get Linden!' "'She has consumed much diamond draft,' the Harachai replied. "'She will not be lightly roused.' His tone was impersonal. "'I don't care,' snapped Covenant. "'We're going to need her.' Whirling away, he flung himself in the wake of the first. She was crouched beside a limp form. As Covenant reached her, she surged erect again. Her eyes echoed the lanterns hotly. Darkness lay along her blade like blood. "'Come,' she rasped. We can do nothing here. Her sword sliced into the piled canvas with a sound like a cry. Covenant glanced at the giant she had left. The crew member was a young woman, he remembered, a grinning sailor with a cheerful determination to be always in the forefront of any work or hazard. He recognized half her face. The rest had been crushed by the broken butt of the mast. For a moment the dark came over him. Bereft of light, he blundered into the wreckage and could not fight free. But then he felt venom rise like bile in his throat, felt worms of fire begin to crawl down his forearm, and the shock steadied him. He had nearly let the wild destruction slip. Cursing, he stumbled after the first again. A stolid shout reported that Galrath had found another of the injured giants dead. Covenant forced himself to go faster, as if his haste might keep the other crew members alive. But the first had already left behind a third corpse— a man with an arm-long splinter of stone driven through the base of his throat. In a fever of suppressed fire, Covenant thrashed onward. Galrath and the first converged on the last giant with Hunnenscrave and Covenant, following closely. The face of this giant was less familiar to him. She had never been brought specifically to his notice. But that did not matter. He cared only that she was alive. Her breath came in hoarse-wet heaves. Black fluid ran from the corner of her mouth, formed a pool under her head. The bulk of the one unsnapped spar lay across her chest, crushing her to the hard deck. Both her forearms were broken. The first slapped her long sword into its scabbard. Together she and Galrath bent to the beam, tried to lift it, but the huge spar was far too heavy for them. Its ends were trapped. One stretched under the fallen mast, the other was snared in a mountain of gear and canvas. Galrath went on straining at the beam as if she did not know how to admit defeat. But the first swung upright, and her voice rang out over the deck, demanding help. Giants are already on their way. Several of them veered toward the mast, fought to clear it, so that they could roll it off the spar. Others slashed into the wreckage at the far end with their knives. There was little time. The life was being squeezed out of the pinned giant. It panted from her mouth in damp, shallow gasps. Her face was intense with pain. No, Covenant panted in response. No. 
Thrusting himself forward, he cried to the climber, Get back! I'm going to break this thing off her. He did not wait to see whether he was obeyed. Wrapping his arms as far as he could around the bowl of the spar, he brought up white fire to tear the stone apart. With a fierce yell, Hunnenscrave wrenched Covenant from the spar, shoved him away. Hunnenscrave, the first began. I must have this spar whole, roared the master. His beard jutted fury and degrevement along his jaw. Starfare's gem cannot endure any sea with but one mast. The plight of his ship consumed him. If Pitchwife can mend this shaft by any amount, then I must have a spar to hold sail. He cannot remake the giant ship entire. For an instant, he and the first confronted each other furiously. Covenant fought to keep himself from howling. Then a groan and thud of granite shook the deck as four or five giants rolled the mast off the end of the spar. At once the first and Hanan's crave sprang to work. With gale wrath and every giant who could lay hand to the beam, they pitted their strength against the spar. The long stone shaft lifted like an ordinary timber in their arms. As the weight left her, the crushed crew member let out a shredded moan and lost consciousness. Immediately, Galrath crouched under the yard to her, clamping one hand under the woman's chin, the other at the back of her head to minimize the risk of further injuring a broken spine. The store's master drew her comrade from beneath the spar to a small clear space in the middle of the wreckage. Covenant gaped at them half-wittedly, trembling as if he had been snatched from the brink of an act of desecration. Swiftly, Galrath examined the crushed woman but the fragmentary light of the lanterns made her appear tentative, hampered by hesitation and uncertainty. She was the Ramon's healer, and knew how to treat any hurt that she could see, but she had no way to correct or even evaluate such severe internal damage, and while she faltered the woman was slipping out of reach. Covenant tried to say Lyndon's name, but at that moment a group of giants came through the shambles carrying lanterns. Mistweave and Kale were among them. Mistweave bore Lyndon. She lay in his arms as if she were still asleep, as if the diamond draft's hold over her could not be breached by any desperation. But when he set her on her feet, her eyes fluttered open. Groggily, she ran her fingers through her hair, pulled it back from her face. Shadows glazed her eyes. She looked like a woman who was walking in her dreams. The yawn stretched her mouth. She appeared unaware of the pain sprawling at her feet. Then abruptly she sank down beside the dying giant as though her knees had failed. She bowed her head, and her hair swung forward to hide her face again. Rigid with useless impatience, the first clenched her fists on her hips. Galrath glared back at the lamps. Hunnensgrave turned away, as if he could not bear the sight, began whispering commands. His tone made the crew obey with alacrity. Lyndon remained bowed over the giant as if she were praying. The noise of the crew in the wreckage, the creaking of the Dramon's granite, the muffled crackle of ice made what she was saying inaudible. Then her voice came into clearer focus. But the spinal cord is all right. If you splint her back, strap her down, the bones should mend. Galrath nodded stiffly, glowering as if she knew there was more to be said. The next moment a tremor ran through Lyndon, her head jerked up. Her heart's bleeding. The broken rib. Her eyes cast a white, blind stare into the dark. Through her teeth the first breathed, Sucker her, Chosen. She must not die. Three others have lost life this night. There must not be a fourth. Lyndon went on staring. Her voice had a leaden sound, as though she were almost asleep again. How? I could open her up, but she'd lose too much blood. And I don't have any sutures. Chosen! The first knelt opposite Lyndon, took hold of her shoulders. I know nothing of these sutures. Your healing surpasses me altogether. I know only that she must die if you do not aid her swiftly. In response, Lyndon gazed dully across the deck like a woman who had lost interest. Lyndon! Covenant croaked at last. Try! Her sight swam into focus on him, and he saw glints of light pass like motes of vision across the dark background of her eyes. Come, she said faintly, come here. All his muscles were wooden with suppressed dismay, but he forced himself to obey. Beside the dying giant he faced Lyndon. What do you— Her expression stopped him. Her features wore the look of dreams. Without a word she reached out, caught his half-hand by the wrist, 
stretched his arm like a rod over the giant's pain. Before he could react, she frowned sharply, and a blare of violation ripped across his mind. In a rush, fire poured from his ring. Wild magic threw back the night, washing the Ford deck with incandescence. He recoiled in shock rather than pain. Her hold did not hurt him. It had bereft him of choice. Without warning, all his preconceptions were snatched apart. Everything changed. Once before, in the cavern of the one tree, she had exerted his power for herself. But he had hardly dared consider the implications. Now her precipience had grown so acute that she could wield his ring without his bare volition. And it was a violation. Moram had said to him, You are the white gold. Wild magic had become a crucial part of his identity, and no one else had the right to use it, control it. Yet he did not know how to resist her. Her grasp on what she was doing was impenetrable. Already she had set fire to the giant's chest, as if she intended to burn out the woman's heart. Around the giant ship every sound fell away, absorbed by fire. The first in Galerath shaded their eyes against the blaze, watched the Chosen with mute astonishment. Linden's mouth formed mumbling shapes as she worked, but no words came. Her gaze was buried deep in the flames. Covenant could feel himself dying. For one moment the giant writhed against his thighs. Then she took a heavy, shuddering breath, and the trickle of blood at the corner of her mouth stopped. Her chest rose more freely. In a short time her eyes opened and stared at the sensation of being healed. Linden dropped Covenant's wrist. At once the fire vanished. Night clapped back over the Dramond. For an instant even the lanterns appeared to have gone out. He flinched back against a pile of ruined gear, his face full of darkness. He hardly heard the first muttering, Stone and sea, over and over again, unable to voice her amazement in any other way. He was completely blind. His eyes adjusted quickly enough, picking shapes and shadows out of the lantern glow. But that was only sight, not vision. It had no power or capacity for healing. Before him, Linden lay across the torso of the giant she had called back from death. She was already asleep. From his position in the Dramon's prow, Findale studied her, as if he expected a transformation to begin at any moment. Blinking fiercely, Covenant fought to keep the hot grief down. After a moment, he descried Pitchwife near the first. The lamps made the malformed giant's face haggard, his eyes red. He was breathing heavily, nearly exhausted. But his voice was calm as he said, It's done. Star Affairs Gem will not run with its wonted ease until it has been granted restoration by the shipwrights of home. But I have wived the breaches. We will not go down. Run? Hanan's crave growled through his beard. Have you beheld the foremast? Star Affairs Gem will never run. In such hurt I know not how to make it walk. The first said something Covenant did not hear. Kale came toward him, offered a hand to help him to his feet, but he did not react to any of them. He was being torn out of himself by the roots. Linden had a better right to his ring than he did. When the cold seeped so far into him that he almost stopped shivering, he made his preterite way to the oven-thick atmosphere of the galley. Seated there with his back to one wall, he stared at nothing as if he were stupefied, unable to register what he beheld. All he saw was the gaunt, compulsory visage of his doom. Outside the giants labored at the needs of the ship. For a long time the muffled thud of the pumps rose from below decks. The sails of the aftermast were clued up to their yards to protect them from any resurgence of the now-diminished dolewind. The stone of the foremast and its spars was cleared out of the wreckage and set aside. Anything that remained intact in the fallen gear and rigging was salvaged. Either sea sauce or hearth coal was away from the stoves constantly, carrying huge buckets of broth to the giants to sustain them while they worked. But nothing the crew could do changed the essential fact. The Dramond was stuck and crippled. When dawn came, and Covenant went hollow-eyed and spectral to look at the giant ship's condition, he was dismayed by the severity of the damage. After the midship housing, nothing had been hurt. The aftermast raised its arms like a tall tree to the blue depths and broken clouds of the sky. But forward, Starfare's gem looked as maimed as a derelict. Scant feet above the first yards, which had been stripped to the bone by the collapse of the upper members, the foremast ended in a ragged stump. 
Covenant had no sea craft, but he recognized that Hunnan's trade was right. Without sails forward to balance the canvas aft, Starfare's gem would never be able to navigate. Aching within himself, he turned to find out what the vessel had struck. At first, what he saw seemed incomprehensible. Starfare's gem lay surrounded to the horizons by a vast, flat wilderland of ice. Jagged hunks were crushed against the Dramon's sides, but the rest of the ice was unbroken. Its snow-blown surface appeared free of any channel which could have brought the giant ship to this place. But when he shaded his gaze and peered southward, he discerned a narrow band of gray water beyond the ice. And squinting so hard that his temples throbbed, he traced a line between the Dramon's stern and the open sea. There the ice was thinner. It was freezing back over the long furrow which Starfare's gem had plowed into the flow. The giant ship was trapped, locked here and helpless. With all three masts intact and a favoring wind, it could not have moved. It was stuck where it sat until spring came to its rescue. If this part of the world ever felt the touch of spring. Damnation! The ship's plight stung him like the gusts which came skirling off the ice. In the land, the clave was feeding the bane fire, stoking it with innocent blood to increase the sunbane. No one remained to fight the Namorom's depredations except Sunder and Halion, and perhaps a handful of Haruchai, if any of them were still alive. The quest for the one tree had failed, extinguishing Covenant's sole hope. And now, have mercy on me. But he was a leper, and there was never any mercy for lepers. Despite did not forbear. He had reached the point where everything he did was wrong. Even his stubborn determination to cling to his ring, to bear the cost of his doom himself, was wrong. But he could not endure the alternative. The simple thought wrung a mute howl from the pit of his heart. He had to do something, find some way to reaffirm himself. Passivity and silence were no longer viable. His despair itself compelled him. He had to. Linden had proved the Elohim right. With his ring she was able to heal. But he could not forget the taste of eager fire when he had warmed the stew-pot to save her. Had to. He could not give it up. His ring was all he had left. He had become the most fundamental threat to everything he loved. But suddenly that was no longer enough to stop him. Deliberately he set aside Lyndon's reasons, her wish to see him do what she believed she would do in his place, her desire to fight Lord Fowl through him, and chose his own. To show himself and his companions, and the despiser, if necessary, that he had the right. Without looking away from the ice, he said to Kale, Tell Hunnensgrave I want to talk to him. I want to talk to everybody. The first, Linden, Pitchwife, in his cabin. When the Harochai moved soundlessly away, Covenant hugged the scant protection of his robe and set himself to wait. The idea of what he meant to do made his pulse beat like venom in his veins. There was blue in the sky, the first blue he had seen for days. A crusty glitter reflected the sun, but the ice was not as smooth as the sunlight made it appear. Its surface was marked with sharp spines and ridges, mounds where flow-plates rubbed, and depressions which ran from nowhere to nowhere. The ice was a wasteland, its desolation grieving in the cold, and it held his gaze like the outcome of his life. Once in winter he had fought his way through long leagues of snow and despair to confront the despiser, and he had prevailed. But he knew now that he would never prevail in that way again. He shrugged against the chill. So what he would find some other way? Even if the attempt drove him mad, madness was just a less predictable and scrupulous form of power, and he did not believe that either Lord Fowl or Findale had told him the whole truth. Yet he did not intend to surrender his scruples or go mad. His leprosy had trained him well for survival and affirmation against an impossible future. And Foam Follower had once said to him, Service enables service. Hope came from the power and value of what was served, not from the one who served it. When Kale returned, Covenant felt that he was ready. Slowly, carefully, he turned from the sea and picked his way across the clogged stone toward one of the entryways to the underdecks. Below the door to Hunnan's grave's cabin was open, and beside it stood Mistweave. 
His face wore a conflicted expression. Covenant guessed that the giant had undertaken more than he realized when he had assigned himself to Kale's former responsibility for Lyndon. How could he have foreseen that his dedication to her would require him to ignore the needs of the Dremond and the labors of the crew? The dilemma made him look unsure of himself. But Covenant did not have any relief to offer the giant, and the door was open. Frowning at the pain all the people around him had to bear, he went into the master's cabin, leaving Kale outside. Hanan's Crave's quarters were austere, except for a few chairs sized for giants, a huge sea-chest, and a deep bunk. Its only furnishings were a long table cluttered with nautical instruments and charts, and two lamps hanging in stone gimbals. Hanan's Crave stood at the far end of the table, as if Covenant's arrival had interrupted him in the act of pacing. Sevenhand sat on the edge of the bunk, more melancholy than ever in his weariness. Near him was the store's master, her shoulders touching the wall, no expression on her blunt features. The first and pitchwife occupied two of the chairs. She held her back straight, her scabbarded blade across her thighs, as though refusing to admit how tired she was. But her husband was slumped with fatigue, emphasizing the deformation of his spine. In one corner of the chamber Lyndon sat cross-legged on the floor. Sleep made her eyes blurry. When she raised them to acknowledge Covenant, she seemed hardly able to see him. In the company of these giants she appeared tiny and misplaced, but the hue of her skin and the steadiness of her respiration showed that she had been essentially restored to health. The air of the cabin felt tense as if Covenant had entered the middle of an argument. None of the giants except Pitchwife and Sevenhand were looking at him, but when he turned his unspoken question toward Pitchwife, the first's husband bowed his head and did not answer and the lines of Seven Hands' old rue were too deep to be challenged. Covenant was stretched taut beyond gentleness. In a raw, brusque voice he demanded, "'So what do you think we should do about it?' Lyndon frowned as if his tone hurt her, or perhaps she had already read the nature of his intent. Without lifting her head she murmured, "'That's what they've been arguing about.' Her explanation eased him somewhat. He had gone so far down the road of his fate that he instinctively expected every hostile or painful or simply difficult emotion to be directed at himself. But his question remained. What choice have we got? At that the muscles at the corners of Hanan's Crave's jaw clenched. Sevenhand rubbed his cheeks with his palms as if he sought to push back the sorrow. The first let a sigh breathe softly through her teeth, but no one answered. Covenant pulled air into his lungs, gripped his courage in the insensate cold of his fists. "'If you don't have any better ideas, I'm going to break us out of this ice.' Then every eye was on him, and a shock of apprehension recoiled through the cabin. Hunnan's Crave's face gaped like a reopened wound. All the sleep vanished from Lyndon's orbs. The first surged to her feet, as harsh as iron. She demanded, "'Will you hazard the earth to no purpose?' "'Do you think your restraint is that good?' Lyndon added instantly. She, too, had come to her feet as if she wanted to meet Covenant's folly standing. "'Or are you just looking for an excuse to throw power around?' "'Hell and blood!' Covenant barked. Had Findale taught everyone aboard the Dremont to distrust him? "'If you don't like it,' his scarred forearm itched avidly, "'give me an alternative. Do you think I like being this dangerous?' His outburst sent a grimace of chagrin across the first's face. Lyndon dropped her eyes. For a moment Pitchwife's difficult breathing punctuated the silence. Then his wife said softly, "'Your pardon, giant friend. I did not intend to front. But we are not without choice in this strait.' She turned, and her gaze went like the point of a blade toward Hunnan's grave. "'You will speak now, master.' Hunnan's grave glared at her, but she was the first of the search. No giant would have refused to obey her when she used that tone. He complied slowly, uttering each word like a flat piece of stone. Yet as he answered, his hands made truncated, fumbling movements among the charts and implements on the table, contradicting him. "'I am uncertain of our position.' I have been granted scant opportunity for sightings since the cloud-rack cleared, 
and this sea has been little frequented by our people. Our charts and knowledge are likewise uncertain. The first frowned a reprimand at his digression, but he did not falter. Where knowledge is insufficient, all choices are hazardous. Yet it would appear that we now lie some four or five score leagues north and east of the coast which you name Sea Reach, home of the unhomed, and site of their destitute city and grave, Kirkry the Grieve. He articulated that name with a special distinctness, as if he would prefer to hear it sung. Then he outlined the alternative which the first had in mind. That Covenant and the leaders of the search leave Starfair's gem and strike westward across the ice until they found land, after which they could follow the coast into Sea Reach. Or, Lyndon interposed warily, studying Covenant as she spoke, we could forget Sea Reach and head straight for Revelstone. I don't know the terrain, but it's bound to be quicker than detouring that far south. Aye, Hunnan's crave permitted himself a growl of disgust or trepidation. Should this literal lie within hope of our charts? Emotion rose in his voice, slipping out of his rigid grasp. And should the ice remain intact and traversable to that coast? And should this winter hold? For we are somewhat southerly to have encountered such ice in the natural course of the seas, and it may thaw beneath us unseasonably. To keep himself from shouting, he ground up the words like shards of rock, and should the northward reaches of the land be not rugged, or mountainous beyond all possibility of travel, then he grabbed a mouthful of air, held it between his teeth, then, I say, our way is clear before us. His distress was acute in the confinement of the cabin, but the first did not relent. We hear you, she said sternly. The choice is jeopardous. Complete your tale, master. Hunnan's grave could not look at her. Ah, my tale, he grated. It is no tale of mine. My brother is dead, and the Dramond I cherish lies locked in ice and crippled. It is no tale of mine. Yet the first's authority held him, clutching a chart in each fist like a weightless and insufficient cudgel. He directed his voice at Covenant. You have offered to sunder the ice. Very good. To Cable Sea Dreamer, my brother who gave his life, you refuse the fire of release. But in the name of your mad desire for battle, you will attempt a league of ice. Very good. But I say to you that Starfare's gem cannot sail. In this maimed state, no. And were the time taken to do what mending lies within our power, time which is so precious to you, and were a channel open to the sea, then still would our plight remain for the Dramond is no longer proof against the stress of the seas. With a kind wind, perchance, we might make way toward sea-reach, but any storm would hold us in its mercy. A score of days, or ten score, might find us yet farther from our goal. Starfare's gem, he had to swallow heavily to force out the words, he is no longer fit to bear the search. But, Covenant began, then halted. For an instant he was confused. Hanan's Crave's grief covered an anger which he could not utter, and Covenant could not decipher. Why was the master so bitter? But suddenly the implications of Hanan's Crave's speech swept over Covenant like a breaker, and his comprehension tumbled down the riptide. Starfare's gem could not sail, and the first wanted the search to leave the giant ship, set out afoot toward the land. He found himself facing her with a knot of cold clenched around his heart. Dismay was all that kept him from fury. Nearly forty giants, foam followers' people, the kindred of the unhomed. You're talking about leaving them here to die. She was a sword main, trained to battle and difficult choices. Her sternness as she returned Covenant's gaze looked as careless of costs as a weapon but behind her eyes moved shadows like specters of pain. Aye, Hanan's crave's voice scraped the air. They must be left to die, or they must accompany us, and Starfare's gem itself must be left to die. 
and from that day forward no one of us shall ever again set gaze upon the crags and harborage of home. We have no means for the making of a new Dremond, and our people know not where we are. He spoke softly, but every word left a wheel across Covenant's mind. It was intolerable. He was no sailor. He could bear to abandon the giant ship. But to leave nearly forty giants behind without hope, or to strand them in the land as the unhomed had been stranded. The first did not waver. She knew her duty, and would not shirk it. Covenant swung away from her, confronted Hanan's crave down the length of the table. Its height made the master appear tall, and hurt beyond any mitigation. But Covenant could not accept that outcome. If we leave the crew here, with the ship— he drove his gaze up at the giant until Hunnan's crave met it. What will they need, in order to have any chance at all? Hunnan's crave's head jerked in surprise. For a moment his mouth parted his beard incredulously, as though he half believed he was being taunted. But then with a wrench he mastered himself. Stores we have in plenty. His eyes clung to covenant, like an appeal, Be not false to me in this. But the plight of the giant ship remains. It must have all the mending which Pitchwife may contrive. It must have time. Time, Covenant thought. He'd already been away from the land for more than sixty days, away from Revelstone for closer to ninety. How many more people had the clave killed? But the only alternative was to leave Pitchwife behind with the ship. And he would surely refuse. The first herself might refuse. Stiffly, Covenant asked, "'How much time?' Two days,' replied Hunnan's grave. "'Perhaps three. Much pitch will be required, and the labor itself will be awkward and arduous.' "'Damnation!' Covenant breathed. Three days. But he did not back down. He was a leper. He knew the folly of trying to purchase the future by selling the present. Grimly he turned to Pitchwife. Fatigue seemed to emphasize the giant's deformities his back bent as if it had been damaged by the weight of his limbs and head. But his eyes glittered and his expression had lifted. He looked at Covenant as though he knew what the unbeliever was about to say, and approved of it. Covenant felt wooden with failure. He had come here primed for fire, but all he had been able to offer his companions was a patience he did not possess. "'Try to do it in one,' he muttered. Then he left the cabin, so that he would— not have to endure the reactions of the giants. Pitchwife's voice followed him. Stone and sea, the giant chuckled. It is a small matter. What need have I of an entire day? Glaring at nothing, Covenant quickened his pace. But as he reached the ladder, leading to the afterdeck, Lyndon caught up with him. She gripped his arm as if something had changed between them. Her intent seriousness bore no resemblance to her old severity, and her eyes were damp. Her soft mouth, which he had kissed with such longing, wore the shape of a plea. Yet he had not forgiven himself, and after a moment she dropped her hand. Her gaze retreated somewhat. When she spoke she sounded like a woman who did not know the words she needed. "'You keep surprising me. I never know what to expect from you. Just when I think you are too far gone to be reached, you do something like that, like what you did for Sunder and Hollion. Abruptly she stopped as if she were hurt by the inadequacy of what she was saying. Covenant wanted to cry out. His desire for her was too acute to be suffered. He had already perverted whatever authenticity he might have had with her. And she was a healer. She had more right to his ring than he did. Self-loathing made him harsh. Do you really think I just want to throw power around? Is that your opinion of me? At that she winced, her expression turned inward like a baffled wail. No, she murmured. No. I was just trying to get your attention. Then her eyes reached toward him again. But you scared me. If you could see yourself— If I could see myself, he rasped, so that he would not put his arms around her, I'd probably puke. Savagely, he flung himself up the ladder away from her. But when he gained the open air and brittle cold of the afterdeck, he had to knot his arms across his chest to hold in the hurt. 
While he ate his breakfast in a galley, trying to absorb some of the stove's warmth, he could hear the sounds of work outside. At first Seven Hand's voice and Gale Rath's commanded alternately. He supervised the preparation of the foredeck. She led the breaking of the ice and the ritual songs for the burial of the three fallen crew members. But after a while Pitchwife made himself heard over the scuffle of feet and clatter of gear, the stiff hiss and thud of half-frozen cable. When Covenant had collected what little courage he had left, he went out to watch. During the night the crew had cleared and organized the wreckage. Now they were busy readying the truncated foremast. Pitchwife was hunched over a large stone vat of his special pitch, but his eyes and voice followed the sailors as they rigged lines between the intact yard and the splintered end of the mast. Except for the necessary questions and instructions, the giants were unusually quiet, dispirited. The dull wind had held them for a long time, and since their encounter with the soul-biter, they had had no rest at all. Now their future had become as fragile and arduous as ice. Even giants could not carry so much strain indefinitely. The Covenant had never seen Pitchwife at work before. Grateful for any distraction, he studied Pitchwife with fascination as the first's husband completed his preparations. Consigning his vat to another giant, he hoisted a slab of set rock and a sling over his shoulder, then went to the ropes and began pulling himself slowly up the foremast. Below him, the crew set his vat of pitch into a net that they had rigged from a pulley fixed as high as possible on the mast. When he reached that height himself, supported now by line lashed under his arms and around the mast, two giants hauled the vat up to him. His breath plumed crisply in the cold. At once he began his work. Scooping up gouts of pitch, he larded them into the jagged crown of the mast. The pitch seemed viscid, but he handled it deftly, fingering it down into the cracks and smoothing it on all sides until he had fashioned a flat butt for the broken stone. Then he reached back to his set rock, snapped a chip from one edge, and tapped the piece into the pitch. Almost without transition the pitch became stone, indistinguishable from the mast's granite. Muttering his satisfaction, he followed his vat back down to the deck. Seven Hand sent several giants swarming up the mast to undo everything which had been rigged to the mast. At the same time, other crew members began binding ropes around the ends of the intact spar and preparing new gear up on the yard. Pitchwife ignored them, turned his attention to the fallen portion of the mast. It had broken into several pieces, but one section was as long as all the rest combined. With pitch and set rock, he formed both ends of this section into flat butts like the new cap of the foremast. Covenant could not see what all this would accomplish, and his need for haste made him restless. After a time he realized that he had not seen Gale Wrath since he had come out on deck. When the dead had been given to the sea, she had gone to some other task. In an effort to keep himself occupied, and to generate some warmth, he tugged his robe tighter and went looking for the store's master. He found her in her particular demean, a worn of holes, water-chests, and storage lockers below decks amidships. The Dramond carried a surprising amount of wood for use both as fuel for the stoves and as raw material for repairs or replacements which could not be readily achieved with stone at sea. Galrath and three other giants were at work in a square hold which served as the ship's carpentry. They were making two large sleds. These were rough constructs with high rails and rude planking, but they looked sturdy, and each was big enough to carry a giant. Two crew members glued and pegged the shells together, while Galrath and the other giant labored at the more difficult chore of carving runners. With files, knives, and hand adzes, they stripped the bark from beams as thick as Covenant's thigh, then slowly shaped the wood to carry weight over ice and snow as easily as possible. The floor was already thick with bark and curlings, and the air smelled of clean resin. But the task was far from being finished. In response to Covenant's question, Galrath replied that to reach Revelstone, Covenant and his company would need more supplies than they could bear on their backs, and the sleds would also transport Covenant and Linden when the terrain permitted the giants to set a pace the humans could not match. Once again Covenant was wanly abashed by the providence of the people who sought to serve him. He had not been able to think farther ahead than the moment when he would leave Starfair's gem. But the giants were concerned about more than the stark question of their ship's survival. He would have died long ago if other people had not taken such care of him. 
his route back toward the upper decks, past the master's cabin. The door was shut, but from within he heard the first's voice, raised in vexation. She was urging Hollenscrave to stay with the Dremond. The master's answering silence was eloquent. As ashamed as an eavesdropper, Covenant hastened away to see what progress Pitchwife and Sevenhand had made. When he gained the foredeck, the sun stood above the gap where the midmast should have been, and the deformed giant's plans were taking shape. Covenant was almost able to guess his intent. Pitchwife had finished the long stone shaft on the deck, and he and Sevenhand were watching as the crew wrestled the one unbroken spar up onto the yard. There they stood the spar against the truncated mast and secured it with loop after loop of cable. For two-thirds of its length the spar reached above the end of the mast. To the upraised tip had been affixed the pulley of a massive block and tackle. Covenant eyed the lashings and the spar distrustfully. "'Is that going to hold?' Pitchwife shrugged as if his arms had become too heavy for him. His voice was husky with fatigue. "'If it does not, the task cannot be accomplished in one day. The spar I can mend.' but the mast we hope to raise must then be broken to smaller fragments which I may bear aloft and wive whole again. He sighed without looking at Covenant. Pray this will hold. The prospect of that labor I do not relish. Wearily, he fell silent. When the tackle had been attached to one flat end of the mast shaft, Pitchwife had prepared. Eight or ten giants lifted the shaft and positioned it below the yard, so that the lines hung as straight as possible in order to minimize the sideward stress on the spar. Creaking in its pulleys, the tackle tightened. Covenant held his breath unconsciously. That spar looked too slender to sustain the granite shaft. But as the ropes strained tighter, and the end of the mast piece lifted, nothing broke. Then the shaft hung straight from the spar, brushing against the bowl of the mast. As the giants pulled slowly on the tow-line of the tackle, the shaft continued to rise. When its butt reached the level of Covenant's head, Pitchwife coughed, Hold! The giants on the tow-line froze. The tackle groaned. The shaft settled slightly as the ropes stretched. But still nothing broke. His hands full of pitch, the deformed giant moved to the shaft and gently covered the butt with an even and heavy layer. Then he retreated to the other side of the mast. A rope dangled near him. When he had carefully cleaned his hands, he gripped it and let the giants on the yard haul him upward. Bracing himself once again within a loop of rope passed around the mast and his back, he labored foot by foot up toward the maimed stump. Alone above the yard, he looked strangely vulnerable, yet he forced himself upward by main strength. Finally he hung at the rim of the mast. For a long moment he did not move, and Covenant found himself panting as if he sought to breathe for the giant, sending Pitchwife strength. The first had come to the foredeck. Her gaze was clenched on her husband. If the spar snapped, only a miracle could save him from being ripped down by falling stone and flying tackle. Then he signaled to the giants below. Sevenhand whispered a command. The crew began to raise the shaft again. Now the bowing of the spar was unmistakable. Covenant could hardly believe that it was still intact. By wary degrees the shaft was drawn upward. Soon its flat crown ascended above Pitchwife's head. Then its butt reached the level of his chest. He looked too weak to support his own weight. But somehow he braced himself, reached out his arms to prevent the shaft from swinging over the end of the mast, from scraping off its layer of pitch or mating crookedly. The giants fisted the lines tighter raised the shaft another foot, then Sevenhand stopped them. Slowly, Pitchwife shifted his position, aligned the stone with a mast. He gave an urgent gasp of readiness. Fervently careful, the giants began to lower the shaft. Alone, he guided it downward. The flat ends met. At once, he thumbed a sliver of set rock into place, and the line separating stone from stone vanished as if it had never existed. The first let relief hiss through her teeth. A raw cheer sprang from the giants as they let the tackle go. The mast stood. It was not as tall as the aftermast, but it was tall enough now to carry a second spar. And two spans of canvas forward 
might give the Dramon the balance it needed to survive. The task was not yet done. The spar had to be attached to the new foremast. But most of the afternoon remained, and the necessary repairs were clearly possible now. Two giants swarmed upward and helped Pitchwife down to the yard, then lowered him to his jubilant comrades. The first greeted him with a hug which looked urgent enough to crack his spine. A jug of diamond draft appeared from somewhere and was pressed into his hands. He drank hugely, and another cheer was raised around him. Weak with relief, Covenant watched them, and let his gratitude for Pitchwife's safety and success wash over him. A moment later Pitchwife emerged from the crowd of giants. He was made unsteady on his feet by exhaustion and sudden diamond draft, but he moved purposefully toward Covenant. He gave the unbeliever a florid bow, which nearly cost him his balance. Then he said, I will rest now, but ere nightfall I will set the spar. That will complete the labor I can do for Starfare's gem. The raw rims of his eyes and the sway of his stance were acute reminders that he had saved the Dramon from sinking before this day's work began. But he was not done. His voice softened as he added, Giant friend, I thank you that you accorded to me this opportunity to be of service to the giant ship. Bright in the sunshine and the reflections of the ice, he turned away. Chuckling at the murmured jests and praise of the crew, he linked arms with the first and left the foredeck like a drunken hero. In spite of his deformed stature, he seemed as tall as any giant. The sight eased Covenant in a way that made his eyes burn. Gratitude loosened his tension. Pitchwife had proved his fear and anger unnecessary. As Sevenhand and his crew went back to work, stringing new tackle so that they could hoist the spar into place against the foremast, Covenant moved away in search of Linden. He wanted to show her what the giant had accomplished, and to apologize for his earlier harshness. He found her almost at once. She was in the galley, asleep like a waif on her pallet. Her dreams made her frown with the solemn concentration of a child, but she showed no sign of awakening. She was still recuperating from the abusive cold of the soul-biter. He let her sleep. The warmth of the galley reminded him of his own chilled weariness. He stretched out on his pallet, intending to rest for a while, and then go back to watch the giants. But as soon as he closed his eyes, his fatigue arose and carried him away. Later, in a period of half-consciousness, he thought he heard singing. At first the songs were ones of gladness and praise of endurance against exigent seas and safe arrival home. But after a while the melodies began to grieve, and the songs became ones of parting, of ships lost and kindred sundered. And through them ran a sound like the crackle of flames, the anguish of a Ka'amora, auguring doom. Covenant had attempted a Ka'amora once, on the headrock of Kirkry, but that bonfire had not been violent enough to touch him. In the night of the unhomed's dismay, he had succored every one but himself. Now, as he sank back into dreams, he thought perhaps a more absolute blaze was needed, a more searching and destructive conflagration. And he knew where to find that fire. He slept like a man who feared to face what was coming. But when he awakened at last, the idea was gone. The way Seesaws and Hearth Coal bustled about their work, suggested that a new day had dawned. Abashed by sleep, he fumbled himself into a sitting position, looked across at Linden's pallet, and saw that it was empty. She and Mistweave were not in the galley, but Kale stood nearby as impassive as if impatience were unknown to him. When Covenant looked at him, the Harochai said, "'You are timely roused, Erlord. The night is past. Those who will sojourn with you ready themselves for departure.' A pang went through Covenant. Ready, he thought. The people around him did everything possible on his behalf. But he was never ready. Struggling to his feet, he accepted the bowl of porridge Hearthcoal offered him, ate as much as his haste could stomach. Then he went to the door Kale held open for him and stepped out into the sharp morning. Again ice glare and sunlight stung his eyes, but he fought them into focus. After a glance at the new foremast, he picked his way across the frozen afterdeck toward the giants thronging near the port rail. Hales greeted him. The crew parted, admitting him to their midst. 
In a moment he found himself at the edge of the deck with Linden and Mistweave, the first and Pitchwife, and Hunnenscrave. Both Linden and Pitchwife looked stronger than they had the previous day, although she avoided Covenant's gaze as if she did not trust him. The first eyed the west with the keenness of a hawk, but Hunnenscrave appeared painfully unsolaced, as though he had spent the long night haunted by his conflicting duties. A glance past the railing showed Covenant that Galrath's sleds had already been set down on the ice. Both were heavily laden, but the sacks and bundles of supplies had been arranged to accommodate at least one passenger in each sled. When she had acknowledged Covenant, the first turned to Sevenhand, Galrath, and the rest of the giants. Now has the time of parting come upon us once more. Her voice rang crisply across the frigid air. The hazard is great, for no longer stands Cable Sea Dreamer's earth sight at the helm of the search. Yet do we pursue our sworn purpose, and for that reason I do not fear. We are mortal, and the visage of failure is heinous to us. But we are not required to succeed. It is required of us only that we hold fast in every gale, and let come what may. On all the seas of the world there are none better for this work than you who remain with Starfare's gem. How, then, should I be afraid? This only do I charge you. When the ice uncloses, come after us. Sail to that littoral which you know, to Sea Reach and brave Kirkry, the Grieve. If there we fail to meet you or send word, then the search falls to you. Do what you must, and do not fear. While one valiant heart yet defends the earth, evil can never triumph utterly. Then she stopped, looked down at Pitchwife as if she were surprised by her own words. For answer, he gave her a gleam of pure pleasure. Seven Hand's eyes reflected hints of the cunning skill which had saved Starfare's gem from the warships of the Breath Air. Galrath glowered stolidly at the future as though it had no power to daunt her. Weary and imperiled though they were, the crew members held up their heads and let their pride shine. Covenant suddenly did not know how he could bear to leave them. But he had to. The first started down the ladder with Pitchwife behind her, and Covenant had no choice. They were not responsible for the earth's peril, but their lives were at stake as much as his. When Kale offered him the ladder, he gestured the Harachai ahead to catch him if he fell. Then he stooped through the railing, set his numb feet into the rungs, and fought his vertigo and his cold bones downward. The ice felt as dead as the nerves of his souls, and in the shadow of the giant ship the breeze was as sharp as the sea. But he strode and slipped across the treacherous surface to one of the sleds. Linden followed him, her hair fluttering like the banner of her determination. Then came Mistweave, still stubborn in his resolve to serve the Chosen. Hunnenscrave was last. He seemed hardly able to refrain from giving Galrath and Sevenhand a host of unnecessary final instructions but after a moment of silence, like a mute cry, he wrenched himself away from his ship and joined the company. Abruptly, several giants shifted out of Vane's way as he approached the rail. He vaulted over the side, landed lightly on the ice, and at once resumed his characteristic immobility, his black orbs gazing at nothing. A shadow glided out of the air. Findale melted back into his human form near Vane as if he and the demon Dimspawn belonged to each other. Obeying the first's murmured instructions, Covenant climbed into one of the sleds, sat down among the supplies. Linden settled herself in the other sled. Ponnenscrave and Mistweave picked up the leads, harnessed themselves into the lines. The first and Pitchwife went to the fore. Kale stood between the sleds. Vane and Findale brought up the rear. Runners crunched against the ice as Covenant and his companions left the giant ship in search of hope. Sixty-three days had passed since they had said farewell to Sunder and Hallian and Sea Reach. They were at least eighteen score leagues from Revelstone. 5. Landward The first set a rapid pace. Steam panted from Hunnan's craves and Mistweave's lungs as they hauled the sleds along. But they did not hang back. 
All the giants were eager to get out of sight of the Drummond, to put behind them their crippled vessel and imperiled people. The runners of the sleds pounded through hollows in the ice, hit and slewed across pressure ridges. Covenant and Linden were tossed ungently from side to side among the supplies, but Linden clung to the rails, made no protest, and Covenant wanted every stride of speed the giants could attain. The land and Lord Fowl had taught him many things, but he had never learned how to leave behind friends who needed him. Hunching down into the heavy robes and blankets he had been given, he kept his face turned blear-eyed and cold-bitten toward the west, and let Hunnan's crave draw him at a hungry trot into the white wilderland. Yet at last the thought of what he was doing impelled him to look back toward the Drummond. Stark in the distance beyond Vane and Findale, the vessel shrank as if it were being slowly swallowed by the bleak flow, and the sight of its abandonment stuck in his throat. But then he described the pennon flying from the aftermast. Sevenhan must have raised it as a salute to the departing company. Vivid with color and jaunty in the wind, it captured for a moment the spirit of Starfare's gem like a promise of valor and endurance. When Covenant's vision became too blurred to make out the giant ship any longer, he was able to face forward again and let the stone vessel go. Lyndon studied him across the gap between their sleds but he had nothing to say to her which would support being shouted over the hard scrunching of the runners, the rhythmic thud of the giant's feet, and the gasp of their breathing. Once again he was being borne toward his goal and his fear, not by any effort of his own, but by the exertions of people who cared about him. At every crisis along his way it was the same. For all his passion and power he would have come to nothing without help. And what recompense did he make for that help? only pain and peril, and at least one lie, nothing more. But that was not something which his sore heart could cry out under these conditions, under the bitter blue of the sky and the gazes of his companions. They were traveling due west. When they had left the vantage of Starfare's gem, a strip of open water had still been visible against the southern horizon, and they could be certain that the closer they went to the sea the less reliable the flow would become. Under the circumstances, Covenant only hoped that they would not be forced northward to find a safe passage. The first had pushed several paces ahead of her companions to watch for flaws and fissures in the frozen expanse. Behind her trotted Pitchwife. Though he bore no burden except his own deformation, his gait betrayed that he was already being pressed to his limits. By comparison, Mistweave and Hunnan's Grave appeared able to sustain this speed for days, dragging the heavy sleds behind them and never faltering. And Kale was another Harachai, born to ice and arduous survival. Only the vapor that plumed from his nostrils and the white crystals which formed along his cheeks showed that he was breathing more deeply than usual. As for Vane and Findale, they moved as though the long trek ahead meant nothing to them. Vane's wooden forearm dangled uselessly from his elbow, but in every other way he remained the structurally immaculate enigma which the Irviles had created for their own secret reasons, and the appointed had long since demonstrated his conclusive immunity to any physical peril or stress. Around them the plain of ice seemed featureless and devoid of any content except cold to the edges of the world. The sun came down hard on the white flow, making the ice glare, forcing Covenant to squint until his temples throbbed, and the cold soaked into him through every fold and clasp of his coverings. The beat of the giant's feet and the expulsion of their breath marked out the frigid silence. The sled jostled him incessantly against a bundle of firewood packed beside him. Grimly he hugged his blankets and huddled into himself. The first's fall took him by surprise. She was nothing more than a gray blur across his disfocused stare as she stepped into a fissure. Scattering snow, she plunged heavily forward. Her chest struck the rim of the break. For an instant she scrabbled frantically at the edge, then dropped out of sight. Pitchwife was four or five strides behind her, but immediately he dove after her, skidding headlong to snatch at her disappearing arms. He was too late, and he could not stop himself. In a flurry of limbs and snow he toppled after his wife. Slewing over the slick surface, Hanan's Crave and Mistweave wheeled the sleds to a halt. The one bearing Linden was nearly overturned, but Kale caught it slammed it back onto its runners. Covenant 
pitched out of his sled, landed on the ice, lurched to his feet. Ahead of him, the master and Mist Weave wrestled at the bindings which harnessed them to their burdens. Findale and Vane had stopped, but Kale was already halfway to the fissure. Covenant and the giants reached the rim together, with Lyndon a scant step behind them. Kale stood there gazing downward as if he had forgotten urgency. The first and pitchwife hung a few feet below the edge. The fissure was only a little wider than her shoulders, and she had clamped herself between the walls, holding her position by main strength. Pitchwife's arms clasped her hips. He dangled awkwardly between her thighs. Below his feet, the snow which had fallen into the fissure became gray slush as the sea absorbed it. He jerked a glance upward. Stone and sea, he gasped. Make haste. But the master and Mistweave were not slow. Hunnensgrave threw himself flat on the ice with his head and shoulders over the rim. Mistweave braced the master's legs, and Hunnensgrave reached down to take hold of the first. In a moment she scrambled out of the fissure, towing Pitchwife after her. Her stern visage showed no reaction, but Pitchwife was breathing hard and his gnarled hands trembled. Stone and sea, he panted again. I am a giant and love an eventful journey, but such happenings are not altogether to my taste. Then a chuckle of relief came steaming between his bared teeth. Also, I am somewhat abashed. I sought to rescue my wife, and it was she who caught my own fall. The first rested a hand lightly on his shoulder. Mayhap, if you were less impetuous in your rescuing— but as she turned to Hunnenscrave, her voice stiffened. "'Master, it is my thought that we must bend our way somewhat northward. This ice is not safe.' "'Aye,' he growled. Ever since he had been forced to the realization that the company would have to leave Starfair's gem, he had not been able to stifle the undertone of bitterness in his voice. "'But that way is longer, and we are in haste. North of the ice will be not so easily travelled and this north is perilous, as you know. The first nodded reluctantly. After a moment she let out a long sigh and straightened her back. Very well, she said. Let us attempt the west again. When no one moved, she gestured Covenant and Linden back to the sleds. Linden turned to walk beside Covenant. Her face was red with cold and severe with concentration. In a flat, quiet voice she asked, why is this north perilous? He shook his head. I don't know. The scars on his right forearm itched in reaction to the first's fall and the suggestion of other hazards. I've never been north of Revelstone and Kirkry. He did not want to think about nameless dangers. The cold was already too much for him, and he could not figure out how the company was going to get across the fissure. But that problem was simply solved. While he and Lyndon climbed into their sleds, the first and pitchwife leaped the gap. Then Hunnenscrave and Mistweave drew the sleds to the rim of the crack. There Covenant saw that the sleds were long enough to span the fissure. Hunnenscrave and Mistweave pushed them out over the gap. The first and pitchwife pulled them across. When the rest of the company had passed the crack, Hunnenscrave and Mistweave slipped their arms into the harness again, and the first went on her way westward. Now she set a slower pace, in part for caution and in part to accommodate Pitchwife's weariness. Still her speed was greater than any covenant could have matched a foot. The ice seemed to rush, jolting and skidding, under the runners of the sled. But whenever she saw something she distrusted, she dropped to a walk and probed ahead with her longsword until she was sure that the ground was safe. For the rest of the morning her care proved unnecessary, but shortly after the company had paused for a brief meal and a few warming swallows of diamond draft, the point of her sword bit into the crust, and several hundred feet of packed snow along a thin line to the north and south fell from sight. This fissure also was easily crossed. But when the companions gained the far side, the first faced Hunnan's crave again and said, It is too much. This ice grows fragile beneath us. The master breathed a curse through his frosted beard. Yet he did not demur when the leader of the search turned toward the northwest and thicker ice. For most of the afternoon the flow remained flat, snow-brushed, and unreliable. From time to time Covenant sensed that the surface was sloping upward, but the brightness of the sun on the white landscape made him unsure of what he saw. Although he sipped diamond draft at intervals, the cold sank deeper into his bones. 
His face felt like beaten metal. Gradually he drifted into reveries of conflagration. Whenever he became drowsy with liquor and chill, he found himself half-dreaming wild magic as if it were lovely and desirable. Flame sufficient to tear down Kemper's pitch. Passion powerful enough to contend with the worm of the world's end. Venom capable of subsuming everything in its delirium. That fire was vital and seductive, and as necessary as blood. He would never be able to give it up. But such dreams led him to places where he did not want to go. To the scream which had nearly torn out his heart when Lyndon had told him the truth of the venom and the worm. And to that other fire which lay hidden at the roots of his need. To the Kamora, which he had always failed to find, though his soul depended on it. Urgent with alarm, he repeatedly fought his way back from the brink of true sleep. And the last time he did so, he was surprised to see that the north was no longer blank. The first path angled toward a ridge of tremendous ice chunks. Piled into the sky, they reached out for the horizons, east and west. Although the sun was near setting, it was far down in the south, and did not blind him, but rather shone full and faintly pink on the ridge, making the ice appear as unbreachable as a glacier. Here the first turn toward the west again, keeping as close to the base of the ridge as possible without sacrificing a clear route for the sleds. But in her way boulders and monoliths they like meniers, where they had rolled or fallen from the violence which had riven the ice. She was forced to slow her pace again as the difficulty of the terrain increased. Nevertheless, her goal had been achieved. The surface which supported that ridge was unlikely to crack or crumble under the pressure of the company's passage. As the sun sank, vermilion and fatal, into the west, the travelers halted for the night. Pitchwife slumped to the ice and sat there with his head in his hands, too tired even to talk. Covenant and Lyndon climbed stiffly from their sleds and walked back and forth, rubbing their arms and stamping their feet, while Mistweave and Hunnensgrave made camp. Hunnensgrave unpacked sections of heavily tarred canvas to use as ground sheets, then laid more blankets. Mistweave unloaded Lyndon's sled until he had uncovered a large flat rectangle of stone. This he set out as a base on which to build a fire, so that melting ice would not wet the wood. To no one in particular, the first announced her estimate that the company had come more than twenty leagues. Then she fell silent. When Mistweave had a crisp blaze going, Pitchwife struggled to his feet, rubbed the frost from his face, and went to do the cooking. As he worked, he muttered indistinctly to himself as if the sound of some voice, his own if no one else's, were necessary to his courage. Shortly he had produced a thick stew for his companions, but still the pall of the waste hung over them, and no one spoke. After supper, Pitchwife went to sleep almost at once, hugging his ground sheet about him. The first sat sternly beside the fire and toyed with the faggots, as though she did not want to reconsider her decisions. As determined as ever to emulate the devotion of the Harachai, Mistweave joined Kale standing watch over the company, and Hanan's crave stared at nothing, met no one's eyes. His orbs were hidden under the weight of his brows, and his face looked drawn and gaunt. Lyndon paced tensely near the fire as if she wanted to talk to someone. But Covenant was absorbed by his visceral yearning for the heat of white flame. The effort of denial left him nothing to say. The silence became as cold and lonely as the ice. After a time he gathered his blankets and followed Pitchwife's example, wrapping himself tightly in his ground sheet. He thought he would be able to sleep if only because the cold was so pervasive. But Lyndon made her bed near his, and soon he felt her watching him as if she thought to fathom his isolation. When he opened his eyes, he saw the look of intention in her firelit face. Her gaze was focused on him like an appeal, but the words she murmured softly took him by surprise. I never even learned her name. Covenant raised his head, blinked his incomprehension at her. That giant, she explained, the one who was hurt when the foremast broke, the one she had healed with his ring. I never found out who she was. I've been doing that all my life, treating people as if they were pieces of sick or damaged meat instead of actual individuals. I thought I was a doctor, but it was only the disease or the hurt I cared about, only the fight against death, not the person. He gave her the best answer he had. Is that bad? 
he recognized the attitude she described. You aren't God. You can't help people because of who they are. You can only help them because they're hurt and they need you. Deliberately, he concluded. Otherwise, you would have let Mistweave die. Covenant. Now her tone was aimed at him as squarely as her gaze. At some point, you're going to have to deal with me. With who I am. We've been lovers. I've never stopped loving you. It hurts that you lied to me, that you let me believe something that wasn't true. Let me believe we had a future together. But I haven't stopped loving you. Low flames from the campfire glistened out of the dampness in her eyes. Yet she was resolutely unemotional, sparing him her recrimination or sorrow. I think the only reason you loved me was because I was hurt. You loved me because of my parents, not because of who I am. Abruptly, she rolled onto her back, covered her face with her hands. Need muffled the self-control of her whisper. Maybe that kind of love is wonderful and altruistic. I don't know. But it isn't enough. Covenant looked at her, at the hands clasped over her pain, and the hair curling around her ear, and thought, Have to deal with you. Have to. But he could not. He did not know how. Since the loss of the one tree, their positions had been reversed. Now it was she who knew what she wanted. He who was lost. Above him the stars glittered out their long bereavement. But for them also he did not know what to do. When he awakened in the early dawn, he discovered that Hunnan's crate was gone. A wind had come up. Accumulated snow gusted away over the half-buried remains of the campfire as Covenant thrashed out of his blankets at ground sheet. The first, Pitchwife and Lyndon, were still asleep. Mistweave lay felled in his canvas cover, as if during the night his desire to match Kale had suffered a defeat. Only Kale, the demon dim spawn, and Findale were on their feet. Covenant turned to Kale. Where? In response, Kale nodded upward. Quickly, Covenant scanned the massive chaos of the ridge. For a moment, he missed the place Kale had indicated. But then his gaze leaped to the highest point above the camp, and there he saw Hanan's grave. The master sat atop a small tor of ice with his back to the south and the company. The wind tumbled down off the crest into Covenant's face, bringing with it a faint smell of smoke. Blood and damnation. Grimly, Covenant demanded, What in hell does he think he's doing? But he already knew the answer. Kale's reply only confirmed it. Some while since, he arose and assayed the ice, promising a prompt return. With him he bore wood and a fire-pot such as the giants use. Kaamora. Hanan's grave was trying to burn away his grief. At the sound of Kale's voice, the first looked up from her bed, an inquiry in her eyes. Covenant found suddenly that he could not open his throat. Mutely he directed the first's gaze up at Hanan's grave. When she saw the master, she rasped a curse and sprang to her feet. Awakening Pitchwife with a slap of her hand, she asked Covenant and Kale how long Hunnan's crave had been gone. Inflexibly, the Harochai repeated what he had told Covenant. Stone and see, she snarled as Pitchwife, and then Lyndon arose to join her. Has he forgotten his own words? This north is perilous. Pitchwife squinted apprehensively up at Hunnan's crave but his words were reassuring. The master is a giant. He is equal to the peril, and his heart has found no relief from Keeble Sea Dreamer's end. Perchance, in this way, he will gain peace. The first glared at him, but she did not call Hunnan's grave down from his perch. Eyes glazed with sleep and vision, Lyndon gazed up at the master and said nothing. Shortly Hunnan's grave rose to his feet, Passing beyond the crest, he found his way downward. Soon he emerged from a nearby valley and came woodenly toward the company. His hands swung at his sides. As he neared the camp, Covenant saw that they had been scoured raw by fire. When he reached his companions, he stopped, raised his hands before him like a gesture of futility. His gaze was shrouded. His fingers were essentially undamaged, but the after-effects of his pain were vivid. Lyndon hugged her own hands under her arms in instinctive empathy. The first's voice was uncharacteristically gentle. 
Is it well with you, Grimmond Hunnenscrave? He shook his head in simple bafflement. It does not suffice. Naught suffices. It burns in my breast, and will not burn out. Then, as if the will which held him upright had broken, he dropped to his knees and thrust his hands into a drift of snow. Tattered wisps of steam rose around his wrists. Dumb with helpless concern, the giants stood around him. Linden bit her lips. The wind drew a cold scud across the ice, and the air was sharp with rue. Covenant's eyes blurred and ran. In self-defense there were many things for which he could claim he was not culpable, but Sea Dreamer's death was not among them. At last the first spoke. "'Come, Master,' she breathed thickly. "'Arise and be about your work. We must hope or die.' "'Hope or die.' Kneeling on the frozen waist, Hanan's crave looked like he had lost his way between those choices. But then slowly he gathered his legs under him, stretched his tall frame erect. His eyes had hardened, and his visage was rigid and ominous. For a moment he stood still, let all the company witness the manner in which he bore himself. Then without a word he went and began to break camp. Covenant caught a glimpse of the distress in Lyndon's gaze, but when she met his look of inquiry she shook her head unable to articulate what she had perceived in Hunnensgrave. Together they followed the master's example. While Hunnensgrave packed the canvas and bedding, Mistweave set out a cold breakfast. His red-rimmed eyes and weary demeanor held a cast of abashment. He was a giant, and not expected Kale's endurance to be greater than his. Now he appeared determined to work harder in compensation and in support of Hunnensgrave. While Covenant, Linden, and the other giants ate. Mistweave toiled about the camp, readying everything for departure. As Covenant and Linden settled into their sleds, bundled themselves against the mounting edge of the wind, the first addressed Hanan's crave once more. She spoke softly, and the wind frayed away the sound of her voice. From the vantage of your Kaamora saw you any sign. His new hardness made his reply sound oddly brutal. None. He and Mistweave shrugged themselves into the lines of the sleds. The first and Pitchwife went ahead, with Kale between the sleds and Vane and Findale in the rear the company set off. Their progress was not as swift as it had been the previous day. The increased difficulty of the terrain was complicated by the air pouring and gusting down from the ridge. Fists full of ice crystals rattled against the wood of the sleds, stung the faces of the travelers. White plumes and devils danced among the company. The edges of the landscape ached in the wind. Diamond draft and food formed a core of sustenance within him, but failed to spread any warmth into his limbs. He did not know how long he could hold out against the alluring and fatal somnolence of the cold. The next time he rubbed the ice from his lashes and raised his head, he found that he had not held out. Half the morning was gone. Unwittingly he had drifted into the passive stupor by which winter and leprosy snared their victims. Linden was sitting upright in her sled. Her head shifted tensely from side to side as if she were searching. For a groggy instant Covenant thought that she was using her senses to probe the safety of the ice, but then she wrenched forward, and her voice snapped over the waist, Stop! Echoes rode eerily back along the wind, Stop! Stop! But ice and cold changed the tone of her shout, made it sound as forlorn as a cry raised from the soul-biter. At once the first turned to meet the sleds. They halted immediately below a pile of broken ice like the rubble of a tremendous fortress reduced by siege. Megalithic blocks and shards towered and loomed as if they were leaning to fall on the company. Linden scrambled out of her sled. Before anyone could ask her what she wanted, she coughed, It's getting colder! The first and pitchwife glanced at each other. Covenant moved to stand beside Linden, though he did not comprehend her. After a moment the first said, "'Cold or chosen? We do not feel it.' "'I don't mean the winter,' Linden began at once, urgent to be understood. "'It's not the same.' Then she caught herself, straightened her shoulders. Slowly and sharply, she said, "'You don't feel it, but I tell you it's there. It's making the air colder, not ice, not wind, not winter. Something else.' Her lips were blue and trembling. Something dangerous. And this north is perilous, Covenant thought dully, as if the chill made him stupid. What kind of peril? 
but when he opened his mouth no words came. Hanans Crave's head jerked up. Pitchwife's eyes glared white in his misshaped face. At the same instant, the first barked, Argul, and sprang at Covenant and Linden. Thrusting them toward the sleds, she shouted, We must flee! Then she wheeled to scan the region. Covenant lost his footing, skidded into Kale's grasp. The Harochai flipped him unceremoniously onto his sled. Linden vaulted to her place. At once Hunnan's Crave and Mistweave heaved the sleds forward as quickly as the slick surface allowed. Before they had taken three strides, the ice a stone's throw ahead rose up and came toward them. The moving shape was as wide as the height of a giant, as thick as the reach of Covenant's arms. Short legs bore it forward with deceptive speed. Dark gaps around its edge looked like maws. Cold radiated from it like a shout. The first slid to a halt, planted herself on the path of the creature. Argul, she cried. Avoid! Pitchwife's answering yell snatched her around. His arm flailed a gesture toward the ridge. Argula! Two more creatures, like the first, had detached themselves from the rubble and were rushing toward the company. In the south appeared a fourth. Together they emitted cold as fierce as the cruel heart of winter. For an instant the first froze. Her protest carried lornly across the wind. But the Argula do not act thus. Abruptly, Findale melted into a hawk and flew away. Hanan's crave roared a command. Westward! He was the master of Starfare's gem, trained for emergencies. With a wrench that threw Covenant backward, he hauled his sled into motion. We must break past. Mistweave followed. As he labored for speed, he called over his shoulder to Linden. Do not fear. We are giants, proof against cold. The next moment the Argula attacked. The creature approaching the first stopped. At Pitchwife's warning shout she whirled to face the Argul, but it did not advance. Instead it waved one of its legs. From the arc of the gesture the air suddenly condensed into a web of ice. Expanding and thickening as it moved, the web sailed toward the first like a hunter's net. Before it reached her it grew huge and heavy enough to snare even a giant. At the same time the Argul, coming from the south, halted, settled itself as though it were burrowing into the waste. Then violence boomed beneath it, ice shattered in all directions, and a crack sprang through the surface, ran like lightning toward the company. In the space between one heartbeat and another the crack became as wide as the sleds. It passed directly under Vane. The demon dim spawn disappeared so quickly that Covenant did not see him fall. Instinctively Covenant turned to look toward the other two Argula. They were almost close enough to launch their assaults. The sled lurched as Hunnan's grave accelerated. Covenant faced again toward the first. The web of ice was dropping over her head. Pitchwife struggled toward her, but his feet could not hold the treacherous surface. Kale sped lightly past him, as if the Harochai were as sure-footed as a runny hen. The first defended herself without her sword. As the web descended, she chopped at it with her left arm. It broke in a blizzard of splinters that caught the light like instant chiaroscuro, and then rattled faintly away along the wind. But her arm came down encased by translucent ice. It covered her limb halfway to the shoulder, immobilized her elbow and hand. Fiercely she hammered at the sheath with her right fist, but the ice clung to her like iron. The sleds gained momentum. Nearing the first, Hanan's grave and Mistwee veered to the side in an effort to bypass the Argul. The crack which had swallowed Vane faded toward the north. Findale was nowhere to be seen. Linden clutched the rail of her sled, a soundless cry stretched over her face. Kale dashed past the first to challenge her assailant. As one, she and Pitchwife shouted after him, No! He ignored them. Straight at the creature he aimed his Harachai's strength. Before he could strike, the Argul bobbed as if it were bowing. Instantly a great hand of ice slapped down on him out of the empty air. It pounded him flat, snatched him under the bulk of the creature. Covenant fought to stand in the slewing sled. Kale's fall went through him like an auger. The landscape was as white and ruined as wild magic. When his heart beat again he was translated into fire. Power drove down through him, anchored him. Flame as hot as a furnace, as vicious as venom, cocked back his half-fist to hurl destruction at the Argul. 
There a web flung by one of the trailing creatures caught him. The two Argola from the north had changed direction to pursue the company. Then one of them had stopped to attack. The snare did not entirely reach him, but its leading edge struck the right side of his head, licked for an instant over his shoulder, snapped on his upraised fist. Wild magic pulverized the ice. Nothing was left to encase him, but an immense force of cold slammed straight into his brain. Instantly paralysis locked itself around him. He saw what was happening. Every event registered on him, but he was stunned and helpless, lost in a feral chill. While Hanenskrave and Mistweave fought the sleds sideward to avoid the Argul, the first sprang to Kale's aid with Pitchwife behind her. The creature sought to retreat, but she moved too swiftly. Bracing itself, it repeated the bow which had captured Kale. Her left arm was useless to her, but she ignored the handicap. Fury and need impelled her. As the Argul raised its ice, she put her whole body into one blow and struck the creature squarely with all the giantish might of her good fist. The Argul shattered under the impact. The boom of its destruction echoed off the towering ridge. Amid volleying thunder, the sleds rushed past the first. She whirled to face the pursuing Argola. Pitchwife dove wild into the remains of the creature. For an instant, he threw chunks and chips aside. Then he emerged, wearing frost and ice powder as though even in death the Argul nearly had the capacity to freeze him. In his arms he bore Kale. From head to foot the Harachai was sheathed like the first's left arm in pure ice, bound rigid as if he were frozen past all redemption. Carrying him urgently, Pitchwife sped after the sleds. The first snatched up a white shard, hurled at the Argula to make them hesitate. Then she followed the company. In response, the creatures squatted against the ice, and cracks like cries of frustration and hunger shot through the flow, gaping jaggedly after the travelers. For a moment, the first had to skid and dodge across a ground that was falling apart under her. Then she missed her footing, fell, and rolled out of the path of the attack. The cracks searched on for the company, but the sleds were nearly out of range. The first regained her feet. Soon she, too, was beyond the reach of the Argola. Covenant saw her come running up behind Pitchwife, clapping him encouragingly on the shoulder. Pitchwife panted in great raw gasps as he strove to sustain his pace. The misshaping of his back made him appear to huddle protectively over Kale. Kale's scar was unnaturally distinct, amplified by the translucence of his casing. He was the last of the Harochai who had promised themselves to Covenant, and Covenant still could not break the cold which clenched his mind. All hope of fire was gone. Linden was shouting to the first, We've got to stop. Kale needs help. You need help. Hunnensgrave and Mistweave did not slacken their pace. The first returned, Should the Argula again draw nigh, will you perceive them? Yes, Linden shot back. Now that I know what they are. Her tone was hard, certain. We've got to stop. I don't know how long he can stay alive like that. The first nodded. Master, she barked, we must halt. At once, Hunnens Crave and Mistweave shortened their strides, let the sleds drag themselves to a standstill. Pitchwife managed a few more steps, then stumbled to his knees in a low bowl of snow. The wind whipped flurries around him. His breathing rattled hoarsely as he hunched over Kale, hugging the Harochai as if he sought to warm Kale with his own life. Linden leaped from her sled before it stopped moving, caught her balance, and hastened to Pitchwife's side. But Covenant remained frozen while Hanenscrave and Mistweave drew the sleds around to Pitchwife, Kale, Linden, and the first. Vane stood there as well. Covenant had not seen the demondom spawn arrive, did not know how he had escaped. Bits of ice clung to his tattered apparel, but his black form was unscathed. He did not breathe, and his midnight eyes were focused on nothing. Pitchwife set Kale down. Linden knelt beside the Harochai, searched him with her eyes, then touched her fingers to his case. At once, pain hissed between her teeth. When she snatched back her hands, her fingertips left small patches of skin on the ice. Bright in the sunlight, red droplets oozed from her torn flesh. Damn it, she rasped, more frightened and angry than hurt. That's cold. Raising her head to the first, she shivered. You obviously know something about these Argula. You know how to treat this? 
In reply, the first drew her falchion. Gripping it above her head, she brought its hilt down hard on the crust which locked her left arm. The ice broke and fell away, leaving her limb free, the skin undamaged. Stiffly she flexed her hand and wrist. A wince touched her face, but she changed it to a skull. See you? We are giants. Proof against cold as against fire. Requiring no other unction. We have learned none. Her glare suggested that she deemed this ignorance to be a kind of failure. But Lyndon had no time for failure. We can't do that to him, she muttered, thinking aloud. We'd break half his bones. She peered closely at Kale to confirm her perceptions. He's still alive, but he won't last long. Red tipped, her fingers moved as if she had already forgotten their hurt. We need fire. Then she looked toward Covenant. At the sight of him her eyes went wide with shock and fear. She had not realized that he had been hit by the cold of the Argula. It felt like a numb nail, driven through the side of his head, impaling his mind painlessly, and it was slowly working its way deeper. His left eye had gone blind. Most of the nerves on his left side were as dead as leprosy. He wanted to cry out for help, but no longer knew how. From out of nowhere Findale appeared. Regaining his abused human shape, he placed himself at the fringes of the company and fixed his attention on Lyndon. Ice muffled whatever she was saying. Covenant could not bear it. He did not want to die like this. Mad protests surged through him. All winter was his enemy. Every league and ridge of the flow was an attack against him. From the pit of his dismay, he brought up flame and venom as if he meant to rid the earth of all cold forever, tear time from its foundations in order to shear away the gelid death which locked his brain. But then there was another presence in him. It was alien and severe, desperate with alarm, and yet he found it strangely comforting. He struggled instinctively when it took his flame from him, but the cold and his impercipience made his strivings pointless, and the intrusion, an external identity which somehow inhabited his mind as if he had let down all his defenses, gave him warmth in return, the warmth of its own strict desire for him and the heat of his fire combined. For a moment he thought he knew that other presence, recognized it intimately, then the world turned into white magic and passion, and the cold fled. A few heartbeats later his eyes squeezed back into focus, and he found himself on his hands and knees. Lyndon had withdrawn from him, leaving behind an ache of absence, as if she had opened a door which enabled him to see how empty his heart was without her. Dull bereavement throbbed in his right forearm. But his ring still hung on the last finger of his half-hand. The wind sent chills ruffling through his clothes. The sun shone as if the desecration of the sunbane would never be healed. He had failed again, and proved once more that she— This time she had simply reached into him and taken possession. There was no difference between that and what Lord Fowle had done to Joan, what he was doing to the land. No difference except the difference between Lyndon herself and the despiser and Gibbon Raver had promised that she would destroy the earth. She had the power to fulfill that prophecy now. She could take it whenever she wanted it. Urgent grief came over him, grief for both of them, for himself in his doomed inefficacy, for her in her dire plight. He feared he would weep aloud. But then the wind's flat rush was punctuated by hoarse, hard breathing, and that sound restored his awareness of his companions. The ice which had held the Harochai was gone, and Kale was coming back to life the hard way, fighting for every breath, resting each inhalation with bared teeth from the near death of cold. Even the mere wives had not so nearly slain him, but Lyndon had restored him to the verge of survival. As Covenant watched, Kale carried himself the rest of the distance. Hanenscrave, Mistweave, and the First studied Kale and Lyndon and Covenant with concern and apprehension, mixed together in their faces. Pitchwife had mastered his own gasping enough to grin like a grimace, but Lyndon had eyes only for Covenant. She was wan with dismay at what she had done. From the first her loathing for possession had been even greater than his, yet the necessity of it was thrust upon her time and again. She was forced 
to evil by the fundamental commitments which had made her a physician. And how was she forced, he asked himself, by her lack of power? If she were given his ring, as the Elohim desired, she would be saved the peril of this damnation. He could not do it. Anything else. He would do anything else, but not this. More than once she had challenged his protective instincts, protected his desire to spare her. But how could he have explained that everything else, every other attempt at protection or preservation, was nothing more than an effort to pay for this one refusal, to give her something in compensation for what he would not give? Now he did it again. Ice gnawed and frost burned, though he was, leprous, poisoned, and beaten. He wrenched his courage to its feet and faced her squarely. Swallowing grief, he said thickly, I hope I didn't hurt anybody. It was not much, but for the time being it was enough. Her distress softened as if he had made a gesture of forgiveness. A crooked smile took the severity from her lips. Blinking at sudden tears, she murmured, You're hard to handle. The first time I saw you, he remembered the moment as well as she did. He had slammed his door in her face. I knew you were going to give me trouble. The love in her voice made him groan because he could not go to her and put his arms around her, not as long as he refused to make the one sacrifice she truly needed. At her back, Mistweave had unpacked a pouch of diamond draft. When he handed it to her, she forced her attention away from Covenant and knelt to Kale. Between heaving respirations, the Harochai took several sips of the tonic liquor. After that, his condition improved rapidly. While his companions shared the pouch, he recovered enough strength to sit up, then to regain his feet. In spite of its flatness, his expression seemed oddly abashed. His pride did not know how to sustain the fact of defeat. But after his experience with the seduction of the mirwives, he appeared to place less importance on his self-esteem. Or perhaps Bryn's promise— that Kale would eventually be free to follow his heart, had somehow altered the characteristic Harochai determination to succeed or die. In a moment Kale's visage was as devoid of inflection as ever. When he indicated that he was ready to travel again, his word carried conviction. No one demurred. At a wry glance from Pitchwife, however, the first announced that the company would eat a meal before going on. Kale appeared to think that such a delay was unnecessary yet he accepted the opportunity for more rest. While the companions ate, Lyndon remained tense. She consumed her rations as if she were chewing fears and speculations, trying to find her way through them. But when she spoke, her question showed that she had found not an answer, but a distraction. She asked the first, "'How much do you know about those Argulae?' "'Our knowledge is scant,' replied the sword main. She seemed unsure of the direction of Lyndon's inquiry. Upon rare occasions, giants have encountered Argula, and there are tales which concern them. But together such stories and encounters yield little. Then why did you risk it? Lyndon pursued. Why did we come this far north? Now the first understood. Mayhap I erred, she said in an uncompromising tone. The southern ice was uncertain, and I sought safer passage. The hazard of the Argula I accepted because we are giants, not readily slain or harmed by cold. It was my thought that four giants would suffice to ward you. Moreover, she went on more harshly, I was misled in my knowledge. Folly, she muttered to herself. Knowledge is chimera, for beyond it ever lies other knowledge and the incompleteness of what is known renders the knowing false. It was our knowledge that Argolat do not act thus. They are savage creatures, as dire of hate as the winter in which they thrive, and their hate is not solely for the beasts and beings of blood and warmth which form their prey, but is also for their own kind. In the tales we have heard and the experience of our people, it is plain that the surest defense against the assault of one Argul is the assault of a second, for they will prefer each other's deaths above any other. Therefore, the first growled, did I believe this north to be the lesser peril. Against any Argu, four giants must surely be counted a sufficient company. I did not know, she concluded, that despite all likelihood and nature, 
they had set aside their confirmed animosity to act in concert. Linden stared across the waste. Hanan's crave watched the knot of his hands as if he feared it would not hold. After a moment, Covenant cleared his throat and asked, Why? In the land, the law of nature was being steadily corrupted by the sunbane. Had Lord Fowl's influence reached this far? Why would they change? I know not, the first said sourly. They would have believed the substance of stone and sea to be more easily altered than the hate of the Argula. Covenant groaned inwardly. He was still hundreds of leagues from Revelstone, and yet his fears were harrying him forward as if he and his companions had already entered the ambit of the despiser's malice. Abruptly, Linden leapt to her feet, faced the east. She gauged the distance, then rasped, They're coming. I thought they'd give up. But apparently cooperation isn't the only new trick they've learned. Hunnenscrave spat a giantish obscenity. The first gestured him and Mistweave toward the sleds, then helped Pitchwife upright. Quickly, the master and Mistweave packed and reloaded the supplies. Covenant was cursing to himself. He wanted a chance to talk to Lyndon privately, but he followed her tense example and climbed back into his sled. The first took the lead. In an effort to outdistance the pursuit, she set the best pace Pitchwife could maintain, pushing him to his already worn limits. Yet Kale trotted between Covenant and Lyndon as if he were fully recovered. Vane and Findale brought up the rear together, shadowing each other across the wind-cut wilderness. That night the company obtained little rest, though Pitchwife needed it urgently. Shortly after moonrise, Kale's native caution impelled him to rouse Linden, and when she had tasted the air, she sent the company scrambling for the sleds. The moon was only three days past its full, and the sky remained clear, the first was able to find a path with relative ease, but she was held back by Pitchwife's exhaustion. He could not move faster than a walk without her support, and in an effort to shore up his strength he had consumed so much diamond draft that he was not entirely sober. At intervals he began to sing lugubriously under his breath, as though he were lunatic with fatigue. Somehow the companions kept a safe distance between themselves and the Argula, but they were unable to increase their lead. And when the sun rose over the wasted ice, they found themselves in worse trouble. They were coming to the end of the flow. During the night they had entered a region where the ice to the south became progressively more broken as hunks snapped off and drifted away. Ahead of the first, the west became impassable, and beyond a wide area where icebergs were being spawned lay open water. She had no choice but to force her way up into the ragged ridge which separated the Arctic glacier from the crumbling sheet of the flow. Their covenant thought that she would abandon the sleds. He and Lyndon climbed out to make their way on foot, but that did not sufficiently lighten the loads Hunnan's crave and Mistweave were pulling. Yet none of the giants faltered. Forging into a narrow valley which breached the ridge, they began to struggle toward the north and west, as if in spite of the exhaustion they now shared with Pitchwife, they had not begun to be daunted. Covenant marveled at their hardiness, but he could do nothing to help them except strive to follow without needing help himself. That task threatened to surpass him. Cold and lack of sleep sapped his strength. His numb feet were as clumsy as cripples. Several times he had to catch himself on a sled so that he would not fall back down the valley. But Hanan's crave, or Mistweave, bore the added burden without complaint until Covenant could regain his footing. For some distance the first route seemed inspired or fortuitous. As the valley rose into the glacier, bending crookedly back and forth between north and west, its bottom remained passable. The companions were able to keep moving. Then they gained the upper face of the glacier, and their path grew easier. Here the ice was as rugged as a battleground. Pressure splintered and wind tooled into high fantastic shapes, riddled with fissures, marked by strange channels and hollows of erosion, and the company had to wend still farther north to find a path. Yet with care the first was able to pick a passage which did not require much strength, and as the companions left the area of the glacier's rim they were able to head once again almost directly westward. Giddy with weariness and cold and the ice glare of the sun, Covenant stumbled on after the sleds. 
a pace or two to his side, Linden was in little better condition. Diamond draft and exertion could not keep the faint fatal hint of blue from her lips, and her face looked as pallid as bone. But her clenched alertness, and the stubborn thrust of her strides, showed that she was not yet ready to fall. For more than a league, with the air rasping his lungs and fear at his back, Covenant followed the lead of the giants. Somehow he did not collapse. But then everything changed. The first's route was neither inspired nor fortuitous. It was impossible. Balanced unsteadily, on locked knees, his heart trembling, Covenant looked out from the edge of the cliff where the company had stopped. There was nothing below him but the bare black sea. Without forewarning, the company had reached the western edge of the glacier. Off to the left was the jagged ridge which separated the main ice mass from the lower flow. But elsewhere lay nothing but the endless north, and the cliff, and the rue-bitten sea. Covenant did not know how to bear it. Vertigo blew up at him like a wind from the precipice, and his knees folded. Pitchwife caught him. No! the deformed giant coughed. His voice seemed to snag and strangle deep in his throat. Do not despair. Has this winter made you blind? Rough with fatigue, he jerked Covenant upright. Look before you. It needs not the eyes of a giant to behold this hope. Hope, Covenant sighed into the silence of his whirling head. Ah, God, I'd hope if I knew how. But Pitchwife's stiff grasp compelled him. Groping for balance, he opened his eyes to the cold. For a moment they would not focus, but then he found the will to force his gaze clear. There he saw it, distinct and unattainable across half a league of the fatal sea, a thin strip of land. It stretched out of sight to north and south. As I have said, Hunnanscrave muttered, our charts hold no certain knowledge of this region but mayhap it is the coast of the land which lies before us. Something like a madman's laughter rose in Covenant's chest. Well, good for us. The despiser would certainly be laughing. At least now we can look at where we want to go while we're freezing to death, or being eaten by Argola. He held the mirth back because he feared it would turn to weeping. Covenant, Lyndon said sharply, a protest of empathy or apprehension. He did not look at her. He did not look at any of them. He hardly listened to himself. Do you call this hope? We are giants, the first responded. Her voice held an odd note of brisk purpose. Dire, though this strait appears, we will wrest life from it. Mutely, Hunnensgrave stripped off his sark, packed it into one of the bundles on his sled. Mistweave dug out a long coil of heavy rope, then followed the master's example. Covenant stared at them. Lyndon panted. Do you mean— Her eyes flared wildly. We won't last eight seconds in water that cold. The first cast a gauging look down the cliff. As she studied the drop, she responded. Then our care must suffice to ward you. Abruptly she turned back to the company. Indicating Hanan's crave sled, she asked Kale. Does this wait, and the giant friends— Surpass your strength. Kale's flat mien suggested disdain for the question as he shook his head. The ice affords scant footing, she warned. He regarded her expressionlessly. I will be secure. She gave him a firm nod. She had learned to trust the Harochai. Returning to the rim, she said, Then let us not delay. The Argula must not come upon us here. The prescient nausea Knotting his guts, Covenant watched Hunting's crave tie one end of the rope to the rear of his sled. The giant's bare back and shoulders steamed in the sharp air, but he did not appear to feel the cold. Before Covenant could try to stop her, the first sat down on the edge, braced herself, and dropped out of sight. Lyndon's gasp followed her away. Fighting dizziness, he crouched to the ice and crept forward until he could look downward. He arrived in time to see the first hit heavily into the sea. For an instant the white froth marked the water as if she were gone for good. Then she splashed back to the surface, waved a salute up at the company. Now he noticed that the cliff was not sheer, though it was too smooth to be climbed. It angled slightly outward from rim to base. 
and it was no more than two hundred feet high. Hanenskrave's rope looked long enough to reach the water. From the edge, Pitchwife grimaced down at his wife. "'Desire me good fortune,' he murmured. Weariness ached in his tone. "'I am ill-made for such valors.' Yet he did not falter. In a moment he was at the first's side, and she held him strongly above the surface. No one spoke. Covenant locked his teeth as if any word might unleash the panic crowding through him. Linden hugged herself and stared at nothing. Hunnenscrave and Mistweave were busy lashing their supplies more securely to the sleds. When they were done, the master went straight to the cliff, but Mistweave paused beside Linden to reassure her. Gently he touched her shoulder, smiled like a reminder of the way she had saved his life. Then he followed Hunnenscrave. Covenant and Linden were left on the glacier with Kale, Vane, and the appointed. Gripping a rope, Kale nodded Covenant toward the sled. Oh, hell, Covenant groaned. Vertigo squirmed through him. What if his hold failed? And what made the giants think these sleds would float? But he had no choice. The Argula must be drawing nearer, and he had to reach the land somehow, had to get to Revelstone. There was no other way. The giants had already committed themselves. For a moment he turned toward Linden, but she had drawn down into herself, was striving to master her own trepidation. Woodenly he climbed into the sled. As Covenant settled himself, tried to seal his numb fingers to the rails, brace his legs among the bundles, Kale looped his rope around Vane's ankles. Then he knotted the heavy line in both fists and set his back to the sled, and began pushing it toward the cliff. When the sled nosed over the edge, Linden panted, Hold tight, as though she had just noticed what was happening. Covenant bit down on the inside of his cheek so hard that blood smeared his lips, stained the frost in his beard. Slowly, Kale let the weight to the end of the rope pull him toward Vane again. Vane had not moved a muscle. He seemed oblivious to the line hauling across the backs of his ankles. Reaching the demon dim spawn, Kale stopped himself against Vane's black shins. Without a tremor, the Harochai lowered Covenant and the sled, hand over hand, down the face of the cliff. Covenant chewed blood for a moment to control his fear, but soon the worst was over. His dizziness receded. Wedged among the supplies, he was in no danger of falling. Kale paid out the line with steady care. The rope cut small chunks out of the lip of the cliff, but Covenant hardly felt them hit. A shout of encouragement rose from Pitchwife. The dark sea looked as viscid as a malign chrism, but the four giants swam in it as if it were only water. Pitchwife needed the first support, but Hunnenscrave and Mistweave sculled themselves easily. Hunnenscrave had placed himself on the path of the sled. As its tip entered the water, he dodged below it and took the runners onto his shoulders. Rocking while he groped for a point of balance, the sled gradually became level. Then he steadied the runners, and Covenant found that the master was carrying him. Mistweave untied the rope so that Kale could draw it back up. Then Hunnenscrave started away from the wall of ice. The first said something to Covenant, but the lapping of the low waves muffled her voice. Covenant hardly dared turn his head for fear of upsetting Hunnenscrave's balance. But peripherally he watched Linden's descent. The thought that Vane might move hurt his chest. He felt faint with relief as the second sled came safely onto Mistweave's shoulders. At a shout from the first, Kale dropped the rope, then slid down the ice face to join the company. Instinctively, Covenant fixed his attention like yearning on the low line of shore half a league away. The distance seemed too great. He did not know where Hunnenscrave and Mistweave would get the strength to bear the sleds so far. At any moment, the frigid hunger of the sea would surely drag them down. Yet they struggled onward though that crossing appeared cruel and interminable beyond endurance. The first upheld Pitchwife and did not weaken. Kale swam between the sleds, steadied them whenever Hunnenscrave or Mistweave wavered. If the seas had risen against them, they would have died. But the water and the current remained indifferent, too cold to notice such stark effrontery. In the name of the search and covenant, giant friend, and Lyndon Avery the Chosen, the giants endured. 
and they prevailed. That night, the company camped on the hard shingle of the shore, as if it were a haven. 6. Winter in Combat For the first time since he had left the galley of Starfare's Gem, Covenant thought his bones might thaw. On this coast, the warmer currents which kept the sea free of ice moderated the winter's severity. The shingle was hard but not glacial. Clouds muffled the heavens, obscuring the lonely chill of the stars. Mist weaves fire, tended by kale because all the giants were too weary to fend off sleep, spread a benison around the camp. Wrapped in his blankets, Covenant slept as if he were at peace, and when he began to awaken in the stiff gloom of the northern dawn, he would have been content to simply eat a meal and then go back to sleep. The company deserved at least one day of rest. The giants had a right to it. But as the dawn brightened, he forgot about rest. The sunrise was hidden behind ranks of clouds, but it gave enough light to reveal the broad mass of the glacier the company had left behind. For a moment, the gray air made him uncertain of what he was seeing. Then he became sure. In the water, a spit of ice was growing out from the cliff, from the same point at which the quest had left the glacier. It was wide enough to be solid, and it was aimed like a spear at the company's camp. With an inward groan, he called the first. She joined him, stood staring out at the ice for a long moment. Uselessly, he hoped that her giantish sight would contradict his unspoken explanation. But it did not. It appears, she said slowly, that the Argula remain intent upon us. Damnation, splinters of ice, stuck in Covenant's memory. Harshly, he asked, how much time have we got? I know not when they commenced this span, she replied. To gauge their speed is difficult, but I will be surprised to behold them gain this shore ere the morrow. He went on cursing for a while but anger was as pointless as hope. None of the companions objected as they repacked the sleds for departure. The necessity was obvious. Linden looked worn by the continuing strain of the journey, uncertain of her courage. But the giants had shed the worst of their exhaustion. The light of attention and humor in Pitchwife's eyes showed that he had begun to recover his essential spirit. In spite of his repeated failures to match Kale, Mistweave bore himself with an air of pride, as if he were looking forward to the songs his people would sing about the feats of the company. And the master appeared to welcome the prospect of the trek ahead as an anodyne for the immedicable gall of his thoughts. Covenant did not know how Vane and Findale had crossed the water, but Vane's black blankness and the Elohim's appointed's pain remained unaltered, dismissing the need for any explanation. The company was still intact as it left the shore, started southwestward up the low sloping shingle to the uneven line of hills which edged the coast. While the ground remained bare, Covenant and Linden walked beside Kale and the sleds. Though he was not in good shape, Covenant was glad for the chance to carry his own weight without having to fight the terrain, and he wanted to talk to Linden. He hoped she would tell him how she was doing. He had no ability to evaluate her condition for himself. But beyond the hills lay a long, low plain, and there heavy snow began to fall. In moments it obscured the horizons, wrapped isolation around the travelers, collected quickly at their feet. Soon it was thick enough to bear the sleds. The first urged Covenant and Linden to ride, so that she would be free to amend her pace. Aided by her keen eyesight and her instinctive sense of terrain, she led her companions through the thick snowfall, as if the way were familiar to her. Toward mid-afternoon the snow stopped, leaving the travelers alone in a featureless white expanse. Again the first increased her pace, thrusting herself through the drifts at a speed which no other people could have matched afoot. Only the Ronnie Hen, Covenant mused, only Ronnie Hen could have borne him with comparable alacrity to meet his doom. But the thought of the great horses gave him a pang. He remembered them as beasts of beautiful fidelity, one of the treasures of the land but they had been forced to flee the malison of the sunbane. Perhaps they would never return. They might never get the chance. That possibility brought him back to anger, reminded him that he was on his way to put an end to the clave and the bane-fire which served the sunbane. 
He began to think about his purpose more clearly. He could not hope to take Revelstone by surprise. Lord Fowle surely knew that the unbeliever would come back to the land, counted on Covenant's return for the fulfillment of his designs. But it was possible that neither the despiser nor his ravers understood how much damage Covenant intended to do along the way. That had been Lyndon's idea. Stop the clave. Put out the bane fire. Some infections have to be cut out. But he accepted it now, accepted it deep in the venom and marrow of his power. It gave him a use for his anger, and it offered him a chance to make the arduous and unfaltering service of the giants mean something. When he thought about such things, his right forearm itched avidly, and darkness rose in his gorge. For the first time since he had agreed to make the attempt, he was eager to reach Revelstone. Two days later, the company still had not come to the end of the snow-cloaked plain. Neither Lyndon's health sense nor the giant's sight had caught any glimpse of the Argola. Yet none of the companions doubted that they were being hunted. A nameless foreboding seemed to harry the sleds. Perhaps it arose from the sheer, wide desolation of the plains, empty and barren. Or perhaps the whole company was infected by the rawness of Lyndon's nerves. She studied the winter, scented the air, scrutinized the clouds, tasted the snow, as though it had been given birth by strange forces, some of them unnatural. And yet she could not put words to the uneasiness of what she perceived. Somewhere in this wasteland an obscure disaster foregathered, but she had no idea what it was. The next day, however, mountains became visible to the east and south, and the day after that the company rose up out of the plain, winding through low, rumpled foothills and valleys toward the ice-gnawed heights above them. This range was not especially tall or harsh. Its peaks were old, and millennia of winter had worn them down. By sunset the companions had gained a thousand feet of elevation, and the foothills and the plain were hidden behind them. The following day they were slowed to a crawl. While Covenant and Lyndon struggled through the snow on foot, the company worked from side to side up a rough, steep slope, which disappeared into the gravid clouds that seemed to go on without end. But that ascent gave them another two thousand feet of altitude, and when it was over they found themselves in a region that resembled rolling hills rather than true mountains. Time and cold had crumbled the crests which had once dominated this land. Erosion had filled in the valleys. The first let the company camp early that night, but the next morning she was brisk with hope for good progress. "'Unless we're completely lost,' Covenant announced. "'This should be the northern climbs.' The simple familiarity of that name lifted his heart. He hardly dared believe he was right. "'If it is, then eventually we're going to hit Landsdrop. Running generally northwestward through the northern climbs, the great cliff of Landsdrop formed the boundary between the lower land and the upper. But it also marked the border of the Sunbane, for the Sunbane arose and went west across the upper land from Lord Fowle's covert in the depths of Mount Thunder, which straddled the midpoint of Landsdrop. When the company reached the cliff they would cross back into the Despiser's power, unless the Sunbane had not yet spread so far north. However, Lyndon was not listening to Covenant. Her eyes studied the West as if she were obsessed with thoughts of disaster. Her voice conveyed an odd echo of memory as she murmured, "'It's getting colder.' He felt a pang of fear. "'It's the elevation,' he argued. "'We're a lot higher up than we were.' "'Maybe.' She seemed deaf to his apprehension. "'I can't tell.' She ran her fingers through her hair, trying to shake her perceptions into some semblance of clarity. We're too far south for so much winter. Remembering the way Lord Fowle had once imposed winter on the land in defiance of all natural law, Covenant gritted his teeth and thought about fire. For Lyndon was right. Even his truncated senses could not mistake the deepening chill. Though there was no wind, the temperature seemed to plummet around him. During the course of the day the snow became crusted and glazed. The air had a wetted edge that cut at his lungs. Whenever snow fell it came down like thrown sand. Once the surface had hardened enough to bear the giants, their work became easier. They no longer needed to force a path through the thigh-deep freeze. As a consequence their pace improved markedly. Yet the cold was bitter and penetrating. Covenant felt brittle with frost and incapacity, caught between ice and fire. When the company stopped for the night he found that his blankets had frozen about him like cerements. 
He had to squirm out of them, as if he were emerging from a cocoon in which nothing had been transformed. Pitchwife gave him a wry grin. You are well protected, giant friend. The words came in gouts of steam, as if the very sound of his voice had begun to freeze. Ice itself is also a ward from the cold. But Covenant was looking at Lyndon. Her visage was raw, and her lips trembled. It's not possible, she said faintly. There can't be that many of them in the whole world. No one had to ask her what she meant. After a moment, the first breathed. Is your perception of them certain, Chosen? Lyndon nodded. The corners of her eyes were marked with frost. They're bringing this winter down with them. In spite of the fire Mistweave built, Covenant felt that his heart itself was freezing. After that, the weather became too cold for snow. For a day and a night, heavily laden clouds glowered overhead, clogging the sky and the horizons. And then the sky turned clear. The sleds bounced and slewed over the frozen surface as if it were a new form of granite. The first and Pitchwife no longer led the company. Instead, they ranged away to the north to watch for Argula. The previous night, she had suggested that they turn southward in order to flee the peril, but Covenant had refused. His imprecise knowledge of the land's geography indicated that if the company went south, they might not be able to avoid Sarengrave Flat. So the travelers continued toward Revelstone, and the first and Pitchwife kept what watch they could. Shortly after noon, with the sun glaring balefully off the packed white landscape, and the still air as keen as a scourge, the company entered a region where ragged heads and splintered torsos of rock thrust thickly through the snowpack, raising their white-crowned caps and bitter sides like men here's in all directions. Hunnan's Crave and Mistweave had to pick a twisting way between the cromlechs, some of which stood within a giant's arm span of each other and the first and pitchwife were forced to draw closer to the company so that they would not lose sight of the sleds. Among the companions, Lyndon sat as tense as a scream and muttered over and over again, They're here. Jesus God, they're here. But when the attack came, they had no warning of it. Lyndon's senses were foundering, overwhelmed by the sheer numbers and intensity of the cold. She was unable to pick specific dangers out of the general peril, and pitchwife and the first were watching the north. The assault came from the south. The company had entered a region which the Argula already controlled. Hanan's Crave and Mistweave were striding through the center of a rude ring of tall stones, Mistweave on the master's left, when two low hillocks across the circle rose to their feet. Maws clacking hungrily, the creatures shot forward a short distance, then stopped. Once but an instant web of ice which sprang at Mistweave's head, the other waited to give pursuit when the companions broke and ran. Covenant's shout and Hunnan's crave's call rang out together. Impossibly sure-footed on the iced snow, Mistweave and the master leaped into a sprint. The jerk threw Covenant back in the sled. He grappled for the left railing, fought to pull himself upright. The first's answer echoed back, but she and Pitchwife were out of reach beyond the menhirs. Then Linden's sled crashed against Covenant's. The impact almost pitched him out onto the snow. Mr. Weave's burst of speed had taken him out from under the ice web, but Lyndon was directly in its path. Heaving on the ropes, he tried to swing her aside, but Covenant's sled was in the way. The next instant, the net came down on the lines and front of Lyndon's sled. Immediately it froze. The lines became ice. When Mr. Weave hauled on them again, they snapped like icicles. Lyndon's head cracked forward, and she crumpled. Kale had been between the sleds in his accustomed position. As the giants had started into a run, he had run also, keeping himself between Covenant and the Argola, so even his Harochai reflexes had not been enough to protect him as Mistweave had slewed Linden's sled to the side. Leaping to avoid the collision, he had come down squarely under the web. His speed saved him from the full grasp of that ice, but the net caught his left arm, binding him by the elbow to the sled. Hanan's grave had already pulled Covenant past Linden. Covenant had no time to shout for the master to stop. The Argul was poised to launch another web. Venom seemed to slam through his forearm. With wild magic clenched in his half-fist, he swung to hurl power in Linden's defense. In that instant, another Argul leaped from atop the nearest boulder and landed on Hanan's grave. It bore him to the ground, buried him under sudden ice. Covenant's sled overturned. He sprawled to the crust practically within reach of the beast. 
but his fear was fixed on Lyndon. He hardly comprehended his own peril. His head reeled. Shedding frost and snow in a flurry like a small explosion, a precursor of the blast within him, he surged to his feet. Stark and lorn against the bare white, she still sat in her trapped sled. She was not moving. The rapacious cold of the Argula overloaded her nerves, cast her back into her atavistic, immobilizing panic. For an instant she bore no resemblance to the woman he had learned to love. Rather, she looked like Joan. At once the inextricable venom passion of his power thronged through him, and he became ready to tear down the very cromlechs and rive the whole region if necessary to protect her. But Mistwe was in his way. The giant had not moved from the spot where he had stumbled to a halt. His head jerked from side to side as his attention snapped frantically between Lyndon's plight and Hunnan's craves. Lyndon had once saved his life. He had left Starfair's gem to take Kale's place at her side. Yet Hunnan's crave was the master. Caught between irreconcilable exigencies, Mistweave could not choose. Helplessly he blocked Covenant from the Argoleb behind him. Move! Fury and cold ripped the cry from Covenant's throat. But Mistweave was aware of nothing except the choice he was unable to make. He did not move. Over his right shoulder arced a second web. Gaining size and thickness as it sailed, it spread toward Linden. Its chill left a trail of frost across Covenant's sight. Kale had not been able to free his left arm, but he saw the net coming like all the failures of the Harochai. Hergrim's slaughter and Seer's death and the siren song of the mere wives encapsulated in one peril, and he drew himself up as if he were the last of his people left alive, the last man sworn to succeed or die. His thews bunched, strained, stood out like a bone, and his arm broke loose, still encased in a hunk of ice as big as a giant's head. Swinging that chunk like a mace, he leaped above Linden and shattered the web before it reached her. She gaped through the spray of splinters as if she had gone blind. Before Covenant could react, the second Argul, behind Mistweave, reared up and ripped the giant down under its frigid bulk. Then the first landed like the plunge of a hawk on the beast holding Hunnan's grave. Pitchwife dashed around one of the boulders toward Linden and Kale, and Covenant let out a tearing howl of power that blasted the first Argul to pieces in one sharp bolt like a rave of lightning. From somewhere nearby, Findale gave a thin cry, Fool! Over her shoulder, the sword mane panted, We are hunted! Hammering and heaving at the ice, she fought to pull Hanan's crave free. The Argula are many, a great many! Hanan's crave lay among the ruins of the beast as if it had succeeded at smothering him, but as the first man handled him upright, a harsh shudder ran through him. All at once he took his own weight, staggered to his feet. "'We must flee!' she cried. Covenant was too far gone to heed her. Linden was safe, at least momentarily. Pitchwife had already snapped the ice from Kale's arm, and the two of them could ward her for a little while. Tall and bright with fire, he stalked toward the beast still struggling to subdue Mistweave. Whatever force or change had overcome the native hate of the Argula, had also left them blind to fear or self-preservation. The creature did not cease its attack on Mistweave until Covenant burned its life to water. In his passion he wanted to turn and shout until the men hears trembled. Come on! Come and get me! The scars on his forearm shone like fangs. I'll kill you all! They had dared to assail Linden. But she had come back to herself now, had found her way out of her old paralysis. She was running toward him, and she was saying, crying, No, that's enough! You've done enough! Don't let go! He tried to hear her. Her face was sharp with urgency, and she came toward him as if she meant to throw herself into his arms. He had to hear her. There was too much at stake. But he could not. Behind her were more Argula. Pitchwife had rushed to help Mistweave. Kale was at Linden's side. Fighting to draw the sleds after them, the first and a dazed Hunnenscrave scrambled to form a cordon around Covenant and Linden. Findale had disappeared. Only Vane stood motionless. And from every side at once charged the vicious ice beasts, crowding between the monoliths, a score of them, two score, as if each of them wanted to be the first to feast on warm flesh, as if they had come in answer to Covenant's call, enough of them to devour even giants. Without wild magic, none of the company except Vane had any chance to survive. 
Something like an avid chuckle spattered across the background of Covenant's mind. In his own way, he was hungry for violence, fervid for a chance to stuff his helplessness back down the despiser's throat. Thrusting Lyndon behind him, he went out to meet his attackers. His companions did not protest. They had no other hope. Bastards, he panted at the Argula. They were all around him, but he could barely see them. His brain had gone black with venom. Come and get me! Abruptly, the first shouted something, a call of warning or surprise. Covenant did not hear the words, but the iron in her voice made him turn to see what she had seen. Then plain shock stopped him. From the south side of the ring, gray shapes, smaller than he was, appeared among the Argula. They were roughly human in form, although their arms and legs were oddly proportioned. But their unclad bodies were hairless, their pointed ears sat high on the sides of their bald skulls, and they had no eyes. Wide, flat nostrils marked their faces above their slitted mouths. Barking in a strange tongue, they danced swiftly around the Argula. Each of them carried a short, slim piece of black metal like a wand, which splashed a vitriolic fluid at the ice beasts. That liquid threw the Argola into confusion. It burned them, broke sections off their backs, chewed down into their bodies. Clattering in pain, they forgot their prey, thrashed and writhed blindly in all directions. Some of them collided with the cromlechs, lost larger sections of themselves, died. But others, reacting with desperate instinct, covered themselves with their own ice and were able to staunch their wounds. Softly, as if at last even he had become capable of surprise, Kale murmured, Wane him. The old tellers speak of such creatures. Covenant recognized them. Like the Irviles, they were the artificial creations of the demondom. But they had dedicated themselves and their weird lore to pursuits which did not serve the despiser. During Covenant's trek toward Revelstone, a band of Wainham had saved him from a venom relapse and death, but that had occurred hundreds of leagues to the south. Swiftly the creatures girdled the company, dashing the fluid of their power at the Argula. Then Covenant heard his name called by an unexpected voice. Turning, he saw a man emerge between the southward rocks. "'Thomas Covenant!' the man shouted once more. "'Come! Flee! We are unready for this battle!' A man whose soft brown eyes, human face, and loss-learned kindness had once given Covenant a taste of both mercy and hope. A man who had been rescued by the Wainhem when the Namorams Grim had destroyed his home. During Stonedown. A man who served these creatures and understood them and loved them. Hamako. Covenant tried to shout, run forward, but he failed. The first instant of recognition was followed by a hot rush of pain as the implications of this encounter reached him. There was no reason why Hamako and this Wainhim Rish should be so far from home, no reason which was not terrible. But the plight of the company demanded speed, decision. More Argulae were arriving from the north, and more of those which had been damaged were discovering the expedient of using their ice to heal themselves. When Kale caught him by the arm, Covenant allowed himself to be impelled toward Hamako. Lyndon trotted at his side. Her face was set with purpose now. Perhaps she had identified Hamako and the Wainhim from Covenant's descriptions of them. Or perhaps her percipients told her all she needed to know. When Covenant seemed to lag, she grasped his other arm and helped Kale draw him forward. The giants followed, pulling the sleds. Vane broke into a run to catch up with the company. Behind them, the Wainhim retreated from the greater numbers of the Argula. In a moment they reached Hamako. He greeted Covenant with a quick smile. "'Well met, Ringwielder.' he said. You are an unlooked-for benison in this waste. Then at once he added, Come! and swung away from the ring. Flanked by Wainham, he ran into the maze of the menhirs. Covenant's numb feet and heavy boots found no purchase on the snowpack. Repeatedly he slipped and stumbled as he tried to dodge after Hamako among the rocks. But Kale gripped his arm, upheld him. Lyndon moved with small quick strides which enabled her to keep her footing. At the rear of the company, several Wainham fought a delaying action against the Argula, but abruptly the ice beasts gave up the chase, as if they had been called back, as if whatever force commanded them did not want to risk sending them into ambush. Shortly, one of the grey, demon-dim-made creatures spoke to Hamako, 
and he slowed his pace. Covenant pushed forward to the man's side. Burning with memory and dread, he wanted to shout, Well met like hell! What in blood and damnation are you doing here? But he owed Hamako too much past and present gratitude. Instead he panted, Your timing's getting better. How did you know we needed you? Hamako grimaced at Covenant's reference to their previous meeting, when his reish had arrived too late to aid the ringwielder. But he replied as if he understood the spirit of Covenant's jibe, We did not. The tale of your departure from the land is told among the Wainhim. He grinned momentarily. To such cunning watchers as they are, your passage from Revelstone to the lower land and sea reach was as plain as fire. Swinging around another boulder into a broad avenue among the stones, he continued, But we knew naught of your return. Our watch was set rather upon these Argula, that come massed from the north in defiance of all law, seeking ruin. Witnessing them gather here, we sought to discover their purpose. Thus at last we saw you. Well that we did so, and that our numbers sufficed to aid you. The mustering place of the Reish is not greatly distant, he gestured ahead, but distant enough to leave you unsuckered in your need. Listening hard, Covenant grappled with his questions, but there were too many of them, and the cold bit into his lungs at every breath. With an effort of will he concentrated on keeping his legs moving and schooled himself to wait. Then the group left the region of jumbled monoliths and entered a wide white plain that ended half a league away in an escarpment which cut directly across the vista of the south. Eddies of wind scurled up and down the base of the escarpment, raising loose snow like dervishes, and Hamako headed toward them as if they were the signposts of a sanctuary. When Covenant arrived, weak-kneed and gasping for air at the rock-strewn foot of the sheer rise, he was too tired to be surprised by the discovery that the snow-devils were indeed markers or sentinels of an eldritch kind. The Wainhim called out in their barking tongue, and the Eddies obeyed, moving to stand like hallucinated columns on either side of a line that led right into the face of the escarpment. There, without transition, an entrance appeared. It was wide enough to admit the company— but too low to let the giants enter upright, and it opened into a tunnel warmly lit by flaming iron censers. Smiling a welcome, Hamako said, This is the mustering place of the Wainhim. There Rishishim. Enter without fear, for here the ringwielder is acknowledged, and the foes of the land are withheld. In these times there is no true safety anywhere, but here you will find reliable sanctuary for one more day, until the gathered Rish come finally to their purpose. To me it has been granted to speak for all Wainhim that share this weird. Enter, and be welcome. In response the first bowed formally. We do so gladly. Already your aid has been a boon which we are baffled to repay. In sharing counsel and stories and safety we hope to make what return we may. Hamako bowed in turn. His eyes gleamed pleasure at her courtesy. Then he led the company down into the tunnel. When Vane and the last of the Wainhim had passed inward, the entrance disappeared, again without transition, leaving in its place blunt, raw rock that sealed the company into the firelight and blissful warmth of the Rishishim. The First Covenant hardly noticed that Findale had rejoined them, but the appointed was there as if Vane's side were a post he had never deserted. His appearance drew a brief, muted chittering from the Wainhim, but then they ignored him as if he were simply a shadow of the black demon dim spawn. For a few moments the tunnel was full of the wooden scraping of the sled's runners, but when the companions reached a bulge in the passage like a rude antechamber, Hamako instructed the giants to leave the sleds there. As the warmth healed Covenant's sore respiration, he thought that now Hamako would begin to ask the expected questions. But the man and the Wainhim bore themselves as if they had come to the end of all questions. Looking at Hamako more closely, Covenant saw things which had been absent or less pronounced during their previous encounter. Resignation. Resolve. A kind of peace. Hamako looked like a man who had passed through a long grief and had been annealed. With a small jolt, Covenant realized that Hamako was not dressed for winter. Only the worn swathe of leather around his hips made him less naked than the Wainhim. In vague fear, Covenant wondered if the stone downer had truly become Wainham himself. What did such a transformation mean? 
and what in hell was this Reish doing here? His companions had less reason for apprehension. Pitchwife moved as if the Wainham had restored his sense of adventure, his capacity for excitement. His eyes watched everything, eager for marvels. Warm air and the prospect of safety softened the first's iron sternness, and she walked with her hand lightly on her husband's shoulder, willing to accept whatever she saw. Hanenscrave's thoughts were hidden beneath the concealment of his brows. And Mistweave, at the sight of Mistweave's face, Covenant winced. Too much had happened, too swiftly. He had nearly forgotten the tormented moment of Mistweave's indecision. But the giant's visage bore the marks of that failure-like tool-work at the corners of his eyes, down the sides of his mouth. Marks cut into the bone of his self-esteem. His gaze turned away from Covenant's, in shame. Damn it to hell, Covenant rasped to himself. Is every one of us doomed? Perhaps they all were. Lyndon walked at his side without looking at him, her mien pale and strict, with the characteristic severity which he had learned to interpret as fear. Fear of herself, of her inherited capacity for panic and horror, which had proved once again that it could paralyze her, despite every commitment or affirmation she made. Perhaps a reaction to the ambush of the Argula had restored her belief that she, too, was doomed. It was unjust. She judged that her whole life had been a form of flight, an expression of moral panic. But in that she was wrong. Her past sins did not invalidate her present desire for good. If they did, then Covenant himself was damned as well as doomed, and Lord Fowle's triumph was already assured. Covenant was familiar with despair. He accepted it in himself but he could not bear it in the people he loved. They deserved better. Then Hamako's branching way through the rock turned a corner to enter a sizable cavern like a meeting hall, and Covenant's attention was pulled out of its gold channel. The space was large and high enough to have held the entire crew of Starfair's gem, but its rough walls and surfaces testified that the Wainham had not been using it long. Yet it was comfortably well lit, Many braziers flamed around the walls, shedding kind heat as well as illumination. For a moment, Covenant found himself wondering obliquely why the Wainham bothered to provide light at all, since they had no eyes. Did the fires aid their lore in some fashion? Or did they draw a simple solace from the heat or scent of the flames? Certainly the former habitation of Hamako's Reish had been bright with warmth and firelight. But Covenant could not remember that place and remain calm and he had never seen so many wane him before. At least three score of them slept on the bare stone, worked together round black metal pots as if they were preparing vitrim or invocations, or quietly waited for what they might learn about the people Hamako had brought. Reish was the wane him word for a community, and Covenant had been told that each community usually numbered between one and two score wane him, who shared a specific interpretation of their racial weird, their native definition of identity and reason for existence. This weird, he remembered, belonged to both the Wainham and the Irviles, but was read in vastly different ways. So he was looking at at least two Reish, and Hamako had implied that there were more. More communities which had been ripped from home and service by the same terrible necessity that had brought Hamako's Reish here? Covenant groaned as he accompanied Hamako into the center of the cavern. There the stone downer addressed the company again. "'I know that the purpose which impels you toward the land is urgent,' he said in his gentle and pain-familiar voice. "'But some little time you can spare among us. The horde of the Argolai is unruly, and advances with no great speed. We offer you sustenance, safety, and rest, as well as inquiries,' he looked squarely at Covenant, "'and perhaps also answers.' That suggestion gave another twist to Covenant's tension. He remembered clearly the question Hamako had refused to answer for him. But Hamako had not paused. He was asking, "'Will you consent to delay your way a while?' The first glanced at Covenant, but Covenant had no intention of leaving until he knew more. "'Hamako,' he said grimly, "'why are you here?' The loss and resolution behind Hamako's eyes showed that he understood— but he postponed his reply by inviting the company to sit with him on the floor. Then he offered around bowls of the dark, musty vitrum liquid which looked like vitriol, 
and yet gave nourishment like a distillation of alianta. And when the companions had satisfied their initial hunger and weariness, he spoke as if he had deliberately missed Covenant's meaning. Ringwielder, he said, with four other Reish, we have come to give battle to the Argola. Battle? Covenant demanded sharply. He'd always known the Wainham as creatures of peace. Yes. Amako had traveled a journey to this place which could not be measured in leagues. That is our intent. Covenant started to expostulate. Hamako stopped him with a firm gesture. Though the Wainham serve peace, he said carefully, they have risen to combat when their weird required it of them. Thomas Covenant, I have spoken to you concerning that weird. The Wainham are made creatures. They have not the justification of birth for their existence, but only the imperfect lores and choices of the demondom. And from this trunk grow no boughs, but two, the way of the Irviles, who loathe what they are, and seek forever power and knowledge to become what they are not, and the way of the Wainham, who strive to give value to what they are through service to what they are not, to the birth by law and beauty of the life of the land. This you know. Yes, I know, but Covenant's throat closed as he recalled the manner in which Hamako's Reish had formerly served its weird. Also you know, the stone donner went on, that in the time of the great High Lord Moram, and of your own last battle against the Despiser, Wainham saw and accepted the need to wage violence in defense of the land. It was their foray which opened the path by which the High Lord procured the survival of Revelstone. His gaze held Covenant's, though Covenant could hardly match him. Therefore do not accuse us that we have risen to violence again. It is not fault in the Wainham. It is grief. And still he forestalled Covenant's protest, did not answer Covenant's fundamental question. The sunbane and the despiser's malign intent rouse the dark forces of the earth. Though they act by their own will, they serve his design of destruction. And such a force has come among the Argula, mastering their native savagery, and sending them like the hand of winter against the land. We know not the name of that might. It is hidden from the insight of the Wadim. But we see it, and we have gathered in this Rishishim to oppose it. How? the first interposed. How will you oppose it? When Hamako turned toward her, she said, I ask pardon if I intrude on that which does not concern me. But you have given us the gift of our lives, and we have not returned the bare courtesy of our names and knowledge. Briefly she introduced her companions. Then she continued, I am the first of the search, a sword main of the giants. Battle is my craft and my purpose. Her countenance was sharp in the firelight. I would share counsel with you concerning this combat. Hamako nodded, but his reply suggested politeness rather than any hope for help or guidance, the politeness of a man who had looked at his fate and approved of it. In the name of these Rish, I thank you. Our intent is simple. Many of the Wainham are now abroad, harrying the Argola to lure them hither. In this they succeed. That masked horde we will meet on the outer plain upon the morrow. There the Wainham will concert their might and strike inward among the ice beasts, seeking the dark heart of the force which rules them. If we discover that heart, and are equal to its destruction, then will the Argola be scattered, becoming once more their own prey. If we fail, the stone donner shrugged. There was no fear in his face. We will at least weaken that horde sorely ere we die. The first was faster than Covenant. Hamako, she said, I like this not. It is a tactic of desperation. It offers no second hope and event of first failure. But Hamako did not waver. Giant, we are desperate. At our backs lies naught but the sunbane, and against that ill we are powerless. Wherefore should we desire any second hope? All else has been rent from us. It is enough to strike this blow as best we may. The first had no answer for him. Slowly his gaze left her, returned to Covenant. His brown eyes seemed as soft as weeping, and yet too hard to be daunted. Because I have been twice bereft, he said in that kind and 
unbreachable voice. I have been granted to stand at the forefront, forging the puissance of five reach with my mortal hands. Then Covenant saw that now at last he would be allowed to ask his true question, and for an instant his courage failed. How could he bear to hear what had happened to Hamako? Such extravagant human valor came from several sources, and one of them was despair. But Hamako's eyes held no flinch of self-pity. Covenant's companions were watching him, sensitive to the importance of what lay between him and Hamako. Even Mistweave and Hunnan's crave showed concern, and Lyndon's visage ached as if Hamako's rue were poignant to her. With a wrench of will, Covenant denied his fear. "'You still haven't told me,' Strain made his tone harsh. "'All this is fine. I even understand it.' He was intimately familiar with desperation. In the warmth of the cavern he had begun to sweat. "'But why in the name of every good and beautiful thing you've ever done in your life are you here at all? Even the threat of that many Argula can't compare with what you were doing before.' The bare memory filled his throat with inextricable wonder and sorrow. Lord Fowl had already destroyed virtually all the natural life of the land. Only Andalane remained, preserved against corruption by Car Caveral's power. Everything else that grew by law or love, from seed or egg or birth, had been perverted. Everything except that which Hamako's reach had kept alive. In a cavern which was huge on the scale of lone human beings, but still paltry when measured by the destitution of the land. The Wainham had nurtured a garden that contained every kind of grass, shrub, flower, and tree, vine, grain, and vegetable they had been able to find and sustain. And in another cave, in a worn of pens and dens, they had saved as many species of animal as their lore and skill allowed. It was an incomparable expression of faith in the future, of hope for the time when the sun vein would be healed, and the land might be dependent upon this one tiny pocket of natural life for its renewal. And it was gone. From the moment when he had recognized Hamako, Covenant had known the truth. Why else would the wane him here instead of tending to their chosen work? Useless rage cramped his chest, and his courage felt as brittle as dead bone as he waited for Hamako's response. It was slow in coming, but even now the stone donner did not waver. It is as you have feared, he said softly. We were driven from our place, and the work of our lives was destroyed. Then for the first time his voice gave a hint of anger. Yet you have not feared enough. That ruin did not befall us alone. Across all the land every reach was beaten from its place and its work. Knowing him, gathered here, are all the remains of their race. There will be no more. But that covenant wanted to cry out, plead, protest, no, not again. Was not the genocide of the unhomed enough? How could the land sustain another such loss? But Hamako seemed to see Covenant's thoughts in his aghast face. You err, Ringwielder, said the stone donner grimly. Against ravers and the despiser we were forewarned and defended. And Lord Fowl had no cause to fear us. We were too paltry to give him threat. No, it was the Irviles, the black and birthless kindred of the Wainham, that wrought our ruin from reach to reach across the land. Wrought our ruin, our ruin across the land. Covenant was no longer looking at Hamako, he could not. All that beauty, gone to grief where all dreams go. If he met those soft brown irreparable eyes, he would surely begin to weep. Their assault was enabled to succeed because we did not expect it. For had not Irvile and Wainham lived in truce during all the millennia of their existence? And because they have studied destruction, as the Wainham have not. Slowly, the edge of his tone was blunted. We were fortunate in our way. Many of us were slain, among them some that you have known. Wraith, Durng, Grauman. He spoke the names as if he knew how they would strike Covenant, for those were Wainham who had given their blood so that he could reach Revelstone in time to rescue Linden, Sunder, and Hollion. But many escaped. 
other reach were butchered entirely. Those Wainham that survived wandered without purpose until they encountered others to form a new reach, for Wainham without community is a lorn thing, deprived of meaning. And therefore, he concluded, we are desperate in all sooth. We are the last. After us there will be no more. But why? Covenant asked, his knotted hands and the blurred light, his voice as thick as blood in his throat. Why did they attack? After all those centuries? Because, Hamaka replied. And now he did falter, caught by the pain behind his resolve. Because we gave you shelter, and with you that making of the Irviles, which they name vain. Covenant's head jerked up, eyes afire with protests. This crime, at least, should not be laid to his charge, though instinctively he believed it. He had never learned how to repudiate any accusation. But at once Samako said, Ah, no, Thomas Covenant, your pardon. I have led you to miscomprehend me. His voice resumed the impenetrable gentleness of a man who had lost too much. The fault was neither yours nor ours. Even at Lord Fowle's command, the Irviles would not have wrought such harm upon us for merely sheltering you and any companion. Do not think about it. Their rage had another source. What was it? Covenant breathed. What in hell happened? Hamako shrugged at the sheer simplicity of the answer. It was their conviction that you gained from us an explanation of vain Demon Dim Spawn's purpose. But I didn't, objected Covenant. You wouldn't tell me. The Wainham had commanded Tamako to silence. He had only replied, Were I to reveal the purpose of this Demon Dim Spawn, that revelation could well prevent the accomplishment of his purpose. And that purpose is greatly desirable. Now he sighed. Yes, but how could our refusal be conveyed to the Irviles? Their loathing permitted them no understanding of our weird. But they did not inquire of us what we had done. At our place, they would not have scrupled to utter falsehood. Therefore, they could not have believed any reply we gave. So they brought down retribution upon us, compelled by the passion of their desire that the secret of this vein not be untimely revealed. And Vane stood behind the seated company, as if he were deaf or impervious. The deadwood of his right forearm dangled from his elbow, but his useless hand was still undamaged, immaculate, as beautifully sculpted as a mockery of Covenant's flawed being. But Amako did not flinch or quail again, though his somber gaze now held a dusky hue of fear. Thomas Covenant he said, his voice so soft that it barely carried across the circle of the company. Ringwielder. His home, during Stone Down, had been destroyed by the Na Morams Grim, but the Wainham had given him a new home with them, and then that new home had been destroyed, ravaged for something the Reish had not done. Twice bereft. Will you ask once more? Will you inquire of me here the purpose of this black demondom spawn. At that Linden sat up straighter, bit her lips to hold back the question. The first tensed, anticipating explanations. Pitchwife's eyes sparkled like hope. Even Mistweave stirred from his gloom. Kale cocked one dispassionate eyebrow. But Covenant sat like Hunnan's crave, his emotions tangled by Hamako's apprehension. He understood the stone downer, knew what Hamako's indirect offer meant. The Wainham no longer trusted their former refusal, were no longer able to credit the unmalice of the Irvile's intent. The violence of their ruin had shaken them fundamentally, and yet their basic perceptions remained. The trepidation in Hamako's visage showed that he had learned to dread the implications of both speaking and not speaking. He was asking Covenant to take the responsibility of decision from him. He and his Reish had come here to die. Fiercely, with all the attention of the company on him, Covenant forced himself to say, No. His gaze burned as he confronted Hamako across the rude stone. You've already refused once. Within himself, 
he swore bitterly at the necessity which compelled him to reject everything that might help or ease or guide him. But he did not shrink from it. I trust you. Linden gave him a glare of exasperation. Pitchwife's face widened in surprise. But Hamako's rue-worn features softened with undisguised relief. Later, while Covenant's companions rested or slept in the warmth of the cavern, Hamako took the unbeliever aside for a private conversation. Gently, Hamako urged Covenant to depart before the coming battle. Night was upon the northern climbs, the night before the dark of the moon. But a him could be spared to guide the company up the escarpment toward the relative safety of Landsdrop. The quest would be able to travel without any immediate fear of the Argula. Covenant refused brusquely. You've done too much for me already. I'm not going to leave you like this. Hamako peered into Covenant's clenched glower. After a moment, the stone downer breathed. Ah, oh, Thomas Covenant, will you hazard the wild magic to aid us? Covenant's reply was blunt. Not if I can help it. If he had heeded the venom coursing in him, the itch of his scarred forearm, he would already have gone out to meet the Argolay alone. But my friends aren't exactly useless. And I don't intend to watch you die for nothing. He knew he had no right to make such promises. The meaning of Hamako's life, of the lives of the gathered Wainham, was not his to preserve or sacrifice. But he was who he was. How could he refuse to aid the people who needed him? Scowling at unresolved contradictions, he studied the creatures. With their eyeless faces, gaping nostrils, and limbs made for running on all fours, they looked more like beasts or monsters than members of a noble race that had given its entire history to the service of the land. But long ago one of them had been indirectly responsible for his second summons to the land. Savagely maimed and in hideous pain, that Wainham had been released from the despiser's clutches to bait a trap. It had reached the lords, and told them that Lord Fowl's armies were ready to march. Therefore High Lord Aelina had made the decision to call Covenant. Thus the despiser had arranged for Covenant's return. And the logic of that return had led ineluctably to Aelina's end, the breaking of the law of death, and the destruction of the staff of law. Now the last of the Wainham people stood on the verge of ruin. A long time passed before Covenant was able to sleep. He saw all too clearly what Lord Fowl might hope to gain from the plight of the Wainham. But when his grasp on consciousness frayed away, the vitrim he had consumed carried him into deep rest, and he slept until the activity around him became constant and exigent. Raising his head, he found that the cavern was full of Wainham, at least twice as many as he had seen earlier. The bleary look in Linden's face showed that she had just awakened. But the four giants were up and moving tensely among the Wainham. Pitchwife came over to Linden and Covenant. "'You have slept well, my friends,' he said, chuckling as if he were inured to the expectancy which filled the air. "'Stone and sea, this vitrum is a hail beverage. A touch of its savor, commingled with our diamond draught, would gladden even the dullest palate. Life be praised, I have at last found the role which will make my name forever sung among the giants. Behold!' With a flourish he indicated his belt, which was behung on all sides with leather vitrim skins. It will be my dear task to bear this roberant to my people, that they may profit from its potency in the blending of a new liquor. And that unsurpassable draught will be named Pitchbrew for all the earth to adore. He laughed. Then will my fame outmeasure even that of great Bagoon himself. The misshapen giant's matter drew a smile from Linden. But Covenant had climbed out of sleep into the same mood with which the peril of the Wainham had first afflicted him. Frowning at Pitchwife's humor, he demanded, "'What's going on?' The giant sobered rapidly. "'Ah, giant friend,' he sighed, "'you have slept long and long. Noon has come to the wasteland, and the Wainham are gathered to prepare for battle. Although the Argula advance slowly, they are now within sight of this covert. I conceive that the outcome of their conflict—' will be determined ere sunset. Covenant swore to himself. He did not want the crisis to be so near at hand. Linden was facing him. In her controlled, professional voice, she said, There's still time. Time to get out of here, he returned sourly. 
Let them go out there and probably get butchered as a race without so much as one sympathetic witness to at least grieve? Forget it. Her eyes flared. That isn't what I meant. Anger sharpened the lines of her face. I don't like deserting people any more than you do. Maybe I don't have your background, she snarled the word. But I can still see what Tamako and the Wainham are worth. You know be better than that. Then she took a deep breath, steadied herself. Still glaring at him, she said, What I meant was, there's still time to ask them about Vane. Covenant felt like a knotted thunderhead, livid and incapable of release. Her pointed jibe about his background underscored the extent to which he had falsified their relationship. From the time of their first meeting on Haven Farm, he had withheld things from her, arguing that she did not have the background to understand them. And this was the result. Everything he said to or heard from the woman he loved became gall. But he could not afford release. Lord Fowl was probably already gloating at the possibility that he, Covenant, might unleash wild magic to aid the Wainham. Grimly, he stifled his desire to make some acerbic retort. Instead, he replied, No, I don't want to hear it from Hamako. I don't want to let Findale off the hook. Deliberately, he turned toward the appointed. But Findale met him with the same trammeled and impenetrable rue with which he had rebuffed every challenge or appeal. More to answer Lyndon than to attack Findale, Covenant concluded, I am waiting for this bloody Elohim to discover the honesty, if not the simple decency, to start telling the truth. Findale's yellow eyes darkened, but he said nothing. Lyndon looked back and forth between Covenant and the appointed. Then she nodded. Speaking as if Findale were not present, she said, I hope he makes up his mind soon. I don't like the idea of having to face the clave when they still know more about Vane than we do. Grateful for at least that much acceptance from her, Covenant tried to smile, but he achieved only a grimace. The Wayne him were milling around the cavern, moving as if each of them wanted to speak to everyone else before the crisis, and their low barking voices thickened the atmosphere. But the giants were no longer among them. Hanan's crave leaned against one wall, detached and lonely, his head bowed. Pitchwife had remained with Covenant, Lyndon, and Kale, and the First and Mistweave stood together near the opposite side of the space. Mistweave's stance was one of pleading, but the First met whatever he said angrily. When he beseeched her further, her reply cracked over the noise of the Wainham. You are mortal, giant. Such choices are harsh to any who must make them. But failure is only failure. It is not unworth. You are sworn and dedicate to the search, if not to the chosen, and I will not release you. Sternly, she left his plain dismay, marched through the throng toward the rest of her companions. When she reached them, she answered their mute questions by saying, He is shamed. She looked at Lyndon. His life you saved when Covenant Giant Friends was at risk. Now he deems that his indecision in your need is unpardonable. He asks to be given to the Wainham, that he may seek expiation in their battle. Unnecessarily, she added, I have refused him. Lyndon muttered a curse. I didn't ask him to serve me. He doesn't need— Abruptly, she cried, Hunnensgrave, don't! But the master did not heed her. Fury clenched in his fists, he strode toward Mistweave as though he meant to punish the giant's distress. Lyndon started after him. The first stopped her. In silence, they watched as Hunnenscrave stalked up to his crew member. Confronting Mistweave, the master stabbed one massive finger at the giant's sore heart, as if he knew the exact location of Mistweave's bafflement. His jaws chewed excoriations, but the interchanges of the Wainham covered his voice. Softly, the first said, He is the master. It is enough for me that he has found room in his own pain for Mistweave. He will do no true harm to one who has served him aboard Starfare's gem. Linda nodded, but her mouth was tight with frustration and empathy, and she did not take her eyes off Mistweave. That first Mistweave flinched from what Hanenscrave was saying. Then a hot belligerence rose up in him, and he raised one fist like a threat. 
but Hanan's crave caught hold of Mistweave's arm and snatched it down, thrust his jutting beard into Mistweave's face. After a moment, Mistweave acquiesced. His eyes did not lose their heat, but he accepted the stricture Hanan's crave placed upon him. Slowly, the ire faded from the master's stance. Covenant let a sigh through his teeth. Then Hamako appeared among the Wainhim, came toward the company. His gaze was bright in the light of the braziers. His movements hinted at fever or anticipation. In his hands he bore a long scimitar that looked like it had been fashioned of old bone. Without preamble he said, The time has come. The Argola draw nigh. We must issue forth to give combat. What will you do? You must not remain here. There is no other egress. And if the entrance is sealed— you will be ensnared. The first started to reply, but Covenant forestalled her. Venom nagged at the skin of his forearm. We'll follow you out, he said roughly. We're going to watch until we figure out the best way to help. To protest in Hamako's mien, he added, Stop worrying about us. We've survived worse. If everything else goes to hell and damnation, we'll find some way to escape. A grin momentarily softened Hamako's tension. "'Thomas Covenant,' he said in a voice like a salute, "'I would that we had met in kinder times.' Then he raised his scimitar, turned on his heel, and started toward the throat of the cavern. Bearing curved bony daggers like smaller versions of Hamako's blade, all the way in him followed him as if they had chosen him to lead them to their doom. They numbered nearly two hundred, but they needed only a few moments to march out of the cavern, leaving the company behind in the undiminished firelight. Hanenscrave and Mistweave came to join their companions. The first looked at Covenant and Linden, then at the other giants. None of them demurred. Linden's face was pale, but she held herself firm. Pitchwife's features worked as if he could not find the right jest to ease his tension. In their separate ways, the first— Mistweave and Hanenscrave looked as unbreachable as Kale. Covenant nodded bitterly. Together he and his friends turned their backs on warmth and safety, went out to meet the winter. In the tunnel they felt the temperature begin to drop almost immediately. The change made no difference to his numb fingers and feet, but he sashed his robe tight as if in that way he might be able to protect his courage. Past the branchings of the passage he followed the wain him until the company reached the rude antechamber where the sleds were. Mutely, Hanenscrave and Mistweave took the lines. Their breath had begun to steam. Firelight transmitted the wisps of vapor to gold. The entrance to the Rishishim was open, and cold came streaming inward, hungry to extinguish this hidden pocket of comfort. Deep in Covenant's guts, shivers mounted. His robe had previously kept him alive, if not warm, but now it seemed an insignificant defense against the frozen winter. When he looked at Linden, she answered as if his thoughts were palpable to her. I don't know how many. Enough. Then the entrance loomed ahead. Now the air blew keenly into Covenant's face, tugging at his beard, drawing tears from his eyes. A dark pressure gathered in his veins, but he ducked his head and went on. With his companions he strode through the opening onto the rocky ground at the foot of the escarpment. The plain was sharp with sunlight. From a fathomless sky the mid-afternoon sun burned across the white waste. The air felt strangely brittle, as if it were about to break under its own weight. Stiff snow crunched beneath Covenant's boots. For a moment the cold seemed as bright as fire. He had to fight to keep wild magic from leaking past his restraint. When his sight cleared, he saw that the whirling snow devils, which had marked and guarded the Rishishim, were gone. The Wainhim had no more need of them. Barking softly to each other, the creatures surged together into the compact and characteristic wedge, which both they and the Irviles used to concentrate and wield their combined force. Hamako stood at the apex of the formation. When it was complete— and the invocations had been made, he would hold the lore and power of five Rish in the blade of his scimitar. As long as they did not break ranks, the Wainhim, along the sides of the wedge, would be able to strike individual blows. But Hamako's might would be two hundred strong. Every moment the battle drew closer. Looking northward, Covenant found that he could barely see the region of monoliths beyond the massed advance of the Argula. Ponderous and fatal they came forward, 
a slow rush of white gleaming over the snow and ice. Already their feral clatter was audible above the voices of the Wainham. It echoed like shattering off the face of the escarpment. The horde did not appear to greatly outnumber the Wainham, but the far larger bulk and savagery of the Argula made their force seem overwhelming. The company still had time to flee, but no one suggested flight. The first stood stern and ready, with one hand resting on the hilt of her longsword. Glints reflected out of Hanenskrave's eyes as if he were eager to strike any blow which might make his grief useful. Pitchwife's expression was more wary and uncertain. He was no warrior. But Mistweave bore himself as though he saw his chance for restitution coming, and had been commanded to ignore it. Only Kale watched the advancing horde with dispassion, unmoved alike by the valor of the Wainham and the peril of the company. Perhaps he saw nothing especially courageous in what the Reish were doing. Perhaps to his Haruchai mind, such extravagant risk was simply reasonable. Covenant struggled to speak. The cold seemed to freeze the words in his throat. I want to help them, if they need it. But I don't know how. To the first, he said, Don't go out there unless the wedge starts to break. I've seen this kind of fighting before. He had seen Irvile slash into the celebration of spring to devour the wraiths of Andalane, and had been powerless against that black wedge. As long as their formation holds, they aren't beaten. Then he turned to Linden. Her expression stopped him. Her face was fixed, pale with cold, toward the Argola, and her eyes looked as livid as injuries. For one dire moment he feared she had fallen again into her particular panic. But then her gaze snapped toward him. It was battered but not cowed. "'I don't know,' she said tightly. "'He's right. There's some force out there, something that keeps them together.' but I can't tell what it is. Covenant swallowed a knot of dread. Keep trying, he murmured. I don't want these Wainham to end up like the unhomed. Damned as well as doomed. She did not reply, but her nod conveyed a fierce resolve as she turned back to the Argula. They were dangerously close now. A score of them led the advance, and their mass was nearly that many deep. Though they were beasts of hate that preyed on everything, they become as organized as a conscious army. Steadily they gathered speed to hurl themselves upon the Wainham. In response, the Wainham raised a chant into the chill. Together they barked a raw, irrhythmic invocation which sprang back at them from the escarpment and resounded across the flat. And a moment later a black light shone from the apex of the wedge. Amako flourished his scimitar. Its blade had become as ebon as demon vitriol. It emitted midnight, as if it were ablaze with death. At the same time, all the smaller blades of the Wainham turned black and began to drip a hot fluid which steamed and sizzled in the snow. Without knowing what he was doing, Covenant retreated. The frigid air had become a thrumming shout of power, soundless in spite of the chant which summoned it, and that puissance called out to him. His yearning for fire battered at the walls he had built around it, the scars on his forearm burned poisonously. He took a few steps backward, but he could not put any distance between himself and his desire to strike. Instinctively he fumbled his way to the only protection he could find, a jagged rock that stood half his height near the entrance to the Rishishim. Yet he did not crouch or cower there. His numb hands gripped the argute stone in the same way that his eyes clung to the Wainham and the Argula and within himself he pleaded, No, not again. He had not been required to watch the actual destruction of the unhomed. Then Hamako gave a shout like a huzzah, and the wedge started forward. Moving as one, the Wainham went out to the foe they had chosen for their last service. Hushed amid the vicious advance of the ice beasts, the long hoarse chant of the Wainham, the echoes breaking up and down the escarpment, Covenant and his companions watched as the wedge drove in among the Argula. For a moment, its thrust was so successful that the outcome appeared foregone. The Reish poured their power into Hamako. He cut an irresistible swath for the wedge to follow, and as individuals the Wainham sliced their ice-corroding fluid in all directions. Argula snapped apart, fell back, blundered against each other. 
Screaming from their many maws, they swarmed around the wedge, trying to engulf it, crush it among them. But that only brought the third side of the wedge into the fray. And Tamako's scimitar rang like a hammer on the ice, sent shards and limbs flying from side to side with every blow. He had aimed the wedge toward an especially large beast at the rear of the mass. An argul that seemed to have been formed by one creature crouching atop another, and with each step he drew closer to that target. The argula were savage, impervious to fear. Webs and snares were flung across the wedge. Booming cracks riddled the snowpack. But black liquid burned the nets to tatters. Falling chunks bruised the wainhim, but did not weaken their formation. And the hard ground under the snow rendered the cracks ineffective. Covenant leaned against his braced hands, half frozen there, hardly daring to credit what he saw. Low shouts of encouragement broke from the first, and her sword was in her hands. Avid with hope, Pitchwife peered into the fray as if he expected victory at any moment, expected the very winter to break and flee. Then, without warning, everything changed. The Argula were virtually mindless, but the force which ruled them was not. It was sentient and cunning and it had learned a lesson from the way the Wainham had rescued the company earlier. Abruptly the horde altered its tactics, in a sudden flurry like an explosion of white which almost obscured the battle. All the beasts raised their ice at once. But now that ice was not directed at the wedge. Instead it covered every argul that had been hurt, broken, or even killed by the Wainham. Ice slapped against every gout of vitriol, smothered the black fluid, effaced it, healed the wounds. Ice bandaged every limb and body that Hamako had hacked or shattered, restoring crippled creatures to wholeness with terrible celerity. Ice gathered together the fragments of the slain, fused them anew, poured life back into them. The Wainham had not stopped fighting for an instant, but already half their work had been undone. The Argula revitalized each other faster than they were damaged. More and more of them were freed to attack in other ways. Unable to rend the wedge with their webs, they began to form a wall of ice around it, as if they meant to insist it until its power gave out through sheer weariness. Covenant stared in horror. The Wainham were clearly unprepared for this counterattack. Hamako whirled his blade, flaring desperation around him. Three times he pounded an argul into pieces no larger than his fist, and each time a web snatched the pieces together, restored them, sent the beast at him again. Wildly he sprang forward to assail the web itself, but in so doing he broke contact with a wedge. Instantly his scimitar relapsed to bone. It splintered when he struck. He would have fallen himself, but hands reached out from the wedge and jerked him back into position. And there was nothing Covenant could do. The giants were calling to him, beseeching him for some command. The first shouted imprecations he did not hear. But there was nothing he could do except unleash the wild magic. Venom thudded in his temples. The wild magic, unquenchable and argent. Every thought of it, every memory, every ache of hunger and yearning was as shrill and frantic as Lyndon's fervid cry, You're going to break the arch of time. This is what Fowl wants. Desecration filled each pulse and wail of his heart. He could not call up that much power and still pretend to control it. But Hamako would be killed. It was as distinct as the declining sunlight on the white plain. The Wainham would be slaughtered like the people of the land to feed the lust of evil. That same man and those Wainham had brought Covenant back from delirium once, and had shown him that there was still beauty in the world. The winter of their destruction would never end. Because of the venom— its scars still burned, as bright as Lord Fowl's eyes and the flesh of his right forearm, impelling him to power. The sunbane warped law, birthed abominations, but Covenant might bring time itself to chaos. At no great distance from him, the Wedge no longer battled offensively. It struggled simply to stay alive. Several Wainham had fallen in bonds of ice they could not break. More would die soon as the Argula raised their wall. Hamako remained on his feet, but had no weapon, no way to wield the might of the wedge. He was thrust into the center of the formation, and to wane him took his place, fighting with all the fluid force its small blade could channel. "'Giant friend!' the first yelled. "'Covenant!' The wedge was dying, 
but the giants dared not act, for fear that they would place themselves in the way of Covenant's fire. Because of the venom, sick fury pounding like desire between the bones of his forearm. He had been made so powerful that he was powerless. His desperation demanded blood. Slipping back his sleeve, he gripped his right wrist with his left hand to increase his leverage, then hacked his scarred forearm at the sharpest edges of the rock. His flesh ground against the jagged projections. Red slicked the stone, spattered the snow, froze in the cold. He ignored it. The clave had cut his wrists to gain power for the sooth-tell, which had guided and misled him. Deliberately he mangled his forearm, striving by pain to conceive an alternative to venom, struggling to cut the fang marks out of his soul. Then Lyndon hit him. The blow knocked him back. Flagrant with urgency and concern, she caught her fists in his robe, shook him like a child, raged at him. "'Listen to me!' she flamed, as if she knew he could hardly hear her, could not see anything except the blood he had left on the rock. "'It's like the Kemper. Like Kosrain. Back and forth she heaved him, trying to wrestle him into focus on her. Like his son. The Argula have something like his son. At that, clarity struck Covenant so hard that he nearly fell. The Kemper's son. Oh, my God. The Croyle. Before the thought was finished, he had broken Linden's grasp and was running toward the giants. The Croyle the succubus from the dark places of the earth, which Kosrain had borne on his back, and with which he had bargained for his arts in his preternaturally prolonged life. And out there was an argul which looked like one ice beast crouched on another. That creature had contracted with the Croyal for the power to unite its kind and wage winter wherever it willed. Findale must have known— he must have understood what force supposed the wane him. Yet he had said nothing. But Covenant had no time to spend on the mendacity of the Elohim. Reaching the first, he shouted, Call them back! Make them retreat! They can't win this way! His arms scattered blood. We've got to tell them about the Croyle! She reacted as if he had unleashed her. Whirling, she gave one command that snatched the giants to her side, and together they charged into the fray. Covenant watched them go in fear and hope. Still furious for him, Lyndon came to his side. Taking rough hold of his right wrist, she forced him to bend his elbow and clamp it tightly to slow the bleeding. Then she watched with him in silence. With momentum, weight, and muscle, the four giants crashed in among the Argula. The first swung her long sword like a bludgeon, risking its metal against the gelid beasts. Hunnensgrave and Mistweave fought as hugely as titans. Pitchwife scrambled after them, doing everything he could to guard their backs. And as they battled, they shouted Covenant's call in the Roynish tongue of the Wainhem. The reaction of the wedge was almost immediate. Suddenly all the Wainhem pivoted to their left, and that corner of the formation became their apex. Sweeping Hamako along, they drove for the breach the giants had made in the attack. The Argola were slow to understand what was happening. The wedge was half free of the fray before the ice beasts turned to try to prevent the retreat. Pitchwife went down under two Argola. Hunnan's crave and Mistweave sprang to his aid like sledgehammers, yanking him out of the wreckage. A net took hold of the first. The leader of the wedge scored it to shreds. Frenetically, the Wainhem and the giant struggled toward Covenant. They were not swift enough to outrun the Argola. In moments they would be engulfed again. But the Wainhem had understood the giants. Abruptly, the wedge parted, spilling Hamako and a score of companions in Covenant's direction. Then the Reish reclosed their formation and attacked again. With the help of the giants, the wedge held back the Argula, while Hamako and his comrades sped toward Covenant and Linden. Covenant started shouting at Hamako before the stone downer neared him. But Hamako stopped, a short distance away, silenced Covenant with a gesture. "'You have done your part, Ringwielder,' he panted as his people gathered about him. The name of the Croyle is known among the Wainhem. He had to raise his voice. The creatures were chanting a new invocation. We lacked only the knowledge that the force confronting us was indeed Croyle, an invocation Covenant had heard before. What must be done is clear. 
Come no closer. As if to enforce his warning, Hamako drew a stone dirk from his belt. Recognition stung through Covenant. He was familiar with that knife, or one just like it. It went with the invocation. He tried to call out, Don't! but the protest failed in his mouth. Perhaps Hamako was right. Perhaps only such desperate measures could hope to save the embattled Rish. With one swift movement, the stone donner drew a long incision across the veins on the back of his hand. The cut did not bleed. At once he handed the dirk to awain him. Quickly it sliced the length of its palm, then passed the knife to its neighbor. Taking hold of Hamako's hand, the Wainham pressed its cut to his. While the invocation welled, the two of them stood there, joined by blood. When the Wainham stepped back, Hamako's eyes were acute with power. In the same way, his reach had given Covenant the strength to run without rest across the whole expanse of the center plains in pursuit of Linden, Sunder, and Hallian but that great feat had been accomplished with the vitality of only eight Wainham, and Covenant had barely been able to contain so much might. There were twenty creatures ranged around Hamako. The second had already completed its gift. One by one his adopted people cut themselves for him, pressed their blood into him, and each infusion gave him a surge of energy which threatened to burst his mortal bounds. It was too much— how could one human being hope to hold that much power within the vessel of ordinary thew and tissue? Watching, Covenant feared that Hamako would not survive. Then he remembered the annealed grief and determination he had seen in Hamako's eyes, and he knew the stone downer did not mean to survive. Ten Wainham had given their gift. Hamako's skin had begun to burn like tinder in the freezing air, but he did not pull back, and his companions did not stop. At his back, the battle was going badly. Covenant's attention had been fixed on Hamako. He had not seen how the Argula had contrived to split the wedge. But the formation was in two pieces now, each struggling to focus its halved strength, each unable to break through the ice to rejoin the other. More Wainham had fallen. More were falling. Ice crusted the giants so heavily that they seemed hardly able to move. They fought heroically, but they were no match for the beasts which could be brought back from death. Soon sheer fatigue would overcome them, and they would be lost for good and all. Go, Covenant panted to Kale. Icicles of blood splintered from his elbow when he moved his arm. Help them! But the Harochai did not obey. In spite of the ancient friendship between the giants and his people, his face betrayed no flicker of concern. His promise of service had been made to Covenant rather than to the first, and Bryn had commanded him to his place. Hellfire Covenant raged, but his ire was directed at himself. He could not tear his flesh until it fell from the bones, but he could not find his way out of the snare Lord Fowl had set for him. Fifteen Wainham had given blood to Hamako. Sixteen. Now the stone downer's radiance was so bright that it seemed to tug involuntary fire from Covenant's ring. The effort of withholding it reft him of balance and vision. Pieces of midnight wheeled through him. He did not see the end of the Wainham gift, could not witness the manner in which Hamako bore it. But as that power withdrew toward the Argula, Covenant straightened his legs, pushed himself out of Kale's grasp, and sent his gaze like a cry after the stone downer. Half naked in the low sunlight, and the tremendous cold, Hamako shone like a sinusure as he flashed through the ice beasts. The sheer intensity of his form melted the nearest attackers as if a furnace had come among them. From place to place within the fray he sped, clearing a space around the giants, opening the way for the Wainham to reform their wedge, and behind him, below dense clouds of vapor which obscured him in the battle, made everything uncertain. Then Linden shouted, There! All the steam burned away, denaturing so fiercely that the ice seemed to become air without transition, and the scene of the combat was as vivid as the waste. Scores of Argola still threw themselves madly against the wedge, but they had stopped using their ice to support each other, and some of them were attacking their fellows, tearing into each other as if the purpose which had united them a moment ago had been forgotten. Beyond the chaos, Hamako stood atop the leader of the Argola. He had vaulted up onto the high back of the strangely doubled beast and planted himself there, pitting his power squarely against the creature and its croyle. The beast did not attempt to topple him, bring him within reach of its limbs and maws, and he struck no blows. Their struggle was simple, fire against ice, 
white heat against white cold. He shone like a piece of the clean sun. The Argul glared bitter chill. Motionless, they aimed what they had become at each other, and the entire plane rang and blazed to the pitch of their contest. The strain of so much quintessential force was too much for Hamako's mortal flesh to sustain. In desperate pain he began to melt like a tree under the desert avatar of the sunbane. His legs slumped, the skin of his limbs spilled away, his features blurred. A cry that had no shape stretched his mouth. But while his heart beat, he was still alive, tempered to his purpose and indomitable. The focus of his given heat did not waver for an instant. All the losses he had suffered, all the loves which had been taken from him, came together here, and he refused defeat. In spite of the ruin which sloughed away his flesh, he raised his arms, brandished them like sodden sticks at the wide sky. And the double creature under him melted as well. Both Argul and Croyal collapsed into water and slush until their deaths were inseparable from his. One stained pool slowly freezing on the faceless plain. With an almost audible snap, the unnatural cold broke. Most of the Argula went on trying to kill each other until the Reach drove them away. But the power they had brought with them was gone. Linden was sobbing openly, though all her life she had taught herself to keep her grief silent. Why? she protested through her tears. Why did they let him do it? Covenant knew why. Because Hamako had been twice bereft, when no man or woman or wane him should have had to endure such loss, so much as once. As the sun went down in red and rue beyond the western line of the escarpment, Covenant closed his eyes, hugged his bloody arm to his chest, and listened to the lamentation of the Wayne hymn rising into the dusk. 7. Physician's Plight Though the night was moonless, the company resumed its journey shortly after the Wayne hymn had finished caring for their dead. The giants were unwilling to submit to their weariness, and the pain Covenant shared with Linden made him loath to remain anywhere near the place of Hamako's end. While Mistweave prepared a meal, Linden treated Covenant's arm, washing it with vitrim, wrapping it in firm bandages. Then she required him to drink more diamond draft than he wanted. As a result, he could hardly keep himself awake as the company left the region of the last Rishishim, while several Wainham guided the giants up the escarpment. He strove against sleep. He knew what his dreams were going to be. For a time the hurt in his forearm helped him, but once the giants had said their long, heartfelt farewells to the Wainham, and had settled into a steady gait striding southwestward as swiftly as the dim starlight permitted, he found that even pain was not enough to preserve him from nightmares. In the middle of the night he wrenched himself out of a vision of Hamako which had made him sweat anguish. With renewed fervor he fought the effect of the diamond draft. "'I was wrong,' he said to the empty dark. Perhaps no one heard him over the muffled sound of the runners in the snow. He did not want anyone to hear him. He was not speaking to be heard. He only wanted to fight off sleep, stay away from dreams. I should have listened to Moram. The memory was like a dream. It had the strange imminence of dreaming, but he clung to it because it was more tolerable than Hamako's death. When High Lord Moram had tried to summon him to the land for the last battle against Lord Fowl, he, Covenant, had resisted the call. In his own world a small girl had just been bitten by a timber rattler, a lost child who needed his help. He had refused Moram and the land in order to aid that girl. And Moram had replied, Unbeliever, I release you. You turn from us to save life in your own world. We will not be undone by such motives. And if darkness should fall upon us, still the beauty of the land endures, for you will not forget. Go in peace. I should have understood, Covenant went on, addressing no one but the cold stars. I should have given Sea Dreamer some kind of Kaamora, should have found some way to save Hamako. Forget the risk. Moram took a terrible risk when he let me go. But anything worth saving won't be destroyed by choices like that. He did not blame himself. He was simply trying to hold back nightmares of fire. But he was human and weary, and only the blankets wrapped around him held any warmth at all. Eventually his dreams returned. He could not shake the image of Hamako's strange immolation. Without hope he slept until sunrise. 
When he opened his eyes, he found that he was stretched out, not in the sled, but in blankets on the snow-packed ground. His companions were with him, though only Kale, Pitchwife, Vane, and Findale were awake. Pitchwife stirred the faggots of a small fire, watching the flames as if his heart were somewhere else. Above him loomed a ragged cliff, perhaps two hundred feet high. The sun had not yet reached him, but it shone squarely on the bouldered wall, giving the stones a faint red hue, like a reminder that beyond them lay the sunbane. While Covenant slept, the company had camped at the foot of Land's Drop. Still groggy with diamond draft, he climbed out of his blankets, cradling his pain-stiff arm inside his robe next to the scar in the center of his chest. Pitchwife glanced at him absently, then returned his gaze to the fire. For the first time in many long days of exposure, no ice crusted the twisting lines of his visage. Though Covenant's breath steamed as if his life were escaping from him, he was conscious that the winter had become oddly bearable, preferable to what lay ahead. The small fire was enough to steady him. Left dumb by dreams and memories, Covenant stood beside the deformed giant. He found an oblique comfort in Pitchwife's morose silence. Surely Kale's flat mien contained no comfort. The Harochai were capable of grief and admiration and remorse. But Kale kept whatever he felt hidden. And in their opposite ways, Vane and Findale represented the antithesis of comfort. Vane's makers had nearly exterminated the Wainhem, and Findale's yellow eyes were miserable with the knowledge he refused to share. He could have told Hamako's Reish about the Croyle. Perhaps that would not have altered Covenant's plight, or Hamako's, but it would have saved lives. Yet when Covenant looked at the Elohim, he felt no desire to demand explanations. He understood Findale's refusal to do anything which might relieve the pressure of his Covenant's culpability, the pressure to surrender his ring. He did not need explanations. Not yet. He needed vision recipients. He wanted to ask the appointed, do you think she's up to it? Is she that strong? However, he already knew the answer. She was not that strong, but she was growing toward strength as if it were her birthright. Only her preterite self-contradictions held her back, that paralysis which gripped her when she was caught between the horror of what her father had done to her and the horror of what she had done to her mother, between her fundamental passions for and against death and she had a better right to the wild magic than he did, because she could see. Around him his companions began to stir. The first sat up suddenly, her sword in her hands. She had been dreaming of battle. As he rose stiffly to his feet, Hanenscrave's eyes looked strangely like Kamako's, as if he had learned something grim and sustaining from the example of the stone-downer. Mistweave shambled upright like an image of confusion, the man baffled by his own emotions. The release and clarity of fighting the Argola had met some of his needs, but had not restored his sense of himself. When Lyndon awoke, her gaze was raw and aggrieved, as if she had spent half the night unable to staunch her tears. Covenant's heart went out to her, but he did not know how to say so. The previous evening she had tended his mangled arm with a ferocity which he recognized as love, but the intensity of his self-repudiation had isolated them from each other and now he could not forget that her right was better than his, that his accumulating falseness corrupted everything he did or wanted to do. He had never learned how to give up. His nightmares insisted that he needed the fire he feared. Mistweave moved woodenly about the task of preparing breakfast, but abruptly Pitchwife stopped him. Without a word, the crippled giant rose to his feet. His manner commanded the attention of the company. For a moment, he remained motionless and rigid, his eyes damp in the sunrise. Then, hoarsely, he began to sing. His melody was a giantish plain song, and his stretched and frayed voice drew a faint echo from the cliff of Landsdrop, an added resonance, so that he seemed to be singing for all his companions, as well as for himself. My heart has rooms that sigh with dust and ashes in the hearth. They must be cleaned and blown away by daylight's breath. But I cannot essay the task, for even dust to me is dear, for dust and ashes still recall my love was here. I know not how to say farewell, when farewell is the word that stays alone for me to say, or will be heard. 
but I cannot speak out that word or ever let my loved one go. How can I bear it that these rooms are empty so? I sit among the dust and hope that dust will cover me. I stir the ashes in the hearth, though cold they be. I cannot bear to close the door to seal my loneliness away, while dust and ashes yet remain of my love's day. When he was done, the first hugged him hard, and Mistweave looked like he had been eased. Linden glanced at Covenant, bit her lips to keep them from trembling. But Hanenscrave's eyes remained shrouded, and his jaws chewed gall as though farewell were not the only word he could not bring himself to utter. Covenant understood. Sea Dreamer had given his life as bravely as Hamako, but no victory had been gained to make his death endurable, and no Kaamora had been granted to accord him peace. The unbeliever was bitterly afraid that his own death would have more in common with Sea Dreamer's than with Hamako's. While the companions ate a meal and repacked the sleds, Covenant tried to imagine how they would be able to find their way up the harsh cliff. Here Landsdrop was not as imposing as it was near the center of the land, where a thousand feet and more of steep rock separated the lower land from the upper, Sarengrave flat from Andalane, and where Mount Thunder crouched like a titan, presiding darkly over the rift. But still the cliff appeared impassable. But the eyesight of the giants had already discovered an answer. They towed the sleds southward, and in less than a league they reached a place where the rim of the precipice had collapsed, sending a wide scallop of earth down fan-like across its base. This slope was manageable, though Covenant and Linden had to ascend on foot while the giants carried the sleds. Before the morning was half gone, the company stood among the snows of the upper land. Covenant scanned the terrain apprehensively, expecting at any moment to hear Linden announce that she could see the sunbane rising before them. But beyond Land's Drop lay only more winter, and a high ridge of mountains which blocked the west and south. These appeared to be as tall and arduous as the western mountains. However, the giants were undaunted, wise in the ways of peaks and valleys. Though the rest of the day was spent winding up into the thin air of the heights, Covenant and Linden were able to remain in their sleds, and the company made good progress. But the next day the way was harder, steeper, cramped with boulders and old ice, and wind came slashing off the crags to blind the eyes, confuse the path. Covenant clung to the back of the sled and trudged after Hanensgrave. His right arm throbbed as if the cold were gnawing at it. His numb hands had no strength. Yet Vitrim and Diamond Draft were healing him faster than he would have believed possible, and the desire not to burden his companions kept him on his feet. He lost all sense of progress. The ridge seemed to tower above him. Whenever he tried to breathe deeply, the air sawed at his lungs. He felt frail and useless and immeasurably far from Revelstone. Still he endured. The specific disciplines of his leprosy had been lost long ago, but their spirit remained to him, the dogged and meticulous insistence on survival which took no account of the distance ahead or the pain already suffered. When the onset of evening finally forced the company to halt, he was still on his feet. The following day was worse. The air became as cold as the malice of the Argola. Wind flayed like outrage down the narrow combs, which gave the company passage. Time and again Kale had to help either Covenant or Linden, or was needed to assist the sleds. But he seemed to flourish in this thin air. The giants fought and hauled their way upward as if they were prepared to measure themselves against any terrain. And Linden stayed with them somehow, as stubborn as Covenant, and, in an odd way, tougher. Her face was as pale as the snow among the protruding rocks. Cold glazed her eyes like frost, yet she persevered. And that night the company camped in the lower end of a pass between peaks ranging dramatically toward the heavens. Beyond the far mouth of the pass were no more mountains high enough to catch the sunset. The companions had to struggle to keep their fire alight long enough to prepare a meal. The wind keening through the pass tore at the brands. Without a makeshift windbreak of blankets, no fire would have been possible at all. But the giants did their best, contrived both to warm some food and to heat the water Linden needed for Covenant's arm. When she unwrapped his bandages, he was surprised to see that his self-inflicted wounds were nearly well. 
After she had washed the slight infection which remained, she applied another light bandage to protect his arm from being chafed. Grateful for her touch, her concern, her endurance, for more things than he could name in that wind, he tried to thank her with his eyes. But she kept her gaze averted, and her movements were abrupt and troubled. When she spoke, she sounded as forlorn as the peaks. We're getting close to it. This— she made a gesture that seemed to indicate the wind. It's unnatural. The reaction to something on the other side. The lines of her face stiffened into a scowl. If you want my guess, I'd say there's been a desert sun for two days now. She stopped. Tensely, Covenant waited for her to go on. From the first, the sunbane had been a torment to her. The added dimension of her senses exposed her unmercifully to the outrage of that evil— to the alternating drought and suppuration of the world, the burning of the deserts and the screaming of the trees. Gibbon had prophesied that the true destruction of the earth would be on her head rather than covenants, that she would be driven by her very health sense to commit every desecration the despiser required. And then the raver had touched her, poured his malice like distilled corruption into her vulnerable flesh, and the horror of that violation had reduced her to a paralysis as deep as catatonia for two days. When she had come out of it, after Covenant had rescued her from the hold of Revelstone, she had turned her back entirely on the resource of her percipients. She had begged him to spare her, as he had tried to spare Joan, and she had not begun to recover until she had been taught that her health sense was also open to beauty, that when it exposed her to ill, it also empowered her to heal. She was a different woman now. He was humbled by the thought of how far she had come. But the test of the sunbane remained before her. He did not know what was in her heart, but he knew as well as she did that she would soon be compelled to carry a burden which had already proved too heavy for her once. A burden which would never have befallen her a second time if he had not allowed her to believe the lie that they had a future together. Firelight and the day's exertions made her face ruddy against the background of the night. Her long, untended hair fluttered on either side of her head. In her eyes, the reflection of the wind-whipped flames capered. She looked like a woman whose features would not obey her, refused to resume the particular severity which had marked her life. She was returning to the place and the peril that had taught her to think of herself as evil. Evil and doomed. I never told you, she murmured at last. I just wanted to forget about it. We got so far away from the land. Even Gibbon's threats started to seem unreal. But now— For a moment her gaze followed the wind. I can't stop thinking about it. After the extremity of the things she had already related to him, Covenant was dismayed that more remained to be told. But he held himself as steady as he could, did not let his regard for her waver. That night, an ache crept into her voice. The first night we were on Starfare's Gem, before I finally figured out we had a raver aboard, and that rat bit you. He remembered that bite had triggered a venom relapse, which had nearly destroyed the quest and the search and the Dromond before she found a way to penetrate it and treat him. I had the most terrible nightmare. Softly, she described the dream. They had been in the woods behind Haven Farm, and he had taken Joan's place at the mercy of Lord Fowle's misled band of fanatics. And she, Lyndon, had gone running down the hillside to save him, but never in all her life had she been able to stop the violence which had driven the knife into his chest. And from the wound had gushed more blood than she had ever seen. It had welled out of him as if a world had been slain with that one blow as if the thrust of the knife had stabbed the very heart of the land. She had been altogether unable to staunch it. She had nearly drowned in the attempt. The memory left her aghast in the unsteady light, but now she did not stop. She had been gnawing her questions for a long time, and knew with frightening precision what she wanted to ask. Looking straight into Covenant's consternation, she said, "'On Kevin's watch, you told me there were two different explanations.' external and internal, like the difference between surgery and medicine. The internal one 
was that we're sharing a dream. Tied into the same unconscious process, you said. That fits. If we're dreaming, then naturally any healing that happens here is just an illusion. It couldn't have any effect on the bodies we left behind, on our physical continuity back where we came from. But what does it mean when you have a nightmare in a dream? Isn't that some kind of prophecy? Her directness surprised him. She had surpassed him. He could not follow without groping. His own dreams— Quickly he scrambled to protest. Nothing's that simple. But then he had to pause. An awkward moment passed before he found a countering argument. You had that dream under the influence of a raver. You dreamed what it made you feel. Lord Fowl's prophecy, not yours. It doesn't change anything. Lyndon was no longer looking at him. She had bowed her head, braced her forehead in her palms, but her hands did not hide the silent tears streaming down her cheeks. That was before I knew anything about power. With an honesty that dismayed him, she exposed the root of her distress. I could have saved Hamako. I could have saved them all. You were so close to erupting. I could have taken your wild magic and torn out that Croyle's heart. I'm no danger to the Arch of Time. None of them had to die. Dread burned like shame across his face. He knew she spoke the truth. Her health sense was still growing. Soon she would become capable of anything. He swallowed a groan. Why didn't you? I was watching you, she flung back at him in sudden anguish. Watching you tear your arm apart. I couldn't think about anything else. The sight of her pain enabled him to take hold of himself, fight down his instinctive panic. He could not afford to be afraid. She needed something better from him. I'm glad you didn't, he said. Never mind what it would have done to me. I'm glad you didn't for his sake. Thinking of her mother, he added deliberately, You let him achieve the meaning of his own life. At that, her head jerked up. Her gaze knifed at him. He died, she hissed, like an imprecation too fierce and personal to be shouted. He saved your life at least twice, and he spent his own life serving the land you claim to care so much about. And the people that adopted him were nearly wiped off the face of the earth, and he died. Covenant did not flinch. He was ready now for anything she might hurl at him. His own nightmares were worse than this. And he would have given his soul for the ability to match Hamako. I'm not glad he died. I'm glad he found an answer. For a long moment her glare held, but then slowly the anger frayed out of her face. At last her eyes fell. Thickly she murmured, I'm sorry. I just don't understand. Killing people is wrong. The memory of her mother was present to her, as it was to Covenant. But dear Christ, saving them has got to be better than letting them die. Linden. She clearly did not want him to say anything else. She had raised the fundamental question of her life and needed to answer it herself. But he could not let the matter drop. With all the gentleness he had in him, he said, Hamako didn't want to be saved. For the opposite reason that your father didn't want to be saved. And he won. I know, she muttered. I know. I just don't understand it. As if to keep him from speaking again, she left the fire, went to get her blankets. He looked around at the mute, attentive faces of the giants, but they had no other wisdom to offer him. He wanted intensely to be saved himself, but no one would be able to do that for him unless he surrendered his ring. He was beginning to think that his death would be welcome when it came. A short time later, the fire blew out. Mistweave tried to light it again and failed, but when Covenant finally went to sleep, he dreamed that the blaze had become violent enough to consume him. During the night the wind died. The dawn was as clear as crystal, and the crags shone in the high, thin air as if no taint could reach them. A mood of impossible hope came over the companions as they labored toward the far end of the pass. Under their circumstances the view from that eminence would have delighted them. Sunlight flashed through the pass to illumine the range as it tumbled downward in a dramatic succession of snow-bright crests and saw-backed arrays. Mighty heads, fronting the heavens, 
and spines sprawling toward lower ground. And beyond the bare foothills, all the way to the southwestern horizon, lay the high north plains which led to Revelstone. But where the sun hit the plains they looked as brown and battered as a desert. That in itself would not have wrenched the giants to silence, raised Lyndon's hands to her mouth, stifled Covenant's breathing, for at this time of year the region below them might be naturally dry. But as soon as the sun touched the denuded waste, a green fur began to spread across it. Distance made teeming shoots and sprouts look like an unconscionably rapid pelt. With a curse, Covenant wheeled to scan the sun, but he could see no sign of the corona which should have accompanied the sudden verdure. "'We're under the fringe,' said Lyndon tonelessly. "'I told you about that. The last time we crossed Landsdrop. We won't see the aura until later.' Covenant had not forgotten her explanation. The sun main was a corruption of earth power, and it rose from the ground, from the deep roots of Mount Thunder, where Lord Fowl now made his home. But it was focused or triggered by the sun, and manifested itself visibly there, in the characteristic penumbra of its phases, and the power for perversion of its initial contact. Thickly he grated to his companions, "'We'll need stone for protection. It's the first touch that does the damage.' He and Lyndon had been preserved by the alien leather of their footwear. The Harochai and Vane had already shown that they were immune. Findale needed no advice on how to care for himself. But the giants! Covenant could not bear that they might be at risk. From now on, every day, we've got to have stone under us when the sun comes up. The first nodded mutely. She and her people were still staring at the green mantle which thickened at every moment across the distant plains. That sight made Covenant long for Sunder and Hullion. The graveler of Mithill Stone Down had left his home and people to serve as Covenant's guide through the perils of the Sunbane, and his obdurate skill and provenance, his self-doubting courage, had kept Covenant and Lyndon alive, and Hullion's ebrand ability to foretell the phases of the Sunbane had been invaluable. Though he had giants with him now, and Lyndon's strength, Covenant felt entirely unready to face the sunbane without the support of his former companions. And he wanted to know what had happened to them. He had sent them from Sea Reach because they had believed that they had no clear role in the quest for the One Tree, no place among such mighty beings as giants, and because he had loathed to leave the clave uncontested during the unpredictable period of his absence. So he had given them the Krill of Lorik the powerful blade which she had raised from Glimmermere, and he had laid upon them the charge of mustering resistance among the villages against the bloody requirements of the clave. Accompanied only by Stell and Harn, armed with nothing more than their own knives, the krill, Sunder's or crest stone, and Hollyan's Leonar wand, and encouraged by the thin hope that they might eventually gain the aid of Mor Harochai, the two lone stone downers had gone in sunlight and poignant valor to hazard their lives against the forces which ruled the land. That memory outweighed any amount of unreadiness. The distant preternatural green swelling below him brought back the past with renewed vividness. Sunder and Hollyan were his friends. He had come this far in the name of Revelstone and the Clave, but now he wanted keenly to rejoin the two stone-downers. Rejoin, or avenge. Come on, he rasped to his companions. Let's get down there. The first gave him a measuring glance, as though she half distrusted the constant hardening of his attitude. But she was not a woman who hung back. With a stern nod, she sent him and Lyndon to the sleds. Then she turned and started down the steep snowbound slope, as if she too could not wait to confront the ill that had brought the search here. Heaving Covenant's sled into motion, Hunnenscrave let out a cry like a challenge and went plunging after the sword mane. In the course of that one day the company passed down out of the mountains, came to the foothills and the end of the snow. Careening at a mad pace which could only have been controlled by giants, they sped from slope to slope, pausing only when the first needed to consider her best route. She seemed determined to regain the time lost by the arduous ascent of the range. Before noon a band of green, the color of chrysoprase and daffin's eyes, closed around the sun like a garrote but Covenant could not look at it. He was nearly blind with vertigo. 
He was barely able to cling to the rails of the sled and hold the contents of his stomach down. Then the ice and snow of the heights failed on the verge of a moiling chaos of vegetation, which had already grown high enough to appear impenetrable. His head still reeling, Covenant considered himself fortunate that dusk prevented the first from tackling the verger immediately. But the sword mane was not insensitive to the nausea in his face, or the aggravated ache in Linden's. While Mistweave and Hanenscrave prepared a camp, she passed a flask of diamond draft to the two humans, and then left them alone to try to recover themselves. The liquor settled Covenant's guts, but could not soften the wide, white outrage and dread of Lyndon's stare. At intervals during the evening, Pitchwife and the First addressed comments to her, but her replies were monosyllabic and distant. The crouching vegetation spoke a language that only she could hear, consuming her attention. Unconscious of being watched, she chewed her lips as if she had lost her old severity and did not know how to recapture it. Her huddled posture, thighs pressed against her chest, arms hugged around her shins, chin braced on her knees, reminded him of a time many days ago, a time when they had begun traveling together, and she had nearly broken under the pressure of her first fertile son. She had quailed into herself, protesting, I can't shut it out, it's too personal, I don't believe in evil. She believed in evil now, but that only made the sensory assault of the sunbane more intimate and unanswerable as heinous as murder, and as immedicable as leprosy. He tried to stay awake with her, offering her the support of his silent companionship, but she was still taut and unslumbrous when the mortal pull of his dreams took him away. He went to sleep thinking that if he had possessed anything akin to her percipience, the land would not be in such danger, and she would not be so alone. Visions he could neither face nor shun seemed to protract the night. Yet dawn and Kale's rousing touch came too early. He woke with a jerk and found himself staring at the dense growth. His companions were already up. While Pitchwife and Mistweave prepared a meal, and Hanans Crave dismantled the sleds, the first studied the choked terrain, clenching a tuneless hum between her teeth. A gap among the peaks sent an early shaft of light onto the vegetation directly in front of the camp. The sun would touch the company soon. Covenant's skin crawled as he watched the verdure writhe and grow. The contrast between the places where the sun hit and where it did not only made the effect more eerie and ominous. In the stony soil among the foothills there were no trees, but the hardy twisted shrubs were already as tall as trees. Thistles and other weeds crowded the ground between the trunks. Huge slabs of lichen clung to the rocks like scabs and everything the sun touched grew so rapidly that it seemed animate, a form of helpless flesh tortured mercilessly toward the sky. He had forgotten how horrific the sunbane truly was. He dreaded the moment when he would have to descend into that lush green anguish. Then the sunlight fell through the gap onto the company. At the last moment the first Hanan's grave and Pitchwife had found rocks on which to stand. Under Mistweave's feet lay the stone with which he had formerly shielded his campfires from ice and snow. Distantly, Lyndon nodded at the caution of the giants. "'Kale's got something you don't,' she murmured. "'You need the protection.' But Vane and Findale required no defense, and Covenant and Lyndon had their footwear. Together they faced the onset of the sun. As it first crested the gap, the sun appeared normal. For that reason, at least, this much of the foothills remained free of vegetation. Yet the company stayed motionless, suspended and silent in an anticipation like dread. And before their eyes the sun changed. A green aura closed around it, altering the light. Even the strip of bare ground between the end of the snow and the beginning of the vegetation took on an emerald timber. Because of the winter which still held the mountains, the air was not warm, but Covenant found that he was sweating. Grimly, Lyndon turned her back on the sun. The giants went to their tasks. Vane's constant, black, ambiguous smile betrayed no reaction. But Findale's pain-marked face looked more aggrieved than ever. Covenant thought he saw the Elohim's hands trembling. Shortly after the company had eaten, Hanan's Crave finished reducing the sleds to firewood. He and Mistweave packed their supplies into huge bundles for themselves and smaller ones for Pitchwife and the First. 
Soon Covenant's companions were prepared to commence the day's journey. "'Giant friend,' the first asked sternly, "'is there peril for us here other than that which we have all witnessed?' Peril, he thought dumbly. If the riders of the clave don't come this far north, and nothing else has changed. Not under this sun, he replied with sweat in his voice. But if we stand still too long, we'll have trouble moving again. The sword mane nodded. That is plain. Drawing her blade, she took two long steps down the hillside and began hacking tall thistles out of her way. Hanensgrave followed her. With his bulk and muscle, he widened her path for the rest of the company. Covenant compelled himself to take his position at Pitchwife's back. Kale followed between the Unbeliever and Lyndon. Then came Mistweave, with Vane and Findale inseparably behind him. In that formation, the failed quest for the one tree met the atrocity of the sunbane. For the morning and part of the afternoon, they managed a surprising pace— Monstrous scrub brush and weeds gave way to stands of immense, raw bracken clotted with clumps of grass, and every added degree of the sun's arc made each frond and leaf and stem yearn more desperately upward, as frantic as the damned. Yet the first and Hunnan's grave forged ahead as fast as Covenant and Linden could comfortably walk. The air became warmer, noticeably more humid, as the snows and elevation of the mountains were left behind. Although Covenant had added his robe to Pitchwife's bundle, he perspired constantly. But his days in the range had toughened him somewhat. He was able to keep the pace. But toward mid-afternoon the company entered a region like a surreal madland. Juniper trees as contorted as ghouls sprawled thickly against each other, strangled by the prodigious vines which festooned them like the web of a gargantuan and insane spider. And between the vine stems and tree trunks the ground was profuse with lurid orchids that smelled like poison. The first struck one fierce blow against the nearest vine, then snatched back her green slick blade to see if she had damaged it. The stem was as hard as ironwood. Around her the trees and vines rustled like execration. In order to advance at all, the companions had to clamor and squirm awkwardly among the hindrances. Night caught them in the middle of the region, but no stone in sight, and scarcely enough space for them to lay their blankets between the trunks. But when Kale roused the company the next morning, they found that he had somehow contrived to collect sufficient small rocks to protect two of the giants, and the stone which Mistweave still carried could hold two more. Thus warded, they braced themselves to meet the sun. When its first touch filtered insidiously down through the choked trees, Covenant flinched, and Lyndon jerked the hand to her mouth to stifle a gasp. They could see only pieces of the sun's aura, but those pieces were red, the color of pestilence. Two days, Covenant spat to keep himself from groaning. It's getting worse. The first stared at him. Bitterly he explained that the sunbane had formerly moved in a cycle of three days. Any shortening of that period meant that its power was increasing, and that meant— But he could not say such things aloud. The hurt of them went too deep. It meant that Sunder and Hollion had failed, or that the Namoram had found a source of blood as large as his malice, or that Lord Fowl was now confident of victory, and therefore the clave no longer made any pretense of holding back the sunbane. Glowering, the first absorbed Covenant's answer. After a moment she asked carefully, "'May it be that this is but a variation, that the essential period remains unaltered?' That was possible. He remembered one son of two days, but when he turned to Lyndon for her opinion she was not looking at him. Her hand did not come down from her mouth. Her teeth were closed on the knuckle of her index finger, and a drop of blood marked her chin. "'Lyndon!' he grabbed at her wrist, yanked her hand away. Her dismay slapped at him. The son of pestilence. Her voice came twisted and harsh from her knotted throat. Have you forgotten what it's like? We don't have any Vura. At that a new fear stung Covenant. Vura was the pungent sap of a certain plant, the sap that warded off the insects which thrived under a red sun. And more, it was also an antidote for the sunbane sickness that pestilential disease could attack through any kind of exposed cut or injury. 
Hellfire, he breathed. Then snapped, Get a bandage on that finger. His arm was healed enough to be safe, but this sun might prove the small marks on her knuckle fatal. Around him steam rolled like a miasma. Wherever the light touched the vines and trunks, their bark opened and began to ooze. The steam stank of decomposition. Nameless insects started to whine like augers through the mounting stench. Suddenly Covenant caught up with Lyndon's apprehension. In addition to everything else, she had realized before he did that even a giant might sicken and fail from breathing too much of that vapor, or from being bitten by too many of those insects. She had not moved. Her eyes appeared glazed and inward as if she could not move. Small red beads formed around her knuckle and dropped to the dirt. Fierce with exasperation and alarm, Covenant snarled at her. By hell, I said, get a bandage on that finger, and think of something. We're in big trouble. She flinched. No, she whispered. The delicacy of her features seemed to crumble. No, you don't understand. You don't feel it. It was never this... I can't remember. She swallowed heavily to keep herself from crying out, and her tone became flat and dead. You don't feel it. It's hideous. You can't fight it. Wisps of steam passed in front of her face, as if she too had begun to rot. Urgently, Covenant grabbed her shoulders, ground his numb fingers into her. Maybe I can't. But you can. You're the Sun Sage. What do you think you're here for? The Sun Sage. Elohim had given her that title. For an instant, her gaze became wild, and he feared he had torn the thin fabric of her sanity. But then her eyes focused on him with an emotional impact that made him wince. Abruptly she was alabaster and adamantine in his grasp. Let go of me, she articulated distinctly. You don't give enough to have the right. He pleaded with her mutely, but she did not relent. When he dropped his arms and stepped back, she turned away as if she were dismissing him from her life. To the first she said, Get some green wood, branches, or whatever you can find. She sounded oddly hard and brittle, not to be touched. Soak the ends in vitrum and light them. The smoke should give us some protection. The first cocked an eyebrow at the tension between Covenant and Lyndon. But the giants did not hesitate. They were acquainted with Lyndon's health sense. In moments they had wrenched several boughs the size of brands from nearby trees. Pitchwife muttered mournfully at the idea of using his precious vitrum for such a purpose, but he handed one of his pouches to the first readily enough. Shortly the four giants and Kale held flaming branches that guttered and spat with enough smoke to palliate the reek of rot. Outsized flying insects hummed angrily through the area, then shut off in search of other prey. When the supplies had been repacked, the first turned to Linden for instructions, tacitly recognizing the change which had taken place in the Chosen. Covenant was giant friend and ring-wielder, but it was Linden's percipients upon which the company depended now for survival. Without a glance at Covenant, Linden nodded. Then she took Pitchwife's place behind the first and Hanan's crave, and the company started moving. Beclouded with smoke and rot, they struggled on through the wild region. Under the particular corruption of the sun's scarlet aura, vines which had been too hard for the first sword were now marked with swellings that burst and sores that ran. Feeder and borers took hold of some of the trees, ate out their hearts. Others lost wide strips of bark, exposing bald wood, fatally veined with termites. The narcoleptic sweetness of the orchids penetrated the acrid smoke from time to time. Covenant felt that he was laboring through the fruition of what Lord Fowl had striven to achieve ten years and three and a half millennia ago, the desecration of all of the land's health to leprosy. Here the despiser emerged in the throes of victory. The beauty of land and law had been broken, with smoke in his eyes and revulsion in his guts, images of gangrene and pain on all sides. Covenant found himself praying for a son of only two days. Yet the red sun produced one benefit. The rotting of the wood allowed the first to begin cutting a path once more. The company was able to improve its pace, and finally the juniper wild land opened into an area of tall, thick grass, as corrupt and cloying as a tar pit. The first called a halt for a brief meal, 
and a few swallows of diamond draft. Covenant needed the liquor, but he could hardly eat. His gaze refused to leave the swelling of Lyndon's bitten finger. Sunbane sickness, he thought miserably. She had suffered from it once before. Sunder and Hollyan, who were familiar with such sickness, had believed that she would die. He would never forget the look of her, as she had lain helpless in the grip of convulsions as flagrant as his nightmares. Only her health sense and Vura had saved her. That memory compelled him to risk her ire. More harshly than he intended, he began, "'I thought I told you, and I told you,' she retorted, "'to leave me alone. I don't need you to mother me.' But he faced her squarely, forced her to recognize his concern. After a moment her belligerence failed. Frowning, she turned her head away. "'You don't have to worry about it,' she sighed. "'I know what I'm doing. It helps me concentrate.' "'Helps?' He did not know how to understand her. "'Sunder was right,' she responded. "'This is the worst, the son of pestilence. It sucks at me, or soaks into me. I don't know how to describe it. I become it. It becomes me.' The simple act of putting her plight into words made her shudder. Deliberately she raised her hand, studied her hurt finger. The pain, the way it scares me, it helps make the distinction. It keeps me separate. Covenant nodded. What else could he do? Her vulnerability had become terrible to him. Huskily he said, Don't let it get too bad. Then he made another attempt to force food down into his knotted stomach. The rest of the day was atrocious, and the next day was worse. But early in the evening, amid the screaming of numberless cicadas, and the piercing frustration of huge smoke-daunted mosquitoes, the company reached a region of hills where wide boulders still protruded from the surrounding morass of moss and ground ivy. That proved to be a fortuitous camping place, for when the sun rose again it was wreathed in dusty brown after only two days. The elevation of the rocks protected the travelers from the effect of the desert sun on the putrefying vegetation. Everything that the fertile sun had produced, and the sun of pestilence had blighted, might as well have been made of wax. The brown-clad sun melted it all, reduced every form of plant fiber, every kind of sap or juice, every monstrous insect to a necrotic gray sludge. The few bushes in the area slumped like overheated candles. Moss and ivy sprawled into spilth that formed turbid pools in the low places of the terrain. The bugs of dawn fell like clotted drops of rain. Then the sludge denatured as if the desert sun drank it away. Long before mid-morning every slope and hollow and span of ground had been burned to naked ruin and dust. For the giants that process was more horrible than anything else they had seen. Until now only the scale of the sunbane's power had been staggering. Verdure grew naturally, and insects and rot could be included in the normal range of experience, but nothing had prepared Covenant's companions for the quick and entire destruction of so much prodigious vegetation and pestilence. Stirring about her, the first breathed, Ah, Cable Sea Dreamer, there is no cause for wonder that you lacked voice to utter such visions. The wonder is that you endured to bear them at all, and that you bore them in loneliness. Pitchwife clung to her as if he were reeling inwardly. Open nausea showed in Mistweave's face. He had learned to doubt himself, and now the things he could no longer trust covered all the world. But Hunnan's Crave's deep eyes flamed hotly, the eyes of a man who knew now beyond question that he was on the right path. Grimly, Lyndon demanded a knife from Pitchwife. For a moment he could not answer her, but at last the first stirred, turned from the harsh vista of the waste and her husband turned with her. Dazedly, Pitchwife gave Lyndon his blade. She used its tip to lance her infected finger. With vitrum, she cleansed the wound thoroughly, then bound it in a light bandage. When she was done, she lifted her head, and her gaze was as intense as Hanan's craves. Like him, she now appeared eager to go forward. Or like High Lord Elena, who had been driven by inextricable abhorrence and love, and by lust for power, to the mad act of breaking the law of death. After only three days under the sunbane, Lyndon appeared capable of such things. 
Soon the company started southwestward again across a wasteland which had become little more than an anvil for the fierce brutality of the sun. It brought back more of the past to Covenant. Heat haze as thick as hallucination and dust bleached to the color of dismay made his memories vivid. He and Lyndon had been summoned to Kevin's watch during a day of rain, but that night Sunder's father, Nasik, had been murdered, and the next day had arisen a desert sun, and Covenant and Lyndon had encountered a raver amid the hostility of Mithill Stonedown. Many of the consequences had fallen squarely upon Sunder's shoulders. As the Stonedown's graveler, he had already been required to shed the lives of his own wife and son, so that their blood would serve the village. And then the raver's actions had cost him his father, had compelled him to sacrifice his friend Marid to the sunbane, and had faced him with the necessity of bleeding his mother to death. Such things had driven him to flee his duty for the sake of the unbeliever and the chosen, and for his own sake, so that he would be spared the responsibility of more killing. Yet during that same desert sun, Covenant's life had also been changed radically. The corruption of that sun had made Marid monstrous enough to inflict the despiser's malice. Out in the wasteland of the South Plains, Marid had nailed venom between the bones of Covenant's forearm, crucifying him to the fate Lord Fowl had prepared for him. The fate of fire. In a nightmare of wild magic, his own terrible love and grief tore down the world. The sun would not let him think of anything else. The company had adequate supplies of water, diamond draft, and food, and when the haze took on the attributes of vertigo, leached the strength out of Covenant's legs, Hunnan's crave carried him. Foam Follower had done the same for him more than once, bearing him along the way of hope and doom. But now there was only haze and vertigo and despair, and the remorseless hammer-blow of the sun. That phase of the sunbane also lasted for only two days, but it was succeeded by another manifestation of pestilence. The red-tinged heat was less severe. The stricken plains contained nothing which could rot, and here the insect life was confined to creatures that made their homes in the ground. Yet this sun was arduous and bitter after its own fashion. It brought neither moisture nor shade up out of the waste, and before it ended the travelers began to encounter stag beetles and scorpions as big as wolves among the low hills. But the first sword kept such threats at bay and whenever Hanan's Crave and Mistweave took on the added weight of Covenant and Linden, the company made good speed. In spite of their native hardiness, the giants were growing weary, worn down by dust and heat and distance. But after the second day of pestilence came a sun of rain. Standing on stone to meet the dawn, the companions felt a new coolness against their faces as the sun rose tinged in blue like a concentration of the sky's deep azure. Then, almost immediately, black clouds began to pile westward. Covenant's heart lifted at the thought of rain, but as the wind stiffened, plucking insistently at his unclean hair and beard, he remembered how difficult it was to travel under such a sun. He turned to the first. We're going to need rope, the wind hummed in his ears, so we don't lose each other. Lyndon was staring toward the southwest as if the idea of Revelstone consumed all her thoughts. Distantly, she said, The rain isn't dangerous but there's going to be so much of it. The first glared at the clouds, nodded. Mistweave unslung his bundles and dug out a length of line. The rope was too heavy to be tied around Covenant and Linden, without hampering them. As the first raindrops hit, heavy as pebbles, the sword mane knotted the line to her own waist, then strung it back through the formation of the company to Mistweave, who anchored it. For a moment she scanned the terrain to fix her bearings in her mind. Then she started into the darkening storm. As loud as a rabble, the rain rushed out of the east. The clouds spanned the horizons, blocking the last light. Gloom fell like water into Covenant's eyes. Already he could barely discern the first at the head of the company. Pitchwife's misshapen outlines were blurred. The wind leaned against Covenant's left shoulder. His boots began to slip under him. Without transition, soil as desiccated as centuries of desert changed to mud and clay. Instant pools spread across the ground. The downpour became as heavy as cudgels. Blindly, he clung to the rope. It led into a blank abyss of rain. The world was reduced to this mad drenching lash and roar, this battering cold. He should have retrieved his robe before the rain started. His T-shirt was meaningless against the torrents. 
How could there be so much water when for days the North Plains and all the land had been desperately athirst? Only Pitchwife's shape remained before him, badly smudged, but still solid, the only solid thing left, except the rope. When he tried to look around toward Kale, Mistwee, Vane, and Findale, the storm hit him full in the face. It was a doom land, he wondered, because he had failed to find any answer to his dreams. Eventually even Pitchwife was gone. The staggering downpour dragged every vestige of light and vision out of the air. His hands, numb with leprosy and cold, Covenant could only be sure of the rope by clamping it under his elbow, leaning his weight on it. Long after he had begun to believe that the ordeal should be given up, that the company should find some shelter and simply huddle there while the storm lasted, the line went on drawing him forward. But then, as suddenly as the summons which had changed his life, the pressure jerked back on the rope, hauled it to a stop, and he nearly fell. While he stumbled for balance, the line went slack. Before he recovered, something heavy blundered against him, knocked him into the mire. The storm had a strange timber, as if people were shouting around him. Almost at once, huge hands took hold of him, heaved him to his feet. A giant, pitchwife. He was pushed a few steps toward the rear of the formation, then gripped to a halt. The rain was at his back. He saw three people in front of him. They all looked like Kale. One of them caught his arm, put a mouth to his ear. Kale's voice reached him dimly through the roar. Here are Darus and Fole of the Harochai. They have come with others of our people to oppose the clave. Rain pounded at Covenant. Wind reeled through him. Where's Sunder? he cried. Where's Hollyan? Blurred in the fury of the torrents, two more figures became discernible. One of them seemed to hold out an object toward Covenant. From it, a white light sprang through the storm, piercing the darkness. Incandescence shone from a clear gem which had been forged into a long dagger at the cross where blade and hilt came together. Its heat sizzled the rain, but the light itself burned as if no rain could touch it. The Krill of Lorik. It illuminated all the faces around Covenant. Kale and his kinfolk, Darus and Fole, Mistweave flanked by Vane and Findale, Pitchwife, the first and Hunnan's crave crowding forward with Linden between them, and the two people who had brought the Krill. Sunder, son of Nossick, Graveler from Mithill Stonedown. Hollyan Amoth daughter, Ebrand. 8. The Defenders of the Land The torrents came down like thunder. The rain was full of voices Covenant could not hear. Sunder's lips moved, made no sound. Hollyan blinked at the water, streaming her face as if she did not know whether to laugh or weep. Covenant wanted to go to them, throw his arms around them, in sheer relief that they were alive. But the light of the krill held him back. He did not know what it meant. The venom in his forearm ached to take hold of it and burn. Kale spoke directly into Covenant's ear again. The graveler asks if your quest has succeeded. At that, Covenant covered his face, pressed the ring's imminent heat against the bones of his skull. The rain was too much for him. Suppressed weeping knotted his chest. He had been so eager to find Sunder and Hollyan safe that he had never considered what the ruin of the quest would mean to them. The first's hearing was keener than his. Sunder's query had reached her. She focused her voice to answer him through the roar. The quest has failed. The words were raw with strain. Cable Sea Dreamer is slain. We have come seeking another hope. The full shout of Sunder's reply was barely audible. You will find none here. Then the light receded. The graveler had turned away. Holding the krill high to guide the company, he moved off into the storm. Covenant dropped his hands like a cry he could not utter. For an instant, no one followed Sunder. Silhouetted against the krill's shining, Hollyan stood before Covenant and Linden. He hardly saw what she was doing, as she came to him, gave him a tight hug of welcome. Before he was able to respond, she left him to embrace Linden. Yet her brief gesture helped him pull himself together. It felt like an act of forgiveness, or an affirmation that his return in Linden's were more important than hope. When Kale urged him after the light, he pushed his numb limbs into motion. They were in a low place between hills. Gathered water reached almost to his knees, but its current ran in the direction he was going, and Kale bore him up. 
the Harochai seemed more certain than ever. It must have been the mental communion of his people, which had drawn Durras and Foal, with the stone downers behind them, toward the company. And now Kale was no longer alone. Mud and streams and rain could not make him miss his footing. He supported Covenant like a figure of granite. Covenant had lost all sense of his companions, but he was not concerned. He trusted the other Harochai as he trusted Kale. Directing his attention to the struggle for movement, he followed Sunder as quickly as his imbalance and fatigue allowed. The way seemed long and harsh in the clutches of the storm. At last, however, he and Kale neared an impression of rock and saw Sunder's krill light reflecting wetly off the edges of a wide entrance to a cave. Sunder went directly in, used the argent heat of the krill to set a ready pile of wood afire. Then he rewrapped the blade and tucked it away within his leather jerkin. The flames were dimmer than the krill, but they spread illumination around a larger area, revealing bundles of wood and bedding stacked against the walls. The stone donners and Harochai had already established a camp here. The cave was high but shallow, hardly more than a depression in the side of a hill. The angle of the ceiling's overhang let rainwater run inward and drizzle to the floor, with the result that the cave was damp and the fire not easily kept alight. But even that relative shelter was a bomb to Covenant's battered nerves. He stood over the flames and tried to rub the dead chill out of his skin, watching Sunder while the company arrived to join him. Darus brought the four giants. Full guided Linden as if he had already arrogated to himself Mistweave's chosen place at her side. Vane and Findale came of their own accord, though they did not move far enough into the cave to avoid the lashing rain. And Hallian was accompanied by Harn, the Harochai, who had taken the Ebrand under his care in the days when Covenant had rescued them from the hold of Revelstone and the Banefire. Covenant stared at him. When Sunder and Hallian had left Sea Reach to begin their mission against the clave, Harn had gone with them, but not alone. They had also been accompanied by Stell, the Harochai who had watched over Sunder. Where was Stell? No, more than that. Worse than that. Where were the men and women of the land? The villagers Sunder and Hallian had gone to muster. And where were the rest of the Harochai? After the heinous slaughter which the clave had wrought upon the people, why had only Darus and Fol been sent to give battle? You will find none here. Had the Namoram already won? Gaping at Sunder across the guttering fire, Covenant moved his jaw, but no words came. In the cover of the cave the storm was muffled but incessant, fierce and hungry as a great beast. And Sunder was changed. In spite of all the blood, his role as the graveler of Mithill Stonedown had forced him to shed. He had never looked like a man who knew how to kill. But he did now. When Covenant had first met him, the stone downer's youthful features had been strangely confused and conflicted by the unresolved demands of his duty. His father had taught him that the world was not what the writers claimed it to be, a punishment for human offense, and so he had never learned to accept or forgive the acts which the rule of the clave and the stricture of the sunbane required him to commit. Unacknowledged revulsion had marked his forehead. His eyes had been worn dull by accumulated remorse. His teeth had ground together, chewing the bitter gristle of his irreconciliation. But now he appeared as honed and whetted as the poniard he had once used to take the lives of the people he loved. His eyes gleamed like daggers in the firelight, and all his movements were tense with coiled anger, a savage and baffled rage that he could not utter. His visage held no welcome. The first had told him that the quest had failed, yet his manner suggested that his tautness was not directed at the unbeliever, that even bare relief and pleasure had become impossible to articulate. In dismay, Covenant looked to Hallian for an explanation. The Ebrand also showed the marks of her recent life. Her leather shift was tattered in places, poorly mended. Her arms and legs exposed the thinness of scant rations and constant danger. Yet she formed a particular contrast to Sunder. They were both of sturdy stone downer stock, dark-haired and short, though she was younger than he. But her background had been entirely different than his, until the shock which had cost her her home in Crystal Stonedown, the crisis of the rider's demand for her life, and of her rescue by Covenant, Linden, and Sunder. She had been the most prized member of her community. As an Ebrand able to foretell the phases of the Sunbane, she had given her people a precious advantage. 
Her past had contained little of the self-doubt and bereavement which had filled Sunder's days. And that difference was more striking now. She was luminous rather than angry, as warm of welcome as he was rigid. If the glances she cast at the graveler had not been so full of endearment, Covenant might have thought that the two stone downers had become strangers to each other. But the black hair that flew like raven wings about her shoulders when she moved had not changed. It still gave her an aspect of fatality, a suggestion of doom. In shame, Covenant found that he did not know what to say to her either. She and Sunder were too vivid to him. They mattered too much. You will find none here. With a perception as acute as intuition, he saw that they were not at all strangers to each other. Sunder was so tight and bitter precisely because of the way Hollyan glowed, and her luminescence came from the same root as his pain. But that insight did not give Covenant any words he could bear to say. Where was Stell? Where were the people of the land and the Harochai? And what had happened to the Stone Downers? The first tried to bridge the awkward silence with giantish courtesy. In the past, the role of spokesman in such situations had belonged to Hanenskrave, but he had lost heart for it. Stone and sea, she began, it gladdens me to greet you again, Sunder Graveler and Holly and Ebrand. When we parted, I hardly dared dream that we would meet again. It is— Linden's abrupt whisper stopped the first. She had been staring intensely at Hollyan, and her exclamation, still the gathering, bore clearly through the thick barrage of the rain. Covenant, she's pregnant. Oh, my God! Hollyan's slim shape showed nothing, but hardly ninety days had passed since the stone donners had left Sea Reach. Linden's assertion carried instant conviction. Her percipients would not be mistaken about such a thing. The sudden weight of understanding forced him to the floor. His legs refused to support the revelation. Pregnant. That was why Hollyan glowed, and Sunder raged. She was glad of it because she loved him, and because he loved her, he was appalled. The quest for the one tree had failed. The purpose for which Covenant had sent the stone downers back to the upper land had failed, and Sunder had already been compelled to kill one wife and child. He had nowhere left to turn. Oh, Sunder! Covenant was not certain that he spoke aloud. Eyes streaming, he bowed his head. It should have been covered with ashes and execration. Forgive me. I'm so sorry. Is the fault yours, then, that the quest has failed? asked Sunder. He sounded as severe as hate. Have you brought us to this pass, that my own failure has opened the last door of doom? Yes, Covenant replied. Aloud or silent, it made no difference. Then hear me, Er Lord. Sunder's voice came closer. Now it was occluded with grief. Unbeliever and white gold wielder, elender and provider of life. His hands gripped Covenant's shoulders. Hear me. Covenant looked up, fighting for self control. The graveler crouched before him. Sunder's eyes were blurred. Beads of wet firelight coursed his hard jaws. When first you persuaded me from my home and duty in Mithill Stonedown, he said thickly, I demanded of you that you should not betray me. You impelled me on a mad search of the desert sun for my friend Marid, whom you could not save, and you refused me the use of my blood to aid you, and you required of me that I eat Aliantha, which I knew to be poison. And so I beseeched of you something greater than fidelity. I pleaded of you meaning for my life and for the death of Nasik, my father. And still you were not done, for you wrested Halian, Amath's daughter, from her peril and crystal stone down, as if it were your desire that I should love her. And when we fell together into the hands of the clave, you redeemed us from that hold, restored our lives. And still you were not done. When you had taught us to behold the clave's evil, you turned your back on that crime, though it cried out for retribution in the face of all the land. There you betrayed me, er lord, the meaning of which I was in such need you set aside. In its place you gave me only a task that surpassed my strength. That was true. In blood loss and folly and passion, Covenant had made himself responsible for the truth he had required Sunder to accept, and then he had failed. What was that, if not betrayal? 
Sunder's accusations made him bleed rue and tears. But Sunder also was not done. Therefore, he went on hoarsely, it is my right that you should hear me, Ur Lord and unbeliever, white gold wielder, he said as if he were addressing the hot streaks that stained Covenant's face. You have betrayed me, and I am glad that you have come. Though you come without hope, you are the one hope that I have known. You have it in your hands to create or deny whatever truth you will, and I desire to serve you. While you remain, I will accept neither despair nor doom. There is neither betrayal nor failure while you endure it to me. And if the truth you teach must be lost at last, I will be consoled that my love and I were not asked to bear that loss alone. Covenant, hear me, he insisted. No words suffice. I am glad that you have come. Mutely, Covenant put his arms around Sunder's neck and hugged him. The crying of his heart was also a promise. This time I won't turn my back. I'm going to tear those bastards down. He remained there until the graveler's answering clasp had comforted him. Then Pitchwife broke the silence by clearing his throat, and Lyndon said in a voice husky with empathy, It's about time. I thought you two were never going to start talking to each other. She was standing beside Holly and as if they had momentarily become sisters. Covenant loosened his hold, but for a moment longer he did not release the graveler. Swallowing heavily, he murmured, Moram used to say things like that. You're starting to resemble him, as long as the land can still produce people like you. And Hollyan. Recollections of the long-dead lord made him blink fiercely to clear his sight. Thal thinks all he has to do is break the arch of time and rip the world apart. But he's wrong. Beauty isn't that easily destroyed. Recalling a song that Lena had sung to him when she was still a girl, and he was new to the land, he quoted softly, The soul in which the flower grows survives. With a crooked smile, Sunder rose to his feet. Covenant joined him, and the two of them faced their companions. To the first, Sunder said, Pardon my unwelcome. The news of your quest smote me sorely but you have come far across the unknown places of the earth in pain and peril, and we are well met. The land has need of you, and to you we may be of use. Formally he introduced Darus and Fol, in case the giants had not caught their names earlier. Then he concluded, Our food is scanty, but we ask that you share it with us. The first replied by presenting Mistweave to the stone donners. They already knew Vane, and Findale she ignored as if he had ceased to impinge upon her awareness. After a glance around the shallow, wet cave, she said, It would appear that we are better supplied for sharing. Graveler, how great is our distance from this revel stone the giant friend seeks? A journey of five days, Sunder responded. Or of three, if we require no stealth to ward us from the notice of the clave. Then, stated the first, we are stocked to the verge of bounty. And you are in need of bounty. She looked deliberately at Hollyan's thinness. Let us celebrate this meeting and this shelter with sustenance. She unslung her pack, and the other giants followed her example. Hunnan's crave and Mistweave started to prepare a meal. Pitchwife tried to stretch some of the kinks out of his back. The rain continued to hammer relentlessly onto the hillside, and water ran down the slanted ceiling, formed puddles and rivulets on the floor. Yet the relative dryness and warmth of the shelter were a consolation. Covenant had heard somewhere that exposure to an incessant rain could drive people mad. Rubbing his numb fingers through his beard, he watched his companions and tried to muster the courage for questions. The first and pitchwife remained stubbornly themselves in spite of rain and weariness and discouragement. While she waited for food, she took out her huge longsword and began to dry it meticulously, and he went to reminisce with Sunder describing their previous meeting and adventures in Sarengrave Flat with irrepressible humor. Mistweave, however, was still doubtful, hesitant. At one point he appeared unable to choose which pouch of staples he should open, confused by that simple decision until Hanan's crave growled at him. Neither time nor the blows he had struck against the Argola had healed his self-distrust, and its cracks were spreading. And the master seemed to grow increasingly ungiant-like. 
he showed a startling lack of enthusiasm for his reunion with the stone donners, for the company of Morharo Chai, even for the prospect of food. His movements were duties he performed simply to pass the time until he reached his goal, had a chance to achieve his purpose. Covenant did not know what that purpose was, but the thought of what it might be sent a chill through him. Hanan's grave looked like a man who was determined to rejoin his brother at any cost. Covenant wanted to demand some explanation, but there was no privacy available. Setting the matter aside, he looked around the rest of the gathering. Lyndon had taken Holly into a drier place against one wall, and was examining the Ebrand with her senses, testing the health and growth of the child Holly and carried. The noise of the rain covered their quiet voices. But then Lyndon announced firmly, "'It's a boy.' Hollyan's dark eyes turned toward Sunder and shone. Vane and Findale had not moved. Vane appeared insensate to the water that beaded on his black skin, dripped from his tattered tunic. And even direct rain could not touch the appointed. It passed through him as if his reality were of a different kind altogether. Near the edge of the cave the Harochai stood in a loose group. Durris and Fole watched the storm. Kale and Harn faced inward. Yet they were mentally sharing their separate stories, their flat expressions gave no sign of the exchange. Like Bloodguard, Covenant thought. Each of them seemed to know by direct inspiration what any of the others knew. The only difference was that these Harochai were not immune to time, but perhaps that only made them less willing to compromise. He was suddenly sure that he did not want to be served by them any more. He did not want to be served at all. The commitments people made to him were too costly. He was on his way to doom. He should have been traveling alone. Yet here were five more people whose lives would be hazarded with his, six counting Hollyan's child, who had no say in the matter. And what had happened to the other Harochai, to those that had surely come like Fole and Darus to oppose the clave? And why had Sunder and Hollyan failed? When the food was ready, he sat down among his companions near the fire, with his back to the cave wall and his guts tight. The act of eating both postponed and brought closer the time for questions. Shortly, Hollyan passed around a leather pouch. When Covenant drank from it, he tasted metheglin, the thick, cloying mead brewed by the villagers of the land. Implications snapped at him. His head jerked up. Then you didn't fail. Sunder scowled as if Covenant's expostulation pained him. But Hollyan met the statement squarely. Not altogether. Her mouth smiled, but her eyes were somber. In no stone down or wood helven did we fail altogether. In no village but one. Covenant set the pouch down carefully in front of him. His shoulders were trembling. He had to concentrate severely to keep his hands and voice steady. Tell me. All the eyes of the travelers were on Sunder and Hollyan. Tell me what happened. Sunder threw down the hunk of bread he had been chewing. Failure is not a word to be trusted, he began harshly. His gaze avoided Covenant Linden, the giants, nailed itself to the embers of the fire. It may mean one thing or another. We have failed, and we have not. Graveler, Pitchwife, interposed softly, it is said among our people that joy is in the ears that hear, not in the mouth that speaks. The quest for the one tree has brought to us many aghast and heart-cruel tales, and we have not always heard them well. Yet are we here, sorely scathed it may be, he glanced at Hanan's grave, but not wholly daunted. Do not scruple to grant us a part in your hurt. For a moment Sunder covered his face as if he were weeping again, but when he dropped his hands his fundamental gall was bright in his eyes. Hear me, then, he said stiffly. Departing sea-reach, we bore with us the krill of Lorik, and the Erlord's trust. In my heart were hope and purpose, and I had learned a new love, when all the old were dead. All slain, his father by murder, his mother by necessity, his wife and son by his own hand. Therefore I believed that we would be believed when we spoke our message of defiance among the villages. From the grieve we wended north as well as west, seeking a way to the upper land which would not expose us to the lurker of Sarengrave Flat. 
and that part of the journey had been a pleasure, for they were alone together except for Stell and Harn. And Sea Reach, from its coast to its high hills and the surviving remnant of giant woods, had never been touched by the sunbane. Uncertainty had clouded their earlier traversal of this region, but now they saw it as a beautiful land in the height of its fall glory, tasted the transforming savor of woodlands and animals, birds, and flowers. The clave taught that the land had been created as a place of punishment, a gallow fells for human evil. But Covenant had repudiated that teaching, and in Sea Reach, for the first time, Sunder and Hollyan began to comprehend what the unbeliever meant. So their purpose against the clave grew clearer, and at last they dared the northern reaches of the Sarin Grave in order to begin their work without more delay. Climbing Land's Drop, they re entered the Pale of the Sunbane. The task of finding villages was not easy. They had no maps and were unacquainted with the scope of the land. But eventually the far sighted Harochai spotted a rider, and that red robed woman unwittingly led the travelers to their first destination a small wood helven crouched in a gully among old hills. Far wood helven did not entirely welcome us, muttered the graveler sourly. The rider took from them their youngest and their best, Hollyan explained, and not in the former manner. Always the clave has exercised caution in its demands, for if the people were decimated, where would the riders turn for blood? But with the foreshortening of the sunbane such husbandry was set aside. Riders accosted each village with doubled and trebled frequency, requiring every life that their coursers might bear. Deprived of the Harochai, which you redeemed, Sunder added to Covenant, the riders turned from their accustomed harvestry to outright ravage. If the tales we have heard do not mislead us, this ravage commenced at the time of our seaward passage from the upper land into Sarangrave Flat. The Namoram read us in the Rook which I then bore, and he knew you were gone into a peril from which you could not strike at him. The graveler spoke as if he knew how Covenant would take this news, how Covenant would blame himself for not giving battle to the clave earlier. Therefore what need had he for any caution? Covenant flinched inwardly, but he clung to what the stone downers were saying, forced himself to hear it. When we entered Far Woodhelven, the Ebrand went on. They were reduced to elders and invalids and bitterness. How should they have welcomed us? They saw us only as blood with which they might purchase a period of survival. Sunder glared into the fire, his eyes as hard as polished stones. That violence I forestalled. Using the krill of Lorik and the Orcrest sunstone, I raised water and Usa Samil, without bloodshed under a desert sun. Such power was an astonishment to them. Thus, when I had done, they were ready to hear whatever words we might speak against the clave. But what meaning could our speech have to them? What opposition remained possible to the remnant of their village? They were too much reduced to do aught but huddle in their homes and strive for bare life. We did not altogether fail, he rasped. But I know no other name for that which we accomplished. Hollyan put a gentle hand on his arm. The rain roared on outside the cave. Water trickled constantly past Covenant's legs, but he ignored the wet, closed his mind to the fierce and useless regret rising like venom from the pit of his stomach. Later he would let himself feel the sheer dismay of what he had unleashed upon the land. Right now he needed to listen. One thing we gained from Far Woodhelven, the Ebrand continued. They gave us knowledge of a stone down lying to the west. We were not required to make search for the opportunity to attempt our purpose a second time. Oh, forsooth, Sunder snarled. Bafflement and rage mounted within him. That knowledge they gave us. Such knowledge is easily seeded. From that day to this we have not been required to make any search. The failure of each village has led us onward. As we passed ever westward, nearer to Revelstone, each Woodhelven and Stonedown became more arduous of suasion, for the greater proximity of the Na Moram's keep taught a greater fear. Yet always the gifts of Krill and Sunstone and Leonar obtained for us some measure of welcome. But those folk no longer possessed blood enough to sustain their fear, and so also they lacked blood for resistance. 
Their only answer to our gifts and words was their knowledge of other villages. Thomas Covenant, he said suddenly, this is vile to me, but I would not be misheard. Betimes from village to village we happened upon a man or a woman, young and hale enough to have offered other aid, and yet unwilling. We encountered folk for whom it was inconceivable that any man or woman might love the land. Upon occasion our lives were attempted, for what dying people would not covet the powers we bore? Then only the prowess of the Harochai preserved us. Yet in the main we were given no other gift, because no other gift was possible. I have learned a great bitterness which I know not how to sweet, but the blame of it does not fall upon the people of the land. I would not have believed that the bare life of any village could suffer so much loss, and still endure. For a moment he fell silent, and the battering sound of the rain ran through the cave. He had placed his hand over Hollyan's. The force of his grip corded the backs of his knuckles. He was no taller than Linden, but his stature could not be measured by size. To Covenant he appeared as thwarted and dangerous as Beric Halfhand had been on the slopes of Mount Thunder when the ancient hero and Lord Fatherer had at last set his hand to the earth power. The silence was like the muffled barrage of the storm. The clave had already shed a heinous amount of blood, yet too many lives remained at stake, and Covenant did not know how to protect them. Needing support, he looked toward Linden, but she did not notice his gaze. Her head was up, her eyes keen, as if she were scenting the air, tracing a tension or peril he could not discern. He glanced at the giants, but Hanan's crave's orbs were hidden beneath the clenched fist of his brows, and Mistweave, Pitchwife, and the First were fixed on the stone-downers. At the mouth of the cave, Kale raised one arm as though, in spite of his native dispassion, he wished to make a gesture of protest, but then he lowered his hand back to his side. Abruptly, Sunder began speaking again. Only one village did not accord to us even that chimera of a gift and it was the last. His voice was knotted and rough. From it we have lately come, retracing our way because we had no more hope. Our path from village to village led us westward in a crescent line, so that we passed to the east of Revelstone, wending toward the north, toward a place which named itself Lands Verge Stonedown. The Woodhelven, giving us that knowledge, lay perilously nigh the keep of the Namorum, but Lands Verge Stonedown was nigher, and therefore we feared its fear of the clave would be too great to be countered. Yet when we gained the village we learned that it would never suffer such fear again. He paused, then growled, It was altogether empty of life. The riders had gutted it entirely, borne every beating heart away to feed the banefire. Not one child or cripple remained to be consumed by the sunbane. After that he stopped gripped himself, still, as if he would not be able to say another word without howling. Hollyan gave him a sad hug. "'We knew not where to turn,' she said. "'So we returned eastward. It was our thought that we must avoid the grasp of the clave and await you, for surely the unbeliever and white gold wielder would not fail of his quest.' Her tone was candid but free of sarcasm or accusation. "'And when he came, he would come from the east.' In that, at least, we were blessed. Far sooner than we had dared desire, the Harochai became cognizant of your presence and guided us together. A moment later she added, We have been blessed also in the Harochai. Linden was no longer facing the loose circle of her companions. She had turned toward Kale and his people, and the lines of her back were tight, insistent. But still she said nothing. Covenant forced himself to ignore her. The stone downers were not done. Apprehension made his tone as trenchant as anger. How did you meet Doris and Fole? He could no longer suppress his quivering. What happened to Stell? At that a spasm passed over Sunder's face. When the answer came, it came from the Ebrand. Thomas Covenant, she said, speaking directly to him as if at that moment nothing else mattered. You have twice redeemed me from the malice of the clave, and though you reft me of my home in crystal stone down, where I was acknowledged and desired, you have given me a purpose and a love to repair that loss. I do not wish to cause you hurt. She glanced at Sunder, then continued, 
but this tale also must be told. It is needful. Stiffening herself to the necessity, she said, When we passed to the east of Revelstone, tending toward the north, we encountered a band of some score Harochai. With fourscore more of their people, they had come to make answer to the depredations of the clave. And when they had heard our story, they understood why the people of the land had not arisen in resistance. Therefore they set themselves a task to form a cordon around Revelstone, a barrier that would prevent the passage of any rider. Thus they thought to oppose the clave and to starve the banefire, while they also awaited your return. Yet four of them elected to join the purpose of our search. Darus and Fole, whom you see, and also Bern and Torrell. Her throat closed momentarily. Who are gone? As Stell is gone. For our ignorance betrayed us. It was known to all that the clave possesses power to dominate minds, by that means with a Harachai ensnared in the past. But none among us knew how great the power had grown. As we traversed the proximity of Revelstone, Baron Torrell and Stell scouted some distance westward to ensure our safety. We were yet a day's journey from the keep, and not Harn, Durris, nor Fole met any harm. But the slightly greater nearness of the others bared them to the clave's touch, and to its dominion. Setting aside all caution, they left us to answer that coercion. Sensing what had transpired, the utter loss of mind and will, Harn, Durris, and Fole could not give chase, lest they also fall under the Na Moram's sway. But Sunder and I— The memory made her falter, but she did not permit herself to stop. We gave pursuit, and we gave battle, striving with krill-fire and force to break the hold of the clave, though in so doing we surely made our presence known to the Na Moram, forewarning him of us, and perhaps also of you. Mayhap we would have opposed Stell and his companions to the very gates of Revelstone. We were desperate and fevered, but at the last we halted. She swallowed convulsively. For we saw that Baron Stell and Torrell were not alone. From around the region came a score and more of the Harochai, all ensnared, all walking mindless and deaf toward the knife and the bane fire. Tears filled her eyes. And at that sight, she went on as if she were ashamed. We were broken. We fled because naught else remained for us to do. During the night, she finished softly, Gibbon Namoram reached out to us and attempted mastery of the Krill's white gem. But Sunder, my love, kept the light clean. Then her tone hardened. If the Namoram remains in any way accessible to fear, I conceive he has been somewhat daunted. For surely Sunder gave him to believe that the Ur-Lord was already returned. But Covenant hardly heard her conclusion. He was foundering in the visions her words evoked. The immedicable stupor of the Harochai, the frenzy of the stone-downers as they had pleaded, opposed, struggled, driving themselves almost into the jaws of the clave and still failing to save their comrades. The glee or apprehension implicit in Gibbon's efforts to conquer the Krill. His brain reeled with images of the enormous consequences of his earlier refusal to fight the clave. Among the dead in Andalane, Banor had said to him, Redeem my people, their plight is an abomination. And he had thought himself successful when he had broken open the hold of Revelstone, set the Harochai free. But he had not succeeded. Had not. He had let the riders and the Namoram live to do again every evil thing they had done before and the sunbane had risen to a period of two days on the blood of ravaged villages and helpless Harochai. Yet Lyndon's sharp protest pierced him, snatched him out of himself. An instinct deeper than panic or shame wrenched him to his feet and sent him after her as she scrambled toward Kale and Harn. But she was too slow, had divined the meaning of their tension too late. With appalling suddenness, Harn struck Kale a blow that knocked him out into the force of the rain. Sunder, Hollion, and the giants sprang upright behind Covenant. One running stride ahead of him, Lyndon was caught by Fole and heaved aside. An instant later, Durris' arm slammed like an iron bar across Covenant's chest. He stumbled back against the first. 
She held him. He hung in her grasp, gasping for breath while small suns of pain staggered around his sight. Veiled by torrents, Kale and Harn were barely visible. In mud that should have made footing impossible, rain that should have blinded them, they battled with the precise abandon of madmen. Furiously, Lyndon yelled, Stop it! Are you out of your minds? Without inflection, Darus replied, You miscomprehend. He and Fole stood poised to block any intervention. This must be done. It is the way of our people. Covenant strove for air. Stiffly, the first demanded an explanation. Darus' dispassion was implacable. He did not even glance at the fierce struggle being waged through the rain. In this fashion we test each other and resolve doubt. Kale appeared to be at a disadvantage, unable to match the sheer conviction of Harn's attack. He kept his feet, countered Harn's blows with a skill which seemed inconceivable in that downpour. But he was always on the defensive. Kale has spoken to us concerning Akharu Kenost and Ardenal. He was companion to the victor, and we desired to measure our worth against his. A sudden feint unbalanced Kale, enabling Harn to slash his feet from under him. But he recovered with a tumbling roll and kick. Also it has been said that Bryn and Kale betrayed their chosen fidelity to the seduction of the mirwives. Kale seeks to demonstrate that the lure of their seduction would have surpassed any Haro Chai in his place. Kale and Harn were evenly matched in ability and strength. But Harn had watched his kindred lose their wills and walk into the jaws of the clave. He struck with the force of repudiation. And Kale had succumbed to the mirwives, learned to judge himself. Bryn's victory over the guardian of the one tree had led to Cable Sea Dreamer's death. A flurry of punches staggered Kale. As he reeled, a heavy two-fisted blow drove his face into the mire. Kale! Covenant grabbed a shuddering breath and twisted out of the first's hands. Fire flashed in his mind, alternately white and black. Flame spread up his right forearm as if his flesh were tinder. He gathered a shout that would stop the Haruchai, stunned them where they stood. But Darus went on inflexibly. Also he desired to grieve for Hergrim and Seer, and for those whose blood has gone to the bane fire. Without warning he spun away from the company, leaped lithe and feral into the rain toward Kale and Harn. Full was at his side. Together they attacked. Then Sunder cried at Covenant, Do not! He caught Covenant's arm, braved fire to halt the imminent eruption. If the Namoram is conscious of the krill in my hands, how much more clearly will your power call out to him? Covenant started to yell, I don't care. Let him try to stop me. But Fol and Darus had not hurled themselves solely upon Kale. They were sailing each other and Harn as well, and Kale had risen from the mud to plunge into the general melee. Blows hammered impartially in all directions. We desire to grieve. Slowly the fire ran out of Covenant. Ah, hell, he sighed. Have mercy on me. He had no right to question what the Harachai were doing. He had too much experience with the violence of his own grief. Lyndon studied the combatants intently. Her face showed a physician's alarm at the possibility of injury, but Sunder met Covenant's gaze and nodded mute comprehension. As abruptly as it had begun, the fighting stopped. The four Harochai returned stoically to the shelter of the cave. They were all bruised and hurt, though none as sorely as Kale. But his visage concealed defeat, and his people wore no aspect of triumph. He faced Covenant squarely. It is agreed that I am unworthy. Slow blood trickled from a cut on his lip, a gash over one cheekbone. My place at your side is not taken from me, for it was accorded by Akharo Kenostan Ardenal, but I am required to acknowledge that the honor of such a place does not become me. Full will ward the chosen. After a fraction of hesitation, he added, Other matters have not been resolved. Oh, Kale, Lyndon groaned. Covenant spat a curse that was covered by the first's swearing and pitch-wife's expostulation. But there was nothing any of them could do. The Harochai had passed judgment, and they were as untouchable as bloodguard. Muttering direly to himself, Covenant hugged his arms over his heart and retreated to the simple comfort of the fire. After a moment, Sunder and Hollyan joined him. They stood nearby in silence until he raised his head. 
Then, in a softer voice, as if his own plight had been humbled by astonishment, Sunder said, You have much to tell us, Er Lord. Stop calling me that, Covenant growled. His mouth was full of gall. Er Lord was the title the Harochai typically used for him. There haven't been any lords worth mentioning for three thousand years. But he could not refuse to give the stone donners the story of his failed quest. The task of narration was shared by Lyndon, the first, and Pitchwife. Sunder and Hollyan gaped at the tale of the Elohim and Findale, of the way in which Covenant had been silenced. But they had no words for their incomprehension. When the companions began to speak of Cable Sea Dreamer, Hanan's grave rose abruptly and stalked out into the rain. But he returned shortly, looking as sharp and doomed as a boulder gnawed by the sempiternal hunger of the sea. His voice rising in grief at loss and celebration of valor, Pitchwife described the crisis of the one tree. Then the first related the sailing of Starfair's gem into the bitten cold of the north. She explained the company's harsh decision to abandon the Drummond, and the stern iron of her voice made the things she said seem more bearable. It fell to Covenant to speak of Hamakal and the Wainhim, of the company's re-entry into the Sunbane, and when he was finished the violence of the storm had become less. The rain was fading toward sunset. As the downpour receded to a drizzle, the clouds broke open in the east and followed the sun away, exposing the land to a night as clear and cold as the stars. A moon with a look of rue on its face swelled toward its full. The fire seemed brighter now as dark deepened outside the cave. Sunder stirred the embers while he considered what he had heard. Then he addressed Covenant again, and the flames glinted like eagerness in his eyes. Is it truly your intent to assail the clave, to bring the bane fire to an end? Covenant nodded, scowling. Sunder glanced at Holly and then back to Covenant. I need not say that we will accompany you. We have been thwarted beyond endurance. Even Hollyan's child, for a moment he faltered in confusion, murmured, My son, as if he had just realized the truth. But then he resumed firmly, Even he is not too precious to be hazarded in such a cause. Covenant started to retort, No, you're wrong. You're all too precious. You're the future of the land. If it has a future. But the graveler had come too far to be denied and Covenant had lost the right or the arrogance to try to withhold the consequences of their own lives from the people he loved. He took a deep breath, held it to steady himself. The force of Dara's arm had left a pain in his chest that would not go away. But Sunder did not ask the question he feared, did not say, How can you think to confront the might of Revelstone when your power threatens the very foundation of the earth? Instead the graveler inquired, What will become of the Harochai? That question, too, was severe, but Covenant could face it. Slowly he let the pent air out of his lungs. If I succeed, they'll be all right. Nightmares of fire had annealed him to his purpose. If I fail, there won't be much left to worry about. Sunder nodded, looked away. Carefully, he asked, Thomas Covenant, will you accept the krill from me? More abruptly than he intended, Covenant snapped, No! When he had first given away Lorex blade, Lyndon had asked him why he no longer needed it. He had replied, I'm already too dangerous. But he had not known then how deep the danger ran. You're going to need it. To fight with if he failed. Or if he succeeded. That was the worst gall, the true root of despair. That even a complete victory over the clay would accomplish nothing. It would not restore the law not heal the land, not renew the people of the land, and beyond all question it would not cast down the despiser. The best covenant could hope for was a postponement of his doom, and that was as good as no hope at all. Yet he had been living with despair for so long now that it only confirmed his resolve. He had become like Kevin Landwaster, incapable of turning back, of reconsidering what he meant to do. The sole difference was that Covenant already knew he was going to die. He preferred that to the death of the land. But he did not say such things to his companions. 
He did not want to give the impression that he blamed Lyndon for her inability to aid his dying body in the woods behind Haven Farm, and he did not wish to quench the stone donner's nascent belief that they had one more chance to make what they had undergone meaningful. Despair belonged to the lone heart, and he kept it to himself. Lord Fowle had corrupted everything else, had turned to ill even the affirmative rejection of hate, which had once led Covenant to withhold his hand from the clave. But Sunder and Hullion had been restored to him. Some of the Harochai and the Giants could still be saved. Linden might yet be returned safely to her natural world. He had become ready to bear it. When Hunnensgrave left the cave again to pace out his tension under the unpitying stars, Covenant followed him. The night was cold and poignant, the warmth of the earth drenched away by the long rain. Apparently unconscious of Covenant, Hunnensgrave climbed the nearest hillside until he gained a vantage from which he could study the southwestern horizon. His lonely bulk was silhouetted against the impenetrable sky. He held himself as rigid as the fetters in Cosrain's dungeon. But the manacles on him now were more irrefragable than iron. From far back in his throat came small whimpering noises like flakes of grief. Yet he must have known that Covenant was there. After a moment he began to speak. This is the world which my brother purchased with his soul. His voice sounded like cold, numb hands rubbing each other to no avail. Seeing that the touch of your power upon the one tree would surely rouse the worm, he went to his death to prevent you. And this is the result. The sunbane waxes, perpetrating atrocity. The human valor of the stone downers is baffled. The certainty of the Harochai is thwarted. And against such evils you are rendered futile, bound by the newborn doom to which Cable Sea Dreamer served as midwife. Do you consider such a world worthy of life? I do not. For a time Covenant remained silent. He was thinking that he was not the right person to hear Hunnan's craves hurt. His own despair was too complete. His plight was constricted by madness and fire on all sides, and the noose was growing tighter. Yet he could not let the need in Hunnan's craves question pass without attempting an answer. The giant was his friend, and he had his own losses to consider. He needed a reply as sorely as Hunnan's crave did. Slowly, he said, I talked to Foam Follower about hope once. That memory was as vivid as healthy sunshine. He said it doesn't come from us. It doesn't depend on us. It comes from the worth and power of what we serve. Without flinching, Foam Follower had claimed that his service was to Covenant. When Covenant had protested, it's all a mistake, Foam Follower had responded, then are you so surprised to learn that I have been thinking about hope? But Hanenskrave had a different objection. I verily, he growled. He did not glance at Covenant. And where now, under all the sunbane, lies the worth and power that you serve? In you, Covenant snapped back, too vexed by pain to be gentle. In Sunder and Hullion, in the Harochai. He did not add, in Andalane. Hunnan's grave had never seen that last flower of the land's loveliness, and he could not bring himself to say, In me. Instead, he continued, When Foam Follower and I were together, I didn't have any power. I had the ring, but I didn't know how to use it, and I was trying to do exactly what Fowl wanted. I was going to Fowl's crash, walking right into the trap. Foam Follower helped me anyway. The giant had surrendered himself to agony in order to carry Covenant across the fierce lava of Hot Ash Slay. Not because there was anything special or worthy or powerful about me, but simply because I was human, and Fowl was breaking my heart. That gave Foam Follower all the hope he needed. In the process, Covenant had caused the giant's death. Only the restraint he had learned in the cavern of the One Tree kept him from crying. Don't talk to me about despair. I'm going to destroy the world and there's nothing I can do about it. I need something better from you. Only that restraint, and the tall dark shape of the master as he stood against the stars, torn by loss, and as dear as life. But then Hunnenskrave turned as if he had heard the words Covenant had not uttered. 
His moon-gilt stance took on a curious kindness. Softly, he said, You are the giant friend, and I thank you that there is yet room in your heart for me. No just blame attaches to you for Sea Dreamer's death, nor for the refusal of the Ka Mora, with which by necessity you sealed his end. But I do not desire hope. I desire to see. I covet the vision which taught my brother to accept damnation in the name of what he witnessed. Quietly he walked down from the hilltop, leaving Covenant exposed to the emptiness of the night. In the cold silence Covenant tried to confront his plight, wrestled for an escape from the logic of Lord Fowle's manipulations. Revelstone was perhaps only three days away, but the wild magic had been poisoned, and venom colored all his dreams. He contained no more hope than the black gulf of the heavens, where the worm of the world's end had already fed. Hunnans Crave's difficult grace did not feel like forgiveness. It felt as arduous as a grindstone, whetting the dark to a new sharpness. And he was alone. Not because he lacked friends. In spite of the land's destitution, it had blessed him with more friendship than he had ever known. No, he was alone because of his ring, because no one else possessed this extreme power to ruin the earth, and because he no longer had any right to it at all. That was the crux, the conflict he could not resolve or avoid, and it seemed to cripple his sense of himself, taking his identity away. What did he have to offer the land except wild magic and his stubborn passion? What else was he worth to his friends, or to Lyndon, who would have to carry the burden as soon as he set it down? From the beginning his life here had been one of folly and pain, sin and ill, and only wild magic had enabled him to make expiation and now the clave had reduced the village to relics. It had ensnared the Harochai once more. The sunbane had attained a period of two days. Sea Dreamer and Hergrim and Seer and Hamako were dead. If he surrendered his ring now, as Findale and Doom urged, how would he ever again be able to bear the weight of his own actions? We are foemen, you and I, enemies to the end. But the end will be yours, unbeliever, not mine. At the last there will be but one choice for you, and you will make it in all despair. Of your own volition you will give the white gold into my hand. Covenant had no answer. In Andalane, among the dead, Moram had warned, He has said to you that you are his enemy. Remember that he seeks always to mislead you. But Covenant had no idea what the former High Lord meant. Around him a dismay which no amount of moonlight could palliate gripped the hills. Unconsciously he had sunk to the ground under the glinting accusation of the stars. Findale had said like the despiser, he must be persuaded to surrender his ring. If he does not, it is certain that he will destroy the earth. Covenant huddled into himself. He needed desperately to cry out, and could not needed to hurl outrage and frenzy at the blind sky, and was blocked from any release by the staggering peril of his power. He had fallen into the despiser's trap, and there was no way out. When he heard feet ascending the hill behind him, he covered his face to keep himself from pleading abjectly for help. He could not read the particular emanations of his companions. He did not know who was approaching him. Vaguely, he expected Sunder or Pitchwife. But the voice which sighed his name like an ache of pity or appeal was Lyndon's. He lurched erect to meet her, though he had no courage for her concern, which he had not earned. The moon sheened her hair as if it were clean and lovely, but her features were in shadow. Only the tone of her voice revealed her mood. She spoke as if she knew how close he was to breaking. As softly as a prayer, she breathed, Let me try. At that, something in him did break. Let you, he fumed suddenly. He had no other way to hold back his grief. I can hardly prevent you. If you're so all-fired bloody eager to be responsible for the world, you don't need my permission. You don't even need the physical ring. You can use it from there. All you have to do is possess me. Stop she murmured like an echo of supplication. Stop! But his love for her had become anguish, and he could not call it back. 
It won't even be a new experience for you. It'll be just like what you did to your mother. The only difference is that I'll still be alive when you're done. Then he wrenched himself to a halt, gasping with the force of his desire to retract his jibe, silence it before it reached her. She raised her fists in the moonlight, and he thought she was going to start railing at him. But she did not. Her percipience must have made the nature of his distress painfully clear to her. For a long moment, she held up her arms as if she were measuring the distance a blow would have to travel to strike him. Then she lowered her hands. In a flat, impersonal tone that she had not used toward him for a long time, she said, That isn't what I meant. I know. Her detachment hurt him more than rage. He was certain now that she would be able to make him weep, if she wished. I'm sorry. His contrition sounded paltry in the sharp night, but he had nothing else to offer her. I've come all this way, but I might as well have stayed in the cavern of the one tree. I don't know how to face it. Then let somebody try to help you. She did not soften, but she refrained from attacking him. If not for yourself, do it for me. I'm right on the edge already. It is all I can do, she articulated carefully, to just look at the sunbane and stay sane. When I see you suffering, I can't keep my grip. As long as I don't have any power, there's nothing I can do about Lord Fowl, or the sunbane. So you're the only reason I've got. Like it or not. I am here because of you. I am fighting to stay in one piece because of you. I want to do something. Her fists rose again like a shout, but her voice remained flat. For this world, or against foul, because of you. If you go on like this, I'll crack. Abruptly her control frayed and pain welled up in her words like blood in a wound. I need you to at least stop looking so much like my goddamn father. Her father, Covenant thought mutely, a man of such self-pity that he had cut his wrists and blamed her for it. You never loved me anyway. And from that atrocity had come the darkness which had maimed her life, the black moods, the violence she had enacted against her mother, the susceptibility to evil, her instances of paralysis, her attempt on Seer's life. Her protest wrung Covenant's heart. It showed him with stunning vividness how little he could afford to fail her. Any other hurt or dread was preferable. Instinctively, he made a new promise, another commitment to match all the others he had broken or kept. I don't know the answer, he said, keeping himself quiet in fear that she would perceive how his life depended on what he was saying. I don't know what I need, but I know what to do about the clave. He did not tell her what his nightmares had taught him. He did not dare. When we're done there, I'll know more, one way or the other. She took him at his word. She had a severe need to trust him. If she did not, she would be forced to treat him as if he were as lost as her parents. And that alternative was plainly appalling to her. Nodding to herself, she folded her arms under her breasts and left the hilltop, went back to the shelter and scant warmth of the cave. Covenant stayed out in the dark alone for a while longer, but he did not break. 9. March to Crisis Before dawn the new company ate breakfast, repacked their supplies, and climbed the nearest hillside to await the sun with stone underfoot. Covenant watched the east, gauntly, half fearing that the sunbane might already have accelerated to a cycle of only one day. But as the sun crested the horizon, the air set blue about it like a corona, giving the still, sodden and gray landscape a touch of azure, like a hint of glory. As if, Covenant thought dourly, the sunbane in any hands but fowls would have been a thing of beauty. But then blackness began to seethe westward, and the light on the hills dimmed. The first fingers of the wind teased at Covenant's beard, mocking him. Sunder turned to him. The graveler's eyes were as hard as pebbles as he took out the wrapped bundle of the krill. His voice carried harshly across the wind. Unbeliever, what is your will? When first you gave the krill into my hand, you counseled that I make use of it as I would a rook. 
that I attune myself to it and bend its power to my purpose. This I have done. It was my love who taught me. He glanced at Halyan. But I have learned the lesson with all my strength. He had come a long way, and was determined not to be found wanting. Therefore I am able to ease our way, to hasten our journey. But in so doing I will restore us unquestionably to the clave's knowledge, and Gibbon Namoram will be forewarned against us. Stiffly, he repeated, What is your will? Covenant debated momentarily with himself. If Gibbon were forewarned, he might kill more of his prisoners to stoke the bane fire. But it was possible that he was already aware of the danger. Sunder had suggested as much the previous day. If Covenant traveled cautiously, he might simply give the Namoram more time for preparation. Covenant's shoulders hunched to strangle his trepidation. Use the krill, he muttered. I've already lost too much time. The graveler nodded as if he had expected no other reply. From his jerkin he took out his sunstone. It was a type of rock which the land's former masters of stone lore had named Orcrest. It was half the size of his fist, irregularly shaped but smooth, and its surface gave a strange impression of translucence without transparency, opening into a dimension where nothing but itself existed. Deftly, Sunder flipped the cloth from the krill's gem, letting bright argent blaze into the rain-thick gloom. Then he brought the sunstone and that gem into contact with each other. At once a shaft of vermeil power from the orc crest shot straight toward the hidden heart of the sun. Sizzling furiously, the beam pierced the drizzle and the thunderheads to tap the force of the sunbane directly, and the krill shone forth as if its light could cast back the rain. In a snarl of torrents and heavy thunder, the storm swept over the hilltop, but the straight red shaft of the oar crest seemed to call down lightning like an affront to the heavens. But Sunder stood without flinching, unscathed by any fire. On the company no rain fell. Wind slashed the region. Thunder crashed. Lightning ran like screams across the dark. But Sunder's power formed a pocket in the storm, a zone free of violence. He was doing what the clave had always done, using the sunbane to serve his own ends. But his exertion cost no blood. No one had been shed to make him strong. That difference sufficed for Covenant. With a grim gesture, he urged his companions into motion. Quickly they ranged themselves around Sunder. With Hollyan to guide him, the graveler turned toward the southwest. Holding his oar crest and the krill clasped together, so that they flamed like a challenge, he started in the direction of Revelstone. His protection moved with him, covering all the company. By slow degrees a crimson hue crept into the brightness of the krill, tinging the light as if the core of the gem had begun to bleed, and long glints of silver streaked the shaft of sunbane fire. But Sunder shifted his hands, separated the two powers slightly to keep them pure. As he did so, his zone contracted somewhat, but not enough to hamper the company's progress. They were scourged by wind. Mud clogged their strides, made every step treacherous. Streams frothing down the hillsides beat against their legs, joined each other to form small rivers and tried to sweep the travelers away. Time and again Covenant would have fallen without Kale's support. Linden clung severely to Fold's shoulder. All the world had been reduced to a thunderous wall of water, an impenetrable downpour lit by vermeil and argent, scored by lightning. No one tried to speak. Only the giants would have been able to make themselves heard. Yet Sunder's protection enabled the company to move faster than the sunbane had ever permitted. Sometime during the day two gray blurred shapes appeared like incarnations of the storm and entered the rainless pocket, presented themselves to Covenant. They were Haruchai. When he had acknowledged them, they joined his companions without a word. The intensity with which Linden regarded Sunder told Covenant something he already knew. The graveler's mastery of two such disparate periaps was a horrendous strain on him. Yet he was a stone-downer. The native toughness of his people had been conditioned by generations of survival under the ordeal of the sunbane, and his sense of purpose was clear. When the day's journey finally ended and he let his fires fall, 
he appeared so weary that he could hardly stand. But he was no more defeated by fatigue than Covenant, who had done nothing except labor through nearly ten leagues of mire and water. Not for the first time Covenant thought that the graveler was more than he deserved. As the wind whipped the clouds away to the west, the company made camp on an open plain which reminded Covenant of the strict terrain near Revelstone. In a bygone age, that region had been made fruitful by the diligence of its farmers and cattle herds, and by the beneficent power of the lords. Now everything was painfully altered. He felt that he was on the verge of the clave's immediate demean, that the company was about to enter the ambit of the Namoram's keep. Nervously, he asked Hollyan what the next day's sun would be. In response, she took out her slim Leonar wand. Its polished surface gleamed like the ancient woods of the land as she held it up in the light of the campfire. Like Sunder's left forearm, her right palm was laced with old scars, the cuts from which she had drawn blood for her foretellings. But she no longer had any need of blood. Sunder smiled and handed her the wrapped krill. She uncovered it only enough to let one white beam into the night. Then, reverently, like a woman who had never learned anything but respect for her own abilities, she touched her Leonar to the light. And flame grew like a plant from the wood. Delicate shoots waved into the air. Buds of filigree fire bloomed. Leaves curled and opened. Without harming her or the wood, flame spread around her like a growth of mystery. It was as green and tangy as springtime and new apples. At the sight, Covenant's nerves tightened involuntarily. Hollyan did not need to explain to him and Lyndon what her fire meant. They had witnessed it several times in the past. But for the benefit of the watching, wide-eyed giants, she said quietly, "'The Mara will bring a fertile sun.' Covenant glanced at Lyndon, but she was studying the Harochai, scrutinizing them for any sign of peril. However, Sunder had said that Gibbon's grasp extended only a day's journey beyond the gates of Revelstone, and when Lyndon at last met Covenant's gaze, she shook her head mutely. Two more days, he thought. One until that raver can reach us, unless he decides to try his grim again. The ill that you deem most terrible— that night nightmares stretched him until he believed he would surely snap. They had all become one virulent vision, and in it his fire was as black as venom. In the pre-green gloom of dawn another pair of Harochai arrived to join the company. Their faces were as stony and magisterial as the mountains where they lived, and yet Covenant received the dismaying impression that they had come to him in fear, not fear of death, but of what the clave could make them do. Their plight is an abomination. He accepted them, but that was not enough. Bonner had commanded him to redeem them. When the sun rose, it tinged the stark bare landscape, a sick hue that reminded him of the ill-earth stone. Six days had passed since the desert sun had melted every vestige of vegetation off the upper land. As a result, all the plain was a wilderness. But the ground was so water-soaked that it steamed wherever the sun touched it and the steam seemed to raise fine sprouts of heather and bracken with the suddenness of panic. Where the dirt lay in shadow, it remained as barren as naked bones, but elsewhere the uncoiling green stems grew desperately, flogged by the sunbane and fed by two days of rain. In moments the brush had reached the height of Covenant's shins. If he stood still much longer, he might not be able to move at all. But ahead of him the western mountains thrust their ragged snow caps above the horizon, and one promontory of the range lay in a direct line with Sunder's path. Perhaps Revelstone was already visible to the greater sight of the giants. If it were, they said nothing about it. Pitchwife watched the preternatural heath with a look of nausea. Mistweave's doubt had assumed an aspect of belligerence, as if he resented the way Fole had supplanted him at Linden's side and yet believed that he could not justify himself. The first hefted her longsword, estimating her strength against the vegetation. Only Hanenskrave studied the southwest eagerly, but his clenched visage revealed nothing except an echo of his earlier judgment. This is the world which my brother purchased with his soul. Do you consider such a world worthy of life? 
However, the first was not required to cut the company's way. Sunder used his sunstone and the krill as the riders used their rooks, employing the sunbane to force open a path. With vermeil fire and white light, the graveler crushed flat the growth ahead of the company, plowed away through it. Unhindered by torrents and streams and mire, the travelers were able to increase the previous day's pace. Before the heather and bracken grew so tall that they blocked Covenant's view of the mountains, he glimpsed a red beam like sunders standing from the promontory toward the sun. With an inward shiver he recognized it. To be visible from that distance, it would have to be tremendous. The shaft of the bane fire. Then the writhing brush effaced all the southwest from sight. For a time, the tight apprehension of that glimpse occupied all his attention. The bane fire. It seemed to dwarf him. He had seen it once, devouring blood with a staggering heat and ferocity that had filled the high cavity of the sacred enclosure. Even at the level where the readers had tended the master rook, that conflagration had hit him with an incinerating force, burning his thoughts to ashes. The simple memory of it made him flinch. He could hardly believe that even rampant wild magic would be a match for it. The conflict between such powers would be fierce enough to shatter mountains. And the arch of time? He did not know the answer. But by mid-morning, Sunder began to stumble, and Covenant's attention was wrenched outward. The graveler used his periapts, as if together they formed a special kind of rook. But they did not. The rooks of the riders drew their true strength straight from the master rook and the banefire, and so each rider needed only enough personal exertion to keep open a channel of power to Revelstone. The banefire did the rest. But Sunder wielded the sunbane and the krill directly. The effort was exhausting him. Linden read his condition at a glance. "'Give him diamond draft,' she muttered stiffly. Her rigid resistance to the ill of the vegetation made her sound distant, impersonal. "'And carry him. He'll be all right.' if we take care of him. After a moment she added, He's stubborn enough to stand it. Sunder smiled at her wanly. Pallor lay beneath the shade of his skin. But as he sipped the giantish liquor, he grew markedly stronger. Yet he did not protest when Hanan's crave hoisted him into the air. Sitting with his back against the master's chest, his legs bent over the giant's arms, he raised his powers again, and the company resumed its trek. Shortly after noon, two more Harachai joined Covenant, bringing to ten the number of their people ranged protectively on either side of him and his companions. He saluted them strictly, but their presence only made him more afraid. He did not know how to defend them from Gibbon. And his fear increased as Sunder grew weaker. Even with Sunstone and Krill, the Graveler was only one lone man. While the obstacles swarming in front of him were simply bracken and heather, he was able to furrow them as effectively as any rider. But then the soil changed. The terrain became a jungle of mad rhododendron, jacaranda, and honeysuckle. Through that tangle he could not force his way with anything like the direct accuracy which the bane fire made possible. He had to grope for the line of least resistance, and the jungle closed behind the travelers as if they were lost. The sun had fallen near the western mountains, and the light had become little more than a filtered gloom when Linden and Hollyon gasped simultaneously, Sunder! Hunnan's grave jerked to a halt. The first wheeled to stare at the graveler. Covenant's throat constricted with panic as he scrambled forward at Linden's back. The master set Sunder down as the company crowded around them. At once Sunder's knees buckled, his arms shook with a wild ague. Covenant squeezed between the first and pitchwife to confront the graveler. Recognition whitened Hollyan's face, made her raven hair look as stark as a dirge. Linden's eyes flicked back and forth between the sunstone and the krill. The vermeil shaft, springing from his oar crest toward the setting sun, had a frayed and charred appearance as if it were being consumed by a hotter fire. And in the core of the krill's clear gem burned a hard knot of blackness like a canker. "'The Namoram attempts to take him,' Hollyan panted desperately. "'How can he save himself when he is so sorely weary?' Sunder's eyes were fixed on something he could no longer see. 
new lines marked his ashen face, cut by the acid sweat that slicked his skin. Tremors knotted in his muscles. His expression was as naked and appalled as a seizure. "'Put them down,' Lyndon snapped at him, pitching her voice to pierce his fixation. "'Let go. Don't let him do this to you.' The corners of Sunder's jaw bulged dangerously. With a groan as if he were breaking his own arm, he forced down the sunstone, dropped it to the ground. Instantly, its crimson beam vanished. The orc crest relapsed to elusive translucence. But the blackness at the center of the krill swelled and became stronger. Grimly, Sunder clenched his free hand under the blade's wrappings. Heat shone from the metal. Bowing his head, he held the krill in a grip like fever and fought to throw off the clave's touch, fought with the same human and indefeasible abandon by which he had once nearly convinced Gibbon that Covenant was dead. Lyndon was shouting, Sunder, stop, it's killing you, but the graveler did not heed her. Covenant put out his half-hand. Fire spattered from his ring, as if the simple proximity of Gibbon's power made the silver-white band unquenchable. Findale's protest rang across the jungle. Covenant ignored it. Sunder was his friend, and he had already failed too often. Perhaps he was not ready to test himself against the clave and the banefire. Perhaps he would never be ready. But he did not hesitate. Deliberately he took hold of the krill. With the strength of fire he lifted the blade from Sunder's grasp, as if the graveler's muscles had become sand. But when he closed wild magic around the krill, all his flame went black. Midnight conflagration as hungry as hate burst among the company, tore through the trees. A rage of darkness raved out of him, as if at last the venom had triumphed, had become the whole truth of his power. For an instant he quailed. Then Lyndon's wild cry reached him. Savage with extremity, he ripped his fire out of the air, flung it down like a tapestry from the walls of his mind. The krill slipped between his numb fingers, stuck point-first in the desecrated soil. Before he could move, react, breathe, try to contain the horror clanging in his heart like the carillon of despair, a heavy blow was struck behind him, and Kale reeled through the brush. Another blow, a fist like stone. Covenant pitched forward, slammed against the rough trunk of a rhododendron, and sprawled on his back, gasping as if all the air had been taken out of the world. Glints of sunset came through the leaves like emerald stars, spun dizzily across his vision. Around him, fighting pounded among the trees, but it made no sound. His hearing was gone. Lyndon's stretched shout was mute. The first strenuous anger had no voice. Galvanized by frenzy, Hollyan dragged Sunder bodily out of the way of the battle. She passed in front of Covenant, blocked his view for a moment, but nothing could block the bright, breathless vertigo that wheeled through him, as compulsory and damning as the aura of the worm. Kale and the giants were locked in combat with Harn, Durris, and the rest of the Harachai. The movements of the attackers were curiously sluggish, imprecise. They did not appear to be in control of themselves, but they struck with the full force of their native strength, blows so hard that even the giants were staggered. Pitchwife went down under the automatic might of Fole and another Harochai. Swinging the flatter for Falchion, the first struggled to her husband's aid. Hunnensgrave leveled one side of the Harochai with each fist. Kale's people no longer had the balance or alertness to avoid his massive punches, but the attackers came back to their feet as if they were inured to pain, and assailed him again. Mistwave bear-hugged one Harochai, knocked another away with a kick but the Harochai struck him a blow in the face that made his head crack backward, loosening his grasp. Moving as stiffly as a man in Aegeus, Harn pursued Kale through the battle. Kale eluded him easily, but Harn did not relent. He looked as mindless as Dara's foal and the others. They had been mastered by the clave. Slowly, the vertigo spinning across Covenant's sight came into focus, and he found himself staring at the krill, it stood in the dirt like a small cross, scant feet from his face. Though fighting hit and tumbled everywhere, no one touched Lorik's eldritch blade. 
its gem shone with a clear, clean argence. No taint marred the pure depths of the jewel. Gibbon's attempt on it had been a feint, a way of distracting the company until he could take hold of all the Haruchai. All except Kale. With the dreamy detachment of Anoxia, Covenant wondered why Kale was immune. Abruptly, the knotting of his muscles eased. He jerked air into his lungs, biting raw hunks of it past the stunned paroxysm which had kept him from breathing. Then sound began to leech back into the jungle. The slash of foliage, the grunt and impact of effort. For a moment there were no voices. The battle was fought in bitter muteness, but then, as if from a great distance, he heard Lyndon call out, Kale, the mere wives, you get away from them. Covenant heaved himself up from the ground in time to see Kale's reaction. With the suddenness of a panther, Kale pounced on Harn. Harn was too torpid to counter effectively. Ducking under Harn's blunt blows, Kale knocked him off balance, then grabbed him by the shoulder and hip, snatched him into the air. Harn lacked the bare self-command to twist aside as Kale plunged him toward a knee raised and braced to break his back. Yet, at the last instant, Harn did twist aside. When Bryn and Kale had been caught in the trance of the mere wives, Linden had threatened to snap Bryn's arm, and that particular peril had restored him to himself. Harn wrenched out of Kale's grasp, came to his feet, facing his kinsman. For a moment they gazed at each other impassively, as if nothing had happened. Then Harn nodded. He and Kale sprang to the aid of the giants. Still coughing for air, Covenant propped himself against a tree and watched the rest of the fight. It did not last long. When Kale and Harn had broken Fole and Durris free of Gibbon's hold, the four of them were soon able to rescue the remaining six. Pitchwife and Mistweave picked their battered bodies out of the brush. The first glared sharply about her, holding her sword ready. Hunnenscrave folded his arms over his chest to contain the startling force of his own rage. But the Haruchai ignored the giants. They turned away to face each other, speaking mind to mind with the silent dispassion of their people. In spite of what had just happened, they did not appear daunted or dismayed. When their converse was over, Kale looked at the giants and Linden, then met Covenant squarely. He did not apologize. His people were Harochai, and the offense to their rectitude went too deep for mere contrition. In a voice entirely devoid of inflection, free of any hint of justification or regret, he said, It is agreed that such unworth as mine has its uses. Whatever restitution you command we will undertake— but we will not again fall from ourselves in this way. Covenant did not know what to say. He had known the Harochai for a long time, and the blood guard before them. Yet he was still astonished by the extravagance of their judgments, and he was certain that he would not be able to bear being served by such people much longer. The simple desire to be deserving of them would make him wild. How was it possible that his white fire had become so black in so little time? Pitchwife murmured something like a jest under his breath, then grimaced when no one responded. Ponensgrave had become too bleak for mirth. In his frustrated desire to prove himself to himself, Mistweave had forgotten laughter. And the first was not mollified by Kale's speech. The Harochai had aroused her battle instinct, and her face was like her blade— whetted for fighting. Because the sun was setting and Sunder was exhausted, she commanded the master and Mistweave to prepare a camp and a meal. Yet the decision to rest did not abate her tension. Dourly she stalked around the area, hacking back the brush to form a relatively clear space for the camp. Covenant stood and watched her. The blow he had received made everything inside him fragile. Even his truncated senses were not blind to her sore, stern vexation. Linden would not come near him. She stayed as far away from him as the first's clearing permitted, avoiding him as if to lessen as much as possible his impact on her percipients. The glances that Holly had cast toward him over Sunder's shoulder were argued with fright and uncertainty in the deepening twilight. Only Vane Findale and the Haruchai behaved as if they did not care. Covenant started to cover his face, then lowered his hands again. Their numbness had become repugnant to him. His features felt stiff and breakable. His beard smelled of sweat. His whole body smelled. He was unclean and rank from head to foot. He feared that his voice would crack, but he forced himself to use it. All right. 
Say it. Somebody. The first delivered a fierce cut that severed a honeysuckle stem as thick as her forearm, then wheeled toward him. The tip of her blade pointed accusations at him. Lyndon winced at the first's anger, but did not intervene. Giant friend, the leader of the search, rasped as if the name hurt her mouth. We have beheld a great ill. Is it truly your intent to utter this dark fire against the clave? She towered over Covenant, and the light of Mistweave's campfire made her appear dominant and necessary. He felt too brittle to reply. Once he had tried to cut the venom out of his forearm on a ragged edge of rock. Those faint scars spread like fretwork around the fundamental marks of Marid's fangs. But now he knew better. Carefully, he said, He will not do that to me and get away with it. The first did not waver. And what of the earth? Her tone made his eyes burn, but not with tears. Every word of his answer was as distinct as a coal. A long time ago, with the blood of half-mindless cave whites on his head, I swore I was never going to kill again, but that hasn't stopped me. With both hands he had driven a knife into the chest of the man who had slain Lena, and that blow had come back to damn him. He had no idea how many brat there had died in the collapse of Kemper's pitch. The last time I was there I killed twenty-one of them. Twenty-one men and women, most of whom did not know that their lives were evil. I'm sick of guilt. If you think I'm going to do anything that will destroy the arch of time, you had better try to stop me now. At that her eyes narrowed as if she were considering the implications of running her blade through his throat. Hollian and Lyndon stared, and Sunder tried to brace himself to go to Covenant's aid. But the first, too, was the unbeliever's friend. She had given him the title he valued most. Abruptly the challenge of her sword dropped. "'No, giant friend,' she sighed. "'We have come too far. I trust you or nothing.' Roughly she sheathed her long sword and turned away. Firelight gleamed in the wet streaks of Lyndon's concern and relief. After a moment she came over to Covenant. She did not meet his gaze but she put one hand briefly on his right forearm like a recognition that he was not like her father. While that touch lasted, he ached to take hold of her hand and raise it to his lips, but he did not move. He believed that, if he did, he would surely shatter, and every promise he had made would be lost. The next day the fruits of the verdant sun were worse. They clogged the ground with the teeming, intractable frenzy of a sea and storm. And Sunder's weariness went too deep to be cured by one night of diamond draft induced sleep, one swallow of the rare and potent Rilberant, pitch wife created by combining his liquor with vitrum. But the clave made no more efforts to take control of the krill or the harochai. The shade of the trees held some of the underbrush to bearable proportions. No grim or other attack came riding out of Revelstone to bar the way and the travellers had made such good progress during the past two days that they did not need to hurry now. None of them doubted that the keep of the Namoram was within reach. At infrequent intervals the distortion of the jungle provided a glimpse of the southwestern sky, and then all the companions could see the hot, feral shaft of the bane-fire burning toward the sun like an immedicable scald in the green-hued air. Every glimpse turned Lyndon's taut, delicate features a shade paler, Memory and emanations of power assaulted her vulnerable senses. She had once been Gibbon Raver's prisoner in Revelstone, and his touch had raised the darkness coiled around the roots of her soul to the stature of all night. Yet she did not falter. She had aimed the company to this place by the strength of her own will, and wrested this promise from Covenant when he had been immobile with despair. In spite of her unresolved hunger and loathing for power, she did not let herself hang back. The stone downers also held themselves firm. They had a score to settle with the clave, a tally that stretched from the hold of Revelstone and the ruin of the villages down to the sunbane-shaped foundations of their lives. Whenever Sunder's need for rest became severe, Hollian took the oar crest and krill herself, though she was unskilled at that work and the path she made was not as clear as his. 
The silent caterwaul and torment of the vegetation blocked the ground at every step, but the company found a way through it. And as the sun began to sag toward the high ridge of the western mountains, still distant to the south and west beyond the region which had once been named Trothgard, but near at hand in the east-jutting promontory of the range, the companions reached the verge of the jungle, below the rocky and barren foothills of the high keep. Halting in the last shelter of the trees, they looked up at their destination. Revelstone, once the proud bastion and born of the ancient land-serving lords, now the home of the Namoram and the Clave. Here, at the apex of the promontory, the peaks dropped to form an upland plateau, pointing east and sweeping north. All the walls of the plateau were sheer, as effective as battlements, and in the center of the upland lay Blimmermere, the eldritch tarn with its waters untouched by the sunbane, until they cascaded down Furl Falls in the long south face of the promontory, and passed beyond the sources of their potency. But the keep itself stood to the east of Glimmermere and Furl Falls. The unhomed had wrought the city of the lords into the eastward wedge of the plateau, filling that outcrop of the earth's hard gut-rock with habitations and defenses. Directly above the company stood the watchtower, the tip of the wedge. Shorter than the plateau, its upper shaft rose free of the main keep bulking behind it, but its lower half was sealed by walls of native stone to the rest of the wedge. In that way, Revelstone's sole entrance was guarded. Long ago, massive gates in the southeast curve of the watchtower's base had protected a passage under the tower, a tunnel which gave admittance only to the closed courtyard between the tower and the main keep, where stood a second set of gates. During the last war, the siege of Revelstone had broken the outer gates, leaving them in rubble, but Covenant knew from experience that the inner gates still held, warding the clave with their imponderable thickness and weight. Above the abutment over its opening, the round shaft of the watchtower was marked with battlements and embrasures to the crenellated rim of its crown. They were irregular and unpredictable, shaped to suit the tower's internal convolutions. Yet the face of the watchtower was as simple as child's work, compared to the dramatic complexity of the walls of the main keep. For a surprising distance into the plateau, the sheer cliffs had been crafted by the unhomed, written with balconies and buttresses, parapets and walkways, and punctuated with windows of every description, embrasures on the lower levels, oriels and shaded coins higher up. A prolific and apparently spontaneous multiplication of detail that always gave Covenant an impression of underlying structure meaning which only giants could read. The faint green sunset danced and sheened on the south face, confusing his human ability to grasp the organization of something so tall, grand, and timeless. But even his superficial senses felt the tremendous power of the Banefire's beam as it struck sunward from athwart the great keep. With one stroke that red force transgressed all his memories of grandeur and glory, change the proud habitation of the lords to a place of malefic peril. When he had approached Revelstone so many days ago to rescue Lyndon, Sunder, and Hullion, he had been haunted by grief for the giants and lords, and beauty the land had lost. But now the knot of his chosen rage was pulled too tight to admit sorrow. He intended to tear that place down if necessary to root out the clave, and the bare thought that he might be forced to damage Revelstone made him savage. Yet when he looked at his companions, saw the rapt faces of the giants, his anger loosened slightly. The keep had the power to entrance them. Pitchwife's mien was wide with the glee of appreciation. The first's eyes shone pride at the handiwork of her long-dead people. Mistweave gazed upward hungrily, all dismay forgotten for a time. Even Hanan's crave had momentarily lost his air of doom, as though he knew intuitively that Revelstone would give him a chance to make restitution. Conflicting passions rose in Covenant's throat. Thickly, he asked, "'Can you read it? Do you know what it means? I've been here three times.' Four, counting the brief translation during which he had refused Moram's summons. "'But no one's ever been able to tell me what it means.' For a moment none of the giants answered. They could not step back from the wonder of the keep. They had seen Kirkry in Sea Reach, and marveled at it, but for them Revelstone was transcendent. Watching them, Covenant knew with a sudden pang that now they would never turn back, 
that no conceivable suasion would induce them to set their search and their private purposes aside, to leave the Sunbane and Lord Fowl to him. The Sunbane had eroded them in fundamental ways, knowing of their ability to believe that their search might actually succeed. What could giants do to aid a land in which nature itself had become the source of horror? But the sight of Revelstone restored them to themselves. They would never give up their determination to fight. Unless Covenant found his own answer soon, he would not be able to save them. Swallowing heavily, Pitchwife murmured, No words. There are none. Your scant human tongue is void. Tears spread through the creases of his face, mapping his emotion. But the first said for him, All tongues, giant friend, all tongues lack such language. There is that in the granite glory of the world's heart which may not be uttered with words. All other expression must be dumb when the pure stone speaks. And here that speech has been made manifest. Ah, oh, my heart! Her voice rose as if she wanted to both sing and keen, but for her also no words were adequate. Softly she concluded, The giants of the land were taught much by their loss of home. I am humbled before them. For a moment Covenant could not respond. But then a memory came back to him, a recollection of the formal salutation that the people of Revelstone had formerly given to the giants. Hail and welcome, inheritor of land's loyalty. Welcome, whole or hurt, in boon or bane. Ask or give. To any requiring name we will not fail. In a husky voice he breathed, Giant troth, Revelstone, ancient ward, Heart and door of earth friend's main, Preserve the true with power's sword, Thou ages keeper, mountain rain. At that the first turned toward him, And for an instant her face was concentrated with weeping As if he had touched her deep giantish love of stone. Almost immediately she recovered her sternness, but not before he had seen how absolutely she was ready now to serve him. Gruffly she said, "'Thomas Covenant, I have titled you Giant Friend, but it is not enough. You are the Earth Friend. No other name suffices.' Then she went and put her arms around her husband. But Covenant groaned to himself, "'Earth Friend, God help me. That title belonged to Beric Halfhand.' who had fashioned the staff of law and founded the Council of Lords. It did not become a man who carried the destruction of the Arch of Time in his envenomed hands, the man who had brought to ruin all Beric's accomplishments. He glared back up at the keep. The sun had begun to set behind the western mountains, and its light in his eyes hampered his sight. But he discerned no sign that the watchtower was occupied. He had received the same impression the last time he had been here and had distrusted it then, as he did now. Though the outer gates were broken, the tower could still serve as a vital part of the keep's defences. He would have to be prepared for battle the moment he set foot in that tunnel, if the clave did not seek to attack him before then. His shoulders hunching like anticipations of brutality, he turned away from the keep and retreated a short distance into the vegetation, to an area of rocks where the company could camp for the night. Shortly his companions gathered around him. The giants left their delighted study of Revelstone to clear the ground, start a fire, and prepare food. Sunder and Hullion cast repeated glances like wincing toward the keep, where the ill of their lives had its center, and where they had once nearly been slain. But they sat with Covenant as if he were a source of courage. The Harochai arranged themselves protectively around the region. Findale stood like a shadow at the edge of the growing firelight. Linden's disquiet was palpable. Vexation creased her brows. Her gaze searched the twilight warily. Covenant guessed that she was feeling the nearness of the raver, and he did not know how to comfort her. During all the land struggles against despite, no one had ever found a way to slay a raver. While Lord Fowl endured, his servants clung to life. The forestall of Garotting Deep, Carr Caverall's creator and former master, had demonstrated that Harem or Sheol or Jehanum might be sorely hurt or reduced if the bodies they occupied were killed and they were not allowed to flee. But only the body died. The raver's spirit survived. 
Covenant could not believe that the land would ever be free of Gibbon's possessor, and he did not know what else to offer that might ease Linden. But then she named the immediate cause of her unease, and it was not the Nam Oram. Turning to Covenant, she said unexpectedly, "'Vane's gone.' Taken aback, he blinked at her for a moment. Then he surged to his feet, scanned the camp and the surrounding jungle. The demon dim spawn was nowhere in sight. Covenant wheeled toward Kale. Flatly, the Harachai said, "'He has halted a stone's throw distant.' He nodded back the way the company had come. "'At intervals we have watched him, but he does not move. Is it your wish that he should be warded?' Covenant shook his head, groping for comprehension. When he and Vane had approached Revelstone looking for Linden, Sunder, and Hollion, the clave had tried to keep Vane out, and had hurt him in the process. Yet he had contrived his way into the keep, found the heels of the staff of law. But after that he had obeyed the riders, as if he feared what they could do to him. Was that it? Having obtained what he wanted from Revelstone, he now kept his distance, so that the clave would not be able to damage him again? But how was it possible that the demon demispawn could be harmed at all, when the sunbane did not affect him, and even Grimfire simply rolled off his black skin? "'It's because of what he is,' Lyndon murmured, as though Covenant's question were tangible in the air. They discussed the matter at other times, and she had suggested that perhaps the clave knew more about Vane than the company did. But now she had a different answer. He's a being of pure structure, nothing but structure, like a skeleton without any muscle or blood or life, rigidness personified. Anything that isn't focused straight at him can't touch him. Slowly, as if she were unconscious of what she was doing, she turned toward Revelstone, lifted her face to the lightless keep. But that's what the sunbane does, what the clave does. They corrupt law, disrupt structure, desecrate order. If they tried hard enough, she was glowering as if she could see Gibbon waiting in his malice and his glee, they could take him apart completely, and there wouldn't be enough of him left to so much as remember why he was made in the first place. No wonder he doesn't want to come any closer. Covenant held his breath, hoping that she would go on, that in this mood of perception or prophecy she would name the purpose for which Vane had been created. But she did not. By degrees she lowered her gaze. "'Damn that bastard anyway,' she muttered softly. "'Damn him to hell!' He echoed her silence. Vane was such an enigma that Covenant continually forgot him, forgot how vital he was to the hidden machinations of the Elohim, if not to the safety of the earth. But here Findale had not hesitated to leave the demon dim spawn's side— and his anguished yellow eyes showed no interest in anything except the hazard of Covenant's fire. Covenant felt a prescient itch run through his forearm. Wincing, he addressed Kale. "'Don't bother. He'll take care of himself. He always has.' Then he went sourly back to his seat near the fire. The companions remained still as they ate supper, chewing their separate thoughts with their food. But when they were done, the first— "'faced Covenant across the smoking blaze "'and made a gesture of readiness. "'Now, earth friend,' her tone reminded him "'of a polished blade, eager for use, "'let us speak of this proud and dire keep.' "'Covenant met her gaze and grimaced in an effort "'to hold his personal extremity "'beyond the range of Lyndon's recipients. "'It is a doughty work,' the first said firmly. "'In it the unhomed wrought surpassingly well.' Its gates have been broken by a puissance that challenges conception. But if I have not been misled, there are gates again beyond the tower, and surely you have seen that the walls will not be scaled. We would be slain in the attempt. The clave is potent, and we are few. Earth friend, she concluded as if she were prepared to trust whatever explanation he gave, how do you purpose to assail this dungeon? In response he scowled grimly. He had been expecting that question, and dreading it. If he tried to answer it as if he were sane, his resolve might snap like a rotten bone. His friends would be appalled, and perhaps they would try to stop him. Even if they did not, he felt as certain as death that their dismay would be too much for him. Yet some reply was required of him. Too many lives depended on what he meant to do. Stalling for courage, he looked toward Hollion. 
His voice caught in his throat as he asked, "'What kind of son are we going to have tomorrow?' Dark hair framed her mean, and her face itself was smudged with the dirt of long travel. Yet by some trick of the firelight, or of her nature, she appeared impossibly clear, her countenance unmuddied by doubt or despair. Her movements were deft and untroubled as she accepted the krill from sunder, took out her leonar, and invoked the delicate flame of her foretelling. After a moment, fire bloomed from her wand. Its color was the dusty hue of the desert sun. Covenant nodded to himself. A desert sun. By chance or design, he had been granted the phase of the sunbane he would have chosen for his purpose. On the strength of that small grace, he was able to face the first again. Before we risk anything else, I'm going to challenge Gibbon. Try to get him to fight me personally. I don't think he'll do it. Though surely the raver would covet the white ring for itself and might therefore be willing to defy its master's will. But if he does, I can break the clave's back without hurting anybody else. Even though Gibbon held the whole force of the banefire, Covenant was ready for that as well. But the first was not content. And if he does not, she asked promptly, if he remains within his fastness and dares us to harm him, Abruptly, Covenant lurched to his feet. Lyndon's gaze followed him with a flare of alarm as she caught a hint of what drove him. But he did not let her speak. Pieces of moonlight filtered through the dense leaves, and beyond the trees the moon was full, stretched to bursting with promises he could not keep. Above him the walls and battlements of Revelstone held the silver light as if they were still beautiful. He could not bear it. Though he was choking, he rasped out, I'll think of something. Then he fled the camp, went blundering through the brush until he reached its verge on the foothills. The great keep towered there, as silent and moon-ridden as a cairn for all the dreams it had once contained. No illumination or life showed from it anywhere. He wanted to cry out at it. What have they done to you? But he knew the stone would not hear him. It was deaf to him, blind to its own desecration, as helpless against evil as the earth itself. The thought that he might hurt it made him tremble. Kale attended him like an avatar of the night's stillness. Because he had passed the limit of what he could endure, he turned to the Harachai and whispered hoarsely, I'm going to sleep here. I want to be alone. Don't let any of them near me. He did not sleep. He spent the night staring up at the city as though it were the last barrier between his hot grief and Lord Fowl's triumph. Several times he heard his friends approach him through the brush. Each time Kale turned them away. Lyndon protested his refusal, but could not breach it. That solitary and intimate fidelity enabled Covenant to hang on until dawn. He saw the light first on the main keep's rim beyond the parapets of the watchtower, while the shaft of the bane fire shot toward the east. This daybreak had the hue of deserts, and the sun gave the high gray stone a brown tinge. Once again Hollyan had foretold the sunbane accurately. As he levered his strained sore and weary bones upright, he thought of the Ebrand, with an odd pang. Married by the child she bore— she and Sunder had grown steadily closer to each other, and Covenant did not know how to heal the wound between himself and Lyndon. Behind him he heard Lyndon accost Kale a second time. When the Harachai denied her again, she snapped in exasperation, "'He's got to eat. He's still at least that human.' Her voice sounded ragged, as if she also had not slept. Perhaps the air around Revelstone was too full of the taste of ravers to permit her to sleep. Gibbon had shown her the part of herself which had arisen in hunger to take her mother's life, yet now, in this fatal place, she was thinking of Covenant, rather than of herself. She would have forgiven him long ago, if he had ever given her the chance. Stiffly, as if all his muscles had been calcified by the night and his long despair, he started up the hill toward Revelstone. He could not face Lyndon now, feared to let her look at him, almost as much as he feared the massive granite threat of the keep. Concealment was no longer possible for him, and he dreaded how she would react to what she saw. The light was on the watchtower, coloring it 
like a wilderland, and dropping rapidly toward the foothills. At the edges of his vision on either side, he saw the treetops start to melt. But the center of his sight was filled by the tower. Its embrasures and abutments were empty, and the darkness behind them made them look like eyes from which the light of life had been extinguished. Light of life and desecration, he thought vaguely, as if he were too weak with inanition and fear to be troubled by contradictions. He knew how to deal with them. He had found that answer in the throne hall of Fowl's Cresh, when the impossibility of believing the land true and the impossibility of believing it false had forced him to take his stand on the still point of strength at the center of his vertiginous plight. But such comprehension was of no use to him now. All the anger had gone out of him during the night, and he ascended toward the gaping mouth of Revelstone like a husk for burning. Yet the apparent desertion of the city made him uneasy. Was it possible that the clave had fled, that his mere approach had driven the riders into hiding? No. The virulence of the Banefire's beam gave no indication that it had been left untended, and Lord Fowl would not have permitted any withdrawal. What better victory for the despiser than that Covenant should bring down the arch in conflict with the clave? Lord Fowl had said, At the last there will be but one choice for you, and you will make it in all despair. He had promised that, and he had laughed. Something that might have been power stirred in Covenant. His hands curled into fists, and he went on upward. The sun laid his shadow on the bare dirt in front of him. Its heat gripped the back of his neck, searching for the fiber of his will in the same way that it would reduce all the upper land's monstrous verdure to gray sludge and desert. He seemed to see himself spread out for sacrifice on the ground, exposed for the second time to a blow as murderous as the knife which had pierced his chest, stabbed the hope out of his life. An itch like a faint scurry of vermin spread up his right forearm. Unconsciously he quickened his pace. Then he reached the level ground at the base of the tower, and the tunnel stood open before him among its ruined gates. The passage was as dark as a grave until it met the dim illumination reflecting into the courtyard from the face of the main keep. Dimly he saw the inner gates at the far side of the court. They were sealed against him. And voluntarily he looked back down toward the place where his companions had camped. At first the sun was in his eyes, and he could descry nothing except the eviscerated gray muck which stretched out to the horizons like a sea as the sunbane denatured life from the terrain. But when he shaded his sight, he saw the company. His friends stood in a cluster just beyond the edge of the sludge. The first and two Harochai were restraining Hanan's grave. Pitchwife held Linden back. Covenant swung around in pain to face the tunnel again. He did not enter it. He was familiar with the windows in its ceiling which allowed the keep's defenders to attack anyone who walked that throat. And he did not raise his voice. He was instinctively certain now that Revelstone was listening acutely, in stealth and covert fear. He sounded small against the dusty air, the great city, and the growing desert as he spoke. "'I've come for you, Gibbon. For you. If you come out, I'll let the rest of the riders live.' Echoes mocked him from the tunnel, then subsided. "'If you don't, I'll take this place apart to find you. You know I can do it. I could have done it the last time, and I am stronger now. You are more dangerous now than you've ever been. Fowl doesn't think you can beat me. He's using you to make me beat myself. But I don't care about that any more. Either way, you're going to die. Come out and get it over with.' The words seemed to fail before they reached the end of the passage. Revelstone loomed above him like the corpse of a city which had been slain ages ago. The pressure of the sun drew a line of bitter sweat down his spine. And a figure appeared in the tunnel. Black against the reflection of the courtyard it moved outward. Its feet struck soft echoes of crepitation from the stone. Covenant tried to swallow, and could not. The desert sun had him by the throat. A pair of hot pains transfixed his forearm. The scars gleamed like fangs. An invisible darkness flowed out of the passage toward him, covering his fire with a pall of venom. The sound of steps swelled. 
then sandaled feet and the fringe of a red robe broached the sunshine, and Covenant went momentarily faint with the knowledge that his first gambit had failed. Light ran swiftly up the lines of the stark scarlet fabric to the black chasuble which formalized the robe. Hands appeared, empty of the characteristic rook, the black iron rod like a scepter with an open triangle fixed atop it, which a rider should have held. Yet this was surely a rider, not given. The Nam Oram wore black. He carried a crozier as tall as himself. The habitual beatitude or boredom of his round visage was punctured only by the red bale of his eyes. The man who came out to meet Covenant was not given. A rider, then. He appeared thick of torso, though his ankles and wrists were thin, and his bearded cheeks had been worn almost to gauntness by audacity or fear. Wisps of wild hair clung like fanaticism to his balding skull. His eyes had a glazed aspect. He held his palms open before him as if to demonstrate that he had come unarmed. Covenant wrestled down his weakness, fought a little moisture into his throat so that he could speak. In a tone that should have warned the rider, he said, "'Don't waste my time. I want Gibbon.' "'Half-hand, I greet you,' the man replied. His voice was steady, but it suggested the shrillness of panic. "'Gibbon Namoram is entirely cognizant of you, and will waste neither time nor life in your name. What is your purpose here?' Impressions of danger crawled between Covenant's shoulder-blades. His mouth was full of a copper taste of fear. The rider's trunk appeared unnaturally thick, and his robe seemed to move slightly of its own accord as if the cloth were seething. Covenant's scars began to burn like rats gnawing at his flesh. He hardly heard himself reply, "'This has gone on too long. You make the whole world stink. I'm going to put a stop to it.' The rider bared his teeth, a grin that failed. His gaze did not focus on Covenant. "'Then I must tell you that the Namoram does not desire speech with you. His word has been given to me to speak, if you will hear it.' Covenant started to ask, "'What word is that?' But the question never reached utterance. With both hands the rider unbelted the sash of his robe. In prescient dread Covenant watched the rider open his raiment to the sun. From the line of his shoulders to the flex of his knees his entire body was covered with wasps, great yellow wasps as big as Covenant's thumb. When the light touched them they began to snarl. For one hideous moment they writhed where they were, and the rider wore them as if he were one of the sunbane warped, made savage and abominable by corruption. Then the swarm launched itself at Covenant. In that instant the world went black. Venom crashed against his heart like the blow of a sledgehammer. Black fire, black poison, black ruin. The flame raging from his ring should have been as pure and argent as the metal from which it sprang. But it was not, was not. It was an abyss that yawned around him, a gulf striding through the air and the ground and the keep to consume them, swallow the world and leave no trace and every effort he made to turn the dark fire white, force it back to the clean pitch of its true nature, only raised the blaze higher, widened the void. Swiftly it became as huge as the hillside, hungry for ruin. Lyndon was not shouting at him. If she had torn her heart with screams, he would not have been able to hear her. She was too far away, and the gathering cataclysm of his power filled all his senses. Yet he heard her in his mind— heard her as she had once cried to him across the worm's aura and the white ring's eruption. This is what Fowl wants, felt the remembered grasp of her arms as she had striven to wrest him back from doom. If he let his conflagration swell, they would all die, she and the others he loved, and the land he treasured, all of them ripped out of life and meaning by blackness. The strain of self-mastery pushed him far beyond himself. He was driven to a stretched and tenuous desperation from which he would never be able to turn back, a hard, wild exigency that he would have to see through to its conclusion for good or ill, ravage or restitution. But the simple knowledge that he would not be able to turn back, and did not mean to try, enabled him to strangle the destruction pouring from him. Abruptly his vision cleared, and he had not been stung. Thousands of small charred bodies still smoked on the bare ground. 
Not one of the wasps was left to threaten him. The writer remained standing with his mouth open and his eyes white, miraculously unscathed and astonished. Covenant felt no triumph. He had gone too far for triumph, but he was certain of himself now, at least for the moment. To the writer he said, "'Tell Gibbon he had his chance.' His voice held neither doubt nor mercy. "'Now I'm coming in after him.' Slowly the astonishment drained from the man's face. His frenzy and glee seemed to collapse as if he had suffered a relapse of mortality. Yet he remained a rider of the clave, and he knew his enemy. All the land had been taught to believe that Covenant was a betrayer. The man looked human and frail, reduced by failure. But he did not recant his faith. "'You surpass me, half-hand,' his voice shook. "'You have learned to wield and to restrain. But you have come to havoc the long service of our lives, and we will not permit you. Look to your power, for it will not aid you against us. Turning as if he were still able to dismiss Covenant from consideration, he followed the echoes of his feet back into the tunnel under the watchtower. Covenant watched him go, and cursed the mendacity which enabled Lord Fowl to take such men and women, people of native courage and dedication, and convinced them that the depredations of the clave were virtuous. Revelstone was full of individuals who believed themselves responsible for the survival of the land, and they would be the first to die. The despiser would sacrifice them before hazarding his truer servants. Yet even for them Covenant could not stop now. The fire still raved within him. He had not quenched it. He had only internalized it, sealed its fury inside himself. If he did not act on it, it would break out with redoubled vehemence, and he would never be able to contain it again. Violence taut in his muscles, he started stiffly down the hillside toward his friends. They began the ascent to meet him. Anxiously they studied the way he moved, as if they had seen him emerge from the teeth of hell, and could hardly believe it. Before he reached them he heard the flat thunder of hooves. He did not stop. He was wound to his purpose and unreachable. But he looked back up at Revelstone over his shoulder. Between the broken gates came riders mounted on coursers, half a dozen of them pounding in full career down the slope. The sunbane bred coursers were large enough to carry four or five ordinary men and women, would have been large enough to support giants. They had malicious eyes, the faces and fangs of saber-tooths, shaggy pelts, and poisoned spurs at the back of each ankle and the riders held their rooks high and bright with flame as they charged. Together they rushed downward as if they believed they could sweep the company off the hillside. And for all their fury and speed they looked more like a charade than a true assault. The bane-fire made them dangerous, but they were only six, and they were hurling themselves against ten Haruchai, four giants, the appointed of the Elohim, and four humans whose strength had not yet been fully measured. Covenant himself had already killed Deliberately, he left the charge to his companions and walked on. Behind him the coursers suddenly went wild. Sunder had snatched out his sunstone and the krill, but now he did not draw his power from the sun. Instead he tapped the huge beam of the bane fire, and he was acquainted with coursers. At one time he had learned to use a rook in order to master a group of the beasts. He knew how to command them. Fierce red flaring shot back and forth, through the krill's white light, as he threw his force at the attack. But he did not falter. The impact of his countervailing instructions struck chaos into the coursers. Two of them fell, trying to lunge in several directions simultaneously. A third stumbled over them. The others attacked the fallen, tried to kill them. Reft of control, the riders sprawled to the hard ground. One was crushed under the massive body of a courser. Another received a dangerous spur-slash. She cried out to her comrades for help, but they were already in flight back toward the keep, bearing the broken rider for his blood. Weakly she struggled after them. Sunder ordered the coursers out into the desert so that the clave would not be able to use them again, but two of them squealed with pain when they tried to obey. They had broken legs. Gripping her falchion in both fists, the first stalked up to the maimed beasts and slew them. Then Sunder, Linden, and Pitchwife approached Covenant. The graveler was panting heavily. Gibbon does not put forth his full strength. I am not the equal of six riders. 
yet there was a grim pride in his tone. At last he had struck an effective blow against the clave. "'He's trying to provoke you,' Lyndon warned. "'You almost didn't pull back in time. You've got to be careful.' Fear of ravers twisted her face into a scowl. "'Earth friend,' breathed Pitchwife. "'What will you do? There is a madness upon Grimm and Hunnensgrave. We will not be long able to withhold him.' But Covenant made no reply. His legs were trembling now, and he could not stop what he was doing or turn aside. He headed toward a blunt boulder jutting from the lower slope of the foothill. When he reached it, he struggled up onto its crown, defying the way the wide landscape below and about him sucked at his balance. All his limbs felt leaden with suppressed devastation. From horizon to horizon the desert sun had almost finished its work. In the low places of the terrain lay ponds of sludge which had once been trees and brush and vines but every slope and rise was burned to dust and death. The thought that he would have to damage Revelstone was intolerable. Sheer grief and self-loathing would break him if he set his hand to that stone. Yet the necessity was inescapable. The clave and the vein fire could not be permitted to go on. His heart quivered at the conflict of his fears, fear of harming the keep, and of not harming it, fear of himself, of the risk he meant to take his desire to avoid killing, and his need to protect his friends. But he had already chosen his path. Now he started down it. Trembling as if he were on the verge of deflagration, he spoke the name he had been hoarding to himself ever since he had begun to understand the implications of what he meant to do. The name of a sand gorgon. Nom. 10. The Bane Fire. Clearly through the sudden shock of the company he heard Lyndon gasp. There was no wind, nothing to soften the arid pressure of the sun. Below him the terrain was falling into the paradoxical purity of desecration, the cleanliness of extermination. No wonder fire was so hard to resist. His balance seemed to spin out of him into the flat brown sky. He had not eaten or slept since the previous day. Perhaps it was inanition which made the horizons cant to one side as if they were about to sail away, in inition or despair. But Pitchwife and Kale caught him, lowered him from the boulder, and Lyndon came to him in a blur of vertigo. He had never been good at heights. He knew that she was saying his name, yet he felt unable to hear her. Her face was impossible to focus. She should have been protesting. A sand gorgon? Are you out of your mind? What makes you think you can control it? but she was not. Her hands gripped his shoulders roughly, then flinched away. This time her gasp was like a cry. You! she began, but the words would not come. Oh, covenant! The first's voice cut through the wild reel of the hills. What harms him? All his friends were crowded around him and spinning. You saw Moram and Foam Follower, Manor and Elena, and Kar Keverall. All there is if they deserve better from him. What has transpired to harm him? They had met him in Andalane, and given him everything they dared, and this was the result. He was caught on a wheel that had no center. Chosen, you must speak. He's on fire. Lyndon's tone was wet with tears. The venom's on fire. We'd already be dead, but he's holding it inside, as long as he can, until it eats its way out. The first cursed then snapped a command that Covenant failed to hear. A moment later Pitchwife's heat-impervious hands lifted a bowl of diamond draft to Covenant's mouth. Its potent smell stung his nostrils with panic. Diamond draft would restore him. Perhaps it would restore his self-mastery as well, or it might fuel the blaze of his suppressed power. He could not take the chance. Somehow he slowed the spin. Clarity was possible. He could not afford to fail, and he would not have to hang on long, only until he reached the culmination of his nightmares. It was possible. When he was certain of the faces hovering around him, he said, as if he were suffocating, Not diamond drafts, Metheglin. The first glared doubt at him. But Lyndon nodded. He's right, she said in a rush. He has to keep his balance. Between strength and weakness, diamond draft is too strong. 
People were moving. Hollyan and Mistweave went away, came back at once with a pouch of the land's thick mead. That Covenant drank, sparingly at first, then more deeply as he felt his grasp on the conflagration hold. By degrees the vertigo frayed out of him. His friends were present and stable. The ground became solid again. The sun rang in his eyes, clanged against his temples like Lord Fowl's silent laughter, and his face streamed with the sweat of desperation. But as the Metheglin steadied him, he found that he was at least able to bear the heat. With Pitchwife's help, he gained his feet. Squinting, he turned to the east, and thrust his gaze out into the shimmering desert. "'Will it come?' the first asked no one in particular. "'The wide seas intervene, and they are no slight barrier.' Cusrain said it would. Linden bit her lips to control her apprehension, then continued. He said distance has no meaning to such power. Covenant remembered that. The Sand Gorgons answer their release swiftly. That was how Hergrim had been killed. But Covenant had already summoned Nom once at Linden's instigation, and he had not been slain, and Nom had not gone back to Sand Gorgon's doom. Therefore, why should the beast answer him now? He had no reason for such a wild hope, no reason at all except the fact that Norm had bowed to him when he had refrained from killing it. But the east was empty, and the haze closed against him like a curtain. Even the eyes of the giants discerned no sign of an answer. Abruptly, Kale's uninflected voice broke the silence. Her lord, behold! With one arm he pointed up the hillside toward Revelstone. For an instant, Covenant believed that the Harochai wanted him to observe the immense hot vermeil shaft of the main fire. With sun echoes burning white and brown across his sight, he thought the sizzling beam looked stronger now, as though Gibbon Raver were feeding it furiously to arm the clave for combat, killing the captured villagers and Harochai as fast as their blood could be poured onto the floor of the sacred enclosure where the main fire burned. At the idea, the spots flaring against the backs of his eyes turned black. His restraint slipped. The fang marks on his forearm hurt as if they had been reopened. But then he saw the riders at the base of the tower, four of them, two holding up their roofs to master a haro chai they had brought with them, two equipped with knives and buckets. They intended to shed their mind-bound prisoner in full view of Covenant and the company. Covenant let out a shout that made the air throb but at the same time he fought for control, thinking, No, no, he's trying to provoke me. The blackness in him writhed. He refused it until it subsided. Hunnan's crave. The first sounded almost casual, as if the sight of atrocities made her calm. Mistweave, it is my thought that we need not permit this. Half the Haruchai had started upward at a sprint. She made no effort to call them back. Stooping to the dirt, she picked up a rock larger than her palm, and in the same motion she hurled it at the riders. Striking the wall behind them, it burst in a shower of splinters that slashed at them like knives. Instantly Hunnan's Crave and Mistweave followed the first's example. Their casts were so accurate that one of the riders had a leg smashed, another was ripped by a hail of rebounding fragments. Their companions were compelled to release the Harochai, so that they could use their rooks to defend themselves. While the four riders retreated into the tunnel, their captive turned on them. Suddenly, free of their coercion, he slew the injured men. Then he pivoted disdainfully on his heel and strode down the slope to meet his people. He was bleeding from several cuts inflicted by sharp pieces of stone, but he bore himself as if he were unscathed. Covenant hated killing. He had chosen his path in an effort to spare as many lives as possible. But as he watched the released Harochai walking toward him like pure and utter dispassion, a dire grin twisted the corners of his mouth. In that moment he became more dangerous to Gibbon and the clave than any host of warriors or powers. When he looked toward the east again, he saw a plume of dust rising through the haze. He did not doubt what it was. Nothing but a sand gorgon could travel with enough swift strength to raise that much dust. Mutely, Linden moved to his side as if she wanted to take his arm and cling to it for support but the dark peril he radiated kept her from touching him. Mistweave watched the dust with growing amazement. Pitchwife muttered inanely to himself, making pointless jests that seemed to ease his trepidation. The first grinned like a scimitar. Of the giants, only Hanenskrave did not study the beast's approach. 
He stood with his head bowed and his arms manacled across his chest as if throwing stones at the riders had whetted his hunger for violence. Unexpectedly Findale spoke. He sounded weary and macerated, worn thin by the prolonged burden of his responsibility. But some of the bitterness was gone from his voice. Ringwielder, he said, your purpose here is abominable and should be set aside. Those who hold the earth in their hands have no justification for vengeance. Yet you have found a wise way to the accomplishment of your ends. I implore that you entrust them to this beast. You little comprehend what you have summoned. Covenant ignored the Elohim. Linden glanced at the appointed. Sunder and Hollyan gazed at him in confusion, but none of the companions spoke. Nom had become visible at the arrow point of the advancing dust. Albino against the desiccated waste, the beast approached at a startling pace. Its size was not commensurate with its might. It was only a few hands taller than Covenant, only a little more thickly built than the Harochai. Yet given time and concentrated attention and freedom, it was capable of reducing the entire gut-rock wedge of Revelstone to wreckage. It had a strange gait suited to deserts. Its knees were back-bent like a bird's to utilize the full thrust of the wide pads of its feet. Lacking hands, its arms were formed like battering rams, and it had no face. Nothing defined its hairless head except the faint ridges of its skull under its hide, and two covered slits like gills on either side. Even to Covenant's unpenetrating sight, the sand gorgon looked as pure and uncontestable as a force of nature, a hurricane bound into one savage form and avid for a place to strike. It came running as if it meant to hurl itself at him. But at the last it stopped in a thick nimbus of dust, confronted him across a scant stretch of bare dirt. For a moment it trembled as it had trembled when he had defeated it in direct combat, and it had not known how to hold back its elemental fury even to save its own life. Service was an alien concept to its brute mind. Violence made more sense. Sweat blurred the edges of his vision as he watched the beast quiver for decision. Involuntarily he held his breath. A few small flames slipped past his control and licked at his forearm until he beat them back. Nom's trembling mounted, and abruptly subsided. Lowering itself to the ground, the beast placed its forehead in the dirt at Covenant's feet. Slowly he let pent air leak away through his teeth. A muffled sigh of relief passed through the company. Linden covered her face momentarily, then thrust her fingers through her hair, as if she were trying to pull courage up out of her alarm. Nom, he said, and his voice shook. Thanks for coming. He did not know to what extent the beast was able to understand him, but it surged erect by unfolding its knees and stood waiting before him. He did not let himself hesitate. The bond which held Nom was fragile and he could feel venom gnawing in him like acid. His purpose was as clear to him as the sooth-tell which had sent him on his futile quest for the one tree. Turning to his companions, he addressed them as a group. "'I want you to stay here.' Gritting his will, he strove to suppress the tremors which made his tone harsh. "'Leave it to Nom and me. Between us, we're already too much for the job. And I can't bear to lose any of you.' He had no right to say such things. Every member of the company had earned a place in this hazard. But when he considered what might happen to them, he burned to spare them. "'I'll need Linden,' he went on before anyone could protest. "'Gibbon's going to try to hide from me. I won't be able to locate the raver without her.' The mere thought hurt him. He knew how deeply she dreaded ravers. "'And I'll take Kale and Fole to guard our backs.' Even that concession made him want to rage. But Linden might need the protection. The rest of you, just wait. If I fail, you'll have to do it for me. Unable to face what his friends wanted to say, the pained indignation in their eyes, the expostulations rising from their hearts, he impelled Linden into motion with his hand on the small of her back. A gesture called Nom to his side. Striding stiffly past the people who had served him with their lives and deserved better than this, he started up the slope toward Revelstone. Then for a moment he came so close to tears that his courage nearly broke. Not one of his companions obeyed. Without a word, they arranged themselves for battle and followed him. 
Under her breath, Lyndon murmured, I understand. You think it all depends on you. Why should people as good as they are have to suffer and maybe get killed for it? And I am so scared. Her face was pale and drawn and urgent. But you have got to stop trying to make other people's decisions for them. He did not reply. Keeping his attention fixed on the open tunnel under the watchtower, he forced his power-clogged muscles to bear him steadily upward. But now he feared that he was already defeated. He had too much to lose. His friends were accompanying him into his nightmares as if he were worthy of them. Because he had to do something, no matter how insufficient or useless it might be, he moved closer to Kale and whispered, This is enough. Banner said you'd serve me. Bryn told you to take his place. But I don't need this kind of service any more. I'm too far gone. What I need is hope. Her lord? the Harachai responded softly. The land needs a future. Even if I win, the giants will go home. You'll go about your business. But if anything happens to Sunder or Halion, the idea appalled him. I want you to take care of them, all of you, no matter what. He was prepared to endanger even Linden for this. The land has got to have a future. We hear you. Kale's tone did not betray whether he was relieved, moved, or offended. If the need arises, we will remember your words. With that, Covenant had to be content. Nom had moved somewhat ahead of him, thrusting toward the great keep as if it triggered a racial memory of the sand wall which the brat there had raised to oppose the sand gorgons in the years before Cosrain had bound them to their doom. The beast's arms swung in anticipation. Grimly, Covenant quickened his pace. In that way, with Lyndon beside him, two stone downers and four giants behind him, and eleven Harochai nearby, Thomas Covenant went to pit himself against the clave and the banefire. There was no reaction from Revelstone. Perhaps the Namoram did not know what a sand gorgon was, wanted to see what it would do before he attempted to provoke Covenant again, or perhaps he had given up provocation in order to prepare his defenses. Perhaps the raver had found a small worm of fear at the bottom of his malice. Covenant liked that idea. What the clave and the banefire had done to the land could not be forgiven. The way in which this raver had transformed to ill the ancient and honorable council of lords could not be forgiven. And for Gibbon's attack on Linden, Covenant would accept no atonement except the cleansing of the keep. Those who hold the earth in their hands have no justification for vengeance. Like hell, Covenant gritted, like hell they don't. But when he reached the base of the watchtower, he commanded Nam to halt and pause to consider the tunnel. The sun was high enough now to make the inner courtyard bright, but that only deepened the obscurity of the passage. The windows of the tower gaped as if the rooms behind them were abandoned. A silence like the cryptic stillness of the dead hung over the city. There was no wind, no sign of life except the stark hot shaft of the banefire. Between the two slain coursers, dead wasps littered the ground. The riders had taken their own fallen with them for the sake of the blood. But red splotches marked the rocks in front of the tower as if to tell Covenant that he had come to the right place. He turned to Linden. Her taut pallor frightened him, but he could no longer afford to spare her. The tower, he said as the company stopped behind him. I need to know if it's empty. The movement of her head as she looked upward seemed fatally slow, as if her old paralysis had its hand on her again. The last time she was here, Gibbon's touch had reduced her to near catatonia. The principal doom of the land is upon your shoulders. Through eyes and ears and touch you are made to be what the despiser requires. Once she had pleaded with Covenant, You've got to get me out of here before they make me kill you. But she did not plead now, or seek to shirk the consequences of her choices. Her voice sounded dull and stunned, yet she accepted Covenant's demands. It's hard, she murmured, hard to see past the banefire. It wants me, wants to throw me at the sun, throw me at the sun forever. Fear glazed her eyes as if that cast had already begun. It's hard to see anything else. However, a moment later she frowned, her gaze sharpened. But Gibbon isn't there. Not there. 
he's still in the main keep, and I don't feel anything else. When she looked at Covenant again, she appeared as severe as she had at their first meeting. I don't think they've ever used the tower. A surge of relief started up in Covenant, but he fought it down. He could not afford that, either. It blunted his control, let hints of blackness leak through his mind. Striving to match her, he muttered, Then let's go. With Nom and Lyndon, Kale and Fole, he walked into the tunnel, and his companions followed him like echoes. As he traversed the passage, he instinctively hunched his shoulders, bracing himself against the attack he still expected from the ceiling of the tunnel. But no attack came. Lyndon had read the tower accurately. Soon he stood in the courtyard. The sun shone before him on the high, buttressed face of the keep and on the massive inner gates. Those stone slabs were notched and beveled and balanced so that they could open outward smoothly and marry exactly when they closed. They were heavy enough to rebuff any force of which their makers had been able to conceive. And they were shut, interlocking with each other like teeth. The lines where they hinged and met were barely distinguishable. I have said it, the first breathed behind Covenant. The unhomed wrought surpassingly well in this place. She was right. The gates looked ready to stand forever. Suddenly Covenant became urgent for haste. If he did not find an answer soon, he would go up like tinder and oil. The sun had not yet reached mid-morning, and the shaft of the bane fire stood poised above him like a scythe, titanic and bloody enough, to reap all the life of the world. Sunder's hands clutched the krill and his oar-crest, holding them ready. But he looked strangely daunted by the great keep, by what it meant and contained. For the first time in the ordeal of the search, Pitchwife seemed vulnerable to panic, capable of flight. Lyndon's skin was the color of ashes, but Hanenskrave held his fists clinched at his sides, as if he knew he was close to the reasons for Sea Dreamer's death, and did not mean to wait for them much longer. Covenant groaned to himself. He should have begun his attack last night, while most of his friends slept. He was sick of guilt. With a fervid sweep of his arm he sent Nom at the gates. The sand gorgon seemed to understand instinctively. In three strides it reached full speed. Hurtling forward like a juggernaut, it crashed headlong against the juncture of the clenched slabs. The impact boomed across the courtyard, thudded in Covenant's lungs, rebounded like a cannonade from the tower. The stones underfoot shivered. A vibration like a wail ran through the abutments. The spot Nom struck was crushed and dented, as if it were formed of wood. But the gates stood. The beast stepped back as if it were astonished. It turned its head like a question toward Covenant. But an instant later it rose up in the native savagery of all sand gorgons and began to beat at the gates with the staggering might of its arms. Slowly at first, then more and more rapidly, the beast struck, one sledgehammer arm and then the other, in accelerating sequence, harder and faster, harder and faster, until the courtyard was full of thunder, and the stone yowled distress. Covenant was responsible for that, and still the gates held, bore the battery. Chips and splinters spat in all directions, granite teeth screamed against each other, the flagstones of the court seemed to ripple and dance, still the gates held. To herself Lyndon whimpered as if she could feel every blow in her frangible bones. Covenant started to shout for Nom to stop. He did not understand what the Sand Gorgon was doing. The sight of such an attack would have rent Morom's heart. But an instant later he heard the rhythm of Nom's blows more clearly, heard how that pulse meshed with the gut rock's protesting retorts and cries, and he understood. The Sand Gorgon had set up a resonance in the gates, and each impact increased the frequency and amplitude of the vibrations. If the beast did not falter, the slabs might be driven to tear themselves apart. Abruptly, red fire poured down off the abutment immediately above the gates. Riders appeared brandishing their rooks, four or five of them. Wielding the bane fire together, they were more mighty than an equal number of individuals, and they shaped a concerted blast to thrust Nom back from the gates. But Covenant was ready for them. He had been expecting something like this, and his power was hungry for utterance for any release that would ease the strain within him. 
meticulous with desperation, he put out wild magic to defend the Sand Gorgon. His force was a sickening mixture of blackness and argents, mottled and leprous. But it was force, nonetheless, fire capable of riving the heavens. It covered the riders, melted their rooks to slag, then pitched them back into the keep with their robes aflame. Nom went on hammering at the gates in a transport of destructive ecstasy, as if it had finally met an obstacle worthy of it. Hunnenstrabe quivered to hurl himself forward, but the first restrained him. He obeyed her like a man who would soon be beyond reach of any command. Then Nom struck a final blow, struck so swiftly that Covenant did not see how the blow was delivered. He saw only the small, still fraction of time, as the gates passed from endurance to rupture. They stood, and the change came upon them like the last inward suck of air before the blast of a hurricane. And then they were gone, ripped apart in a wrench of detonation, with fragments whining like agony in all directions, and stone powder billowing so thickly that Nom disappeared, and the broken mouth of Revelstone was obscured. Slowly the high, wide portal became visible through the dust. It was large enough for coursers, suitable for giants. But the Sand Gorgon did not reappear. Covenant's stunned ears were unable to pick out the slap of Nom's feet as the beast charged alone into the stone city. "'Oh, my God!' Lyndon muttered over and over again. "'Oh, my God!' Pitchwife breathed, "'Stone and sea!' as if he had never seen a Sand Gorgon at work before. Hollyan's eyes were full of fear, but Sunder had been taught violence and killing by the clave, had never learned to love Revelstone. His face was bright with eagerness. Half deafened by the pain of the stone, Covenant entered the keep, because now he had no choice left but to go forward or die, and he did not know what Nom would do to the city. At a wooden run he crossed the courtyard and passed through the dust into Revelstone as if he were casting the die of his fate. Instantly his companions arranged themselves for battle and followed him. He was only one stride ahead of Kale, two ahead of the first, Linden and Hunnenscrave, as he broached the huge forehall of the Nob Moram's keep. It was as dark as a pit. He knew that hall. It was the size of a cavern. It had been formed by giants to provide a mustering space for the forces of the former lords. But the sun angled only a short distance into the broken entrance, and some trick of the high stone seemed to absorb the light, and there was no other illumination. Too late, he understood that the forehall had been prepared to meet him. With a crash, heavy wooden barriers slammed shut across the entryway. Sudden midnight echoed around the company. Instinctively, Covenant started to release a blaze from his ring, then he yanked it back. His fire was entirely black now, as corrupt as poison. It shed no more light than the scream that swelled against his self-control, threatening to tear his throat and split rebel stone asunder. For an instant like a seizure, no one moved or spoke. The things they could not see seemed to paralyze even the first and the Harochai. Then Linden panted, Sunder! Her voice shook wildly. She sounded like a madwoman. Use the krill. Use it now. Covenant tried to swing toward her. What is it? What do you see? But his imprecise ears missed her position in the dark. He was peering straight at Sunder when the krill sent a peal of vivid white ringing across the cavern. He had no defense, as Hollyan's shrill cry echoed after the light. The Namorams! Grim! Argent dazzled him. The Grim! He could not think or see. Such ascending had attacked the company once before, and under an open sky it had killed Memla Namoram in, had nearly slain Linden and Kale. In the enclosed space of the forehall, and it would damage Revelstone severely, he had seen the remains of a village which had fallen under the grim. During Stonedown, Hamako's birthplace, the acid force of the Namoram's curse had eaten the entire habitation to rubble. Covenant wheeled to face the peril, but still he could not see. His companions scrambled around him. For one mad instant he believed they were fleeing, but then Kale took hold of his arm, ignoring the pain of suppressed fire, and he heard the first's stern voice. Mistweave, we must have more light. Chosen, instruct us. How may this force be combated? From somewhere beyond his blindness, Covenant heard Linden reply, Not with your sword. 
The ague in her voice blurred the words. She had to fight to make them comprehensible. We've got to quench it, or give it something else to burn. Covenant's vision cleared in time to see the black, hot thunderhead of the Grim rolling toward the company just below the cavern's ceiling. Confined by the forehall, it appeared monstrously powerful. Nom was nowhere to be seen, but Covenant's knees felt vibrations through the floor, as if the Sandgorgon were attacking the keep's inner chambers, or as if Revelstone itself feared what Gibbon had unleashed. From the entryway came the noise of belabored wood as Mistweave sought to break down the barrier which sealed the hall. But it had been fashioned with all the stoutness the clave could devise. It creaked and cracked at Mistweave's blows, but did not break. When the boiling thunderhead was directly over the company, it shattered with a tremendous and silent concussion that would have flattened Covenant if Kale had not upheld him. In that instant, the grim became stark black flakes that floated murderously downward, bitter as chips of stone and corrosive as vitriol. The thick grim fall spanned the company. Covenant wanted to raise fire to defend his friends. He believed he had no choice. Venom and fear urged him to believe he had no choice. But he knew with a terrible certainty that if he unleashed the wild magic now, he might never be able to call it back. All his other desperate needs would be lost. Loathing himself, he watched and did nothing as the dire flakes settled toward him and the people he loved. Fole and another Harochai impelled Linden to the nearest wall, as far as possible from the center of the grim fall. Harn tugged at Hollion, but she refused to leave Sunder. Kale was ready to dodge, ready to carry Covenant, if necessary. The First and Hanan's Crave braced themselves to pit their giantish immunity to fire against the flakes. Findale had disappeared as if he could sense Covenant's restraint, and cared about nothing else. Glaring in the krill light, the flakes wafted slowly downward, and Sunder stood to meet them. From his oar crest he drew a red shaft of sunbane fire, and started burning the black bits out of the air. His beam consumed every flake it touched. With astonishing courage or abandon, he faced the entire Grim himself. But the bits were falling by the thousands. They were too much for him. He could not even clear the air above his own head to protect himself and Hollion. Then Pitchwife joined him. Incongruously, crippled and valiant, the giant also attacked the Grim, using as his only weapon the pouches of vitrim he had borne with him from Hamako's Rishishim. One after another he emptied them by spraying vitrim at the flakes. Each flake the liquid touched became ash and drifted harmlessly away. His visage wore a grimace of grief at the loss of his carefully hoarded Wainham Rilberant, but while it lasted, he used it with deliberate extravagance. Hanan's grave slapped at the first flake which neared his head, then gave an involuntary cry as the black corrosive ate into his palm. The grim had been conceived to destroy stone, and no mortal flesh was proof against it. Around Covenant the cavern started to reel. The irreconcilable desperation of his plight was driving him mad. But at that instant a huge splintering crashed through the air and the wooden barricade went down under Mistweave's attack. More light washed into the forehall, improving the ability of the Harachai to dodge the Grim. And wood followed the light. Fiercely Mistweave tore the barrier beam from timber and flung the pieces toward the company. Harachai intercepted the smaller fragments, used them as cudgels to batter Grim flakes from the air. But the first, Hanan's Crave, and then Pitchwife, snatched up the main timbers. At once wood whirled around the company. The first swung a beam as tall as herself, as if it were a flail. Hanan's crave swept flakes away from Sunder and Hollion. Pitchwife pounced to Linden's defense with an enormous club in each fist. The Grim destroyed the wood almost instantly. Each flake tore the weapon which touched it to charcoal. But the broken barricade had been huge, and Mistweave attacked it with the fury of a demon, sending a constant rush of fragments skidding across the floor to the hands of the company. Hanan's Crave took another flake on his shoulder and nearly screamed. Yet he went on fighting as if he were back in the cave of the one tree and still had a chance to save his brother. Three of the Harachai threw Linden from place to place like a child, and that way they were able to keep her out of the path of the Grimfall more effectively than if one of them had tried to carry her. But their own movements were hampered. Two of them had already suffered burns, and as Covenant watched, a black bit seemed to shatter Fole's left leg. He balanced himself on his right as if pain had no meaning, and caught Linden when she was tossed to him. 
Around the cavern, flakes began to strike the floor and detonate, ripping holes the size of giant hands in the smooth stone. Acrid smoke intensified the air as if the granite were smoldering. Durus, Harn, and Tumor Harachai whipped brands and staves around the stone downers. Sunder lashed a frenzy of red powder at the grim. The first and Hanan's grave labored like berserkers, spending wood as rapidly as Mistweave fed it to them. Pitchwife followed his wife's example, protected her back with boards and timbers. He still had one pouch of vitrim left. Then Kale bounded and ducked through the drifting peril, with Covenant slung over his shoulder like a sack of grain. Covenant could not catch his breath to shout. Kale's shoulder forced the air from his lungs, but he had to make himself heard somehow. Sunder, he gasped. Sunder. By intuition or inspiration, the Harachai understood him. With a strength and agility that defied the thickening grimfall, he bore Covenant toward the graveler. An instant later, Covenant was whirled to his feet beside Sunder. Vertigo squalled around him. He had no balance. His hands were too numb to feel the fire mounting in him at every moment. If he could have seen Sunder's face, he would have cried out, for it was stretched and frantic with exhaustion. But the light of the krill blazed at Covenant's eyes. In the chaos of the cavern, that untrammeled brightness was the only point on which he could anchor himself. The company had already survived miraculously long, but the grim seemed to have no end, and soon even giants and Harochai would have to fall. This sending was far worse than the other one Covenant had experienced because it was enclosed, and because it was being fed directly by the banefire. Through the stamp of feet and the burst of fires, he heard Linden cursing the pain of the people who kept her alive, people she could not help, even though she suffered their hurts like acid on her own flesh. He had nowhere else to turn except to the krill. Plunging toward Sunder, he got both hands on Lorik's blade. He did not feel the edges cut into his fingers, did not see the blood. He feared that his weight would topple Sunder, but somehow Sunder braced himself against the collision, managed to hold Covenant upright for a moment. That moment was long enough. Before he fell tangled in the graveler's arms, Covenant sent one heart-rending blast of wild magic and risk through the gem of the krill. His power was as black as the grim now, but his desire was pure, and it struck the krill with such suddenness that the gem was not tainted by it. And from that gem light rang like a piece of the clean sun. Its brightness seemed to tear asunder the veil of Revelstone's gloom, lay bare the essential skeleton of the granite. Light shone through both flesh and stone, swept all shadow and obscurity away, made clear the farthest corners of the forehall, the heights of the vaulted ceiling. If his eyes had been equal to the Argents in that instant, he would have seen the deep heart of the great keep and Gibbon already fleeing to the place where he had chosen to hide himself. But Covenant was blind to such things. His forehead was butted against Sunder's shoulder, and he was falling. When he rolled himself off Sunder's panting chest, groped through the dizziness to regain his feet, the moment of his power had passed. The cavern was lit only by the sun's reflection from the entrance and the krill's normal shining. His companions stood at various distances from him, but while his head spun he seemed to have no idea who they were. But the grim was gone. The black flakes had been swept away, and still he retained his grip on the wild magic. He could not make the stone under him stop whirling. Helplessly he clung to the first Harochai who came to him. The numbness of his hands and feet had spread to his other senses. His mind had gone deaf. He heard nothing but the rumble of distant thunder, as if the sun outside Revelstone had become a sun of rain. His thoughts spun. For it was Nom. There were villagers in the hold and Harochai. Unless the clave had killed them already? Gibbon had to be somewhere. What would he do next? The venom made Covenant vicious, and the sheer effort of containing so much ignited violence took his sanity away. He thought he was speaking aloud, but his teeth were clenched and immobile. Why doesn't somebody tell that damn thunder to shut up so I can hear myself? But the thunder did not stop, and the people around him fought their weariness and injuries to ready themselves. Dimly he heard the first's battle cry as she swept out her sword. Then the darkness at the end of the forehall came toward him, and he saw that the riders had unleashed their coursers at the company. Need cleared his head a little. The Harochai holding him pushed him away, and other hands took him. He found himself near Linden at the rear of the company, with only mist weave between them and the entrance. All the Harochai around them were injured. 
Those who were not had gone with the first and Hanan's grave to meet the charge of the coursers. Sunder and Hallian stood alone in the center of the hall. She supported him while he strove urgently to interfere with Clave's command over the beasts. But exhaustion weakened him, and the banefire was too near. He could not blunt the assault. At least a score of the fierce coursers rushed forward, borne by the stone thunder of their hooves. The Harochire protecting Covenant and Linden were severely wounded. Fole stood with his left foot resting in a pool of his own blood. Harn had a deep burn on one hip. The other four Harochai there were nearly maimed by various hurts. The air still reeked of grim flakes and pain. The beasts struck with a scream of animal fury, and Covenant wanted to shriek with them because it was too much, and he was no closer to his goal, and the fingers of his will were slipping moment by moment from their hold on the world's ruin. One heartbeat later the scream arose again behind him like an echo. Riding his vertigo, he turned in time to see Mistweave go down into the hooves of four more coursers. The giant had remained at the entrance to guard the company's rear, but he had been watching the battle, the plight of his companions. The return of the beasts which Sunder had scattered earlier took him by surprise. They reared behind him, pounded him to the stone. Then they thudded past him inward, their feral red eyes flaming like sparks of the banefire. Covenant could not resist as Harn and two more Harachai thrust him toward one wall, interposed themselves between him and the coursers. Fole and the rest bore Linden to the opposite wall so that the attack would be divided. Wounded and extravagant Harachai faced the huge savagery of the sun-bane-shaped mounts. "'You bastard!' Covenant cried at Gibbon, as if he were weeping. "'You bloody bastard!' Because he had nothing else left, he braced himself on venom and readied his fire so that no more Harochai would have to die for him. But once again he had underestimated them. Two of the coursers veered toward Linden, two came for him, and Harn hobbled out to meet them. He was between Covenant and the beasts. Covenant could not strike at them. He had to watch as Harn pitched headlong to the stone directly under the hooves of the leading courser. Pitched and rolled and came up under the beast's belly with its left fetlock gripped in both hands. Unable to halt, the courser plunged to the stone. The fall simultaneously crushed its knee and drove its poisonous spur up into its barrel. Squealing, it thrashed away from him. Its fangs sliced the air. But it could not rise with its leg broken, and the poison was already at work. Near the entrance, Mistweave struggled to lever himself to his feet, but one of his arms sprawled at an unconscionable angle, and the other seemed too weak to lift him. As the first courser fell, the second charged toward Covenant. Then it braked with all four legs to keep itself from crashing into the wall. It looked as immense as thunder as it reared to bring its hooves and spurs down on Covenant and his defenders. The Ronihan also had reared to him, and he felt unable to move. Instinctively he submitted himself to his dizziness. It unbalanced him so that he stumbled away to the right. Each forehoof as it hammered down was caught by one of the Harochai. Covenant did not know their names but they stood under the impact of the hooves as if their flesh were granite. One of them had been burned on the arm and could not keep his grip. He was forced to slip the hoof past his shoulder to avoid the spur. But his comrade held and twisted until the other spur snapped off in his hands. Instantly he drove the spur like a spike into the base of the courser's neck. Then the floor came up and kicked Covenant in the chest. At once he was able to see everything, but there was no air in his lungs, and he had forgotten how to control his limbs— even the fire within him was momentarily stunned. The uninjured Harachai were taking their toll on the beasts, pounding in the far end of the hall. Hunnenscrave swung his fists like bludgeons, matching his bulk and extremity against the size and strength of the coursers. Pitchwife struck and struck as if he had temporarily become a warrior like his wife. But the first surpassed them all. She had been trained for combat, and her long sword leaped from thrust to thrust as if it were weightless in her iron hands, slaying coursers on all sides. Only one of the beasts got past her and her companions, to hurl itself at Sunder and Hallian. The graveler tried to step forward, but Hallian stopped him. She took the orc crest and krill from him, held them high as she faced the courser. Red fire and white light blazed out of her hands, daunting the beast so that it turned aside. There Kale caught up with it and dispatched it as if it were not many times larger than he. But the Harachai guarding Linden were not so successful. Hampered by their wounds, they could not match the feats of their people. Fole attempted what Harn had done, but his leg failed him, and the courser pulled from his grasp. 
It plowed into another Harachai, slammed the man against the wall with such force that Covenant seemed to see Hergrim being crushed by a sand gorgon in the impact. The third Harachai thrust Linden away an instant before a hoof, clipped the side of his head. His knees folded, and he sagged to the floor. Covenant had never seen one of the Harachai fall like that. Fole started after Linden, but a kick caught him by the shoulder, knocked him aside. Then both coursers reared over Linden. Her face was clear in the reflected light from the courtyard. Covenant expected to see panic, paralysis, horror, and he gulped for air, struggled to put out power fast enough to aid her. But her visage showed no fear. It was argued with concentration. Her eyes stabbed up at the beasts. Every line of her features were as precise as a command. And the coursers faltered. For an instant they did not plunge at her. Somehow, with no power to support her, she drove her percipients into their minds, confused them. Their minds were brutish, and the banefire was strong. She could not hold them for more than an instant, but that was enough. Before they recovered, Mistweave crashed into them like a battering ram. He had once left Linden in peril of her life because he had not been able to choose between her and Hunnan's grave, and that failure had haunted him ever since. But now he saw his chance to make restitution, and did not mean to let any mortal pain or weakness stop him. Ignoring his hurts, he threw himself to Linden's rescue. His right arm flopped at his side, but his left was still strong. His initial charge knocked both coursers back. One of them fell onto its side, and he followed it at once struck it a blow which made its head rebound with a sickening thud from the hard stone, its body quiver and lie still. Wheeling, he met the second courser as it rose to pound down on him. His good hand caught it by the gullet, his fingers ground inward to strangle the beast. Its fangs gaped for his face, its eyes flared insanely. Its forehooves slashed at his shoulders, tearing him with its spurs. Blood streamed down his sides, but Linden had saved his life, when he had been more deeply injured than this, and he had failed her. He would not do so again. He held the beast until Fole and the other Harachai came to his aid. They grabbed its forelegs, turned its spurs against itself. In a moment the courser was dead. Mistweave dropped it heavily to the floor. His muscles began to tremble as the poison worked its way into him. Then the fighting was over. Gasps and silence echoed from the far end of the forehall. Grimly, Covenant gained his feet to stumble desperately toward Linden and Mistweave. She had not been harmed. Mistweave and the Harrow Chai had taken all the hurt onto themselves. Her eyes ran as if the wounds of her friends had been etched on her heart, yet the shape of her mouth and the angles of her cheeks were sharp with wrath. She looked like a woman who would never be paralyzed again. If she had spoken, she might have said, "'Just let him try.' Just let that butchering son of a bitch try. Before Covenant could summon any words, the first reached his side. She was panting with exultation. Her eyes were bright, and her blade dripped thick blood. But she did not talk of such things. When she addressed him, she took him by surprise. The master is gone, she said through her teeth. He pursues his purpose inward. I know not what he seeks, but I fear that he will find it. Behind her, Pitchwife wretched for air as if his exertions had torn the tissues of his cramped lungs. Mistweave shivered toward convulsions as coarser poison spread into him. Sunder's face was gray with exhaustion. Hollyan had to hold him to keep him on his feet. Six of the Harochai had been burned by the grim and nearly crippled. One was in Mistweave's plight, gouged by a spur during the battle. Findale had vanished. Linden looked as bitter as acid. And Hanan's grave was gone. Nom was gone, seeking their individual conceptions of ruin in the heart of Revelston. Too many lives, too much pain, and Covenant was no closer to his goal than the entrance hall of the Na Morom's keep. That tears it, he thought dumbly. That is absolutely enough. I will not take any more of this. Linden, he said thickly, his voice was hoarse with fire. Tell Pitchwife how to treat these people. For an instant her eyes widened. He feared that she would demur. She was a physician. Seven Harachai and Mistweave needed her sorely. But then she seemed to understand him. The land also required healing, and she had wounds of her own which demanded care. Turning to Pitchwife, she said, "'You've got some vitrim left. 
In spite of the main fire, her senses had become explicit, immune to bafflement. Use it on the burns. Give diamond draft to everybody who's hurt. Then she gazed squarely back at Covenant. Miss Tweave's arm can wait. But Vura is the only thing I know of that'll help against the poison. He did not hesitate. He had no hesitation left. Kale, he said. You know Revelstone. And you know Vura. The distilled sap which the clave used to ward off the effects of the son of pestilence had once saved Kale's life. Tell your people to find some. There are only four Harachai uninjured. And tell them to take Sunder and Hallian with them. Hallian was experienced with Vura. For God's sake, keep them safe. Without waiting for a response, he swung toward the first. What you ought to do is secure our retreat. His tone thickened like blood. He had told all his companions to stay out of Revelstone, and none of them obeyed. But they would obey him now. He would not accept refusal. But it's too late for that. I want you to go after Hanenskrave. Find him somehow. Don't let him do it, whatever it is. Then he faced Kale again. I don't need to be protected, not any more. But if there's anybody left in the hold, any villagers or Harochai the clave had not yet shed, they need help. Break in there somehow. Get them out, before they're fed to the banefire. Lyndon and I are going after Gibbon. None of his companions protested. He was impossible to refuse. He held the world in his hands, and his skin seemed to be wearing thinner, so that the black power gnawing in him showed more and more clearly. His cut fingers dripped blood, but the wound gave him no pain. When Lyndon indicated the far end of the forehall, he went in that direction with her, leaving behind him all the needs and problems for which he lacked both strength and time, leaving behind especially Sunder and Hallian, on whom the future depended, but also the first and pitchwife who were dear to him, Mistweave on the verge of convulsions, the proven Harochai, leaving them behind, not as encumbrances, but as people who were too precious to be risked. Lyndon also he would have left behind, but he needed her to guide him, and to support him. He was hag-ridden by vertigo. The reports of their steps rustled like dry leaves as they moved, and he felt that he was going to the place where all things withered. But he did not look back or turn aside. When they passed out of the cavern into the amazing giant-planned ways of the great keep, they were suddenly attacked by a small band of riders. But the proximity of Rookfire triggered his ring. The riders were swept away in a wash of midnight. The dark was complete for a short distance. Ahead, however, the normal lights of the city burned, torches smoking in sconces along the walls. No fires of the lords had ever smoked. Their flames had not harmed the essential wood. The clave kept its passage lit so that Gibbon could move his forces from place to place. But these halls were empty. They echoed like crypts. Much beauty had died here, been undone by time or malice. Behind him Covenant heard the sounds of renewed combat, and his shoulders flinched. "'They can take care of themselves,' Lyndon gritted, holding her fear for her friends between her teeth. "'This way!' Covenant stayed with her as she turned toward a side passage and started down a long sequence of stairs toward the roots of Revelstone. Her perception of the raver made no mistakes. Not uncertainty, but only her ignorance of the keep caused her to take occasional corridors or turnings which did not lead toward her goal. At intervals, riders appeared from nowhere to attack and retreat again, as if they raised their fire for no other reason than to mark Covenant's progress through the keep. They posed no danger in themselves. His defenses were instantaneous and thorough, but each onslaught accentuated his dizziness, weakened his control. His ability to suppress the black raving frayed, and to lean on Linden as if she were one of the Harachai. Always the path she chose tended downward, and after a while he felt a sick conviction that he knew where she was going, where Gibbon had decided to hazard his fate. The place where any violence would do the most damage. His forearm throbbed as if it had been freshly bitten. Then Lyndon opened a small heavy door in a chamber which had once been a meeting hall, with curtains on its walls, and a long, twisting stairwell gaped below them. Now he was sure. Night gyred up out of the depths. He thought that he would fall, but he did not. She upheld him. 
Only his nightmares gathered around him as they made the long descent toward the place where Gibbon meant to break him. Abruptly she stopped, wheeled to look upward. A man came down the stairs, as noiseless as wings. In a moment the Harochai reached them. Kale. He faced Covenant. Haste did not heighten his respiration. Disobedience did not abash him. Er, Lord, he said, I bring word of what transpires above. Covenant blinked at the Harochai, but the nauseous whirl of his vision blurred everything. It is fortunate that Vura was readily found. The company is now sorely beleaguered. That battle is one to wring the heart. He spoke as if he had no heart, for it is fought in large part by those who should not give battle. Among the few writers are many others who merely serve the clave and revelstone. They are cooks and herders, artisans and scullions, tenders of hearth and coarser. They have no skill for this work, and it is a shameful thing to slay them. Yet they will not be halted or daunted. A possession is upon them. They accept naught but their own slaughter. Felling them, Pitchwife weeps as Nohara Chai has ever wept. Kale spoke flatly, but Lyndon's grasp on Covenant's arm conveyed a visceral tremor of the emotion Kale projected. Vura and Vitrim enabled the company for defense, he went on, and the hold has been opened. They were found Stell and some few other Harochai, though no villagers. They have gone to the support of the company. The Graveler and the Ebrand are well. But of neither the first nor the master have we seen sign. Then he stopped. He did not ask permission to remain with Covenant. His stance showed that he had no intention of leaving. Because Covenant said nothing, Lyndon breathed for him, Thanks, thanks for coming. Her voice ached on behalf of the innocent men and women who were Gibbon's victims, and of her companions who had no choice. But Covenant had passed beyond the details of pain and loss into a state of utter purpose, of unanodyned grief and quintessential fury. Feeling them, Pitchwife weeps as no Harachai has ever wept. That must be true. Kale would not lie. But it was only one more drop in an ocean eating away the very shores of time, the ocean of Lord Fowl's cruelty. Such things could not be permitted to continue. Lifting himself out of vertigo and Lyndon's grasp, the unbeliever started downward again. She called his name, but he did not answer. With Kale at her side, she came hastening after him. The way was not long now. Soon he reached the bottom of the stairwell, halted in front of a blank wall that he remembered, a wall with an invisible door which he had seen only once before, and never been asked to open. He did not know how to open it. But that did not matter. What mattered was that Gibbon had chosen this place, this place, for his battleground. Simple dismay added a twist which nearly snapped the knot of Covenant's self-command. But he was not required to breach the door for himself. It opened inward at Gibbon's word, admitting Covenant, Lyndon, and Kale to one of the greatest treasures of the old lords, to the Hall of Gifts. After all these centuries it was still intact. The air was tanged with smoke because the torches Gibbon had set for himself created light by destruction and that kind of light could not do justice to the wonder of the high cavern. But everything Covenant saw was still intact. The legacy of the lords to a future which despised them. The makers of Revelstone had wrought little in this spacious cave. They had given it a smooth floor, but had not touched the native stone of its walls, the rough columns which rose tremendously to support the ceiling and the rest of the keep. Yet that lack of finish suited the purpose for which the hall had been conceived. The rude surfaces everywhere displayed the best work of the finest artists and craftspeople of the ancient land. Tapestries and paintings behung the walls, defying the decay of centuries, preserved by some skill of the artists or quality of the hall's atmosphere. Stands between the columns held large sculptures and carvings. Small pieces rested on wooden shelves cunningly attached to the stone. Many different fabrics were displayed but all the other works were made of either wood or stone, the two fundamental materials which the land had once revered. The hall contained no metal of any description. Covenant had not forgotten this place, never forgotten it, but he thought now that he had forgotten its pricelessness. It seemed to bring everything back to him in a rush, every treasured or abhorred memory. Lena and Atiaran, love and rape, 
Moram's hazardous and indefeasible compassion, the unscrupulous lore of Irviles, Kevin in his despair, Ronihin as proud as wind, Raman as stubborn as earth, and giants, giants on all sides, giants wondrously depicted with their fealty and grief and grandeur wreathed about them as if the tapestries and stoneworks and carvings were numinous with eternity. Here the people of the land had shown what they could do when they were given peace. And it was here, in this place of destructible beauty and heritage, that Gibbon Raver had chosen to challenge covenant for the survival of the earth. Moving unconsciously inward, as if he were blind to the brink of madness gaping at his feet, covenant went to meet the Namoram. Stark in his black robe and scarlet chasuble, with his iron crozier held ready and his red eyes bright, Gibbon stood on a mosaic which swirled through the center of the floor. Covenant had not seen that mosaic before. It must have been set at a later time. It was formed of small stone chips the color of aliantha and agony, and it portrayed Kevin Landwaster at the ritual of desecration. Unlike most of the works around it, it conveyed no sense of underlying affirmation, Instead, it expressed Kevin's lurid and extreme pain, as if that were a source of satisfaction. Gibbon had taken his position over the landwaster's heart. At the edge of the mosaic, Hanan's crave knelt in the stone. Covenant's entrance into the Hall of Gifts did not make the giant look up, though his head was the only part of himself he could have moved. By some cunning of Gibbon Raver's power, Hanan's crave had been fused to the floor. Kneeling, he had sunk into it to the middle of his thighs and forearms, as though it were quicksand. Then it had solidified around him, imprisoning him absolutely. His eyes stared in despair at the failure of his life. Loss scarred his face with memories of Sea Dreamer and Starfare's gem. And the Namoram laughed. "'See you, unbeliever?' His voice was crimson and eager. No unbelief will redeem you now. I will spare you only if you grovel. In response, Kale sprang past Covenant toward Gibbon as if he thought he could shatter the raver. But Gibbon was ready. His fist tightened on his crozier. Fire spread from the open triangle at its tip. An involuntary scream tore through Hunnan's crave. Kale leaped to a halt, stood almost trembling a few feet from the Namoram. I know you, Harochai. The raver breathed softly, savagely. The groveller you serve will not assail me. He values the relics of his dead past and fears to harm them. He values the lost earth. But you have not the folly of that scruple. Yet you remain a fool. You will not require me to crush the life of this mad giant who sought to confront me, deeming me as paltry as himself. Kale turned on his heel, strode back to Covenant's side. His visage held no expression, but sweat beaded on his temples, and the muscles at the corners of his eyes squeezed and released like the labor of his heart. Lyndon tried to curse, but the words came out like wincing. Instinctively, she had placed herself half behind Covenant. "'Hear you?' Gibbon went on, raising his voice so that it contaminated every corner of the great hall. "'You are all fools, and you will not lift finger or flame against me.' You will do naught but grovel at my whim or die. You are beaten, unbeliever. You fear to destroy that which you love. Your love is cowardice, and you are beaten. Covenant's throat closed as if he were choking on smoke. And you, Lyndon Avery, his raw contempt filled the air. Knowing my touch, you have yet dared me again. And this you name victory to yourself, thinking that such folly expiates your rooted evil. You conceive that we have misesteemed you, that you have put aside despite. But your belief is anile. You have not yet tasted the depths of your desecration. Hear you all, he cried suddenly, exalted by malice. You are damned beyond description, and I will feast upon your souls. Torn between outrage and visceral horror, Lyndon made whimpering noises between her teeth. She had come this far because she loved Covenant and loathed evil, but Gibbon appalled her in every nerve and fiber of her being. Her face was as pale as a gravestone, her eyes stared like wounds. Covenant had gone numb to everything else, 
but he was still aware of her. He knew what was happening to her. She was being ripped apart by her desire for the power to crush Gibbon, to extirpate him as if he were the part of herself she most hated. If she did that, if she took hold of Covenant's fire and wielded it for herself, she would be lost. The inheritance of her parents would overcome her. Destroying Gibbon, she would shape herself in his image, affirm the blackness which had twisted her life. That, at least, Covenant could spare her. And the moment had come. He was caught in the throes of a rupture so fundamental and puissant that it might tear time asunder. If he did not act now, his control would be gone. Deliberately, desperately, he started forward as if he did not realize that he had gone past the brink. At once Gibbon lifted his crozier higher, gripped it more tightly. His eyes spat red. Bethink you, unbeliever, he snapped. You know not what you do. Consider your hands. Involuntarily Covenant looked down at them, at the krill cuts across the insides of his fingers. His severed flesh gaped, exposing bone, but the cuts were not bleeding. Instead they oozed an essence of leprosy and venom. The very fluid in his veins had become corruption. Yet he was prepared for this. His chosen path had brought him here. It was foretold by dreams, and he had already caused the shattering of Revelstone's gates, already brought immeasurable damage into the keep. More harm could not alter his doom. The scars on his forearm shone black fury. Like poison and flame, he strode onto the mosaic toward Gibbon. Fool! the Namoram cried. A grimace of fear betrayed his face. You cannot oppose me. The banefire surpasses you, and if it does not, I will possess your Lyndon Avery. Will you slay her also? Covenant heard Gibbon. He understood the threat, but he did not stop. Suddenly the raver sent a blast of fire toward Hunnan's grave, and Covenant erupted to protect the master. Erupted as if his heart could no longer contain the magma of his power. Flame as dark and fathomless as an abyss shouted across the glittering surface of the mosaic, rebounded among the pillars, echoed off the high ceiling. Soulless force ripped Gibbon's blast from the air, scattered it in tatters, rose on and on with a deafening vehemence, trumpeting for the raver's life. His hands lifted in front of him, with the palms outward like an appeal for peace. But from his sliced fingers wild magic streamed, venomous and fatal. All his flesh had turned black, his bones were ebon and diseased. The only pure things about him were the stark circle of his ring and the quality of his passion. The Namoram retreated a step or two, held up his crozier with vermeil frenzy, wailing from its triangle. Fire hot enough to incinerate stone crashed at Covenant. The concentrated ferocity of the banefire seemed to scorch straight into his vitals, but he went forward through it. That Gibbon had slaughtered the people of the land to feed the banefire and the sunbane, that he had taught rites of bloodshed to those who survived so that they slew each other in order to live, that he had filled Revelstone itself with such pollution. Blast and counterblast, Hunnan's grave struggling uselessly again, Kale hauling Lyndon out of the terrible concussion of powers with screams in her eyes too acute for paralysis, and precious artifacts falling like faggots. That he had torn the forehall with grim fire, and had sent his innocent servants to compel their own butchery from the company. That he had so appalled Lyndon that she believed the legacy of her parents. That he had brought his violence here, requiring Covenant to spend the land's treasured past as tinder. Gibbon's crozier channeled so much might from the main fire, so much force and rage, that Covenant nearly wept at the ruin it wrought, the price it exacted from him. Under his boots the colored pieces of the mosaic caught fire, became as brilliant and incandescent as prophecy. He trod an image of the land-waster's heart, as if that were where his own path led. Erect and benighted in the core of his infernal power, he tried to advance on the Namoram, and failed. Air and light ceased to exist. Every precious thing near his blaze burned away. The nearby columns began to melt. The floor of the hall rippled on the verge of dissolution. More force than ever before in his life coursed from him and slammed at Gibbon. The essential fabric of the earth's existence trembled as if the last wind had begun to blow. Yet he failed. Lord Fowl had planned well, prepared well. Gibbon Raver was cornered and could not flee and so he did not falter, and the banefire was too strong. Centuries of bloodshed had produced their intended fruit, and Gibbon fed it to Covenant, thrust it morsel by bitter morsel between his unwilling teeth. The banefire was not stronger than he was, 
It was simply stronger than he dared to be, strong enough to withstand any assault which did not also crumble the arch of time. At the taste of that knowledge, Covenant felt his death closing around him, and his despair grew wild. For a long moment, with red fury blazing at him like the sun, he wanted to cry out, scream, howl, so that the heavens would hear him, No! No! Hear him and fall. But before the weaving of the world could tear, he found he knew that answer also. To bear what must be borne. After all, it was endurable, if he chose to go that far, and the choice was not taken from him. Certainly it would be expensive. It would cost him everything. But was that not preferable to a ritual of desecration, which would make Kevin's look like an act of petty spite? Was it not? After time, he said, softly, Yes, and again, yes, accepting it fully for the first time. You are the wild magic. Yes. With the last ragged fragments of his will, he pulled himself back from the brink of cataclysm. He could not quench the blackness, and if he did not quench it soon, it would kill him. The venom was eating away his life, but not yet. His face was stretched and mortal with unutterable pain, but he had accepted it. Turning away from Gibbon, he walked off the mosaic. As he looked toward Lyndon and Kale to beg their forgiveness, Nom burst into the Hall of Gifts with the first in fierce pursuit. She wrenched to a halt when she saw the wreckage of the hall, the extent of Covenant's desperation. Then she went swiftly to join Kale and Lyndon. But the Sand Gorgon shot toward the Namorum as if the beast at last had located its perfect prey. Flashing past Covenant, pounding across the mosaic, Nom crashed into the red heart of Gibbon's power, and was catapulted away over Hanan's Crave's head like a flung child. Even a Sand Gorgon was a small thing to pit against the force of the Banefire. But Nom understood frustration and fury, effort and destruction. It did not understand fear or defeat. Surely the beast recognized the sheer transcendence of Gibbon's might. But Nom did not, therefore, desist or flee. Instead, it attacked in another way. With both arms it hit the floor so hard that the entire center of the hall bucked and spattered like a sheet of water. The mosaic cracked across its face, lifted in pieces, fell apart. Shrieking rage, Gibbon staggered to regain his balance, then cocked back his crozier to deliver a blast which would fry Nom's flesh from its bones. But he was maddened by strain and deathlust, and his blow required a moment's preparation. He did not see the chief result of Nom's attack. That blow sent a fracture from wall to wall, a split which passed directly through the place where Hanan's crave knelt in the stone. His bonds were shattered as if that had been Nom's intent. With a roar, Hanan's crave charged the Nom Oram. Gibbon was too intensely focused on Nom, too precariously poised. He could not react in time. His human flesh had no defense as Hanan's crave struck him a blow which seemed to crush his bones. His crozier clattered across the floor, rang against the base of a column, and lay still, deprived of fire. The first cried Hanan's crave's name, but her voice appeared to make no sound in the stunned hall. For a moment Hanan's crave remained hunched and panting over Gibbon's corpse. Covenant had time for one clear thought. You can't kill a raver that way. You can only kill the body. Then the master turned toward his companions, and Covenant nearly broke. He did not need Lyndon's percipients to see what had happened, did not need to hear her anguished whisper. He had witnessed such horrors before, and Hanenskray's plight was plain. He stood as if he were still himself, his fists clenched as if he knew what he was doing. But his face was flowing like an hallucination, melting back and forth between savage glee and settled grim resolve. He was Grimmond Hanenskrave, the master of Starfare's gem. And he was Samadhi, Sheol, the raver that had led the clave in Gibbon's body. At war with each other. The entire battle was internal. Red flared into his eyes and glazed away. Grins bared his teeth were fought back. Snarling laughter choked in his throat. When he spoke, his voice cracked and seized under the strain. Thomas Covenant! At once his voice scaled upward out of control, crying, Madman! Madman! He forced it down again. Earth friend, hear me! The effort seemed to tear the muscles of his face. Helpless with power, Covenant watched in fever as Hunnan's crave wrestled for possession of his soul. Through his teeth the giant articulated like a death gasp, Heed the bidding of your despair. It must be done. At once several piercing shrieks burst from him. 
the ravers' staccato anguish or Hanan's craves. Help him, Lyndon panted. Help him, dear God. There was nothing anybody could do. She alone had the capacity to interfere in such a struggle. And if she made the attempt, Covenant meant to stop her. If somebody Sheol sprang from Hanan's crave to her, it would have access to the wild magic through her. Retching for air, Hanan's crave gained the mastery. You must slay me! The words bled from his lips, but they were distinct and certain. His face turned murderous, then regained its familiar lines. I will contain this raver while you slay me. In that way, it also will be slain, and I will be at peace. Sheol writhed for freedom, but Hanan's crave held. I beg of you! Covenant let out a groan of fire, but it went nowhere near the giant. The first gripped her sword in both fists until her arms trembled, but her tears blinded her, and she could not move. Kale folded his arms across his chest as if he were deaf. Lyndon was savage with suppressed weeping. Give me a knife. Somebody give me a knife. Oh, God damn you all to hell. Hanan's crave! But she had no knife, and her revulsion would not let her go any closer to the raver. Yet Hanan's crave was answered. By Nom, the sand gorgon of the great desert. The beast waited a moment for the others to act, as if it understood that they all had to pass through this crisis and be changed. Then it padded over to Hanan's crave, its strange knees tense with strength. He watched it come, while the raver in him gibbered and yowled. But he was the master now in a way which surpassed Sama de Sheol, and his control did not slip. Slowly, almost gently, Nam placed its arms around his waist. For an instant, his eyes gazed toward his companions, and yearned as if he wished to say farewell, wished poignantly, at the last, that he had found some way to go on living. Then, with a wrench as unexpected as an act of kindness, the sand gorgon crumpled him to the floor. As if he were not in tears, Covenant thought dumbly, you can't kill a raver that way. But he was not sure any more. There were mysteries in the world which even Lord Fowl could not corrupt. Lyndon gave a gasp as if her own bones had broken. When she raised her head, her eyes were bright and hungry for the power to exact retribution. Stiffly, the first started toward the body of her friend. Before she reached him, Nam turned. And Kale said, as if even his native dispassion were not proof against surprise, The Sand Gorgon speaks. Covenant could not clear his sight. All his peripheral vision was gone, blackened by imminent combustion. It speaks in the manner of the Harochai. Faint lines of perplexity marked the space between Kale's brows. Its speech is alien, yet comprehensible. His companion stared at him. It says that it has rent the raver. It does not say slain. The word is to rend. The raver has been rent, and the shreds of its being Nom has consumed. With an effort, Kale smoothed the frown from his forehead. Thus has the sand gorgon gained the capacity for such speech. Then the Harachai faced Covenant. Nom gives you thanks, Er Lord. Thanks. Covenant grieved. He had let Hanan's crave die, had failed to defeat Gibbon. He did not deserve thanks, and he had no time. All his time had been used up. It was too late for sorrow. His skin had a dark, sick underhue. His sense of himself was fraying away. A gale of blackness rose in him, and it demanded an answer. The answer he had learned in nightmares. From Linden and the first and Kale and Nom and fallen Hanan's crave, he turned away as if he were alone, and walked like a mounting flicker of fire out of the Hall of Gifts. But when he put his feet to the stairs, a hand closed around his mind, and he stopped. Another will imposed itself on his, taking his choices from him. Please, it said, please don't. Though he had no health sense, and was hardly sane, he recognized Lyndon's grasp. She was possessing him with her percipients. Don't do this to yourself. Through the link between them, he knew that she was weeping wildly, but behind her pain shone a fervid passion. She would not permit him to end in this way, not allow him to go willingly out of her life. 
I can't let you. He understood her. How could he not? She was too vulnerable to everything. She saw that his control was almost gone, and his purpose must have been transparent to her. His desperation was too extreme to elude her discernment. She was trying to save him. You mean too much. But this was not salvation. It was doom. She had misinterpreted his need for her. What could she hope to do with him when his madness had become irremediable? And how would she be able to face the despiser with the consequences of possession chained about her soul? He did not try to fight her with fire. He refused to risk harming her. Instead, he remembered the imposed silence of the Elohim and the delirium of venom. In the past, either defense had sufficed to daunt her. Now he raised them together, sought deliberately to close the doors of his mind, shut her out. She was stronger than ever. She had learned much, accepted much. She was acquainted with him in ways too intimate to be measured. She was crying hotly for him, and her desire sprang from the roots of her life. She clinched her will to his with a white grip that would not let him go. To shut her out was hard, atrociously hard. He had to seal off half of himself as well as all of her, silence his own deep yearning. But she still did not comprehend him. She still feared that he was driven by the same self-pity, grown to malice, which had corrupted her father. And she had been too badly hurt by the horror of Gibbon's power and Hanenskrave's death to be clear about what she was doing. At last he was able to close the door, to leave her behind as he started up the stairs again. Lorne and aggrieved, her cry rose after him, I love you. It made him waver for a moment, but then he steadied himself and went on. Borne by a swelling flood of black fire, he made his way toward the sacred enclosure. Twice he encountered bands of riders who opposed him frenetically, as if they could sense his purpose. But he had become untouchable and was able to ignore them. Instinct and memory guided him to the base of the huge cavity in the heart of Revelstone, where the bane fire burned. It was here that the former inhabitants of the city had come together to share their communal dedication to the land. Within its sheer cylinder were balconies where the people had stood to hear the lords speak from the dais below them. But that dais was gone now, replaced by a pit from which the bane fire licked blood for food. At the nearest doorway he stopped. Findale stood there waiting for him. The yellowish anguish of the appointed's eyes had not changed. His face was a wasteland of fear and old pain. But the anger with which he had so often denounced Covenant was gone. In its place the Elohim emitted simple rue. Softly he said, You are going to your death, Ringwielder. I comprehend you now. It is a valiant hazard. I cannot answer for its outcome and I know not how I will prove worthy of you, but I will not leave you. That touched Covenant as the rooks of the riders had not. It gave him the strength to go on into the sacred enclosure. There the banefire met him, howling like the furnace of the sun. Its flames raged as high as the upper balconies where the immense iron triangle of the master rook now rested, channeling the power of the sunbane to the clave. Its heat seemed to char his face instantly, sear his lungs, cinder the frail life of his flesh, and rave through him into the last foundation of his will. The fang marks on his forearm burned like glee, yet he did not halt or hesitate. He had set his feet to the path of his own volition. He accepted it completely. Pausing only to bring down the master rook in molten rain, so that the surviving riders would be cut off from their strength, he moved into the inferno. That is the grace which has been given to you. A small clear space, like hope, opened in his heart as he followed his dreams into the banefire. To bear what must be born. After a time, the blackness in him burned white 